I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. Let's get right to our top story this morning. Hurricane Idalia has just made landfall near Keaton Beach, Florida. The Category 3 hurricane is expected to have a life-threatening storm surge that could reach up to 16 feet. It's also hitting a region of the state that has never seen a hurricane like this in recorded history. Governor Ron DeSantis says the state has already seen almost a dozen tornado warnings and is urging residents in the eye of the storm to stay indoors with sustained wind speeds now at 125 miles per hour. As of right now, more than 85,000 customers are without power and at least 17 counties are under mandatory evacuation orders. We have team coverage this morning of Hurricane Idalia. Let's go straight to meteorologist Greg Dutra from our station WLS. Uh, Greg, where's this hurricane right now and how bad is it? Uh, good morning, Diane. And it just made landfall moments ago, 745 officially. The National Hurricane Center has said that Idalia has made landfall right near Keaton Beach. And we've seen the 125 mile per hour winds now getting back down just a little bit to 120. But still, it's just a little bit. There's an extreme wind warning that goes well inland, all the way inland rather, all the way to Branford, and that goes until about quarter past 10 this morning. And the storm surge continues to increase. A little while ago, it was about five and a half feet, now up and over six feet as you head to places like Cedar Keys. Now, here are some of the wind speeds. These are going to get updated, but a lot of these sensors rather are going offline now as they start to lose power. But 81 miles per hour at Horseshoe Beach, Sarasota, which was a decent away, away from the eye, still got up to 67 miles per hour during the overnight. And it's moving north northeast at almost 20 miles per hour, eight 18 is the exact number. This is a big system that's a lot of momentum, so it's going to keep its act together and likely be a Category 1 storm all the way into southern Georgia by later on this afternoon. It continues up the coast, and as it transitions away from being a hurricane and into a tropical storm, we transition the threat more to a flash flooding one. Yes, there will be some gusty winds, likely power outages, but this becomes the big concern. Major flooding that stretches not only from where it made landfall in Florida, but all the way up into South Carolina. And this will continue all the way through Thursday as Edalia just dumps rainfall anywhere from six inches all the way up to almost a foot of total rain. And that even extends into southern North Carolina. We're certainly keeping an eye on it and getting the latest information as this is developing right now as it makes landfall early this morning in Florida. Diane. And we'll be checking in with you throughout the day. Meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, thank you. And ABC's M. Wynn is live from Tampa with more on the storm. And Hurricane Idalia, as Greg said, just made landfall north of you. What's it like there in Tampa right now? Yeah, right now, Diane, the rain is steadily coming down. We understand that wind gusts have reached at least 61 miles per hour as Adalia makes that landfall. A hurricane to this strength has never touched down in the northwestern part of Florida. Those storm surges alone could reach up to 16 feet in some areas. That's two stories high. It adds to that increasing flood threat here and along the coastline, Diane. So, and what's the biggest concern with this storm right now? The biggest concern, of course, are those storm surges. That's just around the eye of Idalia. Those can really bring damaging winds, damaging uh, uh, types of storms to come through other areas uh, across the coastline. We know that Florida's Gulf Coast could be devastated. This means down power lines, intense flooding, fallen trees, destroyed homes and businesses. And just this morning, the governor had warned for everyone to stay inside as more than 50,000 customers are already without power. So if Hurricane Ian is of any reference, Diane, more than 120 deaths were linked to that storm. So authorities here have been preparing for days for this storm and are hoping to prevent any loss of life, Diane. Uh, all right. Uh, and when there for t in Tampa, um, stay safe. Thank you. And Florida officials are telling the people who chose to ride out that storm it's now too late to evacuate. Governor DeSantis is warning those in Adalia's direct path to stay inside, adding few people can survive a storm surge of this magnitude. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is live from Tampa with more on this. Rob, the National Weather Service is calling Adalia an unprecedented event because no major hurricanes on record have ever passed through this region. How significant is that? You know, it's remarkable, Diane. I thought about, I dug around yesterday, couldn't actually believe that stat because it's such an area that would you would think it gets a lot of hurricanes, but none of this size and strength. A category uh, four and then making landfalls at three, getting into the Big Bend, uh, which is not as populated as places like Tampa and Gainesville and Tallahassee, but there are small towns in there that you, you can bet are really getting hit. 
very, very hard uh, right now. Here in Tampa, we've been getting hit hard all night long, and the winds have died down a little bit here in the last couple of hours, but they're still out of the south, so they continue to push this water from, this is Tampa Bay. I mean, this is typically completely flat. Not today. White caps and big waves coming in off the water, over, up and over the top of that seawall, and just inundating this parking lot, and debris is piling up on the causeway uh, behind us. I'm told that two, Interstate 278, that direction, eastbound has been shut down because that causeway is flooded with a lot of debris. One of the uh, uh, police officers we talked to said this is actually doing a little bit worse as far as the storm surge is concerned than their modeling showed them. And this surge has brought in all sorts of debris along this area, uh, big pieces of uh, wood that probably came from a, a dock of some sort. This trailer has been getting banged around all morning. It looks like it's a... Uh, storage facility for uh, kayaks, paddle boards, and bikes to be rented to, to as, as a something to do for fun here, but that's not that's certainly not happening. Uh, this causeway looks to be still ha still open for now, but high tide is still a couple of hours away, Diane. So we still have significant flooding, even though the storm is over 100 miles away and it has made landfall. It's a pretty big wind field, and this south wind will continue throughout much of the day. And Rob, Diane. you look like you might need one of those kayaks soon if you stay in that spot long enough. Uh, talk to me about your concerns right now, particularly with where the storm's headed. What areas are you most worried about? Well, you know, this thing accelerated, right? Yesterday it went from 8 miles an hour to 16 miles an hour. Now it's heading north-northeast at an even faster clip as a major hurricane. So at, when it comes on shore with that sort of speed, it has some forward momentum. So typically, the hurricanes weaken when they do hit land. But if it's moving at 18, 19, 20 miles an hour, it's going to dive far inland with that sort of strength. So places like... Any, anywhere from uh, between uh, Tallahassee and Gainesville and then Valdosta, Georgia, you're going to get hit really hard. There will be hurricane conditions there in the next couple of hours. And then even as far away as Savannah and Charleston, tomorrow, uh, early tomorrow morning, we're looking at hurricane conditions. So places that typically don't feel hurricanes inland will be feeling it today. And, and Rob, how, so, how important is that? What kind of a difference does that make in terms of danger and damage? when you have a storm like this hitting an area that's not used to seeing storms like this? Well, people maybe not be prepared for one thing, right? And, and when you're talking about areas inland, it's not so much palm trees and low brush. You're talking about tall pines and hardwoods that can come down in, in winds, take power out, potentially do some damage to homes and hurt people. Uh, so that's my concern in the next 12 hours with these strong winds coming into inland areas with significant tree fall in populated areas, that's where it really gets dangerous, Diane. And Rob, in terms of speed, is this storm going to pass quickly or, or is this the kind of thing that's going to sit there for a while? You know, well, it gets offshore as early as tomorrow morning. So that's the good news. Some of our computer models, at least last night, were maybe swinging it back around towards Florida. I think that's pretty unlikely. Uh, but we hope to be rid of this thing uh, sometime tomorrow afternoon and get it out into, into the Atlantic Ocean. This name, Idalio, certainly will be retired on the list uh, because of its uh, ferocity and, and strength and what it's been doing and what it will continue to do across the southeast U.S. today, Diane. All right, and we will keep watching that area closely. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, stay safe. Rob, thank you. And the mayor of Sarasota, Florida, Kyle Batty, joins me live now for more on this storm. Mayor Batty, thank you for coming on. I know the Sarasota Police Department tweeted out a photo saying the majority of Sarasota Bayfront is closed due to flooding. What more can you tell us about the impact there already? Uh, thus far, it, it, you know, that's pretty much been the extent of it. Um, it's a lot of water and a lot of wind. Um, at, you know, as you stated, the, uh, the bridges are, are closed. Um, no, you know, uh, definite timetable in which they'll open again. Um, the Bayfront, as you said, were, was, uh, is uh, currently flooded. I know when I came out of my, my house, uh, because I live on a canal um, in Bayou, uh, my backyard was completely uh, underwater and the, and the uh, dock on the other side of the street was completely submerged. So it's mainly like, you know, uh, along the coastline um, where we're seeing a lot of uh, flooding and so on. Now, Sarasota is under evacuation orders. From what you've seen, have, have most of the residents there left the city or, or did people stay behind trying to ride this out? Well, there, there, there were, you know, uh, quite a few um, that uh, heeded the warning. 
um, and then left the uh, Barrier Islands in particular because you know you're basically surrounded by by water, um, and these storms being unpredictable and not knowing you know what may happen in terms of it turning um, one direction or the other, uh, no one wanted to take that chance, and a, a lot of people did leave the Barrier Islands, and uh, we closed those bridges. Uh, so no no entrance or or exit you know if if someone were to stay but um, for the most part you know our residents here um, they're familiar with uh, the protocol of uh, preparing for these storms our our main concern was was uh, pretty much there sort of being a, a a hot spot so to speak um, those that that relocated here that are not familiar um, with preparation for these storms but um, but everyone did a great job. So, uh, Mayor, what are you telling residents now who did stay? Uh, just stay, stay inside, stay put until further notice, um, and uh, just listen to updates that are, that will be on our website and uh, on our various um, media platforms. Uh, we, we we're giving like real time updates in terms of what's going on. Like I said, it's still a lot of wind. There's still a lot of water out there. Um, and just waiting for uh, the areas where it has flooded um, for that water to recede and uh, go back out. Um, that, you know that that basically gives safe pass passageway for for uh, for people to you know get back to their homes or, or what have you. Particularly when the, the bridge opens. But uh, outside of that, you know, um, I think we we pretty much weathered this storm. Um, you know, pun intended. But. Um, yeah, I, again, I can't uh, thank our residents, uh, those that visit our area, you know, our um, emergency response team and, and all the first responders. I saw them out on the road, but pretty much the only cars out on the road, aside from our, our, our police department, um, basically manning our streets and uh, taking care of any areas that, that may need help. All right, Mayor Kyle Batty of Sarasota. Mayor, wishing you and your constituents safety through this storm. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Be blessed. And now let's get another look at the storm's path with meteorologist Greg Dutra from our station, WLS. Uh, Greg, walk us through what's happening now and what you're seeing in terms of the storm surge. Well, Diane, the water's getting piled up now by this storm. It has a lot of momentum moving on to shore. We've seen the storm surge numbers continue to increase. And of note, this is happening right around low tide. We're coming off of low tide. The tide is coming in. The storm surge is also coming in. And unless we see some significant quick weakening, we're going to see those numbers continue to go up right now that storm surge uh, is around six feet. That's the very lowest one we can find, and it'll continue up, uh, likely past the 10-foot mark, maybe even into those, uh, well into those double digits. Now, as we watch this system make its way to the north and east, uh, I want to go back to something that Rob Marciano said out in the field. It's got a lot of momentum. At 10 to 15 miles per hour is where it was starting last night. Now it's up to about 15, 20 miles per hour, and when you have a system that is this massive and has that much forward speed, it takes a while for it to shred itself effectively as it moves inland. So we'll see Category 1 storm uh, conditions still probably all the way into South Georgia, but... I don't want you to focus right on the core so much because there are wide reaching consequences of this. Uh, as much as 150 miles away right now, we have tornado warnings out in South Georgia, almost 200 miles away from where this is making landfall. And that will be a threat that continues all the way through our Thursday, all the way up the Eastern seaboard. As this makes its way inland at two, three o'clock this afternoon, again, still probably a category one at that time. And you notice it does lose kind of its tropical shape, but the rainfall and that tornado threat will continue at least through Thursday afternoon. So we are far from out of the woods. We're far from even seeing the peak storm surge now, Diane. Again, as that tide continues to come in, we'll keep a very close eye on those numbers. All right, meteorologist Greg Dutra. Thank you, Greg. No problem. And we will be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning as it moves across Florida. So stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. 
from Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. One, two, three. Let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed. <laughs> Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs to lose weight? I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. You're looking live at Tampa, Florida right now where you can see the water is already coming up on the road. Hurricane Idalia made landfall just a few minutes ago, uh, close to a half hour ago now, uh, in the Big Ben area of Florida. So actually north of Tampa and yet you already seeing uh, the impact there in Tampa. I want to go over to our meteorologist Greg Dutra for a little bit more on where the storm is and what's happening now. Uh, Greg, it feels like every time we check in with you, there's a new update. And that's right, and, and the new updates of those storm surge numbers continue to go up, and the center of Adalia is still keeping a lot of strength as it moves inland, still seeing very high wind gusts, and this keeps on getting expanded too. The extreme wind warning, this area out until quarter after 10, likely to be extended farther off to the north, and that's just a testament here that they're not warning just the immediate coastline, that they're uh, warning further inland just how much forward momentum the storm has and how intense those winds were as it made landfall. As you mentioned, it made landfall about a half hour ago. That was at Keaton Beach. Winds were 125 miles per hour, so it made landfall as a strong Category 3 storm, and it continues off to the north and east as we head through the course of today uh, and into our Thursday. Now, tracking this all the way through about Thursday afternoon will still bring threats into the Carolinas, but here we are by this afternoon showing through southern, uh, southern and central Georgia, tornado warnings already out in southeastern Georgia. The core of this is still 150 miles away. But here we are by midnight tonight, early on Thursday morning, making its way past Myrtle Beach. Could still see some tropical storm force winds there, and it's the torrential rain is going to be a big issue. Flooding and also power outages, again, all the way up the eastern seaboard. It is quite an expansive storm, and it's moving north fast, Diane. And Greg, as you look at that path, are there any particular areas that you're especially concerned about? Yeah, I, I was just talking to, I got some friends in Florida, I was just talking to folks that are far away from the core, like out in Gainesville, you're still 75 or so miles away, they're starting to lose power, and that's what we're going to see. And the governor was telling folks, uh, all the emergency managers were telling people, even away from the core of this, you're going to lose power, you may not have power back for the better part of three days. So I'm hoping that folks that are around Columbia or Charleston or even Wilmington or 
trolley way out of the way of this thing. I'm hoping they took heed and they have everything prepared because even though it's a long ways away, it may seem like it at this point, it is definitely coming in that direction and you could be impacted for a couple of days at least. And Greg, looking at the, the map, for those of us who aren't meteorologists, the storm is in the northern portion of Florida and yet yes. we're seeing that big red spot on Tampa. What's happening there? Yeah, and we're seeing that continue all the way up again into the Carolinas here. And the reason that we see this big core is it's pulling in a lot of moisture, not only from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, but also now from the Atlantic seaboard. So once it's all wrapped up with these winds and again, it has all that forward momentum. It doesn't, doesn't go away as soon as you move on shore. It's still going to carry that with it up off to the north at 20 or so miles per hour. All right, meteorologist Greg Dutra. Great to have you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so keep it here on ABC News Live for the very latest. We'll also be talking about some of your other top headlines right after the break. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did she do then? If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Friday, the David Muir two-hour 2020 event at 9, 8 central on ABC. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website runs! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was... Horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy shit. There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. My name is Lisa. Tiffany. Rita. Leslie. I am I'm a mother. mother. My son was shot dead. My partner abducted our son. This is the last chance to get my kids back. I had to live a double life to save my son. Mother Undercover, now streaming only on Hulu. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I love you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I'm Marcus Moore covering the wildfires in Greece. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Hurricane Idalia has made landfall in the Big Bend area of Florida as a Category 3 storm. Data from an Air Force Reserve Hurricane Hunter aircraft indicates Idalia's maximum sustained winds were near 125 miles per hour at that time, and we'll be covering the storm all morning. But right now, we also want to get to some of the day's other top stories. Like former Proud Boys chairman Enrique Tarrio and a top associate set to be sentenced today. 
Prosecutors are seeking 33 years in prison for Tario and 27 years for Ethan Nordian. They were convicted on charges of seditious conspiracy and a host of other felonies for their roles in the January 6th assault on the Capitol. You're seeing the first new video of Paul Whelan more than two years, in more than two years, I should say. The ex-Marine has been detained in Russia since 2018 on espionage charges that the U.S. says are false. The video appears to show Whelan in a Russian prison camp working at a sewing machine, refusing to be interviewed by the Russian outlet that shot the footage. The White House says Whelan continues to show tremendous courage and has called for his immediate release. And be sure to look up tonight to catch a rare blue supermoon in the sky. It's the second time a full moon will appear this month, and it will be at its closest point in orbit. The next blue supermoon won't be visible until January 2037. And we're covering Hurricane Dahlia all morning as it makes its way further onto Florida's west coast. After the break, we have team coverage live from Florida and the latest on the path of the storm. Stay with us. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did you do then? If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Friday, the David Muir two-hour 2020 event at 9, 8 central on ABC. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. We begin tonight here in Buffalo, London, in Alaska, Uvalde, Kentucky, and Poland. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Did you ever have a conversation about an abortion? Is she lying? Do you have a political aspiration? Absolutely. You ready for this? Go! You're going to deliver a show that will be remembered forever. Ooh, the fresh on me. You are just <laughs> a tough, bad <laughs> You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Sato, thanks for streaming with ABC News Live. Let's get right to our top story this morning. Hurricane Idalia has made landfall near Keaton Beach, Florida. The Category 3 storm is bringing maximum sustained winds of 125 miles per hour, and the hurricane is expected to have a life-threatening storm surge that could reach up to 16 feet. It's also hitting a region of the state that has never seen a hurricane like this in recorded history. Governor Ron DeSantis says the state has already seen almost a dozen tornado warnings and is urging residents in the eye of the storm to stay inside with sustained wind speeds now again at 125 miles per hour. As of right now, more than 85,000 customers are without power in at least 17 counties 
are under mandatory evacuation orders. We have team coverage of Hurricane Idalia. Let's go straight to our meteorologist, Greg Dutra. In here in the station. Greg, what's the latest on the storm? Well, the latest is at 745, officially the National Hurricane Center has declared that this made landfall right around Keaton Beach, which you see on the map here. The center of Adalia now making its way inland, and it is chugging along about 20 miles per hour of forward momentum, and that is allowing it to keep a lot of its very strong tropical characteristics even farther inland. Made landfall at 125 is a strong Category 3, but the expansive area that this is affecting is really a lot beyond just the track in the immediate spots we're talking about with landfall. Look how large this tornado watch is. You see it in yellow underneath the hurricane. It goes all the way up through Georgia, almost into South Carolina. I wouldn't be surprised that it gets extended into South Carolina as it gets a little bit closer. We've already seen tornado warnings out early this morning in South Georgia. So it'll strengthen or rather weaken, I'm sorry, to a category two storm, still very strong as it makes its way into Southern Georgia and then to a tropical system into South and North Carolina. And as it continues here through this afternoon and into this evening, look at these wind speeds, even inland. I mean, sustained winds, 50 miles per hour, maybe even gust up to 60 or 65. That's gonna take out a lot of power from Savannah to Charleston to Myrtle Beach, all the way up through the coast as it transitions a little bit more to a flood threat through our Thursday. Look how large this area is, moderate flooding, almost up to the southern reaches of Atlanta, and then severe flooding possible all the way through not only uh, Georgia, but into South Carolina and up to North Carolina too, where six to 10 inches of rain can fall. And these outer bands, they were lashing areas like Tampa last night and the storm surge continues to go up. We actually have our chief meteorologist out there, Ginger Z in the field, and she's been tracking that storm surge, Diane. She sure has. Meteorologist Greg Dutra will be checking in with you all morning. Greg, thank you. And let's go over to our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z in Treasure Island. Uh, Ginger, I saw you getting pelted before. What's it like there right now? Yeah, so we're in between the rain bands, but those bands are those outer whips on the very far end of Idalia. Remember, the center is 120 some miles to my northwest, but look behind me, this is Gulf Boulevard, and it has been flooded for the last six, eight hours because of that big push of water. We're actually at low tide or close to it right now, so we're gonna have a problem all the way through high tide this afternoon. Remember, we've got a full moon. So in concert, you're seeing some places like Cedar Key already reporting nine foot surge. I've seen some of the reports from Horseshoe Beach and a camera there that was up 10 feet getting washed away. Uh, I think you've got our drone there and you can kind of see how a lot of the beach inlets and the dunes have breached in places. So a lot of this is just pure ocean water that is pushing in over Treasure Island. As we mentioned yesterday, such susceptible islands, such bad erosion they've dealt with for so long. So this is just, you know, even with a hurricane 120 miles away, it's a bad situation. Okay, so before my hat goes here, let me also tell you uh, that we have to talk about the warm water and the rapid intensification that this storm went under. It went up to a cat four briefly overnight, and it happened in part because the winds are two to five degrees above average. That's really warm. I keep using the analogy of saying that's like giving candy to a toddler. And then people will ask, well, is it humans or climate change? And yes, we certainly have had an impact on the warming of our waters. We've had El Nino this year. We've got the volcanic explosion. We also had uh, fewer aerosols. There are a lot of variables that come together to make a year like this remarkable. And that's exactly what it did. History now made. A Cat 3 hurricane, a major hurricane or larger, has never hit Apalachee Bay, and now it has. Diana. And Ginger, what's the impact of a storm like this hitting an area that's not used to seeing this level of hurricane? Oh, that's the thing is, is you know, Tallahassee's National Weather Service said it really well yesterday. They said you shouldn't compare Idalia to any other storm because you can't. No one who has ever lived in, since 1851, at least with records, has experienced a storm like this in that part of Florida. Obviously, Ian was huge just last year. We were there in Fort Myers at the end of the Sanibel Causeway. Terrible, terrible destruction they're still reco recovering from. And nearly five years ago, I can't believe it's been five years since I was there for the Cat 5 in Mexico Beach, Florida, Hurricane Michael. Uh, it's tough to get major hurricanes especially in this part of Florida. And Ginger, we've been hearing a lot about the power of this storm. What about the size of it? So that's the thing too, right? Do you have these outer bands and that push of water? And that's what we all, uh, often see is kind of that widespread tropical storm force winds are gonna stay with us 
all the way through high tide. And that's why I think, you know, they've already cut off parts of the causeway around Tampa Bay. We saw I-275 was covered in water. And we are so far from the storm here. The most important thing I would say is people need to stay out of the floodwaters. We just watched somebody drive through because it will keep going up as we approach high tide again later this afternoon. Uh, happy to see at least that driver made it through. Our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z. Stay safe, Ginger. Thank you. And I want to go to ABC's M. Wynn live from Tampa with more. M. Hurricane Idalia uh, made landfall north of you, but Tampa has been seeing the impact for a while from this storm. What are you seeing right now? Yeah, Diane, certainly the rain has been steadily coming down all morning and overnight. Wind gusts have reached up to 61 miles per hour here as Adalia does make that landfall. A hurricane to this strength has never touched down in the northwestern part of Florida, and that storm surge alone could reach up to 16 feet in some areas. That is life-threatening. It adds to that increasing flood threat here and along the coastline, Diane. All right, and when in Tampa, and thank you. And Red Cross spokesperson Grace Meinhofer joins me now for more on coping with this storm. Uh, Grace, the Red Cross uh, we know has helped in more than 400, you know, hundreds of these, thousands of these probably. I know you have a lot of people already on the ground. How bad are you expecting this storm to be? Good morning, Diane. Thank you for having me. The Red Cross have been preparing for days and partnering with local authorities to make sure that we have all the supplies that we need to respond prior, during, and after the storm. What do you think people need most or will need most as soon as the storm passes? First of all, they, we need to assess what is going to be the damage. Look, the damage local authorities will go out and, and assess what the damage is. Some people might be able to go home. Some other people might not be able to return. They probably will have to stay at a Red Cross shelter. But we want to ensure them that they are going to have all the resources that they need to be safe. Safety is our number one priority. We are preparing for this uh, months and years in advance. We have 400 workers that have been already prepositioned, 45 emergency response vehicles that are ready to go out as soon as it's safe. Um, so they need to listen to local authorities, uh, download the American Red Cross app that gives them notifications, uh, shows them a plan what to do prior, during, and after a storm like this. So what's your advice uh, to those who chose not to evacuate? Well, those who didn't, um, they, they stayed home. The most important thing that they are in a safe spot. Continue to listen to local authorities. Continue to look at the weather in the area that they are living in. Um, through the American Red Cross app, they have notifications. They know what kind of climate is going to happen in their area. As you can see, we're experiencing a, a crisis. Uh, these uh, storms are stronger every year. We've seen that in their, the destruction. Um, is worse. So stay safe, listen to local authorities. And when is safe, if you need to move, be prepared to move. All right. Good advice. Red Cross spokesperson Grace Meinhofer. Grace, thank you. Thank you. And let's get another update on that storm with meteorologist Greg Dutra from our station WLS. Uh, Greg, walk us through what's happening now and what you're seeing in terms of storm surge. Well, Diane, you have the typical storm surge that comes with a hurricane, right? The, the meteorologically driven stuff where the wind is blowing that water inland. But I want to add on top of that here, we're going from low tide to high tide. And it's not just normal high tide. It's the king tide in Florida. This is the time of year where they see their highest high tides as the moon reaches perigee, the closest spot in its orbit to Earth. So its gravitational pull is even higher. And that is cause for concern because while the tide is low, we're still seeing inundation of six to up to almost eight or nine feet now. And it's going to continue to go up as the tide now comes in and starts helping out. Thankfully, this made it on shore right after low tide. But again, with it making its way inland, we'll still see that water pile up around Cedar Key. And as Dahlia makes its way farther inland, we are still seeing the extension now to the border of southern Georgia of extreme wind warnings. And this is just a testament of how strong it was when it made landfall, a strong category three, and then how much forward momentum it has, 15, 20 miles per hour. It's chugging inland, and since it's chugging, it's not falling apart as quickly as you would normally expect something that, say, just waddled on shore at three or four miles per hour, as you sometimes see with hurricanes. As a result of that, it'll stay a category two, pretty strong hurricane as it makes its way into southern Georgia. You see the hurricane warnings, they extend up to the border with South Carolina. And even into North Carolina, we've got some tropical storm watches. Here are some of the higher wind speeds, although I do want to put a big asterisk next to this. 
A lot of the time after landfall, you don't get the highest numbers immediately because a lot of those meteorological stations will go offline and then you have to dial back into them if they've even survived the highest winds to get the data out of them. Here's the Dahlia as it makes its way inland. This is this afternoon all the way into Georgia. Again, it's going to continue and actually speed up its forward progression as we get into late tonight, early tomorrow morning. Still seeing effects, but turning more to a flooding rains type deal as we get into tomorrow afternoon. And those rains, well, they could cause major flood all the way from where it made landfall out near Kenton Beach through Wilmington. Wouldn't be surprised if we're catching anywhere from 5 to 10 or even 12 inches of rainfall. Diane. All right. Meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, thank you. And we will be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm, plus the day's other top stories. Right now, we want to take you to WFTS, our station in Tampa. It's where it made landfall. Yeah. The hurricane made landfall at Keaton Beach is a Category 3 hurricane. Wow. He's right there at the still mm. picking up. I mean, he, he, the, the man he was just talking to was wondering, is it past Keaton Beach? Is, is his house in the yeah, clear? Yeah, it is. Okay. It is. Because he, he was saying he heard his house is still standing, well, which is good. Well, it is, but then he's going to get the other side of the eye. Okay. But it's not nearly as strong as the as the front side is. So, so yeah. I mean, the, Paul, I mean, the, you can see he's in Perry. And that, that little that little gust that he had right there, boy, that's really close to the mm -hmm. spin that you're seeing there. I mean, really close to the spin that was showing up right there so uh, he's but Keaton Beach I'll show you Keaton Beach is down here uh, I believe it was right in there yeah right there and so they're in the eye Keaton Beach is in the eye and on the other side there's the back side of the eye but there's not a lot of bad weather out there associated with it I mean it's still the eye wall so maybe still some gusty winds but not even close to what Paul's dealing with right now which is right there and he's Paul's been in the eye wall for what like 40 minutes it's or been something? a while yeah it's almost like it's uh, kind of slowed down and rotated around him and he's still got a little bit ways to go that back side as you see there is really really strong uh, he'll get a bit of a break and then there's more of the storm coming in behind him the winds will be from the north and west so hopefully by then the wind is blowing some of that water back out to the Gulf of Mexico uh, you would expect to be a big the water would recede in a big way here uh, in this area where where Paul is right now uh, we are we are working on some pictures for you guys uh, right now from Steen Hatch yeah, right, so we'll take a look at those uh, no so, surprise, yeah. there are still houses there underwater right now. Uh, as far as for the rest of you in the Bay Area, uh, if you're just kind of looking out the window, I've gotten a couple of requests of weather reports. Uh, there's bands of rain. There's haven't been any severe weather warnings in a while, in at least over an hour. Uh, but we'll continue to watch. We're under a tornado watch until 3 o'clock this afternoon. And there are still going to be some strong wind gusts in this. But then it's... From now on, the wind should gradually and steadily decrease, at, not only as the storm weakens, but it's also moving away from us at this point. And it's point. moving away quickly. Yeah, it is. At almost 18 miles an hour. So th this should clear up. I mean, by midday, any strong wind gust should be done. And by then, we'll already have reached our high tide early in the afternoon. I think after 2 or 3 o'clock, we're going to see some pretty pretty quickly improving conditions. Matter of fact, we'll probably end up seeing some sunshine in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, that's a possibility. Could, could fire up some thunderstorms. I mean, some of you could still hit 90 later today. So this is the Steen Hatchy camera that we've been watching, and apparently it's been moved a little bit. The docks there obviously are floating, so they're going to adjust to the level of the water. Uh, they're they're attached. But they're there. Yeah, they're there. They're still there, so that's a good sign, right? Yeah. I mean, they, they survived the uh, the wind and the surge, uh, but the the surge here likely was significant, likely over 10 feet. We saw 10 feet. I saw 10 and a half feet at Cedar Key, so you got to figure this was in that 12 to 16 foot range. And uh, the wind and the rain continues here, too. Uh, it's going to be a while before folks can really get out there and probably assess this, especially in this area, as they got pretty hard hit. This is the Howard Franklin. This is the area that was closed earlier. The bridge is still closed, I believe, right? Correct? Yeah, in, both in both directions. In both directions. Water coming up over the bridge. Obviously, it's not just the water that's the concern here. It's bringing over debris. And anytime you see the water crashing like this, you have to go and assess the structure of the road underneath to make sure that there is something supporting the asphalt so that when folks do venture out on the bridge, uh, they are doing so safely. So the bridge will remain closed until they have a time to take a look at it. The bay is still high. It has fallen back a little bit. I've been watching the highest tide I could find or the highest surge that I could find from the storm was at East Bay, which is 
uh, the bay by Port Tampa Bay, where the fuel port is, as you come down Causeway into Ebor and Palmetto Beach, that's where that sensor was, and it registered 7.4 feet of surge above the, the the low water level. Let's go back to Paul. Paul, uh, yeah. storm's moving through. You're still in the eye wall. Uh, let us know kind of what you're seeing. How, 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 how are things looking out there? So what happens is things get calm, then they really blow up, and the wind comes through this canopy, and it just funnels right through. Uh, I was told to <laughs> I was told to come back in. Uh, if I go back out there, uh, you've got trees that are snapping right now, and uh, debris flying around, and you can see some of that happening in real time here. And so uh, the situation right now is. Things get calm, deceptively, relatively speaking, and then all of a sudden it just explodes. And people kind of rush inside to the hotel, to the canopy here. Um, hey, Paul, I'll, I'll tell you, over the last uh, yeah, half gonna, hour, yeah, uh, the last half hour, we've seen at least six or seven areas of spin. Um, early tornadoes, vortices, whatever you want to call it. And, and I'll tell you, I would not be the least bit surprised if one of those ones that you just hit, because it looked like it was calm and then all of a sudden it just opened up. I would not be the least bit surprised if that was something with that, because I mean, even right now I'm seeing spin all around you. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised you haven't seen a little more significant damage because what you're showing right there, I mean, you showed some tree branches, but you're not seeing trees down, are you? Are you seeing any actual property damage? Yeah, I mean, you're seeing, you got, in this wooded area here, we've seen, it's slowly starting to erode away. You've seen some trees snapping for sure. Uh, and then in the back of us, that construction area, I'm, I know, is taking a beating. And Tim, I don't know, it's getting a little calm here, so I'm going to walk that way, okay? Uh, you see that that uh, structure there, that, that white fenced area? That's taking a beating. So, yeah, you're starting to see uh, debris. Uh, fly around here but the cars they're shaking but they're standing in place you're right i mean that's the good news is mm -hmm. all things considered not bad but you see how it's like okay it's doable right now like any second now it could get it could explode and kind of take well, your you, breath away and here we go yeah you're still in the eye wall back here I mean, you are, yep. you are still in the eye wall of a Category 3 hurricane. Yeah, you feel it too, even under here. I mean, it's sideways. Here we go. I've <laughs> been in this situation before. You, you, you got to laugh, right? <laughs> but... Um, Wow. And that's like... Oh my god. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, I'm, I'm again, I mean, they're, and they're under, they're in an area of safety. I mean, they're under yeah, that carport, yeah. but I think and at this, this point... And this is the back end of the storm. You would, you would think that this side of the storm would be a little weaker than what they got in the beginning, but it is just as strong, if not stronger, yeah. than, than what they got in the beginning. This, this storm still has staying power. Now, officially, from the Hurricane Center, the winds are down as it is now over land at 120, made landfall at 125, uh, though it is still, a, as you see, really dangerous storm there. So uh, we're going to get Paul back into safety and back inside. All right, we've got uh, James Tully. He's live over in Clearwater. We've been tracking the flooding there. Uh, James, I've been watching some of the gauges around Clearwater, and they may be indicating that maybe we're starting to at least level off, maybe even seeing just the slightest drop, though nothing conclusive yet. What are you seeing on the ground? I mean, the flooding there, it, it, it was pretty substantial, at least at the street level. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to James. Ever so slightly. Maybe that's receding a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Do you got, you have me now? I got you. We got, got you, James. We got you. Yeah. I would. 
good. I'd agree with what you said, Greg, maybe ever so slightly. This down here is Hamden Drive. Just take note of the center yellow line there. You can see the amount of flooding. Uh, interesting to follow up Paul's shot with this. Uh, while the weather here is, of course, substantially improved, uh, this storm has left its mark here in Clearwater. As you see, this surge in excess of six feet, as you told me, Greg, and uh, high tide coming, uh, upcoming around 1130 a.m. But as far as the eye can see, there's flooded streets and Clearwater Bay directly in front of me here. I should have said that first. So this is Clearwater Bay. This is Hamden Drive. And you get the perspective of this flooded street uh, right there. I'm trying to look at certain things, Greg, to see if the water is, in, in fact, going back a little bit. I'm going to draw your attention to this pink and green hotel over here. Uh, look at the front. Uh, one of those front doors, Mike. Yeah, I, I would say 25, 30 minutes ago, there was water up to that front door. So that's a good sign. Might be coming back a little bit. And particularly with tide rising, that is what we want to see. So, you know, where your eyes in the sky up here is we've taken a high ground to get a better perspective. So we'll we'll keep an eye on it. And uh, you guys uh, can uh, send it back to us. Interesting out front, and we saw some people putting up some more um, some more storm barriers, if you will, some some storm uh, uh, things on windows. Uh, you know, boarding boarding up windows is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Losing the ability to speak. Yeah, this is the shock look on a lot of people's faces. They were waking up and, and saw this was really something to see because this is something a lot of people have never seen before in, in Clearwater. So, again, uh, looking at Clearwater Bay and then the street here and hoping we see some more, uh, some more water recede here. And we'll keep an eye on it for you, and I'll send things back to you. All right, James, thanks so much. You're looking uh, back at the radar here as we continue to track uh, this uh, powerful hurricane, still a hurricane, still a Category 3 from the Hurricane Center, tracking through Perry. Now, the backside of the eye wall is now moving through where Paul was and still is. And you see the radar continues to show. It's really interesting how these spins have stayed over Perry, no matter yeah. where the eye wall has yeah. been. They, they just keep popping up. It seems like Paul really has been getting the worst of the storm for the better of the last hour, Dennis. And, and he hasn't quite made it to the eye. He's always been right yeah. along the edge of the eye. And and I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen a tornado warning in any of these because, I mean, there's been a good six, seven, eight of them. But, uh, and, and, and you can see, as Paul said, he'd be out there and it would be quiet. And I had a chance to chase a Cat 5 back in 2005, also with Tim Jones as my photographer. And, and I remember it was the same way. And it, this was a nighttime landfall, Reader was. So we would be out there and you would hear the wind before you felt it. Mm -hmm. It sounded like a lion roaring. Here it was coming. the craziest thing. And then it would just... Take, sweep you off your feet in a sense, and then it would calm down and it would do it all over again, which is exactly what Paul's been dealing with now over the last half hour, 45 minutes. So, so as Greg said, we continue to see it's moving through, and he's right on the fringe of the eye. But then again, he's kind of been on the fringe of the eye now for quite a while. And for our and and there there is again a view. In fact, let's go back and, and look. You know, let's look at the last couple of hours and watch it as it came through. Because there it is through Keaton Beach. That's where landfall was. And now still the northern half of that eye wall is still significant. And that's moving into northern Florida and east of or rather west of Lake City. So it does look like Lake City is going to be spared some of the worst of this. And then it's going to go on into Georgia. Yeah, Madison there is the county seat of Madison County. That's going right through that city. And we can safely say, Dennis, that on this track, Tallahassee had no hurricane force winds from this. No. This is, they probably had some. I mean, looking, remembering where Paul was in relation to the eye and where Tallahassee is in relation to it, they probably just had some relatively minor gusts uh, compared to what's happening just down the road there on I-10. And this is all going to head into South Georgia. I think Valdosta there is up 75. That's probably going to be the next, that's probably the biggest actually population center yeah. in the path of this eye, which is incredible because Valdosta is <laughs> clearly not a coastal city. And they may be dealing with a Category 2 hurricane rolling through here in the next couple of hours.
Yeah, there it is. It's going yeah. right for it. Right right for it. I mean, it's re literally on track for Valdosta. Uh, Highway 82, I believe it is there, that cuts across South Georgia through Valdosta. Took it many times when I lived in South Alabama down towards Tallahassee. And it is headed right up there on 75. And then it'll continue through South Georgia, through the coastal empire, over towards Brunswick and eventually Savannah. And it'll be a problem for folks off the East Coast where they're already getting tornado warnings. For those of you locally, there are no tornado warnings for our area. We continue to see rain bands move ashore but maybe some improvement to the west over the gulf definitely the cells are becoming more isolated there are fewer of them uh, the stronger cells are mainly east of 75 and then south of the bay and this is just a pattern we're going to see for much of the afternoon with a gradual shift of the action south and east uh, but the tornado watch continues until 3 o'clock, just in case any of these, and you see these, what we're basically seeing here now is a strong onshore flow. And anytime we see rain and storms with an onshore flow, quick water spout, brief spin up, not out of the question here around the beaches. Uh, for those of you that are kind of itching to get out, I would wait. Just wait until maybe after this next high tide midday. Nothing's open. There's no reason to be out there. A lot of the coastal communities, Pinellas County, uh, you know, inaccessible. Uh, the emergency management obviously needs some time to assess the situation, help folks out that need help. Uh, so just kind of stay put, wait this one out. Uh, things will improve quickly as we go into the afternoon. And really by tomorrow and Friday, the storm is gone. It'll be off the East Coast and moving out off the, the Carolina. So. Landfall was about 745 Keaton Beach as we continue to track uh, Idalia heading up through the Panhandle. We're going to send it back to uh, Dia and Heather. All right. Thank you, Greg. Uh, just a quick update really quickly here. 201,000 power outages across the state. So that is a statewide number. Uh, but of course, the worst outages right now we're hearing are near landfall, which would be the Keaton Beach area. And of course, uh, Perry, where we... It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slenderman? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did you do then? Stab, 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 stab. If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Ooh. Friday, the David Muir two hour 2020 event at 9 8 Central on ABC. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. One, two, three, let's get it! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy there's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. 
traveling with the president in Dublin, Ireland, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with ABC News Live. Let's get right to our top story this morning. Hurricane Idalia has made landfall near Keaton Beach, Florida. The storm was downgraded from a Cat 4 to a strong Category 3 just before coming ashore at 745 Eastern with winds of 125 miles per hour. The hurricane is expected to have a life-threatening storm surge that could reach up to 16 feet. It's also hitting a region of the state that has never seen a hurricane like this in recorded history. As of right now, more than 215,000 customers are without power, and at least 17 counties are under mandatory evacuation orders. We have team coverage of Hurricane Idalia today. I want to go straight to meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, what's the latest? Uh, the latest here is this continues to make its way inland is that extreme wind warnings are up now to the southern border of Georgia. These go through the rest, basically, of the morning hours as the center of Idalia has made its way farther inland after making its landfall at Keaton Beach. And while it is off to the north and east, that does not mean that the impacts uh, immediately along the coast are done. The tide is coming in along with that storm surge, and we've already seen surges up and over nine feet. Also, well away from the core of this hurricane are tornado watches, and I've even seen some tornado warnings this morning early uh, in southeastern Georgia. So you're about 150 miles away from the center of the hurricane and still seeing those impacts. So while we have the cone on here, I don't want you to focus so much on the cone. I know it's like showing you something and tell you not to look at it. Of course, you're going to look at it, but see how this cone extends all the way through Charleston and Myrtle Beach, Savannah. Well, the impacts will expand well beyond that with the threat of tornadoes and also uh, possibly dangerous flooding too all the way through Thursday evening when this finally makes its way back out and over the Atlantic. Since Idalia is moving so quickly, almost 20 miles per hour, it's going to keep itself together and potent for much longer as it makes its way inland. So 12 to 16 feet of storm surge, we're getting to the bottom end of that now. I expect that to continue high tide about quarter till two this afternoon. The waters will still rise all the way through that high tide hour. Major flooding expected not only along the immediate coast, but remember I said it spreads north all the way to Augusta, Georgia, and then all the way into the Carolinas, where five to 10 plus inches of rain are expected. Diana is going to be a very long day today and possibly all the way into tomorrow through the mid-Atlantic. Long day and a wet day. ABC News meteorologist Greg Dutra, thank you. And our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, joins me now from Treasure Island. Uh, Ginger, we saw your hat blow off the last time I spoke to you. What's it like there right now? Yeah, we get those gusts every once in a while, Diane, so we're certainly still seeing those. But behind me, the roads have been flooded for at least six hours here. This is Gulf Boulevard at 107th. Uh, these islands do flood regularly, but not this much, right? At high tide overnight is when the highest level of this came because we had that coastal onshore flow. And you can see from our drone video that we've been taking throughout the morning, the breaches in some of the dune areas and why these susceptible islands have taken on water, even though the center of the storm is easily 120 miles to our north. West. I, I want to mention too, this thing is racing so fast, and I know Greg was just telling you that. We're so grateful that he's here and helping us out. Uh, but emphasizing the surge in the southeast. So Jacksonville up to Charleston and Savannah. Watch, because two to five feet of surge there does a lot of damage. It often can plug up the rivers and tributaries that are trying to release all the heavy rain. So if you get a half foot of rain and then you can't put it anywhere, you will eventually see flooding. And remember, with high tides and a full moon, super moon, right here, bad timing, we're going to see big problems and even some of the surge up to the Outer Banks. I want to end by just saying, yes, this thing rapidly intensified overnight as we anticipated to a cat four briefly and that has a lot to do with those water temperatures it went right over some of the warmest 86 to 90 degrees that's two to five degrees above average diane and ginger is there a difference between the way flooding like that impacts um, areas more inland versus the coast you know that's the thing is <laughs> And with this storm, because of how fast it's moving, those extreme wind warnings are going to take those power lines and tree damage all the way up to the Georgia state line and beyond. So they're different impacts, um, but that inland flooding is certainly a big uh, danger today. And then this coastal push of water isn't going to stop. Our next high tide is around 1 p.m. So when we keep having these winds, we will see this water come up again a bit. All right, Ginger Z in Treasure Island. Ginger, stay safe. Thank you.
And if you were planning to fly to Florida, you might have to make other plans. Several airports there have been shut down due to the storm. Trevor Alt is at New York's LaGuardia Airport with more on the flight delays and cancellations ahead of the holiday weekend. Hi, Trevor. Well, Diane, there's already been about 800 flight cancellations and counting across the country, and we know that could continue to expand with ripple effects all over America, as a lot of these cancellations so far are stemmed around the fact that airports in Florida, specifically Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, they have all completely shut down as this storm continues to move inland. Now, of course, we're all well aware this is happening as we're heading into a holiday weekend here where a lot of people are going to be traveling. TSA has said they plan on screening more than 14 million passengers in just that long Labor Day weekend. That's a 10% increase in this time last year, and they actually say that's going to punctuate what has been since Memorial Day, the busiest stretch of summer travel in history. Of course, we have a lot that we got to get through before we get to the weekend. People might be reconsidering their plans. The airlines say they're certainly monitoring this storm, and they want travelers to know about travel waivers or even just alerts. If you decide maybe it's not worth the hassle or the chaos and you want to reschedule your trip, that is usually possible. Diane? All right, Trevor Alt at LaGuardia Airport. Thanks, Trevor. And let's go back to meteorologist Greg Dutra now. Greg, how far reaching is this hurricane? Uh, hundreds of miles. I've seen uh, tornado warnings as much as 150, almost 160 miles away from the eye of Idalia. Those were out in southeastern Georgia. And as Idalia continues to make its way farther inland, the storm surge goes up. Yes, the hurricane is inland. You think, OK, cool, the storm surge is going to go back down. Well, thankfully, as a consequence of timing, it actually hit around low tide. But the tide is now coming in. It finishes coming in at about quarter till two Eastern time. So the numbers are going to continue to go up because while the hurricane is inland, it is still wrapping the air around it and bringing that water along the shoreline. In addition to that, it's also bringing some very high winds. Ginger was talking about it too here. Our chief meteorologist out in the field saying that yes, this packs a lot of momentum, almost 20 miles per hour worth of forward movement. So as a result, I think it stays a strong category one, if not a category Two, all the way into southern Georgia. That's about 100 miles plus inland and extending far beyond the eye of this. We have a tornado watch. You can see it as that yellow kind of background there, and it goes all the way through Georgia, almost up to the border now, or actually right to the border of South Carolina. And I wouldn't be surprised that it gets extended into South Carolina uh, in the coming hours and days. The track is on this map. Again, don't focus too much on the track because there are wide reaching consequences here, including soaking rains that continue through tonight into early tomorrow morning, perhaps even all the way into Thursday afternoon until finally, as a tropical storm still, Idalia makes its way back into the Atlantic Ocean. And just look how far this th uh, flooding threat extends all the way through Georgia, South Carolina, and possibly into southern portions of North Carolina, where up to about a foot of rain could fall right against the spine of the Appalachian Mountains, too. And you know, it gets a little bit rugged there, so we could be concerned about a flash flooding risk popping up, Diane. All right, ABC News meteorologist Greg Dutra, thank you. And now we want to go to Paul Legrone in Perry, Florida, from our station WFTS. Hi, Paul. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing, you got, in this wooded area here, we've seen it's slowly starting to erode away. You've seen some trees snapping for sure. Uh, and then in the back of us, that construction area, I'm, I know, is taking a beating. And, Tim, I don't know, it's getting a little calm here, so I'm going to walk that way, okay? Uh, you see that that uh, structure there, that, that white fenced area? That's taking a beating. So, yeah, you're starting to see uh, debris uh, fly around here. But the cars, they're shaking, but they're standing in place. You're right. I mean, that's the good news is... All things considered, not bad. But you see how it's like, okay, it's doable right now. Like any second now, it could get, it could explode and kind of take your breath away. Here we go. Coming back here. Yep. That in. Yeah, you feel it too. Even under here. I mean, it's sideways. <laughs> I've been in this situation before. You, you, you got to laugh, right? <laughs> but, um, wow. And that's like... Paul 
Legron in Perry, Florida. Paul, thank you. Stay safe. And now I want to go to our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano, live from Tampa with more on this. Rob, what's it like there right now, and what are you watching for? Well, we just had a really intense rain band come through, Diana, and it's still, it's still coming down sideways, but compared to what it was just 10 minutes ago, I mean, it was coming down in absolute sheets, the hardest rain we've seen really since the beginning of this storm when it arrived uh, yesterday afternoon. So we're still here on Tampa Bay, which is typically more, much more tranquil than this. Typically, it's completely flat, but this onshore south, southwest wind has really pushed up the waves and pushed up the water up and over the seawall into this, into this uh, parking lot. There's a uh, a trailer that typically uh, rents paddle boards and kayaks. That's not going to be a popular thing to do today. Uh, and this causeway, at least right now, is full of debris, but it is it is open. There are other causeways in Tampa, ooh, with a little lightning flash there, that, that, are, that are closed uh, because of debris and or flooding. So problems still happening here uh, in the Tampa Bay area, even though this storm has made landfall well to our north and uh, is, is weakening this onshore flow. It hasn't weakened at all, Diane. Uh, Rob, the last big storm Tampa had to deal with was Hurricane Ian. It seems like these are very different storms. How does this compare? Well, uh, Ian, um, you know, dove down to the south, so completely different approaches. When, when Ian went down to the south, that basically sucked the water out of the bay. We had a, a reverse surge. This is the opposite. It missed us to the north. I mean, both missed Tampa. That's the good news. Uh, but the bad news with this one is it missed to the north of Tampa, and that's why we have this big onshore push of water up and into the bay. So it impacted uh, Tampa, I would say, uh, much worse than Ian in the way of the, the storm surge and the water push. Uh, so this is not a good approach for the Tampa Bay area, but it's another hurricane that missed one of the most vulnerable cities in America uh, to hurricanes. So they consider themselves, I'm sure, lucky today, Diane. Yeah, I'm sure they'll take that. Rob, what areas are you most concerned about and where are you headed next? Well, we, uh, I think we're going to head to Savannah. Uh, that's where the storm is headed, and we can do a bit of an end around and, 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 and get there safely. Uh, it's a bit of a drive, but uh, that's where we're going. You know, this has been a difficult storm to cover, quite honestly, from a news perspective, because all the spots here north to where it made landfall are very dicey, very dangerous uh, places to, to, to report from. So our, our teams will kind of converge in the areas that are getting hit hard, unfortunately, right now. There's going to be a lot of destruction up in that Perry area and then the Big Bend area. And there's going to be a lot of on the ground reporting to do. But folks in Georgia and Savannah and Charleston tonight and tomorrow, they're going to get a piece of this action, too. So we'll be there as well, Diane. All right. And the important part, of course, to stay safe, Rob Marciano in Tampa. Rob, thank you. And Mayor Ken Welch of St. Petersburg is joining me now for more on the storm. Mayor Welch, I know some areas in St. Petersburg are under evacuation orders. What are you seeing in those areas and what are you telling those residents? Thank you, Diane. It's good to be with you. Well, as uh, Paul and Rob reported, uh, I think the significant thing for me is this storm is so large. Um, Paul was up in Perry, I believe, it's some 250 miles from St. Petersburg, Tampa area, yet we're still seeing impacts uh, in terms of rain and thunderstorm bands. But really the thing we're concerned about uh, is the storm surge. We've uh, received over more than four feet a storm surge already, and as the uh, high tide comes in this afternoon, about 2 p.m., we expect that to increase, and that's where most of our impact is coming from. Uh, street flooding, we've had some high water uh, rescues. All three bridges that lead to St. Petersburg and Pinellas County, we are a peninsula within a peninsula, and all three of the bridges coming into our community are shut down now because of wind and flooding. So uh, the water is really our concern, and this is much more of an impact uh, to our community than Ian uh, had in terms of storm for storm uh, impacts, and storm surge impact. And I know you're talking about the water and the surge. You already have some flooding in areas. What are you seeing there? We're seeing flooding in, in our low-lying areas, areas that were evacuated, our, our level A areas. But it, it is more intense than, than we've seen recently. Uh, I've already had a anecdotal report of someone that's uh, been in an area 18 years and has never seen the water that high. And again, we're still expecting the, the the rest of the storm surge impact later this afternoon. So uh, we were concerned about that when we had a prediction of four to seven feet of storm surge. And, and that is um, um, what seems to be happening right now. So hopefully folks uh, heeded the warning, moved to higher ground. And uh, right now we're trying to help those folks uh, that we can get to with uh, high water rescues.
And Mayor, what's your message, not only to members of your community, but what do you also want to say to the rest of the country? That it's it's a new game uh, in terms of um, extreme weather. Uh, these storms are more powerful. They move more quickly. We have less time to react. And the science has told us that the sea level rise and those impacts will produce exactly what we're seeing, uh, more impact, greater impact from storm surge. And um, uh, we're seeing um, high water in areas that we've never seen it before. And now you've got an area of Big Bend that hasn't been hit by a storm directly in decades. Uh, and our good you know, good friends in Perry and Tallahassee, Leon County, uh, Taylor County, that area, are now having to deal with that. So we just need to pay attention to the science, do our preparation, uh, and that'll get us through this. All right, Mayor of St. Petersburg, Ken Welch. Mayor Welch, we appreciate your time today. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Appreciate it, Diane. And now let's go back to meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, Idalia just got ground downgraded. What can you tell us? To a Category 2, yeah, as, uh, as it made landfall uh, in the Category 3 range. It was briefly at a Category 4. Uh, and as the mayor just spoke to, the amplitude at which these storms intensify to over a short period is certainly getting shorter, and that is helped by the record warm waters in the Gulf, and as we know, human-caused global warming. Now, taking a look at Idalia here, the most immediate concerns, not so much the winds. Remember, they are going down as it makes its way inland, but now we're transitioning to not only uh, a flooding risk, but also a tornadic risk from some of the outer bands as this moves its way up to the north. Now, until noontime Eastern, a flash flood warning is out. That is for what still is slash used to be the northern eye wall of that, an additional one to three inches of rainfall expected over that short period of time in that area, along with the extreme winds that come along with it. Here is where the storm surge is expected to be the worst, and again, get caught up in this for now, but also start getting caught up in what's going on from Savannah to Charleston to Wilmington to Hatteras. Uh, Charleston is an extremely flood-prone city. You get a bad thunderstorm in Charleston, inch, two inches of rainfall, and the streets are flooded out, and it's an absolute mess. This is going to bring much more than that as it continues to track up to the north during the overnight hours and into early tomorrow, bringing all that heavy rainfall. For Charleston, for example, that'll be late today and into tonight. And look at the rainfall totals as it makes its way through. In addition to the severe weather threat, several tornadoes are also possible spinning up on the outer bands of that, and Charleston is right underneath that major flooding concern. Again, one at very prone coastal city there, but it even goes all the way up into North Carolina. Here are the rainfall numbers. It does look like the worst of the rain will fall north of Charleston, but still that's in the contour where you're seeing at least three to six inches. And as I said, an inch or two of rain, that's bad news for portions along the uh, coastline, Georgia, South Carolina, and even into uh, southern North Carolina. Diane. All right, ABC News meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, thank you. And we'll be cover covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm. And right now we want to take you to WFTS, our station in Tampa. Yet to come. He also talked about um, access to the, the beaches. I know that people like to get out on the beaches when right. storms come through because they want to see the waves. But he said if you get out on the beach, you will not be able to get back. So that's very important. So he says just it's best to, and safe. So he's stressing to everyone in Pinellas County to stay off the roads. The worst of the storm, mm -hmm. the storm surge is yet to come. He also talked about um, access to the, the beaches. I know that people like to get out on the beaches when right. storms come through because they they want to see the waves, but he said, if you get out on the beach, you will not be able to get back. So that's very important. So he says just it's best to, and safe is just to stay put right now until they give the all clear that it's okay to get out and explore. Now, again, we've been talking about closures, road closures, bridge closures, as well as the storm surge in the Bay. And so we want to get out to Kylie McGivern, who's in Bradenton. Now, Kylie, this is that you're at the Cortez Bridge right now. And this is a bridge that closed about two hours ago, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, and you're talking with an official out there. Just tell us what you're seeing and uh, who you're talking to. Yes, we are out on Cortez Bridge. This is in the Bradenton area. You're starting to see these bridge closers as we've been talking about this morning all throughout the Tampa Bay area. So this, this is a... All right, it looks... Apologize for that. Yeah. We... Oh, okay. We may be able to get back to Kylie. We lost her shot for just a second there. That's been happening with those, you yeah. know, when those the, the strong winds come through. But it, in the meantime, we're going to go to James. Is James ready for us now? 
Actually, I can take it, guys. Yeah, I'm actually, we'll I, I can fill the time here. We've got another tornado warning that was just issued. This one is going to include a very small sliver of Sarasota County, but this sliver is so small that Sarasota County, you're not in it. This is going to be mainly for DeSoto and Hardy counties. Radar indicated tornado. The warning is until 945. We're going to go through this probably a lot as we go through the morning and the early afternoon. Uh, looking at the data here and analyzing the storm not seeing a very strong indication of rotation that's probably because this storm is a little farther from the radar than the last one that i just showed you kind of putting it into motion to kind of try to get gauge where that could be if there is a tornado it is located right there just south of 72. Uh, this is heading generally in the direction where 72 and 70 come together in Hardy County or DeSoto County, excuse me. So this is gonna be on the west side of Arcadia or the general area of Arcadia. So if you live in Arcadia, Brownville, Pine Level, Lansing communities here along 70 and 72, tornado warning until 945 this morning for a radar indicated tornado. The motion on this, northeast, we're gonna track in northeast at 40 miles an hour. I'll take it through the end of the warning. So the Lansing community, 932, Kinsey around 938 would be your arrival time for this quick spin up potential tornado here. No reports of anything on the ground from the National Weather Service. All of these are radar indicated. So just make sure you're in a safe place away from windows if you're in that area. As far as the storm in Pasco County, still looking at an indication of a potential tornado here. I would not be surprised if they continue to issue warnings on this one out of Pasco into Sumter County. But the area of concern is about to exit the county now. It's past 98, north of 98, and it is about to move out of the warning area. In fact, probably before the warning expires. This one's moving really fast. So Dade City, Zephyr Hills, Wesley Chapel, you're clear. This one is out. It's now moving out of Pasco County. We're looking fine there. Uh, if there was a touchdown, we'll get reports of uh, about it from the uh, local officials. The only other tornado warnings that we're tracking here is DeSoto over towards Hardy County until 945. So that's the latest here. If you guys want to take it back to a live shot, I can do that. I can send it back to Dia and Heather first. Yeah. And then we can continue to watch the flooding situation, which I, I think, guys, is really impactful for a large portion of our area. And Greg, mm -hmm. you've been saying that we haven't seen the worst of it yet. Yeah, it really depends. You know, I've been watching the tide gauges, Dia, and they're either leveling off in some cases, they're dropping at a trickle pace. Uh, and in other cases, they're still rising. It really depends on the location. But we, as you mentioned, and as you know, the sheriff there mentioned in Pinellas County, we're not going to see high tide until the earliest in some places, 1115, in some places as late as 3 o'clock this, this evening. Uh, so it's going to take a while for the water to recede, which is why it's so important that Folks, stay inside while this storm is still moving by. I'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, Greg. And that's exactly what Sheriff Bob Galtieri from Pinellas County was letting all of the viewers know. He says, because we don't know what to expect yet, because high tide has not happened, peak tide has not happened until 11.15. We don't know what the storm surge is going to do. It's expected to get worse. I want to check in now with James Tully. He was already seeing flooding on Coronado Drive in that area. James, I can imagine that it's, that it's if it's not getting worse, and it's definitely not getting any better. It's kind of leveling off to you. That's kind of the this what my two eyes tell me. As we take a look down here, this is um, Hamden Drive, which runs uh, parallel to Coronado Drive, as you mentioned, right at 3rd Street in front of Clearwater Bay. Now, Mike's going to show you the grass down there uh, next to Hamden Drive. And that's the first time we've seen grass in a while, so I can confirm, at least right now, that water's coming back a little bit. Uh, I can also take a look over here at this hotel and some of these homes where the water has come back from the front door uh, of, of these uh, uh, this, these rooms here, these hotel rooms. So that that's certainly a good sign. But the idea, just to echo what you said and, and what we heard from the Pinellas County Sheriff earlier, uh, that uh, the worst is possibly yet to come with high tide uh, set for 1115 in this area of clear water uh, where we are. And he anticipates that uh, we're not going to see uh, these streets passable for another three to four hours after that. So as you mentioned, you know, like people like to go out to the beach. If you're staying here in clear water, you live nearby. That is not something to do right now. You go out to the beach, you may not be able to get back. Same thing goes uh, for 
or walking down any of these sidewalks or any of these streets. I mean, they, they're, they're as impassable as, as it can possibly be. So uh, seeing the water level off, if not recede a bit here, of course, we still have high tide coming our way in about two hours and, and 15 minutes or so. So we're going to stay here, get back down to ground level, and see what we can uh, what we can we can find and any more any more good signs and at least check out the beach area and see what that looks like too. I'll send it back to you guys. All right, thank you, James. We'll check in with you in a little while. All right, we're going to go back to Paula Grone, who is in Perry. That is very close to where this storm made landfall in Keaton Beach. Uh, we know that he was really really in the thick of it uh, just about an hour ago. Uh, we haven't checked in with him in about an hour so let's just uh, get out there right now and see how things have uh, have been going for him Paul are you back outside are you still in the hotel yeah, we are inside right now, inside the lobby of the Holiday Inn off US-19 here in Perry. And the concern was they, they locked the doors because it was getting, as you guys know, it was getting bad out there. And the concern, I, you see those other panel of doors out there? We, their concern was those were going to blow off and glass was going to start flying everywhere. So mm. some pretty scary moments for folks here who are literally holding the fort down, uh, got everyone in that was outside. And uh, at some point, they, they just couldn't hold those doors together. And they kind of left them like that. And then they locked these these doors here uh, to keep everyone safe inside. You got people here from all over uh, Taylor County and beyond that sought shelter and they're in here right now checking on their situation. They're doing good. They're, everyone's good. Uh, giving you the giving you the wave there. That you guys all right? You good? Okay. So everyone, it was a little scary there. For, I'm not going to lie for a while for folks, but they're they're back inside. Power's obviously off. I want to show you something. I would be out there right now, but uh, you know, out of respect for the situation in here, they want to keep those doors shut. So I'm not going to challenge that. Uh, they want everyone to be inside. So, but you can see outside uh, parking lot starting to flood. Trees are down. The big stuff out there, uh, the the campers and the and the trucks and, and things like that. Even the signage is holding steady so far. The power lines are holding steady so far. We've had down trees. I'll take it back outside here because I want to see if we can talk to some folks here who made the decision to come here and have been here for a while. Chris, you, can you talk to me real quick, bud? I know you got your uh, your dog with you. How how are the animals holding up? Uh, they're a little shaking up a little bit right now, but yeah. they're all right. And your mom, your mom is in Chiefland, right? Yeah. And she's doing all right. Yeah, I called her and she said she was all right. A lot of wind, a lot of rain. She said uh, a lot of debris as well. Okay. But she's all right there. All right, scary moments though. I mean, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Mainly here too. It's pretty scary here as well. You you made the right call though. I know you got your children here with you and uh, and they're doing good. They seem to be occupied and and your wife who who works here, she's doing good. So yeah, it's be better to be here and safe than to be out there, obviously. Oh uh, yeah, definitely is. I'd say it was the right call for sure. All right. Hey, Chris, thank you for checking with us. Appreciate it. Uh, and we've been at spy What's the latest, my friend? Oh, uh, man, a friend of mine's house right here looks like I think it's destroyed. I mean, Come on in, I'll, Tim. I'll, I can't. I'm pretty sure it's my friend's house. Can we show that to the camera? Yes. I don't know if a tornado hit it because, no, I hadn't seen any other pictures like that. Now, where is this? Is this, this Dean Hatchie or uh, no, this Keaton is Beach? No, this Keaton Beach. Yeah, this is on Marina Drive. Um, it's one of the canals, one of the little, like, peninsulas. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed! <laughs> Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs to lose weight? I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy 
There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Macedo, thanks for streaming ABC News Live. Let's get right to our top story this morning. Hurricane Idalia has made landfall in a region of Florida that has never been hit by a storm this strong in recorded history. Idalia came ashore around 745 this morning as a Category 3 hurricane after hitting Category 4 overnight. Now the storm has been downgraded to a Cat 2 as it moves over land, unleashing a catastrophic and life-threatening storm surge. Idalia is also sparking tornado warnings throughout central and north Florida and even as far as Georgia as it moves northeast. Hundreds of thousands are without power. And now we're getting a look at the storm from space. Here's the view from the International Space Station. I want to bring in meteorologist Greg Dutra to walk us through this. Greg, looking at this image from the ISS, Tell us what's happening here. What's your reaction to seeing this? So you've got in the foreground a little bit of a part of the International Space Station, but right on the edge of that, that's the eye in the very well-formed eye wall. That was probably taken while it was a Category 3 or maybe even Category 4 storm because, as you see, again, as that eye wall becomes a little more apparent in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, that's really well-defined, almost a clear eye with strong thunderstorms along that band. And then as the image progresses, you start getting into those outer bands. But even even those outer bands, which if you were looking at the image would be something out here, even those have produced tornado warnings that were in effect earlier this morning. And that's not the only concern with this. Of course, uh, right along the eye, it is those outer areas that can produce the spin-up tornadoes and the flooding that goes along with it. Speaking of which, flash flood warning now out for Florida. It goes all the way up to the border with Georgia. Another one to three inches in there before noontime, Diane. It is a pretty intense storm. And Greg, the storm's now been downgraded to a category two, but you say that doesn't mean it's not dangerous we're not out of the woods yeah we are definitely transitioning from more of a pure wind threat which still don't get me wrong category two is a very strong hurricane but we're transitioning more to the secondary and tertiary threats from this which would be the heavy rainfall and again those spin-up tornadoes that happen as this makes its way farther inland so let's track Idalia through this afternoon and into this evening a category two storm it stays a category two into southern Georgia that's just a testament here with how strong and how fast this is moving off to the north. It's keeping that momentum, keeping itself together at Category 2, uh, hundreds of miles inland at that point. Then we go into later on tonight, flooding rain through South Carolina into North Carolina, too. We're talking five, six, seven inches of rainfall, perhaps even up to 10 inches of rain when all is said and done, and winds that'll be sustained for hours up and above 50 or perhaps even to 60 miles per hour. That will likely knock out some power as we move into early Thursday morning, and finally we start seeing some weakening effects from this. But look how widespread the severe weather threat is. It goes all the way from where this has made landfall. It stretches south to almost the northern fringe of Tampa through Orlando, Jacksonville, Gainesville, Savannah, Charleston as well, a very prone city. And this is just from those storms spinning up on the outskirts, on the outer bands uh, of that hurricane. Major flooding threat all the way through the Carolinas too. We are definitely not out of the woods just yet, Diane. And Greg, the phase of the moon is actually playing a role here with high tide. Explain this like we're five. How does this work? Absolutely. Well, so you've got the meteorological effects, right? That would be the winds pushing up the water against the shore, like you'd be shoving a wave against the side of a bathtub. Uh, the secondary is the astronomical effect. So we are at the king tide season in Florida where moon reaches its perigee with Earth. Perigee is just a fancy way of saying the moon is closest in its orbit to Earth 
it's uh, boiled down the supermoon, right? It appears bigger because it's actually physically closer to us. That's more pull, more gravity pull from the moon. So it'll pull these tides farther inland. This last week of August, early September, is the king tide season for Florida. The good news is that as Edalia made landfall, it was low tide, but the tide is still coming in. And you have those meteorological effects tied in with the astronomical ones that is going to make the flooding threat continue, even as this makes its way inland. Two o'clock is when the high tide is. And again, it's one of the highest tides of the entire year for them in coastal Florida, Diane. Mm, bad timing there. Mm -hmm. Meteorologist Greg Dutra, thank you. No problem. And let's go to Tampa Bay now. WFTS affiliate reporter Jada Williams is in Gulfport near St. Petersburg, where the storm surge has washed out some roads and the threat of more water is still there. Jada? I'm Jada Williams here at Gulfport, just behind me, the Gulfport Casino, but it is not easily to get to. You can see this water that is coming all the way up here. There are a lot of people out here watching, seeing what is going on. I spoke to some people out here who say that this is something that happens normally, but it is still insane to see just how fast that water came up. Now, here's the other thing here. We still have to worry about more tidal surge. That's because there's still that threat as well as high tide that is coming later today today. So what you're seeing right now, and there is still that threat that we can see even more water push more inland here in Gulfport. Jada Williams reporting. All right, Jada Williams with WFTS. Jada, thank you. And Florida is no stranger to hurricanes uh, and how to stay prepared, but it's the aftermath, the cleanup, the devastation left behind that can often take months or even years to recover from. And our mayor of Fort Myers, Kevin Anderson, knows that all too well. Mayor, thank you for joining us. Uh, first off, I want to ask how your community is doing right now. Well, you know, we're about 11 months out of Hurricane Ian. Still got a lot of blue tarps and uh, a lot of uh, sites that are under construction. Um, we made it through last night fairly well. A little bit of minor flooding. I haven't heard of any structural structures that have been uh, impacted by the flooding. How's Fort Myers doing? Uh, it's been nearly a year, like you said, since Hurricane Ian just devastated that region. When you think of storms like this, you know, you cover them for a little while and sometimes you forget. But how long has it been and, and how is that community rebuilding? So it's been about 11 months now. And the recovery process is it's going to be anywhere from five to as many as 10 years. It's, it's a very, very long process. Um, Overall, though, the community is bouncing back. A lot of construction projects underway. The city of Fort Myers, the downtown area, is almost back 100%. What lessons did you learn from Hurricane Ian? And do you see those applied now as you face the threat of new storms? So it's not so much what lessons we as government learn. It's more so what lessons did the public learn. And I hope that they learned very, three very important uh, lessons. One, prepare and plan for the storm so that when we're threatened, you don't have to panic. Two, recognize that the most uh, predictable thing about the hurricane is that it's unpredictable. So just because it looks like it's going to hit somewhere else, we've seen it uh, with, with Charlie and um, Ian. Both of them were supposed to go by us and they made a, a hard or a turn and hit us. And then the last thing is, most importantly, what we learned or we should have learned through Ian is that you can hide from the wind, but you've got to run from the water. You can't fight the water. No, you can't. All right, Mayor of Fort Myers, Kevin Anderson, we appreciate it, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And let's go to our meteorologist, Greg Dutra, uh, with a little bit more on the storm. Greg, this is the strongest landfall in the Big Bend of Florida in ever on record. So walk us through the impact there. That's absolutely right. It, it, it's astonishing because the first step I do to kind of give you an insight when we see a track that's kind of firming up is I go into the archive and I pull up storms that are maybe similar to it. I'll pull up a high end storm, I'll pull up a low end one and it plots all of them just like you would see a hurricane path plot on the map. Well, I went in to do the research on this one as we were watching it between the Yucatan Peninsula and Cuba and there were none. It, it's it's wild that there were no major hurricanes that made its way into a spot where you'd think 
that there would be major hurricanes. And this isn't just a 30 or 40 year record. This goes back to the 1850s. So it's quite a long time. And this is a testament to exactly how warm those Gulf waters are. Two to five degrees above normal, the warmest on record. They've supercharged these storms and allowed them to go from just a tropical storm over 24 hours ago to a category four at one point and then a category three at landfall. It really is remarkable here. And I feel for the people at Keaton Beach where this made landfall. I feel for the folks uh, at Cedar Key. In the coming days, we are absolutely going to go into this area. And I guarantee we're going to see a lot of damage and a lot of flooding because it's a very susceptible spot. Now, at this time, we're transitioning a bit more to a rainfall perspective where another one to three inches of rain is expected in this flash flood warning on the southern border of Georgia. It goes until noontime, but that has now been expanded all the way north of Valdosta. And that goes until this afternoon. Afternoon. Still a Category 2 storm. This is also trucking along at over 15, almost 20 miles per hour. So it keeps its shape a bit more than you would expect one that just lollygags at 3 or 4 miles per hour onto shore. Moving very quickly inland, and this is likely to bring anywhere from 5 to 10 inches of rain on this northern swath. Thankfully, it's a little bit farther inland of Charleston, a really flood-prone uh, prone city. Same deal at Myrtle Beach, but remember, the water flows into the ocean, right? So all these rivers and streams are gonna get uh, kind of overwhelmed inland and that has to go somewhere back into the Atlantic Ocean and that somewhere is through cities like Charleston and Myrtle Beach. Now this is going to continue until at least early tomorrow morning. I think we start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel uh, as a nation through the mid-Atlantic by tomorrow afternoon. But still until then, not only is it the core of the storm, it's wide reaching problems that go through Southern Georgia into South Carolina, into to southern North Carolina of heavy rainfall and tornadoes that are spinning up on those outer bands. But our main concern, at least moving forward now, the most widespread concern is going to be that major flooding, as we can see anywhere from five to 10, perhaps even up to a foot of rain uh, all the way along the eastern seaboard until this finally moves out to sea. Diane. All right, meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, thank you. And Hurricane Adalia is already causing dangerous conditions further inland. ABC's Maria Villarreal is in Gainesville for us. Maria, what's the latest? Hey, you know, uh, earlier this morning we had a, a break from the rain, but really what we've seen overnight since about midnight here in Gainesville is a steady amount of heavy rain. Uh, and it comes, you know, with the bands coming. Basically, I'm calling this kind of a hip check for Idalia as she makes landfall or as the storm makes landfall. Uh, we've seen wind gusts up to 35 to 40 miles per hour in this area. And, you know, we were once projected to take a bigger hit here in Gainesville um, and along this region. Right now, it does look like the storm moved a little bit further north of us and is tracking pretty fast. Uh, we are still expected on the back end of this storm to receive about 75 mile per hour wind gusts at times. And so the biggest concern concern right now for people living in this area, local leaders, is what you're seeing right behind me, which is this big wind that starts to come through and the possibility of isolated tornadoes in this area. So as of right now, even though we're not getting the bulk of the storm, there is some major cause for concern as the uh, water continues to flow. So we're going to get some flooding and then on the back of an end of it, getting some of those possible tornadoes. Here we are. Thank you. And we will be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm. Right now, we want to take you to WFTV, our station in Orlando. Get to Cedar Key yet because of it looks like this, right? There's water all over the roads, and there is only one way in and out of Cedar Key, but there are buildings that are damaged there. There is flooding there. Uh, people, about 100, the mayor told us, decided to stay there. We think at this point everyone is okay. We have not heard, but we know there is damage over there. There is a lot of debris here. Um, after we're done with you, we are going to drive around to see if there is any damage to roofs here, but most of the wind uh, along the Big Bend right here between uh, Crystal River and Cedar Key hit Cedar Key and I think that's why you're seeing some trouble with some of the roofs there on some of those buildings uh, but this is what uh, Crystal River and Cedar Key will look like for at least a few more hours if not most of the day there is a lot of water a lot of storm sur surge that has come up uh, on these roads. Shannon, uh, Darlene here with Martha, and I wanted to ask you, because I know you spoke to some residents yesterday, as you said, 100 or so planning to stay there and ride out the storm. Have you seen a lot of people trying to get out there now that we've started to see daylight? I see one vehicle there behind you, maybe someone checking out. 
the conditions? Yeah, since, yeah, since we've been at the marina, um, even before the water started to rise, people were driving around once the sun came up just to see what was happening. But since we've been standing right here and came on the other side, it was just five vehicles behind um, our vehicle now uh, running up and down the roads trying to check things out. The problem with that, as you know, is they bring a lot of weight. And the wake is, because these roads are so flooded, the wake then pushes that water into the homes. That's why, you know, the officials say, please don't drive here until the water starts to subside, because it does push that water into the yards, into the garages, and into the homes. But there are people out on the roads. Even early this morning in the dark, we were looking at the main road into Crystal River. And as soon as the rain stopped, people were driving down the road, trucks, and so people thought maybe this was over. But again, we were still waiting for this. We were waiting for the storm surge and here it is now but this is the kind of you know wakes that are are happening now because so many people are driving along these roads all right shannon butler reporting live for us uh from crystal river where we see the uh what the, the effects of that storm surge that are making it quite difficult for the residents uh, there we want to come a little bit closer to home where we've been checking in with our q mccray who is live in uh, ocala and we see cars moving behind you. Q, one of our viewers actually stopped you in your last live shot and said he's blessed everything's okay there. How is it right now? Yeah, so, well, condition-wise, when we're talking about the weather, the things really haven't changed here, uh, there. Um, you know, the, the rain just stopped maybe three minutes ago. Uh, the wind is blowing some, uh, but nothing serious. And again, that's great news for the people here in Marion County. Ocala, specifically, you mentioned that man uh, who we talked to about an hour or so ago. He says he was watching our newscasts all morning long and noticed that things seem calm here. We're live at the uh, historic downtown square here in the heart of Ocala so he decided to head out and check things out and um, you know really things haven't changed uh, from that uh, point of view uh, when it comes to the conditions out here again um, maybe some gusts from time to time here we've seen the traffic signals uh, sway in the wind uh, but what we have seen now that the sun's out and now uh, kind of poking through the clouds out here if we tilt up we'll show you the cloud coverage and you'll notice how these clouds clouds are just moving by really fast. Um, so it, it is windy at some uh, at higher altitudes, if you will, but here at ground level in Ocala, uh, things are safe, uh, things are sound. I uh, reached out to uh, emergency management. They have no serious issues to tell us about, uh, but they did tell us that their four shelters are still open right now and that a few people have been taking advantage of their services. So uh, for now, that's the latest here live in Ocala. I'm Q McRae. Bet you guys inside. All right, Q. Thanks so much. Good to see that things are okay up there in uh, Ocala. We're going to go right now to Volusia County, where during the last hurricane season, they saw a lot of problems with beach erosion and homes just literally falling into the ocean. Yeah, Channel 9 to Demi Johnson has been keeping an eye on conditions there. Uh, Demi, you're now in the Midtown area. Uh, some businesses have actually left that area because of uh, damage from the last storm. Businesses and people, because look, Darlene, a lot of these homes are still boarded up. This area was way steep water during Hurricane Zian and very, very high water, maybe ankle deep during Hurricane Nicole. That's because this entire neighborhood is shaped like a bowl. And every time we get major rain events, it floods. So this entire neighborhood, good news to report here with this storm, but this entire neighborhood, if you look down this way, there's hundreds of homes and we see one car in a driveway. So there's hundreds, dozens of families, dozens of people still displaced. So we decided to leave the beach side and check out this side of town to make sure that people here were faring okay during the storm. Because again, even just small rain events cause flooding in this neighborhood, but that's not what we're seeing right now. This neighborhood also following Hurricanes Ian and Nicole is part of an Army Corps of Engineers study because they're trying to find ways to mitigate the flooding issues here. Because every time there's rain, these homes flood and people are displaced. This time, though, according to officials here in Daytona Beach, we've learned over recent months this is the worst it's ever been. So they were really hoping that this time 
none of the the major flooding would happen and we haven't seen any of that so far so we're going to go back to beachside see what's going on over there and we'll check back in with you guys when we get there Demi, thanks so much. So good news from her vantage point uh, in Volusia County. We can tell you that Flagler County uh, has lifted all evacuation orders. Their shelter, in fact, uh, is supposed to, to close soon so everything can get back to normal. But what uh, has been a mess, Darlene, is this live shot from uh, Perry, Florida, where it's actually... Uh, there's a lull right now because before we had been seeing debris flying, high winds, and a lot of rain. Yeah, it looks like the the image we're showing you now uh, is gives you perspective as to what they've been dealing with in that area for at least the last hour and a half. You can see the wind and the rain is certainly picking up in that area. Uh, this is a picture from our uh, station WP, WPLG uh, providing us with these images out of Perry, Florida. Uh, you can see just how quickly the wind is picking up in that area. And when we showed you these pictures a short time ago, Martha, you remember you saw the awnings uh, blowing off the buildings there and the conditions have changed significantly uh, since then. Yeah, again, this is a, a shot from earlier, but when we went to our live picture, all looked uh, uh, better uh, there. But again, uh, folks, uh, staying indoors, which is what they need to be doing uh, during this time. Uh, we're going to go to a break and then kind of come back in and check with our meteorologists, Tom Terry and George Waldenberger, to get uh, a live update on what Idalia is doing. So stay with us. You're watching Channel 9. Ashley's Labor Day. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the sun. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park, only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series, sponsored by Hot Tools. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did you do next? If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Ooh. Friday, the David Muir two-hour 2020 event at 9, 8 central on ABC. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. These are long period swells, and they're kind of uh, overcresting with the winds. The swells from Hurricane Franklin in the distance, the winds from, of course, Idalia, which is just to the north of us. Port Canaveral also live shot here, looking at what looked like tropical storm conditions as the palm fronds sway in the breeze there. Now, we are all under a tornado watch through this afternoon. Even though the storm, the Idalia, Hurricane Category 2 right now, is well to the north of us. This is Valdosta 
Georgia with winds gusting above 60 miles per hour. The center of Vidalia is just south of that. Perry, earlier we were showing winds at 80 miles per hour plus, now down to 55 miles per hour. So you could kind of connect the dots here and see the circulation around where Idalia is. So this is about 200 miles to our north, northwest in Orlando. So we're just getting outer gusty passing rain bands and that'll be the case all afternoon. Although they will become less and less numerous as we get later and later into the day. There it is, category two, some flood advisories on the east side of this or ahead of the system. Right now, categorized maximum sustained winds at 110 miles per hour. We're getting updates every hour and we'll continue to see a weakening trend with Edalia as it continues to move over land, moving very quickly as well. So the eye right here, again, starting to fill in, which we've seen with other hurricanes after they move over land, about to cross into the Georgia border. This is I-75 here between Lake City and Valdosta. So again, the hurricane now beginning to move from North Florida, still in North Florida at this point, but about to move into Southern Georgia, at least the center, but the rain bands well into Georgia and actually down here as well. This is a look, uh, you can see it's 180 miles to the north, northwest of us in Orlando. This is kind of a summary of all the advisories we have. We have some flooding concerns uh, in uh, Osceola County, one flood alert there, and then farther south into Hardy County. So the winds are going from southwest to northeast. These storms moving about 35 miles per hour. So the winds and the rain can pick up and actually diminish quite quickly within these rain bands. Earlier, we had a couple of tornado warnings. Uh, they were one system uh, which is actually moving over Sumter and Lake County now. That tornado warning has expired. There still are little bits of rotation that quickly form and then quickly diminish. So we still have the potential for more brief spin-ups, more brief tornado warnings. This is one area we're watching here. Southern Sumter County, south of Terrytown, and then into Bay Lake, Groveland, Mascot, now Claremont, and uh, uh, the turnpike here as you pass the intersection or where it meets 27. And uh, looking at the rotate, looking at uh, our product that kind of shows rotation, I see just a little bit of rotation here. State Road 50 as you move west of Groveland. So the mascot area, just watching in case we see another tornado warning there. Right now, not enough to uh, call a tornado warning. And uh, Altamont Springs over toward Apopka, there's just another quickly passing shower here. This is over the uh, Rock Run area, Mount Plymouth, uh, Wakiva Springs, uh, over toward Heathrow. This little shower is going to be pushing the, through the west sides of uh, Sanford soon. And then uh, taking the turnpike down, not a lot of rotation embedded within the flow at this point, which is good news. But again, that can change quickly with these rain bands. Uh, actually seeing a little bit here, so we'll keep an eye on that in Osceola County. And then uh, monitoring the radar and any spin up here in Volusia and northern Brevard County. Things look okay for now. Now. But again, we're getting these gusty showers here. This is Wedgefield. This is the beach line. So this is State Road 520 where you have that intersection here, that uh, place where you can play, pay your tolls as you're uh, getting on the beach line there. And uh, that's moving over toward Christmas. We're looking at Daytona Beach, New Smyrna Beach, Flagler County. A little bit of a break from the rains right now. Still watching everybody. We have Marion County, a few brief passing showers, but nothing too abnormal here. And then taking you down into Osceola County. This is actually where we have some of the most widespread passing rain right now and where we have that flood alert which includes Point Siena, Kissimmee. So uh, for people that must go out, uh, just please stay off of flooded roadways. You just don't really know the condition of the road underneath any rains there. So uh, tornado watch will continue through three o'clock this afternoon. We'll see if we get an extension of that later and uh, live look at Daytona Beach. The flags whipping around in the breeze. You can see they're kind of pointed that way. So that's a south to north wind. So there would be a longshore current as well. The winds would kind of drive waters northward in addition to the waves from distant Hurricane Franklin. So very rough waters here. Wave heights could top eight feet today. Rip currents obviously going to be an issue. We'll see if we have any minor coastal erosion during high tides here. But uh, quickly projecting into the future. Category two expected for Idalia through this afternoon. Again, it's staying well to the north. But with this flow here, we have these continuing rain bands that that uh, will just move through this afternoon, but they'll become a little less numerous because on the backside, not only is Idalia getting farther from us, but dry air is moving in uh, from the west 
on the south side of this as well. Again, the overall flow is counterclockwise. Uh, into this evening still could be a Category 2 as it <laughs> moves toward Savannah, Georgia and the coast of South Carolina from the landward side as opposed to from the ocean side where South Carolina normally expects the approach of hurricanes from. At this point, this is this evening. Still a chance for some gusty passing showers, but again, they're really diminishing this evening. A little breezy overnight, and then for the next couple of days, well after Idalia moves off, we're still going to have a chance for some passing showers here and there. So we're not going to take the rain out of the forecast the next couple of days. Uh, but again, what's new with Idalia recently? Still a Category 2. The squalls continue. Locally, a tornado watch will continue until 3 o'clock. We're going to continue to monitor storm reports. We'll uh, let you know if we get any more rotational couplets that would give us any additional tornado warnings. We're going to monitor our coast. We have our team of reporters out there monitoring all areas to see rainfall amounts, any flooding issues, and we're also going to show you how strong the winds are. We'll let you know. Uh, everything that's going up, we'll continue to track Adalia, but I'm going to toss it back to you, Martha and Darlene. Thanks, George. All right, we're going to take a quick break mm -hmm. and come back with more as we continue to follow Hurricane Adalia. Stay with us. We've covered storms moving over 90 miles. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. One, two, three. Let's go. Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed. <laughs> Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming ABC News Live. Let's get right to our top story this morning. Hurricane Idalia has made landfall in a region of Florida that has never been hit by a storm this strong in recorded history. Idalia came ashore around 7.45 this morning as a Category 3 hurricane after hitting Category 4 overnight. Now the storm has been downgraded to a Cat 2 as it moves over land, unleashing a catastrophic and life-threatening storm surge. Idalia is also sparking tornado warnings throughout Central and North Florida and even as far as Georgia as it moves northeast. Hundreds of thousands are without power. And now we're getting a look at the storm from space. Here's the view from the International Space Station. I want to bring in meteorologist Greg Dutra to walk us through this. Greg, looking at this image from the ISS, Tell us what's happening here. What's your reaction to seeing this? So you've got in the foreground a little bit of a part of the International Space Station, but right on the edge of that, that's the eye in the very well-formed eye wall. That was probably taken while it was a Category 3 or maybe even Category 4 storm because, as you see, again, as that eye wall becomes a little more apparent in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, that's really well-defined, almost a clear eye with strong thunderstorms along that band. And then as the image progresses, you start getting into those outer bands. But even those outer bands, which if you were looking at the image would be something out here, 
even those have produced tornado warnings that were in effect earlier this morning. And that's not the only concern with this. Of course, uh, right along the eye, it is those outer areas that can produce the spin-up tornadoes and the flooding that goes along with it. Speaking of which, flash flood warning now out for Florida. It goes all the way up to the border with Georgia. Another one to three inches in there before noontime, Diane. It is a pretty intense storm. And Greg, the storm's now been downgraded to a category two, but you say that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. We're not out of the woods. Yeah, we are definitely transitioning from more of a pure wind threat, which still, don't get me wrong, category two is a very strong hurricane, but we're transitioning more to the secondary and tertiary threats from this, which would be the heavy rainfall and again, those spin up tornadoes that happen as this makes its way farther inland. So let's track Edalia through this afternoon and into this evening. A category two storm, it stays a category two into southern Georgia. That's just a testament here with how strong and how fast this is moving off to the north. It's keeping that momentum, keeping itself together at Category 2, uh, hundreds of miles inland at that point. Then we go into later on tonight, flooding rain through South Carolina into North Carolina, too. We're talking five, six, seven inches of rainfall, perhaps even up to 10 inches of rain when all is said and done, and winds that'll be sustained for hours up and above 50 or perhaps even to 60 miles per hour. That will likely knock out some power as we move into early Thursday morning and finally we start seeing some weakening effects from this but look how widespread the severe weather threat is it goes all the way from where this has made landfall it stretches south to almost the northern fringe of tampa through orlando jacksonville gainesville savannah charleston as well a very prone city and this is just from those storms spinning up on the outskirts on the outer bands uh, of that hurricane major flooding threat all the way through the carolinas too we are definitely not out of the woods just yet diane and Greg, the phase of the moon is actually playing a role here with high tide. Explain this like we're five. How does this work? Absolutely. Well, so you've got the meteorological effects, right? That would be the winds pushing up the water against the shore, like you'd be shoving a wave against the side of a bathtub. Uh, the secondary is the astronomical effect. So we are at the king tide season in Florida where moon reaches its perigee with Earth. Perigee is just a fancy way of saying the moon is closest in its orbit to Earth, it's uh, boiled down the supermoon, right? It appears bigger because it's actually physically closer to us. That's more pull, more gravity pull from the moon. So it'll pull these tides farther inland. This last week of August, early September, is the king tide season for Florida. The good news is that as Edalia made landfall, it was low tide, but the tide is still coming in. And you have those meteorological effects tied in with the astronomical ones that is going to make the flooding threat continue, even as this makes its way inland. Two o'clock is when the high tide is. And again, it's one of the highest tides of the entire year for them in coastal Florida, Diane. Mm, bad timing there. Mm. Meteorologist Greg Dutra, thank you. No problem. And let's go to Tampa Bay now. WFTS affiliate reporter Jada Williams is in Gulfport near St. Petersburg, where the storm surge has washed out some roads and the threat of more water is still there. Jada? I'm Jada Williams here at Gulfport, just behind me, the Gulfport Casino, but it is not easily to get to. You can see this water that is coming all the way up here. There are a lot of people out here watching, seeing what is going on. I spoke to some people out here who say that this is something that happens normally, but it is still insane to see just how fast that water came up. Now, here's the other thing here. We still have to worry about more tidal surge. That's because there's still that threat as well as high tide that is coming later to Today. So what you're seeing right now, and there is still that threat that we can see even more water push more inland here in Gulfport. Jada Williams reporting. All right, Jada Williams with WFTS. Jada, thank you. And Florida is no stranger to hurricanes uh, and how to stay prepared, but it's the aftermath, the cleanup, the devastation left behind that can often take months or even years to recover from. And our mayor of Fort Myers, Kevin Anderson, knows that all too well. Mayor, thank you for joining us. Uh, first off, I want to ask how your community is doing right now. Well, you know, we're about 11 months out of Hurricane Ian. Still got a lot of blue tarps and uh, a lot of uh, sites that are under construction. Um, we made it through last night fairly well. A little bit of minor flooding. I haven't heard of any structural structures that have been uh, impacted by the flooding. 
How's Fort Myers doing? Uh, it's been nearly a year, like you said, since Hurricane Ian just devastated that region. When you think of storms like this, you know, you cover them for a little while and sometimes you forget, but how long has it been and, and how is that community rebuilding? So it's been about 11 months now and the recovery process is, is going to be anywhere from five to as many as 10 years. It's, it's a very, very long process. Um, Overall, though, the community is bouncing back. A lot of construction projects underway. The city of Fort Myers, the downtown area, is almost back 100%. What lessons did you learn from Hurricane Ian? And do you see those applied now as you face the threat of new storms? So it's not so much what lessons we as government learn. It's more so what lessons did the public learn? And I hope that they learned very, three very important uh, lessons. One, prepare and plan for the storm so that when we're threatened, you don't have to panic. Two, recognize that the most uh, predictable thing by the hurricane is that it's unpredictable. So just because it looks like it's going to hit somewhere else, we've seen it uh, with, with Charlie and um, Ian. Both of them were supposed to go by us and they made a, a hard or a turn and hit us. And then the last thing is, most importantly, what we learned or we should have learned through Ian is that you can hide from the wind, but you've got to run from the water. You can't fight the water. No, you can't. All right, Mayor of Fort Myers, Kevin Anderson, we appreciate it, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And let's go to our meteorologist, Greg Dutra, uh, with a little bit more on the storm. Greg, this is the strongest landfall in the Big Bend of Florida in ever on record. So walk us through the impact there. That's absolutely right. It, it, it's astonishing because the first step I do to kind of give you an insight when we see a track that's kind of firming up is I go into the archive and I pull up storms that are maybe similar to it. I'll pull up a high end storm, I'll pull up a low end one, and it plots all of them just like you would see a hurricane path plot on the map. Well, I went in to do the research on this one as we were watching it between the Yucatan Peninsula and Cuba and there were none. It, it's, it's wild that there were no major hurricanes that made its way into a spot where you'd think that there would be major hurricanes. And this isn't just a 30 or 40 year record. This goes back to the 1850s. So it's quite a long time. And this is a testament to exactly how warm those Gulf waters are. Two to five degrees above normal, the warmest on record. They've supercharged these storms and allowed them to go from just a tropical storm over 24 hours ago to a category category four at one point and then a category three at landfall. It really is remarkable here. And I feel for the people at Keaton Beach where this made landfall. I feel for the folks uh, at Cedar Key. In the coming days, we are absolutely going to go into this area. And I guarantee we're going to see a lot of damage and a lot of flooding because it's a very susceptible spot. Now, at this time, we're transitioning a bit more to a rainfall perspective where another one to three inches of rain is expected in this flash flood warning. On the southern border of Georgia, it goes until noontime. But that has now been expanded all the way north of Valdosta, and that goes until this afternoon. Still a Category 2 storm. This is also trucking along at over 15, almost 20 miles per hour. So it keeps its shape a bit more than you would expect one that just lollygags at 3 or 4 miles per hour onto shore. Moving very quickly inland, and this is likely to bring anywhere from 5 to 10 inches of rain on this northern swath. Thankfully, it's a little bit farther inland of Charleston, a really flood-prone uh, prone city. Same deal at Myrtle Beach, but remember, the water flows into the ocean, right? So all these rivers and streams are going to get uh, kind of overwhelmed inland, and that has to go somewhere back into the Atlantic Ocean, and that somewhere is through cities like Charleston and Myrtle Beach. Now, this is going to continue until at least early tomorrow morning. I think we start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel uh, as a nation through the mid-Atlantic by tomorrow afternoon. But still, until then, not only is it the core of the storm, it's wide-reaching problems that go through southern Georgia into South Carolina, into southern North Carolina of heavy rainfall and tornadoes that are spinning up on those outer bands. But our main concern, at least moving forward now, the most widespread concern is going to be that major flooding, as we can see anywhere from 5 to 10, perhaps even up to a foot of rain uh, all the way along the eastern seaboard until this finally moves out to sea. Diane? All right, meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, thank you. And Hurricane Adalia is already causing dangerous conditions further inland. ABC's Maria Villarreal is in Gainesville for us. Maria, what's the latest? Hey, you know, uh, 
uh, earlier this morning, we had a, a break from the rain, but really what we've seen overnight since about midnight here in Gainesville is a steady amount of heavy rain. Uh, and it comes, you know, with the bands coming. Basically, I'm calling this kind of a hip check for Idalia as she makes landfall or as the storm makes landfall. Uh, we've seen wind gusts up to 35 to 40 miles per hour in this area. And, you know, we were once projected to take a bigger hit here in Gainesville um, and along this region. Right now, it does look like the storm moved a little bit further north of us and is tracking pretty fast. Uh, we are still expected on the back end of this storm to receive about 75 mile per hour wind gusts at times. And so the biggest concern right now for people living in this area, local leaders, is what you're seeing right behind me, which is this big wind that starts to come through and the possibility of isolated tornadoes in this area. So as of right now, even though we're not getting the bulk of the storm, there is some major cause for concern as the uh, water continues to flow. So we're going to get some flooding and then on the back of an end of it, getting some of those possible tornadoes. Here we are. Thank you. And we will be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm. Right now, we want to take you to WFTV, our station in Orlando. Get to see the squally showers in central Florida, but dry air on the backside of this will actually begin to clear some of those out. But I just want to point out that even after Adelia passes, some of these showers will still be possible not only tomorrow, but Friday as well, as we have more moisture kind of following the whole system as it moves out over the Atlantic. Again, Adelia, a category two, uh, winds now peaking, sustained 105 miles per hour. There's Lake Park, Valdosta, I-75. If you were to say drive toward Atlanta, these would be some of the areas you would drive through. And the eye right now, again, kind of getting a core of wind and rain near the center of the eye. I'm seeing a few lightning flashes as well as this pushes into Georgia, far southern Georgia, getting some flood alerts with this as well. Uh, locally, our alerts consist of flood advisories. And one of the biggest flood concerns right now is still Osceola County. Some of these places in St. Cloud and on the south side of, say, uh, Lake Kissimmee up to six inches or more of rain. So just realize that pockets of flooding still possible with this system. Again, we're looking more at isolated flooding and not a widespread flash flooding event for now. We'll let you know if we see any additions to these flood concerns, but uh, the turnpike here all the way down into southern Osceola County toward Yeehaw Junction, uh, that's where one of these bands of rain is pushing through. Now, if you're watching us from Bay Lake, Claremont, Ferndale, this is just a typical rain band. It's gusty showery here the winds picking up this is actually in fact the same cell the same rain band that had some rotation earlier in a tornado warning as it was west of Sumter County. We're monitoring for more spin-ups. This is Mount Plymouth up toward Pine Lakes and DeBerry. And as I change modes toward velocity, I can get an idea of where these little nuggets of rotation, like there's one right there. So I'll zoom into that. This is eastern Orange County. This is a rain band. Probably our Biggest potential for any sort of tornado warnings would be right here at this moment on the east side of Orange County, Osceola County, thank you, Tom, and uh, into northern Brevard County, Titusville. So if you're along I-95, Titusville, Port St. John, Rockledge, all the way up toward Oak Hill, Scottsmore, Mims, this area. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Tom is at the helm here right now. He's pointing mm -hmm. out a few of these little nuggets. These are things that we look for as meteorologists where we can see the winds changing quickly. And that's an idea that, hey, we could have rotation. We have rotation, we could have a tornado. So we monitor those to see the trend. If the uh, rotation looks like it's growing or weakening. And with these, it can grow or, or weaken very quickly. Uh, zooming in, that, that little nugget of rotation just went right through Wedgefield, right through Christmas earlier, right over 520, right over State Road 50, and then now pushing toward uh, Mims, north of Titusville, Southmore here in northern Brevard County, this little notch of southern Volusia County as well. And uh, again, we're scanning all over, looking to see if we see any other nuggets of rotation here. And that's really the one we're watching at this point. So we'll continue with rain bands, gusty, squally showers. We're going to monitor rainfall uh, amounts to see if we see any additional flood warnings, flood advisories. We'll let you know. But right now, we'll toss it back to uh, Darlene and Martha. Darlene, you have... Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you focused on the winds here for a few minutes because I know a lot of people at home may be joining us now still wondering, well, wait, why didn't we have school today? All of our local school districts are out of school. And again, we just want to point out the winds were the primary concern for our local uh, school districts here. Yeah, they can't. I think it's the 35 mile an hour winds. You can't move school buses. There's a concern with that and obviously the tornadoes. So that's why kids are not in school, George. Yeah, and all day, too. We're not just talking about one part of the day. We're talking about morning. We're talking about the lunch hour. We're talking about afternoon. We're talking about the afternoon drive as well. So all day today, this uh, tropical storm force uh, wind will be possible even into the evening. Our tornado watch is all the way through 3 o'clock this afternoon. So even on top of the wind, these isolated little pockets of uh, spin-ups, tornadoes, will be possible as well. Uh, this That area right here, on the east side of Orange County, Osceola, that's the main area we're watching. But uh, we have this tornado watch, as we've been saying, through the afternoon, Darlene. All right. Thanks a lot, George. And we want to get back to our crew in Marion County. We now. want to go live right now to Jeff Love Coolidge, who is in Marion County at the Rainbow Springs State Park. What do you have, Jeff? Martha, you guys mentioned about all the local school districts that closed. And with these hurricanes, as you know, they're unpredictable. So you got to take precautions, you know all over Central Florida and all over the state. And that's uh, exactly what happened here in Dunellen in the Rainbow Spring State Park area. You know, they could have been majorly affected by this hurricane, but they really just got a few strong bands of rain since uh, about 6.30 this morning, and that was about it. We're still experiencing some uh, heavy winds right now, not too heavy, probably about 10, 15 miles an hour. Uh, nothing that they're getting on in the Big Bend area where the hurricane went through. Uh, as far as rain right now, we have seen just some little minor rain bands come through here. Nothing major at all. Nothing uh, causing no problems here. But uh, Rainbow State Spring State Park is closed today uh, because of the storms. Uh, uh, lots of places here in this area in Marion County were closed today. We did see some businesses that were open in downtown Dunellen. Uh, but uh, other than that, you can see traffic is flowing. There's several people out on the roads here uh, driving uh, down here heading towards Dunellen. But for the most part, it's pretty... Uh, it's been pretty good. They got lucky here in this area, and because they're so close to that Big Bend area where the storm hit, it could have been a lot worse. But that's the latest here in Dunellen. I'm Jeff Left Coolidge. We'll send it back to you in the studio. All right, Jeff, thanks so much. That is good news. I yeah. Mean, we, we, we dodged one here, and, and it's nice to see that uh, things will be getting back to normal mm -hmm. up there in Marion County soon. We want to get to a crew we have in the Lake City area. That's in Columbia County. That is just west of Jacksonville and northwest of Gainesville. Right now, significant power outages in that county. And we want to go right, live right now to Action News Jacks reporter Robert Grant. And you have an update on the conditions there, Robert. Yeah, we actually just got 75% of the county right now here in Columbia out of power. That's because of the strong winds that we've seen here, as probably you guys are dealing with as well. It's those inland areas that were really the concern, exactly what we're seeing here in downtown Lake City, where I am right now. You can see behind me at the square some small debris as a result of some of those bands of wind that moved through. The rain really is not as much of an issue right now. It's an, a wind event, really. And we've seen 50 to 60 mile per hour gusts moving through. And you can see on some of the businesses on the side, for example, that sign right up top, you can see the wind just took half of it right off there. Now, power outages, as I mentioned, a big concern. There's a lot of trees here in Columbia County. County. It's a very rural area. They've got a staging area at the fairgrounds for Columbia County, which is often a staging area. They got utility crews there. Governor Ron DeSantis was in town just yesterday talking about nearly 40,000 linemen from as far away as Nebraska here on standby all across the state for those who might lose power as a result of the wind. Some of those tree limbs and branches coming down and possibly even trees, depending on how strong those gusts can get. But as you can see in the trees here behind me, that does move through every so often. It gets a little bit stronger here here in Lake City, which is exactly what we've seen. The good news, the worst of it for us here in Lake City, it seems to have moved through. Now it's headed up towards Georgia, Valdosta area. But something, of course, we're continuing to monitor here for Action News Jackson, doing the same for you all at WFTV. Uh, so I'm sending it back to you guys in the studio in Orlando.
Robert Grant, thanks so much from the perspective that's happening there right now. Yeah, and he mentioned the power outages. We've been tracking those here, and I know you mentioned a short time ago we had 264,000 statewide. It's now up to 268,000 statewide without power. And so. we know that our Nick Pampantonis has been uh, hunkered down with the crew in Sumter County as they're in a fleet, a team of line workers, men and women here coming from all over the country to help us out to get the power back on. And once things calm down, the winds aren't as high. That's where they're going to be sending out the crews to get the power back on. Well, we're going to continue to cover Idalia. Stay with us. We'll be back right after this break. Pick your price. Pick your payment. One. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting when the nurse is on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. The story is we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy there's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Uh, Idalia has already made landfall. If for those of you just joining us, I'm Darlene Jones. And I'm Martha Sagowski. We are continuing to monitor the situation happening across our state where tens of thousands of people at this hour are now without uh, power. And we're going to check in right now on Lake County where our Sam Martello is live in Mount Dora. And Sam, you caught up with some utility workers. In fact, we see a crew behind you. Yeah, they're working right now. We're in a neighborhood off of 441 and Saddler Road in Mount Dora. And this morning there was about 2,500 uh, customers without power. That's down to just 100 now. And if you take a look here behind me, there is a crew here who has been working on the power in this area. Now, he has this pole that he's been putting something on top of that you're probably going to see him do here in a second. And we, while we've been watching them do this, they're having to fight the wind and the rain that we've been seeing since we've been on this road. We are getting strong gusts of wind, and the rain was really coming down moments ago, and these poles are probably 30 or 40 feet up. So they're having to fight those conditions while trying to get these these items back onto these poles to get the power back on for everyone. Now, there was a crew on the other end of the road who actually got their tower up. Someone was in the bucket fixing those lines when the rain was really coming down. The wind was really whipping. And again, they're probably 30 or 40 feet up. So you can see him using that pole now to get those items back on to get the lights back on for people in this area. So like I mentioned a bit earlier, there was about 2,500 outages in Lake County. Not That's very small compared to what other people across the state are dealing with. And now it's just a bit over 100 customers without power. So those are the people we got to be thanking today. We'll head back to you all in the studio. Sam, thanks so much. And again, the good news for our area, uh, Darlene, is that we, we mentioned, you know, the power outages for us are typical uh, yeah. for this time of year. So we all should be thankful for that. And the crews that are here from all over the country helping to get the power back on where you live, 
or throughout our state. Yeah, we do have significant power outages uh, to the north of mm -hmm. us, but just a few hundred here uh, locally. Uh, we want to get you back over to Certified Chief Meteorologist Tom Terry, and I'm checking around. George Waldensberger <laughs> uh, there. Uh, He's having some breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With an update for us. All right, thanks a lot, guys. It's a kind of a damp day. We've had uh, some moderate rain in downtown Orlando. We did not get any hurricane issues here, as expected. It was more of a tropical storm advisories for a lot of us. And winds still out of the south at 22. And we're still keeping an eye not only on Adalia, but I just thought I'd show you the big map here to mm -hmm. <laughs> widen things out. Franklin is still pulling away. We've been watching the swells along the coast. And this is the remnants of GERD. It still shows up on my map wow. here. This has not redeveloped. My name is Lisa. Tiffany. Rita. Leslie. I am I'm a mother. mother. My son was shot dead. My partner abducted our son. This is the last chance to get my kids back. I had to live a double life to save my son. And this is, is my, my story. story. They are taking your children away. And that's when all hell breaks loose. I wanted him to know you messed with the wrong mother. Mother Undercover. Now streaming only on Hulu. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did you do then? If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Friday, the David Muir two-hour 2020 event at 9, 8 central on ABC. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with ABC News Live. Let's get right to our top story this morning, Hurricane Idalia. The storm made landfall in a region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm this strong since 1896. Idalia came ashore around 7.45 this morning as a Category 3 hurricane after reaching a Category 4 overnight. The storm has now been downgraded to a Cat 2 as it moves over land, unleashing catastrophic and life-threatening wind and storm surge. Idalia is also sparking tornado warnings throughout Central and North Florida. Power outages are now being reported across the state from the Gulf to the East Coast, leaving hundreds of thousands without power. And now Georgia's reporting damaging winds as the storm center approaches that state. Tens of thousands are already without power there. I want to go straight to meteorologist Greg Dutra with the latest. Greg, what's the update? Uh, this thing is moving along at least 20 miles per hour. And we were looking at this. It may even be closer to moving at 25 miles per hour. The center of it's likely to be in Georgia by lunchtime here. It is trucking inland. Now, that's doing a couple of things. One is it's easing a bit of the flash flooding concerns along the immediate coast because it's moving out of the area quickly. But two, the other side of that coin is that it's also keeping a lot of its strength at category two as it moves more inland because it's moving so fast. Flash flood warnings, they keep on popping up here. We started in Florida, and now they're starting to get issued into southern Georgia, almost into the uh, center third or so of the state. These will go until about one, two o'clock in the afternoon, two to four inches in that red area. That's for Brooks County, for Madison County, Jefferson County, and Lotus County, too, as you head into central and southern Georgia. The storm surge, 12 to 16 feet. We've seen at least 9 or 10 feet of that realized, but the tide continues to come in, and that's going to go up 
until about 2 o'clock this afternoon. That's when high tide hits, and it's an astronomical high tide, too, one of the highest highest tides rather of the entire year. All right, on this map, I've got the track and then I've also got the future cast for rainfall. I want you to notice something. The track is something you can't really get caught up in here because a lot of the heavy rain actually occurs on the northern side of that official National Hurricane Center uh, track. Charleston also seeing winds piling in line. You see those streamlines there. Charleston is an extremely flood prone city. Two inches of rain, flash flooding downtown. Well, this could get four or six inches of rain along with that water getting pushed along the Atlantic coast. And it continues to move until early tomorrow morning up the coastline, bringing with it not only the flash flooding concerns, but also those spin up tornadoes. Already have seen tornado warnings in Georgia. I expect that spin up tornadic threat to continue all the way up the coast and possibly into Thursday afternoon when this finally moves out back to sea. And when it does so, it brings flash flooding and even just general flooding along with it, as you'll see anywhere from five to possibly 10 plus inches of rain. We're definitely shifting our focus now away from the immediate coast of Florida where they're getting into cleanup mode over the next couple of hours and watching this track farther inland. Diane. All right, ABC News meteorologist Greg, Greg Dutra, thank you. I want to bring in ABC's Victor Okendo there in Tallahassee. Victor, this was expected to be one of the hardest hit areas, but you say Tallahassee dodged a bullet, why? So Diane, it has been raining relentlessly all morning long. The wind has also been pretty strong, although it looks like we're getting a little bit of a break from it right now. The huge concerns here, what everyone was watching so closely, the winds, and here's why. Just take a look behind me. Tallahassee, the capital city, it is covered in trees. Now, with Idalia coming through with near hurricane force winds, as we've been seeing, toppling, you know, topping about 70 miles per hour, they were going to have quite a fight on their hands as we get another uh, strong band coming through here right now. Uh, these trees, with those winds, could have been knocked down. They're not like palm trees that bend a little bit. No, these break. And with that, they knock out power lines. And that's what we're seeing right now here throughout Leon County, the Tallahassee area. More than 50,000 customers here already without power near us. Statewide, that number is much higher. More than 285,000 here are without power. But Diane, I'm saying that they've dodged the bullet here because there was that one final little jog to the east. Clearly looks like they, they, you know, miss what could have been a much stronger storm for this area. Diane? We'll take the good news where we can find it. ABC News' Victor Kendo in Tallahassee. Thanks, Victor. And our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, is in Treasure Island, Florida. Ginger, what's it like there right now? Diane, it has been a long eight hours or so here in Treasure Island where we saw the water come up even higher than it is now with that push of the initial winds on shore. Even though we were staying, you know, 100 plus miles away from the center of that landfalling hurricane, the coastal flooding is and will be an issue through this afternoon because we've got another high tide and still got this onshore flow. So let's talk about what we're seeing from our drone. Our drone shows these really susceptible barrier islands, exactly what we were warning about yesterday, uh, that, that they have breaches, you know, and the erosion has been an issue for years. I've told stories here about it. And you can see why the ocean was so easily allowed onto this main drag all the way down to St. Pete up to Madeira. Tampa Bay always has flooding issues, but look at I-275, impassable there uh, on the right side. So we're going to see that type of action, those white caps on what is usually a very calm Tampa Bay as we go through uh, much of the afternoon again. You don't want to get out and drive if you don't have to around here. And then we got to talk about the wind because the high wind warnings at one point went all the way to the Georgia state line. And as this thing cruises over Georgia and South Carolina today, it will have the constitution of a hurricane likely all the way to Hilton Head. They've got a hurricane warning in place. So keep in mind, you can see trees down and power line down even if you're way far away from the coastal Florida. Uh, so we will be updating here uh, and probably staying around here because a lot of the uh, bridges and inlets are cut off over here and staying safe as well. Thankfully, we're not going to see the life-threatening surge here, uh, but we'll get in to see that damage further north soon. Diane? All right, Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z in Treasure Island. Thanks, Ginger. And Hurricane Adalia is already causing dangerous conditions further inland as well. ABC's Maria Villarreal is in Gainville for us. Uh, Maria, what's the latest there? 
Hey, Diane, you know, it's been uh, a consistent amount of heavy rain since uh, overnight, really around midnight is when we started to see that outer band of Idalia kind of make its way inland and into the Gainesville area. Uh, you know, we talked about this earlier. It feels a little bit like Idalia gave this area a hip check uh, as she started to move up and north towards the Tallahassee area. Um, what we have been most concerned about here is obviously low lying areas that are getting a large amount of rain in a short amount of time. That is obviously going to produce a lot of flooding for us um, in this region. On top of that, we are very concerned still with the wind gusts, with the amount of wind that is on the backside of this storm. Uh, we've seen gusts overnight, 30, 40 miles an hour, um, but there was a point where they were predicting the possibility of 75 mile per hour winds just in this area alone, which could pop up tornadoes. Uh, so right now there is a tornado watch in place. It'll stick around until about 3 p.m. this afternoon. For the most part, a lot of restaurants businesses they are all shut down for the day um, and it'll stay like this including the University of Florida which is the home of the Gators uh, they will be closed as well throughout uh, the afternoon and through tomorrow pretty much Maria you were in Cedar Key Florida as residents were evacuating there I know you spoke to a business owner as well uh, what did you see there and what are they telling you now so it is a night and day situation with that area as we have been able to see and kind of keep track of uh, Cedar Key was uh, hard hit. You know, they started to get the outer bands last night and they took a, a really strong, powerful impact by by Idalia over overnight. Um, and the tough part of it is, is that they're not just getting obviously what the storm is bringing, but then they have high tide that comes in right around eight o'clock this morning. So they were seeing a large amount of water starting to go into the homes and businesses in that area. I've been able to keep in touch with uh, one of the uh, business owners. Her name is uh, Sharon Keaton. She has a business that her and her husband own, a restaurant that is right on the water. As we were with them yesterday, they basically said, uh, we're going to stay here as long as we possibly can. They were moving out big appliances. They were boarding up their windows. Um, but late last night, she sent me a text message and said, we just can't stay here any longer. We've got to get out for our own safety. So they left very late last night. They were able to keep track of their um, restaurant restaurant um, because they had security cameras that were still working until early this morning. But she basically said they could see the flood of water coming in after about midnight last night. And they are extremely concerned um, that they will have nothing to come back to. So obviously right now there are still people stranded in the Cedar Key area that chose to say and did not heed the warnings of evacuation. So we do understand that there will be rescue teams that are going to try and get to them a little bit later on this morning when it is safe for everybody to get out there and try and help these people out. Out. All right, Maria Virial in Gainesville. Maria, thank you. And Michael Bobbitt lives in Cedar Key, Florida. He joins me now on the phone. Uh, Michael, uh, thanks for coming on. You know, Cedar Key recently reported a water level of 6.8 feet above normal. So what does that look like to you? What's Cedar Key like right now? It, it looks like our entire, uh, our entire downtown uh, commercial district is underwater. Uh, we have no commercial buildings that aren't almost entirely uh, inundated, and it means uh, I'd say 50% of the houses on the island have water in them. Um, right now I'm walking in waist-deep water about a mile to try to get to my houseboat to see if it broke its mooring and is out bouncing around hurting other people's houses. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking down a, down a, a waist-deep uh, road right now. Michael, I, I hope you're doing so safely. I know you wrote out the storm in the home that you rebuilt. That home's over 100 years old. Uh, and yeah. what's the status of your home itself right now? Uh, I, by the grace of God, we dodged the bullet. It, it, it sits up high on a hill, and, uh, and the storm on the south is that it's never flooded. But the storm, it sure seemed like it was going to. Water made it into my backyard, but didn't make it up to the house. So but you're and, saying... And the water Sorry, um, Michael. I didn't mean to interrupt. You're you're saying you're you're estimating 50 percent of the houses that you can see are flooded. Uh, uh, everywhere that I've seen, yes. And I haven't been able to make some of the out make it to some of the outlying areas of the island because they're completely cut off. We're completely cut off from the mainland. Our bridges are inundated, um, so no help is coming. So the few of us have stayed behind to help. We've been checking on our neighbors and making sure everybody had what they needed, and and we think we're in in good shape here. It's going to be a a several month process to rebuild once the water goes away but I so far I don't think we've had any loss of life or any significant injury and Michael what was it like riding out this storm were you scared uh, I mean I was scared because I put my uh, my uh, heart and soul into this house 
and it seemed like it was about to float off into the Gulf of Mexico. I'm a native Floridian, so hurricanes inherently aren't, aren't a big deal to me, but this one bearing down right on us when I live so close to the ocean now, yeah, heck yeah, I was scared. And Michael, have you heard from your neighbors? How are other people there doing who rode out this storm? Uh, good. We've all been out. We're already cleaning up the streets and seeing what we can do to help. And uh, this is, this is uh, CDC is really a remarkable example of what community is supposed to be. We, we live in community with one another. Uh, we really take that seriously here, and I'm, I'm really proud of our little town. And, and, Michael, we just heard from our correspondent from Maria Real that there are people there that are believed to be stranded and will be in need of rescue. Are you worried about any of your neighbors? Uh, I'm not. Uh, we're uh, just the, the very minute we can put our boats in the water, we'll, we'll get to them before any help can make it across the bridge from the mainland. So we're, uh, we're, we're after it. We're going to take good care of them. All right, Michael, good luck to you. I hope your houseboat is still intact. And most importantly, I hope you stay safe. You're walking in waist-deep water. You said, I, I, I can't pretend that doesn't make me nervous. <laughs> you and my mother both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael, stay Have safe. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye -bye. Good luck. And Deputy Assistant Administrator at FEMA's Office Response and Recovery, Matthew Payne, is joining me now for more on this. Uh, Matthew, you just heard from that resident in Cedar Key. He says he's walking in waist-deep water right now trying to check on his boat. Uh, what happens to residents who decided to stick this out? Uh, well, but first, thank you for having me. Uh, for residents who uh, rode out the storm, it, it's very important that they stay safe. Uh, and know that even as the storm has passed, there are still many hazards uh, in the area, whether that's uh, fallen trees, down power lines, or standing water. There can be lots of hazards in those waters. Uh, so we really encourage uh, residents to heed the, the warnings uh, of their local communities and their states uh, and, and check on their neighbors when it's safe to do so. Uh, but there's a lot left in this storm. So it's important to know uh, for those in Georgia and South Carolina uh, that this is a significant storm. So uh, if they have time to complete their uh, preparedness actions, uh, do so quickly. Uh, take shelter if you're in an evacuation area. Heed the warnings of the local officials because it's a particularly dangerous storm and we want everyone to be safe. And, and I mean, we're looking at some of the images now of the water. You almost can't tell where the water is supposed to be and where you're seeing what is usually land, in some cases, roads. Uh, FEMA, I know, has personnel and resources ready to assist Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Uh, so how difficult is it to prepare for a storm that's hitting such a wide swath of land? How do you prepare for that, and what happens next? Yeah, thanks for the question. We, we have over 600 people uh, pre-positioned, ready to support in Florida, and, and also ready to support uh, in uh, Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, that includes search and rescue teams, our incident management teams. We also have commodities that are pre-positioned in the area uh, that we have uh, uh, commodity uh, distribution centers across the country, which enable us to be able to respond quickly to the needs uh, of impacted states. Uh, later today, Administrator Criswell uh, will be in Florida to uh, work directly with the governor to ensure that as uh, they have requirements, uh, we're able to meet those as soon as possible. So what's your advice to residents who are in areas that are starting to see this storm pass? Uh, as the storm passes, I think it's just critical to know uh, that, that the hazards have not uh, left. Uh, there are still many hazards from fallen trees, from down power lines, uh, standing water. You don't know what could be in those waters, so there could be hazards in the water. So it's still very important to listen to the guidance uh, of local officials uh, and, and be safe. Uh, when it's safe to do so, uh, check on your neighbors, check on, on your, your loved ones uh, to make sure that they're doing okay. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, take care of yourself, make sure that you're safe. All right, good advice. Deputy Assistant Director at FEMA's Office of Response and Recovery, Matthew Payne. Matthew, thank you. Good luck. Great, thank you. And nearly 900 flights have been canceled due to this storm. Several airports in Florida have been shut down. Trevor Alt is at New York's LaGuardia Airport with more on flight delays and cancellations ahead of the holiday weekend. Hi, Trevor.
Well, Diane, there's already been about 800 flight cancellations and counting across the country, and we know that could continue to expand with ripple effects all over America. As a lot of these cancellations so far are stemmed around the fact that airports in Florida, specifically Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, they have all completely shut down as this storm continues to move inland. Now, of course, we're all well aware this is happening as we're heading into a holiday weekend here where a lot of people are going to be traveling. TSA has said they plan on screening more than 14 million passengers in just that long Labor Day weekend. That's a 10% increase in this time last year, and they actually say that's going to punctuate what has been since Memorial Day, the busiest stretch of summer travel in history. Of course, we have a lot that we got to get through before we get to the weekend. People might be reconsidering their plans. The airlines say they're certainly monitoring this storm, and they want travelers to know about travel waivers or even just alerts. If you decide maybe it's not worth the hassle or the chaos and you want to reschedule your trip, that is usually possible. Diane. And Trevor Alt at LaGuardia Airport. Trevor, thank you. And let's get another check with meteorologist Greg Ducha. Greg, what area is feeling the brunt of the hurricane now? Diane, we're watching this unfold right in front of our eyes, so we keep on getting new information. The newest stuff that just came in was that flash flood warning that's been extended into southern portions of Georgia. While it has been upgraded to a considerable flash flooding risk, and what does that mean? Well, they've already seen four inches of rain. Now they're expected to see another one to three inches of rain, and that's through Brooklyn Brooks and Lowndes counties. Now, we've been talking a lot about sides of the hurricane, right? And you're probably saying to yourself, Greg, does it really matter what side of a hurricane you're on? This is Ian from 2002, a look over Tampa Bay. They got the reverse surge. They were on the left side of the storm, so the hurricane sucked all the water out of Tampa Bay. I've stood in almost this very spot, and this is just a completely odd sight. I mean, look at that. You can see the Gulf of Mexico right in front of you. Now I want to show you a live view of what Tampa is looking like at this time. Completely different, right? That water is coming up and over that wall from the view that you saw in that last video and the tide is still coming in, it's going to continue to rise until about 2 o'clock this afternoon. So Tampa, even though the storm passed 150 miles away, it was on the other side, the stronger side of the hurricane, and that's the difference it makes. Imagine if this passed just a little bit closer or was a little bit stronger. I don't even want to think about it. All right, so here we go, tracking this, drops to a hurricane of a category one strength, but I don't want you to focus too much on the cone. Look at the rainfall that goes outside of the cone. Augusta, Columbia, Florence, seeing inches and inches of rainfall. And I wanna note that while it's falling inland, where does that water go? Well, it has to go back to the ocean, right? So it's going to go through towns that have rivers through them, like Charleston, towns that are prone, prone rather, to flash flooding. So you've got water coming uh, down on you from the rainfall, water draining towards the ocean, and then ocean water blown up by the hurricane. Charleston's not going to get off of this uh, without seeing any sort of damage from it or any sort of results from it. And add to that also the severe weather risk, tornadoes possible all the way up through the Carolinas as we have the combination of rain and spin up tornadoes through at least the next 24 hours. Diane, there's still a lot of storm to go, including that 6 to 10 inches extending well north of where the storm is now. All right, ABC News meteorologist Greg Dutra. Thanks for that, Greg. And we'll be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm. And now we're going to take you to WFTS, our station in Tampa. Um, we do want to uh, we do want to go to Bayshore right now. Our Larissa Scott, and you know, I used to live off of Bayshore, and seeing Larissa's live pictures from Jason Richards, our photographer out there, blowing my mind. I know a lot of you guys are really astonished looking at Bayshore. Let's go out to her now because I think we're seeing some uh, high water vehicles out there. Yeah, and it's only expected to get worse, Larissa. It is, and I don't know, oh, they're out of frame now, but yes, we did just have a high water vehicle pass by us. Um, and if you check out the water levels here, it's starting to recede pretty quickly. I'd say in the past 30 minutes, it's gone down quite a bit. If you look up this way, if we can pan the camera up the side of the street a little bit, where that debris is, is how high the water was earlier. And it has receded quite a bit in the past half hour or so. But of course, Bayshore 
still very flooded. You know, we've been telling you all morning that, you know, we've had people we've talked to who've lived here for decades saying that this is some of the worst flooding that they have seen in this area. Obviously, Bayshore is prone to flooding, but many of them have not seen it get this bad. Um, some of them have seen the water levels rise this high, but haven't seen it this deep. So, of course, something that they've been keeping an eye on. We had a, a business owner come by here earlier who put sandbags up in front of his business because he said that he saw us, you know, reporting right in front of in front of his business, and he got worried when he saw how high the water levels were. Um, again, you know, even though the water is starting to recede some, like we said, you can see Bayshore still clearly very flooded. It is not a safe sp space for you to drive. If you turn this way, Jason, if we can just show them, we still have um, Tampa City police here uh, keeping people from driving through because that has been an issue all morning long. We've had at least a dozen vehicles that we've seen try to come through here. A couple of them got stuck up a little farther up Bayshore. A couple of people we had to stop ourselves um, fr from driving through. Some of them said they would have driven had we not stopped them because they just didn't realize how deep the water was. Um, you can see here we got ton of debris coming up all this stuff that was washed up from the bay um, we've been having you know waves from the bay crash over the seawall onto Bayshore all morning long the bay does look like it's calming down some which you know is good news as people wait to see when we have high tide later that's what the business owner said to us when he stopped by here he said you know the water might recede some but we're worried about what's going to happen in a couple hours from now so of course they want to protect their homes you know, we had some people who had to evacuate their homes last night. This, of course, evacuation zone A for obvious reasons. You know, Bayshore, so prone to flooding. They told us, you know, they're hoping that they don't have flooding in their homes and they'll be watching that closely. We've had lots of people come out here today thanking us for, for our reporting and, you know, hoping that we continue to keep an eye on it. And, of course, we will do that. That's it here. The latest from Bayshore. We'll continue to report back to you guys. Larissa, you've been doing a great job out there. I know that's a long morning standing out there on Bayshore. So we've seen the video and we've shown you the video of the major flooding as the storm has moved past and now all of the rescue efforts are underway. Yeah, Jada Williams is in Tarpon Springs and she's been following the National Guard through flooded neighborhoods. You're actually with the National Guard right now on one of their high water vehicles. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm actually on the truck right now. Now this can go through up to 30 inches of water and we are coming through these neighborhoods here in Tarpon Springs. And while there's no flooding right now, that doesn't mean that they aren't going through these areas where a regular car wouldn't be able to make it through this road. Now there is a very brave crew on here with me right now. Their job is to make sure that anyone who is here past this impassable water is safe. This is the second time that this particular truck has come back here on this road. Um, they're out making sure that everyone that is here in this community is going to be safe as possible. Now, the truck is stopping right now, so guys, let me know if you need me to get out of the way for you so that you get off. Um, but again, we're in these neighborhoods right here. We're right on the water, and as you can see, these are some of the manufactured homes. We see that they're uh, getting off of the truck, getting prepared for this rescue. Um, it's, this is one of those important things to remember that if you don't evacuate and you say, all right, well, I'm choosing to stay. You call 911. It's not going to be all that simple for any of the first responders and those rescue crews to get to you. There is a lot of elements out here. These roads are closed. There is uh, extra equipment that has to go into making sure that these rescues happen. And this right here is just proof that is also the little technical difficulty there with yeah. the live shot but um, I mean what Jada was showing us we'll be with her and mm -hmm. maybe see some of those rescues it's what we're seeing in you know Hernando County as well and yeah a and, lot of rescues happening and I can imagine that they're probably having some Wi-Fi issues mm -hmm. um, and that's been happening throughout Pinellas County because again they are just you know dealing with the the, the power outages they're dealing with um, all of the storm damage so we're just waking up to all of it right now so uh, we want to check back in in Pinellas County uh, I know that we just were in Tarpon Springs with Jada. We're actually going to check in with uh, Keely McCormick, who is also in Tarpon Springs. Keely, are you seeing any water receding on your end? Because again, it just depends on where you are, it looks like at this point. 
Heather, we are starting to see some of that water recede. I mean, there still is a lot of flooding here, but just about an hour and a half ago, this whole area was flooded. So you just can see now that water's been pulled back out. Even right here on this part of the sidewalk too, that was a pretty high water a few hours ago. Now it's really starting to clear up over here. But as the water starts to recede, many business owners are starting to show up again to assess the damage. Many people are shocked, telling me this is the worst they've ever seen it while others say they expected this. Many of these stores here in the sponge dock area will have some water damage. The water got higher than many of the sandbags. And I peeked into one of the restaurants and saw around three feet of water in there. But I also spoke to a man. He just opened up his business in Tarpon Springs last year. He tells me luckily his shop was okay, but this storm brings a lot of concerns for business owners. Take a listen. Like we have your sound in right now. It doesn't look like we have your interview in if you want to. Oh, okay. It looks like we lost her. Yeah. Well, we didn't lose her shot, but we lost Keely, so we will get Tarpon her back. Springs, we might be having some issues in yeah, Tarpon Springs. Yeah. But now we do want to move uh, to Crystal River. Our Michael Paluska is there. It's under a mandatory evacuation order like a lot of places on the coast. Mike, I'm looking at some of the pictures you just sent into the newsroom and uh, a lot of flooding you're seeing. A lot, and Lauren, I'll just zoom in real quick. This lady, I don't know if she was checking on her boat, but she was just all the way out by that boat to the right with her neck up into the water. That is where the sidewalk is. Uh, and you know, the photos that we were showing you earlier, we've been going up and down this area. We were able to walk this for a couple of hours, um, you know, all morning. And then for the past, well, as, as soon as the, the hurricane made landfall, all of this water rushed in. There were some fence posts that you could see that were, were popping up uh, and all of those are gone. We're supposed to get that seven to 11 feet of storm surge. I don't know what we're at now, but I do know so many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did she do next? If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Friday, the David Muir two hour 2020 event at 9 8 Central on ABC. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and Shine! Rise and Shine! So, could we be coming to your hometown? When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Thanks for streaming ABC News Live. Let's get right to our top story this morning. Hurricane Idalia has made landfall in a region of Florida that's never been hit by a storm this strong in recorded history. We're learning of at least one death so far. Idalia came ashore around 745 this morning as a Category 3 hurricane after hitting Category 4 strength overnight. Now the storm's been downgraded to a Cat 1 as it moves over land, unleashing a catastrophic and life-threatening storm surge. Idalia is also sparking tornado warnings throughout central and north Florida and Georgia as it moves northeast. 
Hundreds of thousands are already without power. And I want to bring in meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, the storm is now down to a Category 1. Walk us through what that means for those in it. Oh, so the recent downgrade, of course, as this moves inland, it's lost the support of the really warm, almost bathwater temperatures across the Gulf of Mexico. But even at this hour, and even as it is a Category 1 crossing now into southern Georgia, we still see considerable problems from not only extreme wind, but also flash flooding. A new bunch of counties, new crop of counties has been added to the northern extent of that. Adele, one of the cities that's in there, Brooks County, Lodkin County as well. And there are going to be spots that see an additional, after seeing four or five inches of rain, an additional three or four inches of rain on top of that. Storm surge along the coast up to 11 feet here. That has been updated too, dropped just a little bit as the storm continues to move north at about 20 miles per hour. So it is cooking along. We're going to drop those even as the tide continues to come in, that water. Um, uh, is going to continue to rise. Now, as it moves up the coast, I want you to pay attention to these winds that are blowing uh, against cities like Charleston and Savannah and Myrtle Beach. That's going to blow in water. It's going to bring in, at, in general about two to five on the lowest end feet of storm surge and then you have the rain falling a little bit inland but it has to drain towards the coast that's going to cause some flooding concerns along as we head into late tonight early tomorrow morning along with the chance of storms to become severe any thunderstorm in any band of Idalia as it moves inland has the potential to be not only a severe thunderstorm but maybe even produce a spin-up tornado we've already seen tornado warnings in southern Georgia early this morning but the biggest threat for the widest portion of people will be major flooding as that continues to track inland and drops about six to 10 inches of rain. Diane, we are definitely transitioning now to more of a flooding risk from this as it makes its way inland and the winds at least start to relax. So I don't want to get laser focused on the category. It's still very important, but now it's definitely becoming a flooding threat. Yeah, still dangerous. Meteorologist right. Greg Dutra, thank you. No problem. And Hurricane Idalia is now causing dangerous conditions further inland. As Greg mentioned, ABC's Maria Virial is in Gainesville for us. Maria, what's the latest in that area? Hey, Diane, you know, we've had a good amount of rain that uh, started up right just past midnight here in the Gainesville area and has kept pretty consistent uh, throughout the morning hours. It is slowly tapering off, but you can see right now what we're going to probably deal with m most of the rest of the day is going to be this wind. Uh, overnight, we saw wind gusts between 30 and 40 miles per hour, which is pretty big here for this area. Um, but on top of that, there were predictions that we would see up to 70 miles per hour, which is why there was such a big concern that there could be tornadoes on the backside of Idalia as she was making her way onto land. Uh, right now, we've been able to also just kind of take a look around this area, um, around Gainesville. Uh, most of the restaurants, most of the major grocery stores are closed for the day. Uh, a lot of that has to do with um, the consistent rain bringing a lot of potential for flooding. Um, and, and people do not need to be driving outside in, in those kinds of conditions. And so um, right now, this is kind of the, the conditions that we're dealing with. All right, Maria Virial in Gainesville, Florida for us. Thanks, Maria. And ABC's Victor Kendo joins me now from Tallahassee. Victor, Tallahassee at one point was expected to be one of the hardest hit areas. You say the area dodged a bullet, but that there are still concerns. What's happening now? Hey, Diane, so we are in downtown Tallahassee, and in speaking with residents and officials, they all told me the same thing, that they were expecting to lose power, and here's why. Just take a look behind me. Tallahassee is covered in these trees and with strong enough winds like from Hurricane Adalia can bring some of these trees down and knock out power with it. So here we are after this relentless rain and winds all morning long. Leon County, the Tallahassee area, about 50,000 customers are without power right now. That's more than any other county in the state of Florida. And statewide in Florida, about 265,000 customers are without power. The locals here, I've covered storms before. They told me before Adalia that really doesn't take much to knock out power here, but from officials, they say that they feel confident in the resources they had in place before Adalia came through from crews to clear the debris because the roads, they are going to be a mess today. There are down trees that they've had to clear already. They have uh, teams ready to restore power on top of ambulances and search and rescue crews as well. So they felt confident about their plan. Here we are now, Diane. Uh, the rain, it's still coming down. We're still feeling a few strong wind gusts, but I'd say for the most part here, dodged a bullet. Send it back to you. All right, we'll take it. Victor Kendo in Tallahassee. Thanks, Victor. And let's check in with Eric Waxler in Pasco County, Florida, just north of Tampa. Eric, what are you seeing?
Now that the sun is up, we're getting a better look at the flooding caused by the storm surge that started last night. This is Port Ritchie, where we are just uh, off of US 19, and you can see uh, this intersection near some waterfront restaurants underwater. In fact, I see a guy over there trying to walk through it, which is probably not ideal. Uh, the police tell me in this area there are certain neighborhoods where people of are in need of evacuation, that they are trapped in their homes because of the rising waters, and they are taking efforts to uh, help those people out. We actually just saw a guy bring his jet ski over here a little while ago, offering uh, his volunteer efforts to help as well. Uh, this is a, a Nick's Park. You see it's completely uh, underwater, the parking lot. This is a popular spot where people launch their boats. But uh, the storm surge started about midnight coming over the seawall and it has continued to rise. And there is a lot of concern about what's going to happen later today when high tide comes again at about 1230 this afternoon. That's it from Port Ritchie in Pasco County. I'm Eric Waxler reporting. All right, Eric, thank you. And the Director of Emergency Management for Pasco County, Andy Fossa, joins me now. Andy, thank you. I know you're busy. Uh, Florida Highway Patrol is now reporting at least one death in Pasco County, a driver who lost control and crashed into a tree. What's your message to those who aren't heeding those warnings to stay home, to stay inside? So we've been publicly messaging this warning out since early yesterday afternoon, and we're still trying to message it. Um, don't go out traveling around. Don't go out looking, sightseeing. Uh, stay at home. If you're able to stay in your house, stay in your house at this time. The storm has passed. We were very lucky, as it's been said. We did dodge a bullet once again. Um, but however... We're not done with this storm yet. We still have a, another storm surge coming into play today about 12, 31 o'clock. So if you can stay home, stay home. If you're trapped in your home and you need to be removed, dial 911. We have crews out with high water vehicles, boats, um, so on and so forth, removing residents from their homes. We have the National Guard involved. We have fire rescue involved. We have law enforcement involved. Um, by all means, do not go up into your attic. Do not go up on top of your roof. It's only going to make rescues harder. If you can make it out your front door, stand there and we will come get you. But please do not go out wandering. Stay home if possible. And I want to pick up a little bit more on something you said. For many, they may go outside and think the threat has passed. But you're saying even in areas where the storms pass, there can be more surge coming. Can you explain that? Yes, so we had two surges. We had one last night that started out about midnight. Um, and with the winds and the way they were sustained, the water never receded. So even though we were in a low tide this morning, we had four foot of water in, in, in areas of the county on the coast. Now this afternoon, we're getting another high tide, which is projected to bring an additional two feet of water into the county. So it's still not safe. We're going to see more water. If you still have time to evacuate, please leave your homes. We have shelters open. They've been publicly messaged. They're all on the west side of the county. They're more than willing to take you in until this whole event subsides. All right, Andy Fossa with FEMA. Andy, thank you. And let's go back uh, to meteorologist Greg Dutra. Uh, Greg, this storm is moving really fast. Is that just a, an impression or is that what you're seeing on the radar as well? Definitely seeing on the radar for sure. About 20 or so miles per hour. That is a faster forward speed than anticipated, which is both good and bad. Uh, of course, good because it'll get the rain out earlier. Bad because folks who are just finishing up preps are now pushed to finish them up even more quickly. We've also just received a flash flood warning, now upgraded to a flash flood uh, emergency for Londis County. We were talking about this earlier. Valdosta is there. Also, Moody Air Force Base is there, too. They've already seen three to six inches of rain, and they expect to see another couple inches of rain before things start to let up. And that's not counting these outer bands that have to move through a little bit later. So watching that very closely, downgraded to a Category 1, yes. But we've been talking about this for the better part of the days, even before it made landfall. Even though the category is going to drop, the, threading, uh, the flooding risk, rather, is still not going to go away. There's a lot of rain, a lot of moisture, a lot of energy still packed up with this system. And when the winds are moving onshore, even later uh, on our Wednesday night and into our Thursday morning, we're going to see some two to five feet 
of storm surge on the Atlantic coast. Now, not just the Gulf Coast. So there it goes, continuing as a Category 1 through the rest of today into tonight. By about dinner time tonight, you'll be seeing some pretty frequent thunderstorms through Charleston. Remember, the storm surge is also coming up at that point, too. It continues late tonight, early tomorrow morning into Myrtle Beach. Then it makes its way uh, up into North Carolina, continuing with heavy rainfall. And also, look at these winds. I mean, they're not light. They're 35, 40, 45 miles per hour for a long period of time, and that could possibly take down trees and also take out additional power. So watching a couple of facets here, the main one that's unfolding now is the major flooding. Already seeing it through the panhandle of Florida into southern Georgia. This will continue. Make no mistake about it. Even though the winds drop and the categories drop, it will continue tonight and into early tomorrow where they could see 6 to 10 inches of rain, and we've already seen flash flooding emergencies because of 6 inches of rainfall. Diane, would not be surprised if that goes all the way through today and into tonight. Wow, and, and Greg, we just got a new update. We're hearing over 300,000 people are now without power. Looking yeah. at what's ahead for the storm, do you expect that to increase? I do, especially as it moves more north and into more wooded areas where you'll see above ground lines taken down. And when you start stressing the grid like that, uh, you get cascading failures because they're trying to reroute power to different spots and it becomes more of a logistical problem than a meteorological problem. So I wouldn't be surprised if we do see those numbers go up uh, through the next couple of hours, if not even into early tomorrow morning. All right, meteorologist Greg Dutra. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. And we will be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm. We're going to take you now to WFTS, our station in Tampa. I was on earlier, if you were watching, it's able to drive through up to 30 inches of water. So what's really important is that it was able to pick up those first responders, those firefighters, bring them back here to be able to put out this fire. Now, as I mentioned, they are just a little bit down the road. They're still in. With James Tully, who is on Clearwater Beach. Now, uh, something that is interesting is I was just looking at the radar. It does look like maybe some bands are about to come through or have come through. Uh, you're seeing some clouds out there, uh, and I know that that high tide was supposed to happen around 11.15. 11.15. Is, 11.15. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah, Heather, uh, that's right. We are approaching high tide. The good news is the water's receding on both the beach side and right here next to Clearwater Bay. Let's give you a look at what things um well, what, we, what we're seeing right now, if you've been watching our coverage, uh, we've been with you about every hour. Last time we looked at the street, it was completely flooded, so you see it's improving quite a bit. I'd even call it passable at this point. The sun's peeking through right now. That can hurt things. I'm also noticing wind direction probably helping matters, too. You see the water still cresting over the seawall there, uh, but it's pulling back quite a bit. And, you know, with high tide right around the corner here, that's certainly a good sign. Uh, you know, talking to Clearwater Police, a lot of good stuff coming from them. They've had to make no rescues. They feel like a lot of people uh, follow the evacuation orders. And that's a good thing. I mean, we saw over six feet of storm surge come through this area you know, over overnight. And uh, the sheriff, uh, Pinellas County Sheriff, even warning us that the worst may be yet to come. I can't speak for too many other parts of Clearwater Beach besides where we are here on Hamden Street uh, by 3rd Street and also Coronado, which runs parallel to it. Uh, things are pretty bad there, but they're improving quite a bit. Um, and police uh, also telling me that for the most part, this was one of the worst areas in Clearwater. So it's certainly good to know. But still, folks, beach access is uh, restricted until further notice. So don't try and go to the beach. And uh, you just kind of have to sit tight. Uh, the sheriff saying, for the most part, he thinks it's going to be three or four hours after a high tide. So that's set for 11 o'clock, 11.15 in that area. So it's going to be some time here until these most of these streets are passable. But for now, I, I got some good news to tell you, Heather. I mean, this is a, a big improvement and at a time when we, we really wanted to see it. I'll send it back to you. All right. Thanks, James. And we'll be watching Clearwater Beach very closely because mm -hmm. of that high tide time. And very important to note, you still cannot get on the beach. So don't try to do that. Honestly, it's probably going to be several more hours. We'll, of course, keep you updated when that reopens. Absolutely. We're going to get over now to Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. uh, we were checking with Anthony Hill just a little bit ago. He's been driving around. He has seen some flooding, other areas that aren't flooded. But now he is actually on Indian Rocks Beach. Anthony, what are you seeing out there? 
or what's left of Indian Rocks Beach. I mean, if you can call it that. And the reason why I say that is because, as you can see, the water literally comes up. We're at the entrance of the beach. The water has literally risen to the point where it comes up to the entrance of the beach. Yesterday, when we were here, there was some distance between where we are right now and where the water started. I also want to point you guys um, to your attention, the damage that we see. I mean, there's a bench here. How did this get here? We're not, where it came from, we're not sure, but this bench literally got picked up and moved across the beach. There's also another, well, we can talk about this first, but we talked about that. Um, this is the level to where the water got to. So, I mean, we have reason to believe that maybe the water is receding uh, because the water came all the way to where this bridge is. I do want to show you guys the last bench, though, because I think this is pretty impressive. The bench over there that is literally submerged in the water. How did that happen? Who knows? It's the fault of the hurricane. But I mean, it kind of is a testament of the power of Mother Nature. Um, we're going to continue to look around again, as I said before, survey the damage. And when we have more information, we'll jump right back on the air and report about it. I'll send it back to you guys. All right. Thank you, Anthony. And we do want to pass along a quick update from St. Pete that we just got in. It's an 11 a.m. update from the city. Um, the Howard Franklin and Skyway bridges are still closed. However, the Gandhi is open, but the beaches are closed. Snell Isle Bridge and 40th Ave Bridge are also closed. And as of right now, they've seen four to five feet of storm surge around St. Pete. And we also have an uh, update from Citrus uh, County. School will be closed tomorrow, Thursday, August 31st. We want to make sure uh, that we relay that message. We also have have a um, picture here of the Rivergate Tower. You can see again that band of rain and storms coming through. I was just looking at the radar. Shea had pulled it up and uh, it does look like we are about to see some storms roll through. Again, um, it is just a band and this is something we've been seeing basically throughout the morning as this storm has uh, made its way out. And I mean Rivergate Tower Camp Tampa does not look too friendly right now. So again, this is just another reason why if you can and you really should be able to at this point because everything is closed, just stay inside because even if you go out wandering, you're going to get hit with some rain at some point. And um, we do want to bring in meteorologist Shay Ryan in a moment because, you know, the storm may have moved past us, but we're still getting those outer bands. We're still getting a little bit of rain in some places. We've seen it in some of our reporters' live shots. Um, and, of course, we're still watching those the next tide for that water to, unfortunately, probably surge in. Yeah, and Shay, I mean, the interesting thing is to see, you know, James, um, who his high tide was supposed to happen um, right now, yeah. and he's seeing the the water recede, but then, you know, we saw Katie Legrone mm -hmm. up in Hernando Beach, and right. um, that water is not receding at all. In fact, they're seeing quite the opposite. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of variation up and down the coastline. We've got about two to three hours between tides of when you move up and down the coast and you go around the bay, so there's a lot of variation, and uh, of course, there's also a lot of variation in how that water is going to move around different depths. And uh, so again, we've got that stronger west flow. The center of the system is well to the north and inland, so we're no longer getting the push of the storm. We're really looking at high tide in addition to a strong west wind pushing that water against our coastline. So again, it will be enhanced as we're coming up to those high tides, which are going to occur over the next couple of hours. We have some that are as late as about two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so as we're approaching that, and we're watching those uh, tides starting to come up. Uh, just naturally, what we'll also be looking for is to see if there will be any additional uh, push from this westerly flow. And you can see how uh, fast these storms and uh, the rainfall is moving uh, behind this system, or I should say on the south side of Adelia now. And it's just rushing through, but we've got a lot of breaks in those rain bands. We're not really seeing any thunderstorms at this point, uh, but we still will have a chance for that as the sunshine comes through. That'll help to just uh, add a little energy and we could see more thunderstorms as we get into the afternoon and get a little more daytime heating in there. But at this point, we do have very heavy pockets of rain uh, right around Riverview just to the south and then across uh, the Waimama area uh, down 75. That's where we're getting some heavy rain still in northern uh, Pinellas County around Tarpon Springs and then extending back uh, toward the northern section of Clearwater Beach. The rest of Clearwater Beach is looking pretty dry and then you head uh, down the coast and you see a little more just light to moderate rain. So again, we've got a lot of variation in uh, dry spots to really heavy rain across the area and 
we'll continue to see this uh, throughout the rest of the day with that uh, onshore flow allowing more of that Gulf moisture to just move inland and give us those hit or miss uh, batches of rain all throughout the day. So the varying amounts of coverage are going to be anywhere around 40 to 50 percent uh, all the way through the day and even into tonight we'll still have chances for rain with the winds uh, being fairly strong. The gusts are going to really taper off later this afternoon. I'd say anytime after about three, four o'clock, we'll start to notice that the winds are dying down and we're not getting those gusts into the 30 and 40 mile per hour range, but it still may be a little breezy out there and we may have some uh, breezes tomorrow as well. Right now, the sustained winds have come down to about 15 to 25 miles per hour. So again, it's still an onshore flow, which is helping to push that water from the Gulf of Mexico against our coastline, not nearly to the extreme uh, that we had earlier when the storm was moving along the coast and that low pressure was helping to push the water. But again, it is still uh, somewhat of, a, uh, of an influence on our tides for sure. 84 mile per hour uh, wind gusts now reported in Tallahassee. 47 in uh, Gainesville and you can also see how the wind direction is opposite so that is where the, we know the storm the center of the storm is going right in between those two cities when you see the wind direction uh, going uh, in different directions in between two areas uh, right here in Tampa of course we've got that southwesterly to westerly flow 44 mile per hour maximum uh, gust here in the last ha half hour as well and then we've got wind gusts also in the upper 40s around Jacksonville and we'll continue to see those gusty winds as uh, the storm continues to make its way into uh, through Georgia and into the South Carolina coast here uh, through the next several hours and uh, then off into the Atlantic by tomorrow. Uh, the current wind gusts across the area are looking actually a little improved from the last time uh, we looked. Most of the 40s are still are to the north now around I-4 or to the north. So uh, we're seeing a little less of that, although Mayaka City now 43 mile per hour gusts as well as Arcadia. Uh, but we'll continue to watch those wind gusts come down as we move through the afternoon and into the early evening. We're looking at wind speeds that are going to come down around 10 to 15 miles per hour. So really very reasonable at that point and certainly nothing that would be uh, damaging. But our chance for showers and storms continues right past sunset and even uh, past 10, 11 o'clock tonight. Uh, we will see more sunshine and lower coverage of rain over the next several days. So we will have some improving weather there. But uh, Again, we are looking much better now and we'll continue to at least see uh, some improving weather here over the next several hours. But we're watching for those high tides, of course. That's the last of our concerns. Lauren? All right, thank you, Shay. We want to move back now to Pinellas County. And again, we're closely watching that storm surge and that second tide. Yeah, ABC Action News reporter Keely McCormick is in Tarpon Springs. She has been there all morning long. And Ke Keely, you are seeing some of the water recede, although there is still a concern for flooding. And a lot of folks um, that own businesses businesses down there have not yet been able to get to their businesses because of that flooding. Heather, that's right, and the street is still very much flooded, but it's a big difference from even just an hour ago that we're seeing right now. You can differentiate the sidewalk between the roadway now, which is a big difference. We've been here since about 1.30 this morning. When we first showed up, it looked dry for the most part. And then throughout the day, we really saw a lot of flooding. And it's good to kind of see that pushing back now. But people are showing up, still trying to see their businesses and see the damage that's inside. Some tell me they expected bad flooding. Others were pretty surprised to see how bad it got earlier today. But many of the stores in the sponge dock area will have some water damage. The water got higher than many sandbags. And it I did peek into one of the restaurants today and did see a lot of water that had spilled into that front room there. I also spoke to one man who just opened up his business in Tarpon Springs last year. He tells me luckily his shop was okay, but the storm did bring in a lot of concern for business owners. Well, definitely anytime you have a storm, this is a low lying area. Uh, it's prone to flooding. Uh, we've seen worse than, than this, but this is pretty bad. 
And as more people come out to check their businesses right now, I do want to warn you to be really careful. I mean, there is still a lot of water right here. This is one of the shallower parts behind me on this corner here where there's a lot of businesses. The water is still pretty high. There's a lot of debris in the water. We've been here since really early in the morning. I've seen flower plants. I've seen signs and you really can't see all that from the top of the water. So just be really careful. Wait till the water goes down a little bit more before you get in there and check the damage and check your businesses. Reporting live in Tarpon Springs, I'm Keely McCormick, ABC Action News. Keely, thank you. Important note there that I think every official is saying, all of our reporters are saying, just don't get in the water. You do not know what could be in that water. All right, we want to go now to Bayshore Boulevard. Our Larissa Scott is there live. So Larissa, at this point, I mean, the last time we came to you, the water was receding a bit, saw a lot of debris in the area. What are you seeing right now? Well, still the same situation, Lauren. Um, the water has receded since we last talked to you. Check out this debris here. We could not stand here about two hours ago. This was all covered with water. You see all this debris coming in uh, from the bay. The bay brought all this water in. But, I mean, yeah, it's receded some. But, I mean, Bayshore Boulevard is still very flooded. Um, you know, we've been telling you that we've talked to people who've lived here for 40 years, um, and they have not seen it this bad um, in the entire time that they have have been here. Um, we still have police officers patrolling this area, keeping people out of the water. Um, we have seen some people walking through the water and it was waist deep for them, you know, obviously would not recommend that for people to do. But, um, you know, the big question now, high tide, how high will this water go? Will it will it start to go back up again? You know, that's what everyone here is watching, business owners and homeowners. You know, we've had them come out and put more sandbags out to protect their homes in case, um, you know, the water gets higher again. And the bay still it looks pretty angry out there. We're still getting some of those waves coming in over the seawall onto Bayshore Boulevard. And, you know, it is, you know, in, in many parts just completely underwater and impassable, not safe for people to drive through. So, you know, we'll, of course, continue continue to monitor the situation here. Good news is that the water is receding some, you know, but just not very quickly yet. So we'll continue to keep you updated with what's happening out here. I'm live in Bayshore. Back to you. Thank you, Larissa. Definitely not at the point where you want to drive on Bayshore. And now we want to take a live look at from the Hyatt Regency Clearwater camera. You see Clearwater is it's angry. Clearwater Beach is angry right now. You see, I mean, a lot of the white caps, high surf, really dark clouds. I think we were looking at a band maybe coming through that area. So, I mean, this is picture evidence of that. Yeah, and look how far the water the water comes up. I mean, usually Clearwater Beach is one of the beaches that has a lot of sand in the area for that folks beautiful to sand. sit. That yeah. beautiful sand, yeah, and it is just being taken over by the water right now. So, we are still seeing, uh, you know, that water again, not necessarily flooding uh, because we're checking in with James Tully right now who is on Clearwater Beach and has been there all morning and and he has been reassuring us that it looks like it is going out but we are still seeing some issues um, you know in terms of the high of the high water and we didn't see a lot of people on the beach I don't mm -hmm. think we saw anyone which was good all right James what are you seeing from your vantage point yeah good morning uh, Heather and Lauren we just want to take a look at that camera myself. Yes, yeah, the water is certainly much higher than we're used to seeing, but the key word is it's improving. Uh, and so as that improves, all the surge that we've seen, the, the six plus feet of it that at one point early this morning we saw, it, it's all improving. And as we are now past high tide, that's all just the best news we can possibly report right now. Below me, next to Clearwater Bay here, is Hamden Street. Uh, first time. We've seen somebody out here even venture out. They can actually walk across the street. This, of course, was all flooded out. Uh, the, the, the water in the in Clearwater Bay here is a very strange green color. You know, it just got churned up so much overnight. Uh, it just don't see that too often either. Like, like an aquamarine almost, uh, very unusual. Also, keep an eye on those, on those rain bands you guys had mentioned. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for streaming with ABC News Live. Let's get right to our top story this morning. Hurricane Idalia has made landfall in a region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm this strong since 1896. At least one death has already been reported. Idalia came ashore around 745 this morning as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. After reaching Category 4 strength overnight, the storm has now been downgraded to Cat 1 as it moves over land, unleashing catastrophic and life-threatening wind and storm surge. Power outages are now being reported across the state from the Gulf to the East Coast, leaving hundreds of thousands without electricity. And now Georgia is reporting damaging winds as that storm moves in. Nearly 50,000 homes there are already without power and hundreds of flights are canceled at Atlanta's Hartsfield Airport. I want to bring in our meteorologist Greg Dutra with the latest on the storm. Greg, what are you watching right now? Uh, Diane, watching those winds die down, of course, as the hurricane makes its way inland, still very strong at a Category 1 with 90 mile per hour winds. Now officially in Georgia, too, but we are transitioning, as we had always talked about, to more of a flooding risk. And there's a flash flooding emergency now out for southern Georgia. Uh, this includes Moody Air Force Base, the area around Adel, too, a uh, Ray City, Georgia, all of those underneath this flash flood warning and flash flood emergency that goes uh, until after the noontime hour. Now, this is because three to six inches of rain has already fallen. And on top of that, another one to three inches of rain will fall as this continues to track inland, losing strength category wise, but still with a full head of steam, some 20 miles per hour of forward motion, making it hold together. All that momentum keeping the storm together as it makes its way up the eastern sea through South Carolina and really prone cities are going to see up to seven feet worth of storm surge through tonight and into early tomorrow. Those prone cities that come to mind, Savannah, Charleston, Myrtle Beach, they all have winds blowing in from the hurricane and also they're going to have rainfall that falls its heaviest inland. But remember, all the water goes to the sea, right? So it has to flow through those cities while the hurricane is piling up the water against those rivers and streams that are supposed to be outlets. This goes on throughout the overnight and into early tomorrow. Again, now switching mainly to a major flooding problem with another six to 10 inches of rain on the way through the Carolinas. And we're seeing with those flash flooding emergencies, what six inches of rain over a short period of time actually does. Diane? All right, meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, thank you. And ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is making his way out of Tampa right now, heading north. Rob, what are you seeing? Hey, Diane, uh, just uh, heading, heading out of Tampa now, but significant debris, uh, parts of this causeway. Nice one coming up here. So that's, that's all from surge. That obviously you can still see uh, some of the some of the frothy water of the of the bay here coming o uh, over the causeway. But it looks like it's receded somewhat. But this is just a mess. So at least one lane here uh, not drivable, and still uh, reports of some other causeways and over and interstate lanes shut down because of debris and or or water. So it's a mess here at Tampa. Higher impact certainly than uh, Hurricane Ian brought just a year ago, and uh, officials urging people to to stay inside until it completely passes and these waters recede. So, because because it's still raining, as you can see, we still have an onshore flow, which is pushing the water up uh, towards the end of the bay. And we still have a high tide that's yet to come later on this afternoon. So uh, conditions, although the most ferocious winds have ended, um, conditions are gonna be very, very slow to improve, I think, as we go through the afternoon. Diane? All right, ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano on the road leaving Tampa, Florida. Rob, thank you. And ABC's Maria Virial is in Gainesville for us. Maria, what's the latest there? 
Hi, Diane. So right now, the bulk of what we are dealing with is the wind. Uh, we had uh, some pretty strong gusts come in overnight, 30 to 40 miles per hour, upwards of 50 miles in this region. And there was a concern that we would hit wind gusts up to 75 miles per hour. Um, so at this point, that has kind of um, slowed down just a little bit. We aren't as concerned, but uh, until this hurricane passes all the way through the state of Florida, I think that we're going to keep a lot of those tornado watches in effect for this region at least until about 3 p.m. this afternoon. Obviously, we did get a good amount of rain here uh, overnight, started up at about midnight or so, and pretty much uh, kept hitting us until about 10 o'clock this morning. Although the rain has subsided, there is still some low-lying areas that have flooding, and so uh, the biggest concern for uh, a lot of officials in places like here, like Gainesville, is um, the wind is, is slowing down, you know, the rain has stopped, and now people are going to want to venture out to see exactly Exactly what has happened to their city and a lot of those people tend to drive in these low-lying areas where there are floodwaters and you're really not sure exactly what to expect and so as of right now uh, local leaders are saying listen take a beat give us a minute to assess a lot of these roadways and if you do have to get out just be very careful um, not to go around a lot of those barriers that are probably still up um, in a lot of these coastal regions Diane all right Maria Villarreal in Gainesville Florida Maria thank you and ABC's Victor Kendo joins me now from Tallahassee. Victor, that area was a source of, of a lot of concern. What are the conditions like there now? Well, Diane, the rain, it keeps coming down. We've been following along with updates from the city of Tallahassee. They've been posting them online, now saying that they have crews actively rushing to restore power to tens of thousands of customers. That was always the concern all along in speaking with residents and officials. And just quickly, here's why they were so concerned. Tallahassee is covered with trees, trees lining the streets like right behind us here with strong enough winds like from Idalia. These trees can come crashing down, bringing power lines and power poles with it. So at last check here in Leon County, the Tallahassee area, about 50,000 customers, homes and businesses are without power right now. That's more than any other county in the state. And statewide, that number right now, it's about 275,000 without power. Locals here kind of frustrated and speaking with them before the storm hit last night telling me that it doesn't take much to lose power here in Tallahassee, uh, but officials feel confident that they had enough resources in place ahead of time. Crews ready to clear the debris and restore power should get things back to normal pretty quickly. Diane. All right, Victor Kendo in Tallahassee. Victor, thank you. And disaster preparedness expert General Russell Honore is joining me now for more on this. General, thank you for coming on. I know you were the commander of Joint Task Force Katrina. So what are you watching for with this storm? Well, the the amount of terrain, the, uh, if you take from Tampa all the way to Tallahassee and all those mandatory evacuations, that's about a 250 mile straight line distance. Uh, and all those areas that were uh, mandatory evacuated will have to be go in and be searched because not everyone evacuated. That's the norm. And that is a lot of uh, miles to be able to get into with roads closed. Uh, Sometimes it'll be accessed by air or by the sea. This is gonna be a tremendous search and rescue operation because of the long distance and then the surge water still pressing in for the next 12 hours. And there are many cities that's not flooded now that could be flooded as the day go on. So the enormity of the space we're dealing with are 250 miles. And then to track this storm across Interstate 10, it crossed out of Category 2. And now Category 1, the damage is doing in Florida, uh, in Georgia, as it cut across Georgia, uh, the damage it'll do to the electric grid and the surge water will produce up in Savannah and in Charleston, South Carolina. This is an enormous search and operation uh, once the storm uh, subsides and we get aircraft up in the air. And the upside of a fast moving storm versus a slow moving one is the areas getting hit aren't getting hit for as long. But as you mentioned, that means the storm is maintaining its strength for a longer period of time and hitting a wider area. How difficult is it to respond to an area this large, the, the amount of different 
um, different sections of not only Florida, but multiple states that are expected to now get hit with category, uh, at least category one strength winds, and, and some of them all the way up to category three. Yeah, it's going to be a, a big job. The, the good news is uh, uh, Florida is well organized, great operation centers in each one of the counties. But the difficulty is, is going to be able to get through those rural roads to make their way out to those isolated communities or come in by sea or air. And that won't happen until the winds subside. Uh, the other thing is that our National Guard in that region, Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, they all work together. And uh, if there's something going on in Florida, uh, Georgia, and the Carolinas, go help. In this case, uh, they will have to keep their guard at home for their own search and rescue. So it'll be some maneuvering you'll see with National Guard and our active duty forces coming in to assist because that search and rescue has got to be done. We ought to knock on every door from Tallahassee to uh, Tampa that was mandatory evacuated. And uh, that's going to take a lot of boots on the ground. But they're well organized. FEMA has a lot of capacity. They brought in, but this still is going to be one of the biggest and largest search and rescue we've done since we established the Department of Homeland Security. And General, we likely have not seen the worst of this storm in terms of the damage it's done because you mentioned those rural areas. There's not a lot of structure there where you can safely report from. So what are you most worried about as we start to get images in of the areas hardest hit by this storm? I'm worried about the elderly and the disabled who did not evacuate. Uh, that the uh, history show they have the highest uh, mortality rate in an event like this, as they did during Katrina. 90% uh, of those who died in Katrina, the 1800, were alone. They were elderly, and they were poor. So those isolated uh, communities where elderly people didn't get out uh, because they're not watching the news all the time, or they don't have the confidence to want to leave their home. The other thing I worry about is the recovery. You know, Florida is still recovering from Hurricane Ian, and we have people that are still trying to resolve things with her, with insurance and with FEMA, uh, and thousands of them are still uh, not in the, back in their homes. And that's been a year ago. The good news is Florida is well prepared, uh, but this is a lot of space to deal with. All right. Disaster preparedness expert General Russell Honore. We appreciate your time today, General. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. And let's get another look at that storm with meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, Ian was the last major hurricane to make landfall in Florida. How does this storm compare to that? Uh, it, it is a completely different storm for spots like Tampa that saw the opposite side of Ian move through. This is the perfect example. When Ian moved through, Tampa was on the left-hand side of the storm. They saw what's called the reverse storm surge, where all of the water was sucked out of Tampa Bay, and you're looking at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico there as all that water was pulled out, brought around the eye of the storm and pushed uh, into areas off to the south like Fort Myers. Now, this storm moved on the opposite side of that. It blew through Tampa Bay, blowing the uh, winds and water in. And as you saw that live video just a little while ago from Rob Marciano, who was on the ground there, that water was flooding the roadways. Completely different. And we're still dealing with storm surge not only along the Gulf side, but also also, now we're going to start dealing with it on the Atlantic side as winds from this hurricane will blow inland. This is a similar type setup to when Ian moved its way up the coast, bringing in heavy rainfall and storm surge through the mid-Atlantic. And that is now what we transition to. I don't want you to pay so much attention now to the cone of this. I want you to pay more attention to where the rainfall is and what those winds are because flooding rains are now a concern through Georgia into the Carolinas to all of these spots that you're the rain this is six o'clock tonight all these spots uh that rainfall is going to cause flooding problems and the winds which still as you get up to florence 
are 45 or so miles per hour. Tropical storm force winds, that's going to cause more folks than already the quarter million to have lost power to lose power through the overnight. And it could be out for the better part of a couple of days here as this makes its way off the coast as a tropical storm. So again, we are transitioning. Yes, the winds are weakening down to category one strength now, which is still very strong at 90 miles per hour. But with the rainfall, major flooding concerns that stretch from where they are now through southern Georgia into South Carolina, into North Carolina as well, through the Outer Banks, six to 10 inches of rain is on the way. And yes, that doesn't fall right over cities like Charleston, but where's that water going to try and go? It's going to try and go into the ocean, right? Well, your problem there is it's not going to drain effectively because you got the winds blowing into those inlets. So storm surge along with the inability or inefficiency for that water to drain out is going to cause huge problems and a big difference from Ian when it passed through just a while ago. Diane, it is, is definitely looking like a different storm to me. Well explained. Meteorologist Greg Dutra, thanks for that, Greg. No problem. And nearly 900 flights have been canceled due to the storm. Several airports in Florida have been shut down. Trevor Ault is at New York's LaGuardia Airport with more on the flight delays and cancellations ahead of the holiday weekend. Hi, Trevor. Well, Diane, there's already been about 800 flight cancellations and counting across the country, and we know that could continue to expand with ripple effects all over America, as a lot of these cancellations so far are stemmed around the fact that airports in Florida, specifically Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, they have all completely shut down as this storm continues to move inland. Now, of course, we're all well aware this is happening as we're heading into a holiday weekend here where a lot of people are going to be traveling. TSA has said they plan on screening more than 14 million passengers in just just that long Labor Day weekend. That's a 10% increase in this time last year, and they actually say that's going to punctuate what has been since Memorial Day, the busiest stretch of summer travel in history. Of course, we have a lot that we got to get through before we get to the weekend. People might be reconsidering their plans. The airlines say they're certainly monitoring this storm, and they want travelers to know about travel waivers or even just alerts. If you decide maybe it's not worth the hassle or the chaos and you want to reschedule your trip, that is usually possible. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at LaGuardia Airport. Trevor, thank you. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and Shine. Rise and Shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? One, two, three, let's get it! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed! <laughs> Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy there's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We're Honored, ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember...
that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, the Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Welcome back. Hurricane Idalia has made landfall in a region of Florida that's never been hit by a storm this strong in recorded history. At least one death has already been reported. Let's get another look at that storm with the help of meteorologist Greg Dutra. Greg, what's the latest? Idalia now setting its sights on Georgia at this hour. The core of it has moved across the state line and flash flooding, which we had long known to be the main problem when this made its way inland, has started to show itself a flash flood emergency out for southern Georgia. And that is because three to six inches of rain has already fallen and another one to three inches is on the way for that area then extending north of that flash flood warnings which aren't to be taken on seriously at all from a Dell all the way up to Pearson covering Moody Air Force Base and another couple of areas to Nashville uh, Georgia as well a uh, category one storm but let's not get too hung up on that at this point as there's still some storm surge making its way into the Cedar Key area and storm surge will start building over the coming hours as the tide comes in for cities like Savannah and Charleston. Yet on top of that, the rainfall that is also incoming as this tracks its way up through the afternoon and into the evening tonight. I want to show you where it's going to be at by this evening because it makes its way through Georgia pretty quickly, moving at 20 or so miles per hour. And look at these winds around at 40, 50 miles per hour. The evening hours still packing those strong winds, power outages likely across South Carolina. So this becomes your problem in South Carolina before dinner time and all the way through the overnight hours of tonight. Would not be surprised if we see power outages and also flash flooding uh, in South Carolina. Then it makes its way into North Carolina by early Thursday morning, finally making its way back out to sea as a tropical storm, losing its hurricane strength likely late tonight, early tomorrow morning. But again, I don't want to get too caught up on that because major flooding will be the concern all the way through our Thursday where some six up to 10 inches of rain is on the way. Diane, six to 10 inches of rain is what's causing the flash flooding emergency in Georgia right now. So that could carry all the way up through the coast. All right, meteorologist Greg Dutra. Thanks for that, Greg. No problem. And we'll be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm. Right now, we're going to take you to WFTS, our station in Tampa. And certainly into the early evening, you can see the sustained winds will be coming down to about 10 miles per hour. Uh, so overall, we'll see the temps vary somewhere in the low to mid 80s throughout the rest of the day and into tonight as the rain showers move in and out. We get a little sunshine that'll help to heat us up, but we're not going to get into one of those really hot and steamy days ahead. And we will have decent chances for rain even over the next couple of days. So we're making some progress with that big deficit in the uh, severe drought that we've been in along the coast. This is definitely uh, helping us out there. We just didn't need the flooding to go along with it. And of course, that's what we're going to continue watching. That is the biggest threat that we continue to have for damage along our coastline here over the next several hours. Heather. All right, Shay, we'll check back in with you in just a little bit. Thank you. And we have Jackie Calloway joining our uh, coverage this morning. She's going to be over at the University of Tampa. Jackie, I know that's along the Hillsborough River. Are you seeing any flooding from that? Because obviously a little closer to Bayshore, that is where we're seeing a lot of the flooding in Larissa's live shots. Uh, are you seeing that in, along the Hillsborough River? Good morning, everyone. Well, for those of you who are familiar with the UT campus or you've spent any time on the boardwalk, 
off. This is just a site that I've never actually seen. There's no difference between where the UT campus begins and where Riverwalk starts. Hillsborough River has overrun its banks by probably 50 feet, if not more at this point. You can see the benches out there that are for the most part underwater. The water comes all the way up to the bench. There's trash cans that are submerged. The seawall that you can normally see that differentiates from where the campus ends and the water begins, that's completely gone. And if you look across the way, I know it's a distance away, you'll see Riverwalk. You can see some people walking along Riverwalk. Look how close the water is to the sidewalk of Riverwalk. And as you've been hearing from us for hours now, um, this isn't high tide yet. We're not going to see high tide until this afternoon, but yet we're already seeing this kind of surge and this much water cross over barriers, cross over banks. Just look at the trees, for instance, how uh, if you look at the trees that are about 30 feet in the distance, how high the water comes up on those trees. We were talking to some UT students who kind of wandered out to, to see what was going on this morning and to see how the campus fared overnight. They said they've never seen anything like this. Some of them actually went out and sat at the benches in the water, which we do not recommend. I mean, we've been told over and over, if you don't know how deep the water is, don't drive in it, don't step in it, because you just don't know what's underneath the water or how deep that water goes. Of course, we're going to be keeping an eye on things. The only damage we've really seen out here is as we were driving down Ashley, we were driving um, by the, the Tampa Museum and by the Straw Center, a lot of downed branches, a lot of downed limbs, uh, but for the most part, as far as damage goes, uh, nothing nothing really too concerning, nothing really too serious. Just a lot of flooding um, in this area downtown in the entire Riverwalk area. And of course, we're going to be driving around. We're going to be keeping an eye on things as the high tide uh, continues to build for the next few hours and let you know how it's looking in this area. Back to you. All right, Jackie, thank you. And where Jackie is on the UT campus, right across the river is the Riverwalk. So like Curtis Hickson Park is right there. And we were looking at some pictures from the city of Tampa about an hour and a half ago. And the part of the Riverwalk that actually goes under the bridge that you could see in the back of Jackie's shot right there, that was completely underwater. So there's a lot of flooding on the Riverwalk. Granted, it may have receded slightly, but uh, today's not the day to take a Riverwalk stroll. Let's just say that. Let's, uh, let's leave it alone for a while. Yeah, we'll avoid that yeah. area for sure. Uh, we're going to check in with now with James Tully. He's on Clearwater Beach. Now, James, we were looking at Gulf Boulevard. We had seen some video from there uh, where they were experiencing flooding. But from your vantage point, things are getting better. A lot better, Heather, for sure. I mean, what a night it was for Coronado Drive. I got to take that line from our own Sean Daly, who's helping us out this morning. This, a couple hours ago, was a river with a current. Now, it's just dare I say, some ponding. And this is good because this is actually an accelerated timeline from what Pinellas County officials told us. Uh, high tide hit about 11.15. Uh, you know, we're flirting with it, I guess, an hour past that. Uh, easy to lose track of time when you've been doing this for 12 straight hours. But um, this, is, uh, this is a great sign. Uh, water's receding for sure. Uh, over here, we've been showing you uh, shots of Clearwater Bay. Uh, as you can see, this is um, these are passable roads, guys. And this was, according to Clearwater Police, one of the worst sections uh, when it came to flooding from the storm surge we saw last night. Storm surge in excess of six and a half feet. And so, you know, we were able to give you uh, a vantage point of what that looks like when the surge is over six feet in Clearwater, and it wasn't good. Uh, almost all of Clearwater was underwater at, at one point, and that that was really something. But, you know, the great news is that most people heeded the warnings. Police didn't have... And our thanks to our colleagues there at WFTS right now. We're going to go over to Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia now giving an update as the hurricane hey, enters uh, his thank state. Thank you for being Let's with listen. us. Uh, joined by Director Stallings from the Georgia Emergency Management Agency, uh, Will Langston, who's been doing a great job with our weather forecast and, and also just giving updates. I want to thank everyone in the State Operations Center, the Department of Public Safety, Georgia National Guard representatives, Georgia Department of Transportation, Department of Natural Resources folks that are here and throughout the state. The Forestry Commission is in that same boat. Our Agriculture Commissioner, Tyler Harper, and his team at the Department of Agriculture Insurance Commissioner uh, General John King, 
Attorney General Carr and others who are helping Georgians in the state prepare and now respond uh, to the hurricane. I also want to thank our private sector partners that we've been working with, as well as our utility companies. Uh, just a few quick updates. I'll turn it over to Director Stallings, and, and he's going to give you some logistical information. And then if Will has anything to add on the weather, uh, we'll let, chime, let him chime in as well. On our private sector utility partners, we've got about 61,000 uh, without power right now that we know of. Uh, we have folks standing by and ready to move as soon as it's safe to do so, and Director Stallings will fill you in a little more on that here at the end of the briefing. As you all know from current events, Idalia made landfall on the Florida Gulf Coast as a Category 3 uh, this morning uh, before dropping to a Category 2, and currently it's Category 1 uh, as it continues to move throughout Georgia. We feel like that will fall to a tropical storm by the time it leaves us and heads into South Carolina. It entered Georgia around 10 a.m. Uh, we're thinking that it's going to get to South Carolina between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. this evening. There's been a heavy impact in South Georgia with heavy rainfall and heavy winds. I know most of the people across the state of Georgia will not feel the impact of the storm, but for those that were in uh, the, the line of the storm, it is very hard hitting, and uh, we're certainly watching that as it continues to move through the state. We had multiple counties in the affected area that are seeing winds in the 70 to 80 mile per hour and some gust up to 90. We know by radar it looks like we may potentially have in some areas 9 to 10 inches of rain. The good thing is this is a narrow storm and is very fast moving, so it's not sitting on us and dumping uh, even more rain than that at one time. So we're thankful for that. Uh, just to give you some logistics on what Director Stallings has been doing in my direction, we've activated the State Operations Center, as you all know, early Monday morning to monitor the storm's progress and coordinate closely with all relevant agencies that I mentioned earlier, not only at the state but also uh, at the local level, and we've certainly been in touch with our partners at FEMA. The state of emergency was issued yesterday, making state resources available to all local governments and organizations within the hurricane impact area. We have assets staged and our personnel are in the EOCs in the affected areas and we're coordinating with our utility provide, uh, providers and Director Stallings is going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, lastly, I would just say that we feel uh, fairly confident that we're going to be able to get crews moving here. Uh, as we move into the afternoon. We obviously have to make sure that the storm passes and it's a safe environment for them to be working. You're talking winds that drop below 35 miles an hour for folks that need to be up in bucket trucks. Uh, we certainly want to take our, uh, make sure our first responders stay safe. But as soon as those conditions are right for us to move, we have resources ready and able to do that. Uh, lastly, I would just say when the storm came into our state and counties like Eccles, in Lowndes, we've certainly seen a lot of downed trees. Uh, I mentioned the power outages, and there has been some flash flooding. So we're going to continue to watch that as the storm moves. But thankfully, it is weakening now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Stallings. And then if Will has anything, we'll let him uh, brief you guys, and we'll do some questions. Director. Sir. First and foremost, I want to thank Governor Kemp and the Hi, first I'm Diane Macedo. For Thanks for streaming with ABC News Live. You just heard from Georgia Governor Brian Kemp as Hurricane Idalia hits his state. The storm made landfall in a region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm this strong since 1896. At least one death has already been reported. Idalia came ashore around 745 Eastern this morning as a Category 3 hurricane after reaching Category 4 strength overnight. Now the storm's been downgraded to a Cat 1, but it's still bringing powerful winds and major storm surge. Hundreds of thousands are already without power. I want to bring in meteorologist Greg Dutra. Uh, Greg, what's the latest with this storm? I was just looking at uh, the Doppler-indicated rainfall. Doppler radars, they do a really good job, especially in tropical systems like this, estimating how much rain has fallen when you don't have sensors on the ground actually measuring it. And there is a swath here from Valdosta down to Statonville that has easily, and this is a big, wide swath, uh, easily five, six, 
inches of rain and there were hot spots in there that were eight to 10 inches of rain. That's why there's a flash flood emergency out going until early this afternoon for those locations because they could still see another two, three inches of rain on top of that. Now, as you heard Governor Kemp say, uh, it is a rather thin or narrow swath in comparison to the state as a whole, but the folks that are seeing that rainfall uh, certainly are not going to have a good next couple of hours until those rainwaters do recede. Now, storm surge along the coast still up to 11 feet. We're getting towards the peak of that. I want to shift our focus a little bit more now to South Carolina uh, and even into North Carolina as we head through tonight and into early tomorrow morning because as this tracks that way, you almost can't pay attention to the cone anymore because you're really wanting to see not where the core of it is, where the heaviest rain is. And that'll start really concentrating itself on the northern side, falling over Florence and Columbia and on towards Wilmington and Moorhead cities. You get into North Carolina too, even through the outer banks. And even though this is, and I'm going to use air quotes here, only a tropical storm as it makes its way back off into the Atlantic Ocean, there is plenty of moisture with it. And that's going to be a wide area that sees anywhere from six to possibly 10 inches of rain. The good news is that it is moving very fast. It's moving ahead of schedule. That's nice to see. What's not nice to see and what we always do expect with these is even far away from the core, there could be some tornado warnings or severe thunderstorm warnings that come up for extremely high winds and also the occasional spin up tornado. So we are transitioning now to a major flooding potential along the coast. And remember, rain is falling. It's trying to drain out into the Atlantic Ocean, but winds from this are blowing into those river outlets and that's just going to keep water standing in spots for longer amounts of time. So the six to ten inches of rain that falls in some isolated cases could have a tough time draining out of the spots and folks could end up being stranded for quite some time pretty far inland too, maybe further than you would think if you're in South Carolina watching a storm make its impact on the coast of Florida. Diane. All right, meteorologist Greg Dutra, thank you. No problem. And South Georgia resident and former news anchor Darren Kagan lives along the coast but has evacuated to Savannah. She's on the phone right now with more on that. Darren, thanks for coming on. I'm wondering what it was like to evacuate your home on the South Georgia coast. Uh, how did you feel making that decision to leave? You know, uh, Diane, thanks for having me on and thanks for giving so much coverage to something that's so important along this part of the Georgia coast. Um, it was I was surprised. It was quite emotional to leave this area. It is so beautiful, and we've come to love it. And it does have its challenges. But just as um, your meteorologist was saying, it was kind of it was the full experience. We were leaving to get ahead of flooding and high winds. And as we were driving up I-95, we went right into a tornado warning. So we had, you know, you, you kind of pick your poison. Are you going to get away from flooding or uh, get away from the tornadoes? But we're in Savannah now. It is safe. Uh, right now, I can tell you Savannah looks just pretty much like a warm summer day in terms of a, a rainstorm. Um, it is raining and um, a little bit of wind, but really, really not that bad here yet. What are you most worried about right now in, in terms of the coastal area where you left? The biggest thing to understand about the Georgia coast is the tides. So you have these beautiful marshes where the tides just on a regular day fluctuate as much as nine feet. So Mother Nature sends the water in and it brings the water out. Um, those high tides, though, fluctuate throughout the month. It just turns out that this storm is hitting for the during the highest tides of the month. So the tides that are going to come in anyway are already two to three feet above what they might have been, let's just say, two weeks ago. Um, so if the, if the storm hits when the high tide hits, then we're going to have some big, some big problems. Are you worried about what you'll see when you go back home? Um, yeah, just because it is what it is, right? Um, we've, we've done what we could. We spent yesterday afternoon getting everything up and out and away and did as much as we could and putting boats away and equipment. And after that, it's, it's up to Mother Nature at this point. Really, it is. And Darren, you did the same thing. You left. When you talk with your neighbors, does it mm -hmm. seem like other people in your area heeded those warnings as well, or are there people trying to ride this out? Most of our neighbors chose to stay. Now, most of them are lifetime residents of McIntosh County and that part of the coast. They look at us as the city slickers who moved there three years ago, and they're not all wrong. Um, 
So, and I will say we only came as far as Savannah because we want to be able to get back as soon as possible to help with cleanup um, and anything else that we can. But most people did choose to stay. All right. Well, hopefully uh, safe reports from there and hopefully your home is okay. Uh, but uh, Darren, we appreciate you calling in. Keep us posted. Will do. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Stay safe. And I want to go over to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who's in Treasure Island. Uh, Ginger, what's it like there right now? Right, so we're just getting a little bit of a tail end of a rain band, but looking behind me, the receding of the water. Even here at high tide, we've seen some of this coastal flooding start to pull back because the storm has raced so quickly into Georgia and will eventually get to South Carolina. I do want to share, though, it is not just here along Treasure Island down to St. Pete that we've got this where it kind of washed over. You can see from our drone that a lot of the erosion that we talk regularly about on these really vulnerable islands has allowed a lot of the water in. And so I don't know if you're seeing that there, but, uh, you know, my producer and the drone operator were telling me that there were actual trees that were uprooted by the water and then kind of taken into the ocean. So we will end up seeing some of that damage. I'll also take you to Tampa Bay I-275. We've had flooding on that. So the causeway, a problem. I know we've just started to see traffic come in and out here on 107th Avenue into Treasure Island. So I'm sure as the flooding keeps receding down this far, we will see things improve. But we had anywhere really from three to six feet of surge around here. I've seen some of the Crystal River uh, tide numbers going up to around six feet. Uh, that's going to be a problem, and hopefully uh, they can start to see that go away. And then the wind. Guys, this is the part, right? You've heard from Greg, and you, you were just talking to that woman about the trees down, the power lines, and that is a big concern. Um, just some of the gusts that we've seen already, Horseshoe Beach to 81. I just saw that there are some... Um, they're going in to try to search and see if anybody needs rescue. Perry, 85 miles per hour. Mayo, 86 miles per hour. So some really gusty stuff going in there. That easily takes out power and takes trees into homes. On top of the wind, you still have surge that'll start on that counterclockwise rotation on the storm, right? You push the water against the coast and Savannah and Charleston, uh, Hilton Head, all have to watch because you're going to see that push of water come along with the six plus inches of rain. And so when that happens, the rain falls and then it kind of plugs it up and it's not able to get out as quickly as it could. So I think flooding along the coast there is a major concern in the next 24 hours, Diane. And, and Ginger, you mentioned how fast moving this hurricane is. It's already in Georgia. Why is it moving so quickly? Yeah, I mean, the dynamics of this storm were really interesting. There is a front just west of us, and that was all to do with how far east this storm would make it and how close it would be to Tampa Bay. Um, fortunately, again, they had that miss here, thankfully, because you have such a huge population in such a susceptible Bay Area. Uh, but unfortunately, it did take that more north northeasterly track right into Appalachie Bay, which is an area that has not ever seen a Cat 3 or higher since records began. And, you know, that front is going to be the one in part that is starting to drive this to the north and east. Um, there are other upper air dynamics, but I don't want to bore you with all of that. Just basically think that. Plus, remember, it was over 86 to 90 degree waters. So the rapid intensification that happened last night was something we anticipated. Uh, we're two to five degrees above average. So those Gulf warm waters had a lot to do with that fuel as well, as far as strength goes. All right, Ginger Z in Treasure Island. Glad to see the waters receding there, Ginger. Thank you. And the mayor of Treasure Island, Tyler Payne, is joining me now for more on this. Mayor, thanks for coming on. We just saw Ginger there uh, in Treasure Island. What are you hearing from those in the area right now as another high tide comes in? Um, I just drove into the city over our main entrance, our uh, Treasure Island Causeway Bridge, and there's definitely um, still a lot of flooding in our main roadways. Um, Gulf Boulevard is where we're standing right now at one of our main beach access points, um, which is the largest section of our beach here. Um, so a lot of residents are asking if they can come back yet. Our access to all the beaches in Pinellas County is still restricted. Um, no cars are gonna be allowed to come onto the island. And we're asking all residents to continue to shelter in place if you didn't leave the, the island, um, as a lot of the roads are still impassable from the, the storm surge. Uh, yeah, we are seeing some of the streets there full of water. What's your biggest concern right now? 
My biggest concern, we have a neighborhood at the very south end of our, our city called Sunset Beach. It has a lot of older homes that are small beach bungalows, very close together, um, and a very narrow strip of land between the Gulf and the Bay. And last night we had, our initial assessments are saying we had at least three to four feet of water come over and connect the Bay and the, oh, the Gulf. Um, so a lot of those homes down in there that are much older have probably six inches to a foot of water in them, and that could really be devastating for them. We've also had a lot of issues with our um, our beach as it is. It's, it's severely eroded. We've had a project um, with, to try to get beach nourishment through the Army Corps of Engineers that's been delayed, and the storm is just compounding that issue. And um, the water has washed over all of our sand dunes. You can see behind me um, our the sand dunes are still full of water in between the beach and Gulf Boulevard here. Um, and there's still a ton of standing water out on, on the beach. Yeah, in some cases, our drone was showing palm trees completely uprooted, scattered on the beach as well. Uh, what message do you want to send to your community and to the rest of the country right now? I mean, we are almost 200 miles south of where this storm hit. So especially when we have a storm coming and hitting to the north of us, I mean, like the meteorologist just said, the storm's in Georgia right now, and we're still, I'm standing on the beach, and we have a lot of very gusty winds. It's still not safe to be here. So this is why we do mandatory evacuations. We're in a zone A, so there was a mandatory evacuation for our whole city. Um, so we need to take this seriously. It could have been even worse if it had hit closer to us. Just because it isn't hitting us directly does not mean that you shouldn't be evacuating. All right. Mayor of Treasure Island, Tyler Payne, we know you're busy, Mayor. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck. And ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is making his way out of Tampa right now, heading north. Rob, what are you seeing? Hey, Diane. Uh, just uh, heading, heading out of Tampa now, but significant debris uh parts of this causeway this one coming up here so that's that's all from surge that obviously you can still see uh, some of the some of the frothy water of the of the bay here coming o uh, over the causeway but it looks like it's receded somewhat but this is just a mess so at least one lane here uh not drivable and still uh, reports of some other causeways and overpass and interstate lanes shut down because of debris and or, or water. So it's a mess here at Tampa, higher impact certainly than uh, Hurricane Ian brought just a year ago. And uh, officials urging people to to stay inside until it completely passes and these waters recede. So because because it's still raining, as you can see, we still have an onshore flow, which is pushing the water up uh, towards the end of the bay. And we still have a high tide that's yet to come later on this afternoon. So uh, conditions, although the most ferocious winds have ended, um, conditions are going to be very, very slow to improve, I think, as we go through the afternoon. Diane? And ABC News meteorologist Rob Marciano on the road for us, leaving Tampa, Florida. Rob, thank you. And Michael Bobbitt lives in Cedar Key, Florida. He joined me earlier on the phone with his experience riding out the storm. Cedar Key recently reported a water level of 6.8 feet above normal. So what does that look like to you? What's Cedar Key like right now? It, it looks like our entire, uh, our entire downtown uh, commercial district is underwater. Uh, we have no commercial buildings that aren't almost entirely uh, inundated. And it means uh, I'd say 50% of the houses on the island have water in them. Um, right now I'm walking in waist deep water about a mile to try to get to my houseboat to see if it broke its mooring and is out bouncing around hurting other people's houses. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking down a, down a, on a waist deep uh, road right now. Uh, Michael, I, I hope you're doing so safely. I know you wrote out the storm in the home that you rebuilt, that home's over 100 years old. Uh, and yeah. what's the status of your home itself right now? Uh, I, by the grace of God, we dodged the bullet. It, it, it sits up high on a hill, and the, and the sewer down the south is that it's never flooded, but it's a storm. It sure seemed like it was going to. Water made it into my backyard, but didn't make it up to the house. So but you're I, saying... The water season. Go ahead. Sorry, um, Michael, I didn't mean to interrupt. You're, you're saying you're, you're estimating 50% of the houses that you can see are flooded? Uh, 
Uh, everywhere that I've seen, yes. And I haven't been able to make some of the out, make it to some of the outlying areas of the island because they're completely cut off. We're completely cut off from the mainland. Our bridges are inundated. Um, so and no help is coming. So a few of us have stayed behind to help. We've been checking out our neighbors and making sure everybody had what they needed. And, and we think we're in, in good shape here. It's going to be a, a several-month process to rebuild once the water goes away. But I... So far, I don't think we've had any loss of life or any significant injuries. And, Michael, what was it like riding out this storm? Were you scared? Uh, I mean, I was scared because I had put my uh, my uh, heart and soul into this house, and it seemed like it was about to float off into the Gulf of Mexico. I'm a native Floridian, so hurricanes inherently aren't, aren't a big deal to me, but this one bearing down right on us when I live so close to the ocean now, uh, heck yeah, I was scared. And, Michael, have you heard from your neighbors? How are other people there doing who rode out this storm? Uh, good. We've all been out. We're already cleaning up the streets and seeing what we can do to help. And uh, this is, this is uh, CDC is really a remarkable example of what community is supposed to be. We, we live in community with one another. Uh, we really take that seriously here, and I'm, I'm really proud of our little town. And, Michael, we just heard from our correspondent from Maria Real that there are people there that are believed to be stranded and will be in need of rescue. Are you worried about any of your neighbors? Uh, I'm not. Uh, we're uh, just the, the very minute we can put our boats in the water, we'll, we'll get to them before any help can make it across the bridge from the mainland. So we're, uh, we're, we're after it, but we're going to take good care of them. All right, Michael, good luck to you. I hope your houseboat is still intact. And most importantly, I hope you stay safe. You're walking in waist-deep water. You said, I, I, I can't pretend that doesn't make me nervous. <laughs> you and my mother both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael, stay Have safe. Thank you so much. Right, bye -bye. Good luck. And we will be covering Hurricane Idalia all morning, so stay with ABC News Live for the latest on the storm. And now we're going to head over to WFTS, our station in Tampa. Uh, so... It has gotten a little bit better out here, which is the good news. A lot of people out walking about uh, the rain. We, there's a little bit of a band between 9 and 10 o'clock this morning. That has since stopped. But very important here, uh, law enforcement, they are around this area, and they say while it's not raining, while it is not severe uh, flooding anymore, there are still some puddles out there. I don't know if you can kind of see behind me. There's still a little bit of water. And they don't want people to go out and walk around in into these waters where you don't know what is in it. You know, it may be like, hey, it's only to my ankle, it's fine. You don't know what's underneath there. And I say that because there's an electric charging station out here for your electric vehicles. And a law enforcement officer was telling our photographer, Allison, earlier this morning that he wants people to stay away from it because it was sparking. So just another example of, I know we're all curious. We wanna come see what the storm brought, what it left behind. But just to err on the side of caution, if you can, try to refrain, especially going out into those waters, because you don't know what is underneath it. So you may think, okay, it's not raining. It's just a little overcast. It's safe to go out. Not always the case. So please continue to stay safe out there. Uh, and I actually, when we were leaving our hotel, one of the uh, employees there said, I live over in Coquina Key, and it is severely flooded in that area. She said, we don't even know if we're going to be able to get back there this evening. And she said, they do have uh, electricity, but as far as getting Getting into our neighborhood, she says that is not the case right now. So we wanted to give you a view of what the downtown St. Pete area looked like over close to the marina. We're also going to try to make it out over to Shore Acres because, as you know, if you live in that area, they get severe flooding. They get flooding on a sunny day. So you have a hurricane come in and bring all this water. So we're going to try to make it out there, but we wanted to give you a view of what St. Pete looks like right now. So for now, I'm going to toss it back to you guys. All right. Thank you, Vanessa. Very good look there in the St. Pete Pier area. And uh, piggybacking off of what she was talking about, electric vehicles, um, HCSO actually put out a tweet not too long ago saying if you own a hybrid or electric vehicle that has come into contact with salt water because of the flooding within the last 24 hours, it's crucial to relocate the vehicle from your garage as soon as you can because salt water exposure can trigger combustion in those lithium ion batteries. They also said if possible, get that vehicle to higher ground. So be aware of that if you have a hybrid or electric vehicle. That is very, very good advice and probably something that most folks wouldn't even think about. It's so. some new technology that we have to yep. deal with in hurricanes, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So we uh, we are continuing to see flooding on the Bay, on Bayshore Boulevard. Larissa Scott has been live out there all morning long. Uh, Larissa, it does seem like it is getting a little bit better and you have seen folks uh, out there, which of course is not a good idea, but um, it, it does seem like it is receding slightly. 
Yeah, Heather, that's exactly right. We came to the other side of the street to give you a kind of a different vantage point now that we're able to more safely walk over this way. That now the water is coming down a little bit. Uh, you know, as we've been telling you, Bayshore is still very much flooded. You know, not um, safe driving conditions for anyone. But you know, you can see people are. Okay, it looks like we're we just lost Larissa's shot. Not, yeah. I think we just lost Larissa's, uh, Larissa's shot. So we're going to go ahead. You have an update from TPA, right? Yeah, uh, Tampa International Airport just tweeted saying TPA to reopen to arriving flights only at 4 p.m. today. They sustained minimal damage from uh, the hurricane. Departing flights and normal operations will resume early Thursday morning. So check with your airline. But that is the latest update uh, just in from Tampa International Airport tweeting that moments ago. And I want to show you some video because we continue to get some incredible images from our crews in the field. And this is video from just north of us in Taylor County, that small community definitely seeing a lot of damage from Adalia. Our anchor Paula Grown and photojournalist Tim Jones were on the ground there. Uh, this looks like it was a little earlier, obviously. Um, look at the storm damage here. You can see that the, the winds were 100% a factor there. So we've been talking all morning how storm surge really was the issue for our area. But up in Taylor County where uh, this uh, storm made landfall in Keaton Beach, uh, it went right through Perry, which is exactly where this crew was, Paula Grown and Tim Jones. And wind was really, really bad out there. So bad that they had to actually go into their hotel because the doors, the glass doors, could not handle the wind. Uh, and again, you can see here, that is what they were dealing with. It was really, really bad out there. Although we were able to follow them through this entire process of seeing the eye go over Perry. And when that happened, uh, as soon as it started to pass, you know, Dennis and Greg were able to give the, the good news, which was that, you know, the worst of the storm had, had gone. So uh, I, I, Paul, Paul did a fantastic job. Tim did a fantastic job up there. Uh, and they were speaking with folks who had left the Keaton Beach area, uh, you know, and, and surrounding areas um, because they wanted to, you know, seek higher grounds, uh, seek a safer area. And um, they were also getting images um, of their houses out there and most of them, it looked like their houses had fared pretty well, although there was one house in, in uh, I, I believe it was, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the city here, but uh, they they had, it looked like the roof had been completely taken off and you could see right into the bedroom and, and the up upstairs area. So there is damage out there, 100% sure. Um, and I'm sure that Paula Grown and, uh, and Tim Jones will be heading out there to, to assess that as well when it's safe. That wind video is something we are mm -hmm. not getting around here and it was it was crazy to see because you usually look to the trees for the wind, but I was looking at the water being blown all over the place. All right, now let's uh, get back to our coverage here in the Tampa Bay area. We do want to check in with James Tully. He's out on Clearwater Beach and James, we're hearing rescues are happening there now too. Oh, good afternoon, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, it's not a really nice day here. It's, it's raining, it's cloudy, uh, it's windy a little bit still, but that's okay because five hours ago, Pretty much all of Clearwater was underwater, and this is a nice sight to see. Uh, I've been coming on live with you guys, giving you uh, some pretty positive news of improvements, uh, with the exception of some side streets. As we take a look here at Bridgewater, uh, Michael, that's over here to my right. Uh, you see Bridgewater. There's still that's that's an impassable road. However. On the other side of me, Coronado Drive, looking great. Uh, this uh, road below me right next to Clearwater Bay is uh, all but completely receded. So, it, again, great great news. Uh, Clearwater Police telling me that uh, no rescues. Haven't had to do anything. Minimal power outages. Uh, I think a lot of people did the right thing and evacuated. We found out firsthand, you know, six and a half feet of storm surge, perhaps more. We'll get the final readings on that, I'm sure, to get that, that data uh, in the coming days. But... Uh, uh, yeah, we saw what it did here, and it put the all of Clearwater pretty much under uh, six inches. Sometimes, you know, uh, in places a foot of water. I talked to a couple of uh, a, a couple of people who were vacationing here. Told me that they they took a step uh, about a m half mile down the street here and said it was two feet deep. 
So, you know, the water uh, sinking in there and that surge coming through. But uh, it's the sun's peeking through. That's nice to see, too. Uh, things are looking really, really good here. And I, I don't think myself and my crew, uh, Michael Brantley here on camera, Sean Daly Field producing, Eric Moore, our chief photographer, surveying and doing all kinds of work for us. They're not going to be a problem getting out of here. And that's great news. Um, that goes for anybody else who, who needs to get out of here. Uh, but at the same time, proceed with caution. Some side streets still are full of water. Uh, but... Um, you know, high tide was a couple hours ago. Um, we thought at that point we would see more, uh, more flooding. Uh, we haven't. So, all good stuff. Uh, the beach access still restricted. Stay away from the beach until further notice. But otherwise, things looking very good here, and it's it's nice to come on and report that to you after the night that we had. I'll send it back to you guys. James, thank you. And just really quickly, um, I was I was trying to remember the name of that town. It's Steenhatchee, and that is where they saw some pretty major damage to homes in that area. And I'm looking at Florida 511, which gives you updates, uh, live updates on traffic uh, and closures. And in that area along US 19, there is a major incident emergency vehicles on us 19 in both directions at northeast 124th avenue all lanes closed and again that is probably because they have seen some pretty significant damage out there and just another reason to not get on the roads right now and as we're taking a live look at from the mainsail beach in this is anna maria island and this picture is not something you see on the west coast very often i mean this looks like an east coast this looks like the atlantic ocean you see the waves crashing on anna maria island usually this area is so calm serene and peaceful but uh, clear evidence that a storm has gone through and we're still you know waiting for that high tide and that the storm surge to potentially be an issue again so now we are going to go to Madeira Beach our Anthony Hills uh, Hill has been kind of going around the Pinellas County area Anthony what are you seeing on Madeira right now First, we finally got here. People have been watching, and they've been watching for the past two hours. We've been talking about how we tried to get here, and we had issues uh, with not being able to cross the bridge. Well, we found a way. We just kind of came down Gulf and turned this road, turned that road, and, and now we're here. But we are here at the Madeira Beach 9-11 uh, Memorial, which is partially underwater. I want to show you guys. Uh, this is part of it right here. Um, as you can see, there is a seawall, and look how close the water level is to the seawall. There's supposed to be a difference there. Um, obviously, to your left, uh, those kids over there, they were playing in the water um, after the hurricane, kind of seeing uh, what's what's left in, in more bodies of water right here. If you look at this, this, this body right here, uh, again, this is the 9-11 memorial here on Madeira Beach. Another thing that we want to point out, and this is about safety, uh, because we know that a lot of people are experiencing standing water where they live. Um, if you look at right in front of that, in front of you, that is an electrical body. Box. Don't assume that you can just, because we saw some kids getting in the water, putting their feet, don't assume that that is the safest thing to do because um, water, electricity, you do the math. That's not a situation you want to be in. Another thing we noticed driving here uh, that I want to tell you, like I said before, we were going up and down a Gulf Boulevard through a lot of the, the towns on the coastal um, barrier islands. And we saw a picture from last night and the boulevard was completely inundated with water. And that makes sense because one of the things that we keep reporting is that we see so many of the roads that meet with the boulevard just inundated. So again, just wanted to bring that to you guys that it seems like the water is subsiding, but if you were on a lot of these barrier islands, a lot of the side roads will be inundated. Again, this was an evacuation, a mandatory evacuation zone. I said before how, you know, you drive through these towns and it kind of feels like a, a ghost there's a little bit more people here, but from the other towns we were in, it felt like a ghost town. And it makes sense because it was a mandatory evacuation zone. It was uh, zone A. And local officials were strongly urging people to at least get to a zone C or higher for their own safety. And due to it looking like a ghost town, I mean, I guess that's proof that a lot of people heeded uh, to that warning, which is a good thing. We like people staying safe. Uh, we will continue to travel around and give you the latest updates from Pinellas County. For now, I'll send it back to you guys in the studio. All right. Thank you, Anthony. He was talking about those electrical boxes. Perfect reason to not go into the water. Also, Hernando County Sheriff put out a photo on Twitter saying they found a snake in the middle of flooded roads. So if we can't convince you with electricity, we'll try to convince you with the snakes. You don't want to accidentally step on that or oh, just 
please don't go in the water. Definitely not. And it looks also like parts of that road have caved in. We, I know we can't show you the pictures right now, but we'll work to get some of these pictures up for you so you can see if that is the case. That means that that water was just so incredibly strong uh, to, to be able to cave that road in. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, we want to move now to the Tampa area. We've seen a lot of flooding in the downtown Tampa area, Bay Shore, the Riverwalk, that, that section. Yeah, our Jackie Calloway is out at University of Tampa. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is giving a press conference now. Uh, Let's lost listen. Power have been restored, and there are more than 250,000 accounts that are currently out of power and in need of restoration. Uh, as you'd imagine, the counties that have the highest percentage of power outages are the counties that were in the main pathway of the storm. Counties like Dixie, Levy, Taylor, Swanee, Madison, Jefferson, and Columbia. Utility workers are actively working to restore power in all affected areas. And they have started doing that as soon as it was safe to do so. So those, those restoration efforts are ongoing. Uh, we do anticipate you could have um, that these power outage numbers could go higher, uh, but, but the re restoration numbers are going to go higher as well. All eight uh, urban search and rescue teams uh, are uh, deployed. Uh, our National Guard uh, has folks uh, in places like Taylor County. Uh, they're getting on scene there to do things like clear uh, major pieces of the roads and, and get debris that, is, that has been uh, knocked around. So there's a lot of moving parts there, kind of at ground zero. So we've got a, a National Guard unit there. General Haas going to talk more about that. The Coast Guard uh, is active, including with rotary wing assets. Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, has both boats and vehicles in route to the affected areas. And Florida Department of Transportation has been conducting cut and toss operations starting at the southern part of the state as the storm moved through southwest Florida, uh, clearing those roads and then moving all the way up north. And so they are in route to clear all the way up to Taylor County. Uh, right now, Tampa Airport is going to reopen for incoming flights at 4 p.m. Uh, by 3 a.m. tomorrow, will be fully reopened. Gainesville Airport will reopen tonight, and Tallahassee Airport will reopen first thing in the morning. Uh, the ports in Tampa and Manatee are currently undergoing assessments, and when those assessments are concluded, uh, they will be able uh, to resume operations, assuming all is well, which we anticipate it will be. There are, as of now, no confirmed fatalities. Uh, and those fatalities are uh, things that get a, a confirmed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement through medical examiners. We do not have any uh, confirmed fatalities yet. Uh, if you have any questions about how things are unfolding in your area, you can go to floridadisaster.org for updates. The Florida Division of Emergency Management will continue uh, to update uh, that website with all the latest information. We, we have a really good uh, retail in terms of all the counties, I think, other than the, the Big Bend proper, uh, the Tampa Bay area, I think things are good. Um, Leon County is, is, is doing well. Uh, we're still assessing what is all going on on the ground in the places that had the, the initial impact. And so we're probably going to be, you know, I'm probably going to try to get down to some of those counties today. Uh, but we've got a lot of people that are going in, uh, offering assistance uh, from the state perspective, helping these, uh, these counties be able to, to stabilize the situation. So for more updates on this, I'm going to bring up Kevin Guthrie from the Florida Division of Emergency Management. All right. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so far right now, the, the biggest impacted area that we have, following up on what the governor said, is uh, seems to be in Perry. Um, right now, we know we have a, a couple of businesses that have caught on fire, um, a few that have roofs knocked off of them, maybe maybe potentially one collapse. We're getting um, some conflicting information on that. But we do have crews that are there working hand-in-hand -hand with Taylor County Sheriff's Office and Taylor County Fire Rescue. So uh, that's going on. Madison County is another county that has been uh, impacted um, they have a lot of debris on the ground. <clears throat> they have about 99% power outages in that particular county. So again, we do have resources heading in that direction. Again, I'll let General Haas talk about that. He's got one of his uh, task forces heading in that direction as well. So uh, 
other than that very specific detail, we continue to uh, search, secure, and stabilize areas that we can do that in. Uh, most of what we're doing here in the Big Bend, Big Bend area is initial search. Um, I will say this. Uh, I know we don't have anybody from the uh, CFO's office here, but in, uh, in search and rescue, uh, in Fort Myers, we were able to clear a lot of houses very quickly because of the uh, footprint of Fort Myers. Up here in the Big Bend, you may have two houses that are on a five-mile road. So that is going to take a very long time to clear those. Now, we have more than enough assets, more than enough resources to get that done in a timely manner, but I just want to go ahead and set expectations. Some of this is going to take longer than what we experienced with initial search and rescue in Fort Myers, just again because of the the landscape. We're going to have to do it of uh, tree cutting and a lot of uh, push emergency access to get into those areas to then do the securing and stabilizing. But we are working through all of that. We have maintained communications with all of our counties. We did have a couple of 911 centers that went down briefly uh, for about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, but again, all 911 calls have been answered. Uh, there are some minor backlogs in uh, Taylor County and Madison County that, uh, again, local officials are working through, and then we are supplementing those resources to help them get through those calls as quickly as possible. Um, I will reiterate uh, that even though there, we have 911 calls, there is no one in distress that has not been taken care of. The ones that were in distress, we got uh, folks to immediately. We have a lot of people that have called 911 saying, I'm, I'm entrapped in my house, I'm okay, but I need help. So uh, they are 100% okay. We're going to get to those uh, folks just as fast as we can get our emergency access teams into them. The state emergency response team will continue to work around the clock uh, to meet the needs of all the survivors, support our first responders, and initiate an efficient, reco uh, efficient recovery process to communities impacted by Hurricane Adelia. We are actively working with our law enforcement partners to, con to continue to conduct search and stabilize, as I've already mentioned. Uh, we have a recovery team that's already uh, in the EOC. We uh, here at the Division of Emergency Management, we activate our recovery team the exact same time that we activate our response team. So our recovery team has already been working for several days getting ready for this. They are uh, already conducting windshield assessments throughout the state of Florida. We will go into the next um, phase of this. We'll Will be individual damage assessments, where the, or I'm sorry, in, initial damage assessments, where those are done at the local county level in a little more detail to get numbers that will then roll up with us. We already have uh, FEMA that is uh, standing by ready to do what we call joint damage assessments. So they have teams here already ready to go for that. So um, you're going to see a very, very quick response on the recovery side of the house to do uh, individual damage assessments and what's also referred to as public assistance damage assessments. That's where we check uh, public infrastructure, uh, city, county buildings, things of that nature. So again, all of that stuff will be unfolding most likely as soon as tomorrow uh, so that we can get the recovery process uh, jump started here in the state of Florida. As always, we could not do that without the leadership of the governor and uh, the, the uh, objectives that he sets for. So again, governor, thank you so much. Okay, General. <clears throat> Good morning and thank you, Governor, for your leadership and support of your Florida National Guard. Director Guthrie, thank you again for the great work your team is doing to protect Florida citizens. As we continue to assess the damage uh, landfall caused across the state of Florida, our thoughts and prayers remain with the impacted, uh, impacted, uh, the impact of the storm on the folks. Uh, Florida National Guard is fully mobilized with approximately 5,500 soldiers and airmen supporting hurricane response efforts. Post landfall, um, uh, guard elements have been uh, providing support to our state and local partners with mission sets, including uh, reconnaissance, uh, search and rescue, damage assessment, and route reconnaissance operations. Our 53rd Infantry Brigade combat team is heavily engaged in Florida's western coastal counties, uh, primarily conducting ground search and rescue and route clearance operations. In fact, Florida's, uh, Florida Guardsmen are conducting high water vehicle rescues in Hernando and Taylor counties. Likewise, our 164th ADA Brigade is conducting similar missions throughout our central and northeast counties. We maintain uh, additional immediate response forces available to rapidly uh, reinforce our presence and capabilities in areas with, uh, with greatest need, like Taylor County. 
Uh, we are embedded with uh, each of our impacted county emergency operations centers and remain ready to provide support as requested. Uh, as briefed earlier, the Florida National Guard is currently has uh, 2,400 vehicles, including high water and high uh, mobility vehicles, 40, 14 rotary wing aircraft conducting planned um, urban search and rescue operations this afternoon, and 23 small watercraft on hand to support riverine operations as needed. Additionally, Florida is receiving assistance from other state National Guards. We're expecting two truck companies, one from South Carolina and the other from Tennessee. And we're also preparing to receive three UH-60 helicopters from Kentucky. As at the same time, Maryland, Tennessee, and Colorado are standing by to in case we need additional air assets. We remain grateful to our fellow Guard states for their assistance and support. Your Florida National Guard is prepared to accomplish any mission required by the Florida Department of Emergency Management, and we stand ready to support our state, fellow citizens, and our neighbors in need. Thank you. All right, thank you, Governor DeSantis, for your continued leadership. Thank you, Director Guthrie, for your continued partnership as we respond to this event. Um, you know, several days ago, we began preparing. We've had our crews and equipment staged for the last 36 hours. Immediately after landfall and the storm passed through, we began pushing those crews into the impacted area. Over 700 crew members, which includes 100 bridge inspectors, uh, 1,100 generators, and 250 pieces of heavy equipment We've been moving these resources into the impacted area so that we can quickly address any needs, get the cut and toss operations taken care of, and support the life safety mission. In the main area of impact, uh, we have nearly 1,000 bridges that have to be inspected, really focusing our efforts close to the, the coastline initially. Uh, we have several major roadways that go over the Steenhatchee River, the Suwannee River, and others. Um, right now, State Road 24 going into Cedar Key is impassable because of high water. State Road 51 going into Steenhatchee is also impassable because of high water. But our bridge crews are inspecting most of the bridges as we speak and will be finishing those operations within the next hour. We've made a lot of progress. We're going to continue to do so. Um, we've, we've moved the generators that are needed into the area. Most of the traffic signal assessments have been completed. We have about 50 locations left to complete, and we will be deploying generators for those traffic signals that need power. Um, as we continue to respond to this storm, all 13 of our traffic management centers across the state will continue their 24-7 operations inputting real-time traffic data into Florida 511. Again, that is the most accurate and timely information you can get for traffic at florida511.com. Uh, we have 185 road rangers that are continuing to patrol our interstate system and responding to motorists as needed. Um, one thing to remember, there is still high water in a lot of areas of the state. If you see water overtopping a road, please do not drive through it. If you see water, please stop, turn around, go a different way. It can be really dangerous to drive through flooded roadways. Thank you again, Governor DeSantis, for your leadership and support as we respond to this event. Okay, so we're going to have, um, you know, all these assets are, are in motion. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of efforts at power restoration. Uh, you're going to see the, the, the roads cleared in the, in the really significantly affected areas. That's going to just increasingly happen. And we're going to do uh, whatever we need to do to help these local communities uh, get back on their feet. Any questions? Uh, what time did uh, the I cross into Georgia? That's a good question. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I think it was... Um, I think it was probably within the hour, within the last 30, 40 minutes. This morning, at what time did it become too dangerous for people in that Big Bend area to evacuate? What would you say? Probably uh, probably the last evacuations probably happened somewhere between midnight and 2 a.m. And do you have an idea of how many people might have stayed in the house? I know with Ian there was a form families filled out. Yeah, so uh, on this particular one, we uh, did door-to-door -door because it was just a little bit different scenario with much less people. So uh, Florida Highway Patrol and local sheriff's office agencies, again, in, down in Levy County, had about 100 people that stayed in homes. And then anecdotal, or I should say anecdotally, but up into Taylor County, it was more uh, in the 50-ish range that was confirmed. But uh, I'm sure other people did stay as well. But 
It's a little bit different way to do this. Uh, would you say that uh, the Florida... Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming ABC News Live. You've been listening to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and other officials there uh, talking about Hurricane Idalia after the storm quickly moved through the state. Now it's hitting Georgia. Hurricane Idalia made landfall in a region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm that strong since 1896. At least one death has already been reported. Idalia came ashore as a Category 3 hurricane after reaching Category 4 strength overnight. The storm is now downgraded to a Category 1, but it's still bringing powerful winds and major storm surge. Hundreds of thousands are without power in Florida and Georgia. And Georgia Governor Brian Kemp says South Georgia is already seeing flooding in the coastal region and is urging residents in the area to stay put while that storm passes. I want to bring in meteorologist Greg Dutra for the latest on this storm. Greg, what's the update? Uh, Diane, just amazing here how this has evolved. Of course, just 24 hours ago, it was barely getting to hurricane strength, then all of a sudden to a Cat 4 during the overnight, thankfully weakening a little bit as it made its way inland and also making its way inland at low tide. Now, the tide has gone up. The storm surge has gone up as well. Tide's still going up until about 1 o'clock this afternoon noon or shortly before two actually and here's what we have going on now and this is what we always knew would be transitioning to it's more of a flash flooding concern as you see flash flood warnings are still out from the border of uh, Georgia and uh, Florida all the way up through almost the southern third or so of Georgia watching this is six or so inches of rain has fallen another two on the way we're going to continue to track this coming up Diane all right meteorologist Greg Dutra thanks Greg no problem and South Georgia resident and former news anchor Darren Kagan lives along the coast but has evacuated to Savannah. She's on the phone right now with more on that. Darren, thanks for coming on. I'm wondering what it was like to evacuate your home on the South Georgia coast. Uh, how did you feel making that decision to leave? You know, uh, Diane, thanks for having me on and thanks for giving so much coverage to something that's so important along this part of the Georgia coast. Um, it was I was surprised. It was quite emotional to leave this area. It is so beautiful, and we've come to love it. And it does have its challenges, but just as um, your meteorologist was saying, it was kind of, it was the full experience. We were leaving to get ahead of flooding and high winds, and as we were driving up I-95, we went right into a tornado warning. So we had, you know, you kind of pick your poison. Are you going to get away from flooding or uh, get away from the tornadoes? But we're in Savannah now. It is safe. Uh, right now, I can tell you Savannah looks just pretty much like a warm summer day in terms of a, a rainstorm. Um, it is raining and um, a little bit of wind, but really, really not that bad here yet. What are you most worried about right now in terms of the coastal area where you left? The biggest thing to understand about the Georgia coast is the tides. So you have these beautiful marshes where the tides just on a regular day fluctuate as much as nine feet. So Mother Nature sends the water in and it brings the water out. Um, those high tides though fluctuate throughout the month. It just turns out that this storm is hitting for the during the highest tides of the month. So the tides that are gonna come in anyway are already two to three feet above what they might've been, let's just say two weeks ago. Um, so if the, if the storm hits, when the high tide hits, then we're gonna have some big, some big problems. Are you worried about what you'll see when you go back home? Um, yeah, just because it is what it is, right? Um, We've, we've done what we could. We spent yesterday afternoon getting everything up and out and away and did as much as we could and putting boats away and equipment. And after that, it's, it's up to Mother Nature at this point. Really, it is. And Darren, you did the safe thing. You left. When you talk with your neighbors, does it mm -hmm. seem like other people in your area heeded those warnings as well? Or are there people trying to ride this out? Most of our neighbors chose to stay. Now, most of them are lifetime residents of McIntosh County and that part of the coast. They look at us as the city slickers who moved there three years ago, and they're not all wrong. Um, so, and I will say, we only came as far as Savannah because we want to be able to get back as soon as possible to help with cleanup um, and anything else that we can. But most people did choose to stay. All right. Well, hopefully uh, safe reports from there and hopefully your home is OK. Uh, but uh, Darren, we appreciate you calling in. Keep us posted. Will do. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Stay safe. And I want to go over to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who's in Treasure Island. Uh, Ginger, what's it like there right now? Right. So we're just getting a little bit.
bit of a tail end of a rain band, but looking behind me, the receding of the water. Even here at high tide, we've seen some of this coastal flooding start to pull back because the storm has raced so quickly into Georgia and will eventually get to South Carolina. I do want to share, though, it is not just here along Treasure Island down to St. Pete that we've got this where it kind of washed over. You can see from our drone that a lot of the erosion that we talk regularly about on these really vulnerable islands has allowed a lot of the water in. And so I don't know if you're seeing that there, but you know, my producer and the drone operator were telling me that there were actual trees that were uprooted by the water and then kind of taken into the ocean. So we will end up seeing some of that damage. I'll also take you to Tampa Bay I-275. We've had flooding on that, so the causeway, a problem. I know we've just started to see traffic come in and out here on 107th Avenue into Treasure Island. So I'm sure as the flooding keeps receding down this far, we will see things improve. But we had anywhere really from three to six feet of surge around here. I've seen some of the Crystal River uh, tide numbers going up to around six feet. Uh, that's going to be a problem, and hopefully uh, they can start to see that go away. And then the wind. Guys, this is the part, right? You've heard from Greg, and you, you were just talking to that woman about the trees down, the power lines, and that is a big concern. Um, just some of the gusts that we've seen already, Horseshoe Beach to 81. I just saw that there are some, uh, they're going in to try to search and see if anybody needs Needs rescue, Perry, 85 miles per hour. Mayo, 86 miles per hour. So some really gusty stuff going in there. That easily takes out power and takes trees into homes. On top of the wind, you still have surge that'll start on that counterclockwise rotation on the storm, right? You push the water against the coast and Savannah and Charleston, uh, Hilton Head, all have to watch because you're going to see that push of water come along with the six plus inches of rain. And so when that happens, the rain falls and then it kind of plugs it up and it's not able to get out as quickly as it could. So I think flooding along the coast there is a major concern in the next 24 hours, Diane. And, and Ginger, you mentioned how fast moving this hurricane is. It's already in Georgia. Why is it moving so quickly? Yeah, I mean, the dynamics of this storm were really interesting. There is a front just west of us, and that was all to do with how far east this storm would make it and how close it would be to Tampa Bay. Um, fortunately, again, they had that miss here, thankfully, because you have such a huge population in such a susceptible Bay Area. Uh, but unfortunately, it did take that more north northeasterly track right into Appalachie Bay, which is an area that has not ever seen a Cat 3 or higher since records began. And, you know, that front is going to be the one in part that is starting to drive this to the north and east. Um, there are other upper air dynamics, but I don't want to bore you with all of that. Just basically think that. Plus, remember, it was over 86 to 90 degree waters. So the rapid intensification that happened last night was something we anticipated. Uh, we're two to five degrees above average. So those Gulf warm waters had a lot to do with that fuel as well, as far as strength goes. All right, Ginger Z in Treasure Island. Glad to see the waters receding there, Ginger. Thank you. And the mayor of Treasure Island, Tyler Payne, is joining me now for more on this. Mayor, thanks for coming on. We just saw Ginger there uh, in Treasure Island. What are you hearing from those in the area right now as another high tide comes in? Um, I just drove into the city over our main entrance, our uh, Treasure Island Causeway Bridge, and there's definitely um, still a lot of flooding in our main roadways. Um, Gulf Boulevard is where we're standing right now at one of our main beach access points, um, which is the largest section of our beach here. Um, so a lot of residents are asking if they can come back yet. Our access to all the beaches in Pinellas County is still restricted. Um, no cars are gonna be allowed to come onto the island and we're asking all residents to continue to shelter in place if you didn't leave the, the island, um, as a lot of the roads are still impassable from the, the storm surge. Uh, yeah, we are seeing some of the streets there full of water. What's your biggest concern right now? My biggest concern, we have a neighborhood at the very south end of our, our city called Sunset Beach. It has a lot of older homes that are small beach bungalows, very close together. Um, and a very narrow strip of land between the Gulf and the Bay. And last night we had our initial assessments are saying we had at least three to four feet of water come over and connect the Bay and the, uh, the Gulf. Um, so a lot of those homes down in there that are much older have probably six inches to a foot of water in them, and that could really be devastating for them.
we've also had a lot of issues with our um, our beach as it is. It's, it's severely eroded. We've had a project um, with, to try to get beach nourishment through the Army Corps of Engineers that's been delayed. And the storm is just compounding that issue. And um, the water has washed over all of our sand dunes. You can see behind me, um, our the sand dunes are still full of water in between the beach and Gulf Boulevard here. Um, and there's still a ton of standing water out on on the beach. Yeah, in some cases, our drone was showing palm trees completely uprooted, scattered on the beach as well. Uh, what message do you want to send to your community and to the rest of the country right now? I mean, we are almost 200 miles south of where the storm hit. So especially when we have a storm coming and hitting to the north of us, I mean, like the meteorologist just said, the storm's in Georgia right now, and we're still, I'm standing on the beach, and we have a lot of very gusty winds. It's still not safe to be here. So this is why we do mandatory evacuations. We're in a zone A, so there was a mandatory evacuation for our whole city. Um, so we need to take this seriously. It could have been even worse if it had hit closer to us. Just because it isn't hitting us directly does not mean that you shouldn't be evacuating. All right, Mayor of Treasure Island, Tyler Payne. We know you're busy, Mayor. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020. Winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. Happening right now on ABC News Live, E. Dahlia on the move after slamming into Florida's Gulf Coast as a powerful Category 3 hurricane, the storm carving a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles and triggering widespread power outages. We have the latest on the aftermath and the time and track as the storm swirls inland, putting millions of Americans on alert. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Let's get right to our top story. We're talking about Hurricane Idalia making history in Florida, lashing Big Ben, blowing out power across the state with huge waves just battering homes and a lot of people right now wondering if they have anything left. Idalia made landfall as a Cat 3 just before 8 this morning in the Big Ben region, making it the strongest storm to hit that area in 127 years. It came ashore packing powerful winds, catastrophic storm surge, and the threat of tornadoes as far-reaching as Georgia. The storm has now been downgraded to a Cat 1, losing strength as it moves northeast now over land. At least one death has been attributed to this storm. Florida Highway Patrol saying that a driver actually lost control in Pasco County and died from his injuries. We have team coverage across the region. We're going to start with our Alex Brache, though, because he is exactly where the storm is headed. What are you seeing right now, Alex? 
Hey, Kira. So we did the drive up from Savannah and we just got to Charleston probably about a half hour ago. I'm standing along the banks of the Ashley River. Now, just to orient you a little bit, this dumps into a bay uh, near Fort Sumter down this way and then it hits the ocean, but it's low lying ground. And so we've seen a lot of preparation here at the hotel. They've certainly uh, closed down the patio area. They've taken all the outdoor furniture. People are uh, batting down the hashes, uh, hatches, if you will. But one of the things that's kind of surprising, you know, with all these warnings, because listen, while there has been rain, there have been tornado warnings uh, over the last couple of hours. We've seen quite a bit of traffic here. People out at, at, at bars and restaurants, I guess, getting that last meal in before before they hunker down for this storm. But a lot of preparations underway. I talked to the, uh, the, the front desk here and look, I mean, They've dealt with hurricanes in the past. They know what comes with that, usually flooding, especially with some of these low-lying areas. Uh, they've been able to deal with it in the past. They're hopeful that uh, the history repeats itself. Well, and you're right there in, in a big boating community as well, Alex. And as we have covered uh, clearly these types of hurricanes and the impact, I mean, we've watched those boats come rolling up on shore and adding just to all the damage. I mean, how is everybody there that well at least that you've talked to so far just preparing for what's about to come including you know the entire boating community uh, that stands behind you or floats behind you <laughs> Floats behind me. well listen Kira. i mean there is apprehension right i mean like look again this isn't their first this isn't their first storm um and and certainly there is hope that by the time idelia makes its way here that it will be considerably weaker but they have seen the worst of this, and they understand what comes with this surge. And as you mentioned, I mean, this is a, a, a huge boating community behind me, and there's always that risk. And so, so there is a a, a a nervousness. But 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 as I mentioned, you know, talking to a, a lot of these these business owners along the along the shoreline here, they mentioned that yes, um, while there are areas of this uh, this region that they expect to flood, even areas around here that they expect to flood, they're optimistic that uh, that at least damage to a lot of these buildings uh, won't. Won't be too great and we know clearly we were talking yesterday in florida about just all the colleges and universities there in south carolina as well my oldest daughter went to college there you've got a military academy you know there are preparations underway and things that you know the colleges and academies need to be thinking about as well because you've got students from all over the world right that are living there and don't necessarily have a place to go any idea just how the schools there um the colleges uh, are getting ready for this and how they're they're just making sure the students there will be safe. Well, we haven't had a chance to check in with some of the uh, the schools here in South Carolina, but Kira, I can tell you, we've been doing a, a tour of the Southeast. We made our way all the way up from Jacksonville uh, just a couple of days ago, and in one of the universities there, you know, they were uh, just two weeks into the school year, and and so with these impending storms, um, yes, there is a lot of preparation underway, uh, trying to make sure that these kids who are a lot of times uh, hundreds of miles away from home and, and don't have any way to, to get back home are, are properly taken care of they they have the food that they need because again i mean you know these storms they cut off a lot of access to food grocery stores gas stations we've seen uh the the, the effects of that whenever whenever gas and food kind of become scarce uh and so there's been a lot of communication i can tell you specifically uh edward waters university down in jacksonville uh was was talking about this as we were leaving and it was something that they were in uh, constant communication with with their student body all right, we'll keep checking in with you, Alex, clearly throughout the day. Appreciate it so much. Now let's head to Tampa, where a tornado watch is still in effect until later this afternoon. Our M. Wynn is there. So, M., how have things changed over just the last few hours? Yeah, Kira, you know, right now it is hot. It is humid here, almost eerily quiet compared to earlier this morning. It's also darker, a little bit more dreary than usual in the Tampa Bay area. It comes after hours of heavy rain and strong winds of up to 61 miles per hour. Many coastal areas experience flooding, and this area is no exception. It saw a storm surge of up to six feet, Kira. So let's talk about crews. Uh, have they been able to be, really get an idea of how bad the damage is? I mean, we've got the pictures here. We can see the destruction and how uh, the storm came through there. But what is it that they are dealing with right now? And, um, you know, how's it going to look for the next couple of days? 
Yeah, we heard from the governor just a few minutes ago. He said that the National Guardsmen have been deployed to some parts of Florida to kind of pick up that debris that I'm actually seeing across the area that I'm at right now. And some of those crews already out today assessing that damage. The Tampa Police Department finding cars stranded in high waters. They're warning people to stay inside and avoid even just a few inches of water on the streets. We've also heard from the Tampa International Airport, which actually experienced plenty of flooding in that area. They had officials working around the clock to assess the situation and some good news for you Kira to leave you with after hundreds of cancellations as you probably know out of Tampa the airport is officially reopening this afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern that's the latest we've heard okay I'll tell you folks will be happy to hear that em thank you so much all right let's go further inland now and that's where our Maria V real is she's in Gainesville Florida Maria describe the conditions for us from your vantage point where you are Hey, Kira, so the good thing is that the rain has mostly stopped in this area, but what we're dealing with now on the backside of this storm is the high amount of wind in this area, which could be a major concern for people in this area because we have so many college students that are around here, as you can probably see behind me, that are just anxious to get out of their, their rooms here and really kind of get back out into the real world. Um, the problem is, is that when you have so many people that are, are around this area trying to do this, um, the cell towers just go up and down um, it becomes an issue for law enforcement later on the amount of not having service here so uh, that is what we're dealing with the most just on the back side of this is the floodwaters which you just heard talked about that are slowly receding but also just not having that access to service what about evacuations uh, did, did you see a lot did a lot of people have to evacuate from the area there so there was a point yesterday where we really felt like we were going to catch the brunt of the storm. And so a lot of local law enforcement, a lot of local leaders were asking people to self-evacuate and if not to shelter in place, really. Uh, there were at least three different evacuation centers that were opened up in this area uh, for people who were needing it, who were concerned about really flooding, getting into their homes. The good news is we just checked in with local leaders. They tell us right now they really only have people in one of those shelters at this time right now. Pretty much as the storm blew through Earth, Early this morning, a lot of people felt very comfortable to go back home, um, so they did so. Uh, the shelter that uh, we do know is open right now and has actually people inside of it that'll probably stay open throughout the afternoon. One of the things that a lot of these college students, but really all people in these areas and regions that were really concerned about getting hit hard by this hurricane is um, a lot of stores and businesses closed in anticipation of the storm hitting them pretty hard here. So as of right now, they are still closed and probably will be throughout tomorrow. So uh, we're going to have a lot of anxious uh, uh, people ready to get out and really try and try and get back into the real world at, at this point. All right, Maria, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now for a bit of a broader forecast, uh, we turn to our ABC News meteorologist, Greg Dutra. He's there in New York. So Greg, just give us the latest on the storm. Oh, the latest here is that we continue to see downgrades to the winds, now down to 80 miles per hour, but we knew that was going to happen when it made it inland. Now the main problem is that flash flooding. We had up until recently a flash flood emergency for just south of Pearson, but in this swath from Madison to Perry, all all the way up to about Pearson, five plus inches of rain has fallen. I've even seen a couple of spots that are eight, 10 inches of rainfall. And another couple of inches of rain will fall on top of that as this continues as a category one storm up the coast. And as I mentioned, we're transitioning now to more of a high rainfall, heavy rainfall type threat. You can just see here along the coast how those waters are still pretty high from Idalia. And as this makes its way farther off to the north, it does weaken below, I believe, uh, hurricane strength likely by this afternoon, if not early this evening. But still, these winds, tropical storm force, that's enough to, as you see in that video, knock down trees and remove power from areas. That will be a problem into late tonight, early tomorrow. Notice, too, how those winds are on shore. So rain will be falling on land, trying to go into the ocean, but kind of plugged up by those winds blowing inland. I think that's going to create some flash flooding problems for spots like Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Wilmington, areas where that water is trying to get back out into the ocean ocean and that are already prone to flash flooding. Additionally, on top of that, of course, we do have the problem for tornadoes to spin up as we have seen that happen throughout the day today. 
Oh, yeah, and we've been talking about the morning, uh, the warnings in certain yeah. parts of, of Florida already. If you don't mind, Greg, just to kind of tap dance with me here for sure. a couple minutes. We did get about a two-minute warning from the White House. We're hoping to hear from the FEMA administrator uh, there at the briefing. Um, so while we wait for her to step up to the mic, um, talk to us more about um, the storm, how it's going to impact, you know, states further to the north. We've Absolutely. been talking a little bit about that. Absolutely, and I always bring my dancing shoes with me, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, we have, again, the flooding concerns, and the reason for that, for the areas farther to the north, uh, are twofold, meteorological, and also astronomical too. I mean, we're talking about space here a little bit. The super moon that maybe you've heard of, well, that's because the moon is now at its perigee. It's closest to the earth. The tides are higher when the moon is closer to the earth. So these are the king tides for areas of Florida and along the Eastern seaboard, meaning two feet, three feet higher than normal tides. You gotta combine that with not only the rainfall you see, but the storm surge from this hurricane, which from Charleston to Wilmington, all the way up to uh, even the Northern Banks is gonna be anywhere from two to four feet. So I really do think, even though we are seeing the winds start to die down a little bit, two to five feet of storm surge in Savannah and Charleston is not going to be good news for them because remember that water is trying to flow out, but it's being pushed back in by those waves. Craig, you're a great dancer. We're going to take you out of the White House briefing uh, there where uh, the FEMA Administrator Dan Criswell is going to provide hopefully another update on the hurricane for us. Deployed, prepared to support um, not just Florida, but all of our states that are in the path as needed. Um, while I was in there, the governor also, or the president also directed me to travel immediately into the area, and I will be traveling later this afternoon um, to join Governor DeSantis tomorrow um, to do assessments and see firsthand what the impacts from this storm are, and I can be able to report back to the president exactly what I see, what we think the needs might be, and where the federal family can continue to assist. Before I touch more on Hurricane Idalia, I also want to address um, the second reason that I am here at the White House today. Today I will also join President Biden alongside his cabinet and agency officials who are supporting the response and the recovery efforts on the ground in Hawaii um, as we continue to help the people of Maui rebuild and recover over the long term. The whole of this whole of government approach is what is needed to get the right resources to the people of Maui, the resources and the assistance that they need and that they deserve. Now back a little bit to um, what we know so far on Hurricane Idalia. Uh, while it is still too soon to assess the total damages, we know that the storm made landfall as a Category 3, which means over 120 mile per hour winds and up to 10 inches of rain in some areas. Uh, peak storm surge in some places along the coast. Um, it has peaked right now, but it could surpass once they measure um, over 15 feet of storm surge. And we'll get exact numbers as they're able to go in and assess what the total um, storm surge was. And in fact, Idalia is the strongest storm to hit this part of Florida, to make landfall in this part of Florida in over 100 years. But FEMA and the entire Biden-Harris administration, we were prepared and we were ready to support the needs of this storm. As I mentioned, we have um, actually over 1,500 federal responders that are on the ground in the affected area. This includes over 300 personnel from FEMA, as well as over 500 urban search and rescue personnel ready to support any of the state's requests. As of 7.30 this morning, and I know these numbers are dynamic and fluid, but as of 7.30 this morning, there are nearly 300,000 customer outages um, for power in Florida, and we do expect those numbers to continue to rise as the storm passes through um, and goes into Georgia, and we'll see power outage numbers for Georgia, South Carolina, and perhaps North Carolina. Our partners at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are pre-positioned to support power restoration, and they have over 30 generators that are pre-staged. Additionally, the utilities are preparing for storm impacts, including pre-staging crews and equipment outside of the projected storm track, and the state anticipates a total of about 30,000 to 40,000 linemen in Florida to begin to assist in the power restoration efforts. People that are still in the storm's path, however, as you heard from Corrine, they should not venture out into the storm and remain sheltering in place if your local officials are telling you to do so. However, if you are in trouble and you need immediate assistance, please call 911. 
As you do go out, do not wade in the water. Do not drive through flooded roads and streets. Just remember, turn around, don't drown. Unfortunately, we see so many fatalities after the storm passes. We want to uh, make sure that everybody is taking the right precautions to keep themselves safe. And as always, please continue to listen to your local officials as this storm continues to pass over Georgia currently and into South Carolina. Please check on your friends and your family and your loved ones, especially older adults and people living with disabilities to see if they have any needs. In closing, I just want to remind people that this is still very much an active situation. Remnants of the storm are still affecting Florida as we speak. The storm is over Georgia and moving into South Carolina. People there and in the Carolinas will continue to experience impacts throughout the day today and possibly into the weekend. Again, FEMA is well postured with our federal partners to support Floridians during this time of need and stands ready to support other affected states as needed. With that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Administrator, what are you most concerned about over the next day or two since you just said it's too early right now to assess the extent of damage in Florida? Yeah, my biggest concern is those people who chose not to evacuate. And I know that our local first responders, the heroes that are out there in those local communities are doing an amazing job already of going into the areas where people did not evacuate and helping to get them to safety. I think that is our priority through the day today is to make sure that everybody is safe after this storm has passed. As we go into the next few days, we're gonna wanna assess what the total amount of damage is and see what immediate needs need to be put forth in order to help support and start the recovery process. Uh, Administrator Criswell, thank you so much. Um, could you just take us a little bit into that briefing that you had with the president today? What is he most concerned about? What was he most focused on? Any other direction that he gave to you other than to fly down to Florida? And then secondly, you said that Governor DeSantis is satisfied with the federal response, doesn't need anything additional. Uh, was there anything else discussed on that, on that call? Yeah, the, the president's main concern is making sure that we are, are bringing everything that we have in to support these states as they're um, having immediate response response and life-saving needs or beginning to start their assessment and their recovery process. Um, I think it's incredibly important that, that our governors know that, that we are ready and postured to bring in all federal resources to support any of their life-saving and their life-sustaining needs um, in the very near future. Uh, the conversation with Governor DeSantis uh, was that, you know, reiterating the fact that we already have over 1,500 personnel there um, in the area to be able to support. And the governor currently has no unmet needs, um, but as as we begin to assess, right, as the governor assesses and as I get on the ground tomorrow to assess, we'll see what additional needs might be there and if any of those resources need to be employed or we need to move more into the area. Has the president spoken yet with the governors of Georgia or South Carolina as well or any plans for that to happen? Um, I believe he was preparing to contact them after I left so I could come to this briefing. Good job. Uh, thank you. Administrator, to what extent do you attribute climate change as a cause of this storm and the other weather events that we're seeing over the last weeks and months? Yeah, you know, I'm not going to attribute the cause of the storm, but what I can say is that we are seeing an increase in the number of severe weather events. And what we saw with this storm, as we have seen with several of our hurricanes over the last few years, is that they are intensifying more rapidly due to the um, elevated heat of the water temperature in the Gulf or in the Pacific or whether it's in the Atlantic. These storms are intensifying so fast that our local emergency management officials have less time to, to warn and evacuate and get people to safety. This is something that we have to take into consideration as we build our preparedness plans, as our local communities build their preparedness plans on how they're going to communicate and prepare their communities for the types of storms that they're going to face in the future. Secondly, more specifically on this storm, do you have any sense, or is it too early now, to say what the cost of recovery will, will require or will be? Yeah, it's far too early to even estimate what the cost is. Uh, it's still unsafe in many parts to even go out. Um, that's what's going to happen over the next several days is to really get a good understanding and an initial estimate of what we think the costs will be and what the amount of impact to these communities has been. Absolutely. Just to follow on that, with what you've seen so far, how long do you think it will take to get that full assessment and how long will it take to understand the costs of the recovery efforts? Yeah, we have rapid assessment teams that have been pre-positioned, ready to go out as soon as it's safe to 
to do so. And so th those are personnel that will integrate in with the state personnel to go see what the damages are. Um, but we also use technology, right? We use aerial imagery and satellite technology, and we use our geospatial information to get a better idea. So we don't have to physically put people out there, and it allows us to make these types of decisions much quicker than we've been able to in the past. And so, again, it will take several days to get a full understanding of what the initial assessment, a uh, damage assessment is, but it will take longer to get the full picture of the total um, amount of impact to these communities. And yesterday you had said that FEMA's disaster relief fund was running low. With what we've seen from this storm so far, there's also the Maui fires. Do you think there's enough funding? Are you confident there's enough if there's another extreme weather event in the next month? Yeah, so yesterday, as I announced, I directed uh, my personnel to implement what we call immediate needs funding, and that prioritizes the remaining funding within the Disaster Relief Fund to support those life-saving efforts. Um, I believe through this effort we have plenty of funding to be able to support our ongoing efforts in Maui, as well as this event, um, to include Florida, Georgia, South Carolina as needed. Um, but we are monitoring it very closely, right? Every day we are looking at what the cost of these storms are as we approach um, end of this fiscal year, and if we have another storm, we're going to have to closely monitor what impact that's going to have and any other actions we might have to take. Uh, Administrator, thank you for being here. As we do approach the end of the fiscal year, as you just noted, just getting a little bit down the road, these take weeks, months to recover. FEMA's involvement will go on for quite a long time. Back in 2013, when there was a government shutdown, FEMA had to furlough its non-essential staff right now. What potential impact would a government shutdown, as lawmakers have considerations about whether to fund the government, have on FEMA's ability to care for those in both Maui and in Florida? I mean, we always uh, want to take account to what our personnel that are funded through the Disaster Relief Fund, and so they're able to continue operating and supporting all of the immediate um, efforts and life-saving efforts that continue to go on. And we also, for our other staff, uh, can designate our, our emergency essential personnel to support any life-saving efforts. And so uh, we have plans in place, as we have gone through this before, on how we would staff our, our agency to continue to support those efforts. And if I can't follow up about the critical needs assistance that was provided to those in Maui, seven hundred dollars in payments to individuals there given the cost of living in Hawaii specifically in the Lahaina community is anything being done right now are there considerations or efforts being made to try to raise that cap that seven hundred dollar figure for those who are there yeah the seven hundred dollar figure of critical needs assistance is really just that amount of funding for some of the very immediate needs um, that individuals have uh, every year the the main part of our assistance which is our individual and household program adjusts annually Annually, based on inflation. This year it's $41,000 of a cap that individuals can get. Uh, that will get raised after the um, fiscal year. I, I don't know what that number is yet, but we do adjust that main portion of the funding that goes to individuals annually based on inflation. So 700 is it for now, and then they can pursue those other monies going forward. But if people have run through that money right now, they're on their own until they get access to the further assistance coming. Yeah, and we already have... Um, I think it was 12,000 individuals that registered for assistance in Maui um, and somewhere um, over $15 million that's out on the street. That number could be higher um, right now from that other program. Thank you. Um, I know that you and the governor and local officials, state officials have all told people that they get out of the way of this storm. So my first question is, are you satisfied that people heeded those calls, both from you and, and local and state officials? And then secondly, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the search and recovery teams that are sort of deployed and ready to, to go. What's your assessment so far on what those needs look like if people are sort of stranded right now? Yeah, so on the first question, I think many people did heed the warning, but unfortunately many did not. Right, we're already getting reports of people that chose to stay and they're getting calls um, into the local first responders to come in and assist them. And if anybody needs assistance, they should. They should call 911 and those local uh, first responders will come in and help. Um, as far as the, the entire footprint of those resources that are available, it's a combined effort recognizing uh, the capability that the state already has with all of their resources and we have additional resources that are integrated in with that operation. So if we need to immediately augment, we have of resources that are ready to deploy um, as soon as requested um, without hesitation and without interruption. But is it clear yet how many people may be stranded? Oh, I don't have a number on how many, no. Uh, from the initial assessment, what would you say are the most damaged areas? And uh, what was the 
response from the population in those areas to the government's instructions? I would say that initial reports um, are in that Big Bend area that have had the greatest impact. They have experienced the greatest amount of storm surge. They experienced the greatest wind speeds. And so when we do get out to start assessments, that would be uh, my anticipation of where we would experience the greatest amount of damage and impact um, across Florida. And how did people respond in those areas? Again, I think many people did heed the warnings and there was a lot of public messaging that went out there to let people understand that the danger is not just the cone of the hurricane, but it's the storm surge and the water, which is creating and causing the most fatalities in these events. Um, but again, many people did not, as we are hearing about our first responders going in to support rescuing people from their homes that are now stranded. Okay, we're gonna wrap, we'll wrap it up we'll way in the back and then edge of the James, on the immediate needs funding, I'm curious if you have recognized the potential long-term ongoing recovery efforts that could be at risk here. Uh, so if I understand the, the long-term recovery efforts based on right now or what it looks like going into the next fiscal year? Going into the next, next fiscal year, which ones are at risk here if you do not get the funding you need? Yeah, so what immediate needs funding does is the work does not stop, right? The projects continue to go underway. Our longer term recovery projects for the variety of disasters that we've experienced over the year. The obligation or the reimbursement of the funding for those is delayed into the next fiscal year. Um, if it gets delayed into the next fiscal year, then that just starts us out at a smaller balance of what we had anticipated our needs would be for fiscal year 24. Are there any ongoing efforts, though, that you've identified that would be at risk if it comes to that? Again, the funding or the work itself does not stop. It's the funding that just gets delayed into the next fiscal year. Could add last question. Well, I think the fact that Hawaii has been administrator because there's still a lot of questions uh, among officials in Maui and the Hainan across Hawaii about who was in charge in the hours as the fires burned and in the hours after. You're a veteran local emergency management official. Uh, state emergency management official, not at the federal level. How do you assess how officials there responded? Uh, are there lessons to be learned perhaps for other communities? And is your agency prepared to work with congressional Republicans if they launch investigations as they say they will? Um, again, I was not there during the response, and so I would um, be out of line to assess how they responded during the time because I did not experience what they were experiencing. Uh, what the federal government does is we come in and we support their efforts, and that's exactly what we did, and we will continue to support their recovery and their rebuilding efforts as they move forward. Were you being properly briefed by FEMA authorities in Hawaii that would have been working with those officials? Uh, what I was briefed on throughout the time is my regional administrator, Bob Fenton, happened to be uh, in Oahu um, for another meeting, and he was engaging with the team and giving us updates as to the spread of the fire and what the population was impacted and what the potential uh, federal resources would be needed to come help support the initial response and the ongoing recovery efforts. And if congressional Republicans want you or other agency officials to testify about what went on in Hawaii, I'm happy to, to so. testify on what the federal role was in this process. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. All right. Thank Safe you. Travels Thank tomorrow. You. Thank you. All right. One, one thing before we continue. All right. White House Thank briefing is going to continue there. Corrine Jean-Pierre stepping up to the mic, but you just heard from Deanne I Criswell, the update. FEMA administrator. So more than 1,500 federal personnel on the ground right now. More than 540 urban search and rescue personnel. U.S. Coast Guard uh, has teams in position uh, for uh, search and rescue efforts. Um, she also mentioned three disaster survivor assistance teams have already been deployed, uh, and including pre stage critical supplies uh, from meals uh, to water to everything uh, that those um, that have experienced really the worst part of this hurricane so far that just all all the assets are there to support. For more, let's bring in our uh, White House correspondent Elizabeth Schulze and also uh, meteorologist Greg Dutra, who we'll talk to in just a second just about where this storm is moving and how we need to sort of look ahead um, from state to, to state, really. So Elizabeth, it, you know, 
you heard Criswell um, clearly um, uh, touting its horn, <laughs> the FEMA horn, uh, and also the administration. Uh, but we do have to look at the reality things, uh, the reality of things right now, and we're just not out of the woods uh, completely. We're still tracking clearly the storm, but um, there has been a lot of uh, devastating um, effects from mm -hmm. from the storm so far, and and people need the assistance. Right, Karen, one thing that struck me from FEMA Administrator Criswell's kind of remarks was saying that several people did not heed those evacuation orders in the parts of Florida that have been hit. And so they are dealing with kind of that immediate aftermath of how to help those who might still kind of be in the path and trying to get help now. She did say it will take several days to assess the damage on the ground, very much talking about how this is, you know, just really made landfall. It's going to take some time for the federal government to try to figure out exactly what its response needs to look like, but clearly the effort right now is on looking at what the damage is, but also the path of the storm overall. We heard uh, Administrator Criswell talk about how President Biden is going to be speaking to the governors of Georgia and South Carolina. We know he's been talking to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in recent days and trying to send this message, Kira, the federal government is here for what you need. We have these 1,500 personnel on the ground already, and we stand ready with additional resources as they come and as we assess what's going on uh, on the ground. All right, Elizabeth, uh, just stay with us if you don't mind. Let's take it over to Alex Prochet. He's there in Charleston um, where he's uh, getting ready, uh, I guess bracing uh, for what could be uh, next. Um, the storm definitely headed that way. You're all already feeling some of the effects. What did you think about um, what you heard uh, from the FEMA administrator there, Alex? And, um, and what do you think those there in Charleston are most concerned about at this point. Well, we heard this afternoon uh, from the FEMA administrator something that's been e echoed by a lot of the leaders here in South Carolina. Actually, here we're expecting a, uh, a, a, an update from uh, Governor Henry McMaster uh, around 2 p.m. But I can tell you that the city of Charleston has already declared a state of emergency. So has the state in preparation for Idalia making its way here. And with that, uh, they're operating at something called OpCon 2, which means uh, more emergency personnel out. Uh, they've taken more precautions in terms of uh, uh, limiting some, some some street access here and also they've gone about opening shelters uh, for, for for homeless uh, they've uh, opened up parking garages for folks uh, that need to get their cars off the ground again I mean you can see we're ground level right here there's a marina here right on the Ashley River uh, and uh, you know this is an area that's prone to flooding and so because of that they're, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're giving people the opportunity to kind of get their cars off the ground. They know that part of this area is going to flood, uh, and because of that, uh, they, they want to make these preparations. But again, we're expecting Idalia to make its way here to South Carolina around 8 p.m., but also keep in mind that high tide is 8.30, and so there is a big concern that with that could come uh, an increased storm surge. And that's exactly what Greg Hutra is tracking for us right now. Greg, you want to weigh in on Charleston? Uh, I would love to. Yeah, Charleston is a very flood-prone city. They won two inches of rain from a severe thunderstorm. I've been there before uh, and watched what that does. And I mean, the water runs down the streets in a lot of cases very quickly, overwhelming the storm systems, the storm drain systems. So here's the problem. Right about now, we're at the peak of high tide. The tide will start to recede a little bit, but already we're getting these onshore winds up the coast in two to five feet of storm surge along with four or five inches of rain. And that's going to be a problem for spots like Charleston because they do have just easy storms drainage issues. Now, through the next couple of hours here, I do expect this to continue to move off to the north and east. And as it does so, it will lose wind strength. But again, this is exactly the point I'm trying to illustrate. You got all this rain that's falling inland, even inland of Charleston, but it's got to go somewhere, right? It wants to empty into the sea. And as it's trying to do so, you've got these winds that are blowing inland, and that's kind of plugging up all the rivers and streams that allow it to move out of the cities. So that's going to be an issue. I really do think there's going to be some flash flooding through Charleston up to Myrtle Beach, possibly Wilmington. As this continues north and becomes a tropical storm, I don't think we're really concerned so much about the winds anymore. It's more the rain threat going forward.
Well, and you were listening to the FEMA administrator there at the briefing, uh, mm -hmm. Greg. I mean, I, w I was surprised, as was Elizabeth, uh, to hear about her biggest concern, and that was uh, for those who decided not to evacuate. You know, we always, <laughs> this seems to be the same thing over and I over know. again, right? Every time we cover these conditions, there's warning out there, but some people either can't uh, or they just don't mm -hmm. want to. So, um, I guess we should reiterate, reiterate because you see this time and time again, just the points yeah. that the administrator made about um, you know, tracking the storm, listening to people like you, and doing what you need to do to protect yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to brush under the rug the fact that some people just can't evacuate. They don't have the means to right. evacuate. Uh, so that is, of course, an issue. But there are a lot of people, and I hear it time and time again, you hear it time and time again, it's so frustrating, that just won't. You can tell them that this thing's going to wipe their house off of the face of the earth, and they're not going to leave no matter what you say because they have an attachment. Uh, that is, of course, a problem because now trees are down and power is out and hopefully they have enough food and water for three days because it's not like the storm just leaves you and moves off the coast and then you can pop back out and go about your day live and you know, you're picking up a couple of sticks out of your yard. There's power lines down. There's infrastructure that's damaged. They have to do, the first responders now, a very door-to-door -door type deal where they're trying to reestablish first the damage that's done and then actually go back and get the power fixed and it's a very house by house type thing that takes quite a lot of time so it is a very big heavy burden that you have to weigh the staying versus going now the good news is folks that are kind of down from this you're going to have plenty of warning of course before the rain gets here and you still have some time to prep but to be honest with you in charleston uh and myrtle beach you're just going to have to ride this out if you're there now because the rain's headed for you. And you know, thankfully, people who live in Charleston, they know what parts of town are most vulnerable to it. So I would actually, you know, leave it up to them to make a pretty good decision. All right, Greg, we'll keep talking throughout the day, of course. Right. Thanks to you, Alex, Elizabeth. And straight ahead, our continuing coverage of Idalia swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Cat 3 hurricane. We are tracking the storm for you throughout the day. Stay with us. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us here on ABC News Live. Our breaking news coverage of Hurricane Idalia continues. The storm now a Cat 1 moving into Georgia after really wreaking havoc all across the state of Florida. The hurricane initially made landfall around 745 this morning as a major Cat 3 storm right there in the region of Florida that hasn't been hit 
by something like this or this strong since 1896. And my next guest is being directly impacted by the hurricane. Lisa Benson lives there in Pinellas Park in St. Petersburg, Florida. She decided to rough it out, uh, wait out that storm instead of evacuating, despite living very close to Tampa Bay. Lisa joins me now via phone. So I guess, uh, or no, we got you up uh, excellent via uh, Zoom. So glad. So Lisa, I guess, tell me, bring me up to date on just how the past 24 hours have been for you so far. Uh, well, good afternoon. Um, no sleep deprived, but I'm thankful to be here. I feel actually a little blessed right now when it's not over yet. Um, we still have to deal with this king tide, obviously, but we are very thankful that we still have power and that we woke up dry, at least for this first half. Um, it was a rough night. Um, you know, I've been up since about 2.30, but um, I'm very thankful that we are where we are right now. I do have some friends who um, are in a much rougher situation than we are. So I'm very thankful um, for that we are still dry for right now, but ask me again in like another hour and a half as we are still waiting this king tide that is supposed to come through. And let's talk so about this king tide in Tampa and, and, and what it could mean for you. Not everybody's familiar with that. Well, um, cause, hey, it's Florida. So besides having a hurricane, besides having, let's have a hurricane at high tide, let's throw a full moon on top of it. So, you know, you can't, you know, it's Florida. You got to have a sense of humor about these things. So <laughs> with a hurricane, with high tide, you know, we're going to have a full moon on top of that high tide. So it makes what's called a king tide. So it makes that high tide that much more intense. It's going to be that much. I'm not a scientific person, but it makes the high tide that much more intense. It's that much more of a, um, apparently a higher pull on the water. So it makes your high tide that much higher. So um, I live uh, I live actually in between the Gulf and Tampa Bay. So I'm like right smack dab in the middle. But my neighborhood is surrounded by all these bayous. You know, you hear about all these lovely canals. Well, I'm like right, I've got bayou. I've got a house that's like across the street. There's a bayou right behind them. The next street over, there's a lovely bayou right behind them too. So yeah, I've been sweating bullets all night. All I'm day. curious. No, I, I can understand. I, I'm curious. Are you are you on your computer right now, or are you are you on a phone? I'm on an iPad. You're on an iPad. I'm just wondering. I mean, are you able to take us outside and sort of show us um, how close you are to the water? Don't feel like you have to, but I was just curious if we might be able to see <laughs> how close those canals are to you. I'm so locked in with sandbags. <laughs> and tarps <laughs> i have not opened anything <laughs> that when makes sense that okay bagged in there we were yeah I, I i think my husband can you call me back in like an hour and a half and then i can do that for you <laughs> okay that's because a deal this, well because here's the thing you know the low tide low tide was a good six feet above what meteorologists predicted. So everybody now is super paranoid about what this high tide and king tide is going to bring. Right. So when you've got the low tide being a good five and a half to six feet higher, you know, now we're all like, oh my God, <laughs> you're kidding me. So yeah, my husband's not letting me open any kind of doors. <laughs> Okay, no, I understand. Because, you know, you are got, locked in. You've got everything. We are so locked in. I mean, I, you know, I did all the sandbags I could. We tarped everything on top of it. Um, you know, and I see, you know, I mean, I'm thankful that we still have power. So, yeah, I'm seeing all the pictures. I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing downtown Clearwater. I'm seeing Tarpon. I'm seeing all these places where, you know, I'm seeing my girlfriend in Snell Isle. Snell Isle is completely you know, it's completely flooded. And I'm seeing where, you know, the water is going over all of the sandbags. And I'm just, I'm, I'm praying really hard. And I'm in zone B, I'm not even in zone A. You know, zone A is like, you know, 
the next street over. So that's why we didn't evacuate because they were like, they didn't even think about zone B. And I'm like, okay, well, we're really close. Should we, shouldn't we, should we, shouldn't we? And it's just that this storm was so wonky. This was not like any of the other storms. You know, I mean, normally we always evacuate, but we were like, so they did they tell, they did they tell you? B. Okay, so they didn't, they didn't tell zone B to evacuate. Um, okay, no, so then they no. didn't tell what you to I, evacuate. Why? No, no, ma'am. No, they so only why did, did you, they, they did. Why did you choose did, not to they, leave, they Lisa? Did, they, one, they didn't tell us to. Um, okay. Two, um, they didn't really tell us about the king tide at first. You know, they just said, you know, oh, well, you know, you're going to have, you know, it's going to come at high tide. King tide didn't come until much later. And then uh, it was too late. Like, you had oh. to stay put. It, 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 well, it was kind of late. And my, right, and my husband works like two counties over. And we were like, oh, well, that makes it a little different. And we're like, should we? Shouldn't we? And we're like, okay. No one else was leaving either. And okay, so like, all your okay, neighbors well, are there too? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And do they have sandbags and up? It, how high? How high did you stack the sandbags? I'm curious. Oh, girl, like two to three high. <laughs> <laughs> and then the tarps. Where exactly do you put the tarps? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. There's a system. You do tarps. Yeah. Give first. us. A, tell us the system, right? You you tarp first, and if you run out of tarps, then you use shower curtains, and the places where you run out of tarps, and then you sandbag over that. So that this, so you have a barrier for your sandbag. So have you been through so, a situation similar? I mean, we know this is historic, what we're talking about, but have you been through uh, a storm uh, that even compares to something like this? Um, and did no, you get water in your house? Bumpier. Okay. We did not get water, but we are not from here. I'm originally from Detroit, as you can tell by my New York accent. And when we first moved here, when we first moved here, I moved here, um, and the first uh, major hurricane we had, we had, it was, we had four at once. It was with Charlie. And, you know, then we had the three ones right after that. But Charlie was that bullseye right to Tampa. And, you know, it was my first major hurricane. I had two small children, and um, one of my children's classmates was from St. Pete. And he basically gave me like the crib notes on what to do during a hurricane. And I studied it like I was a college student studying for a final exam, pulled, basically pulled an on item with it. And I have taken that, run with it. Anybody that's new that's ever come to town, that is what I've taught them. Um, and I, you know, take everything seriously with these. You cannot play. Um, nope, sure can. And you, you know, it, I mean, from the, tossing the furniture, you know, if it's plastic, into the pool because it could be a projectile to, you know, grabbing everything off, running everything upstairs if you have an upstairs, you know, um, you know, having everything elevated to, you know, grabbing things that's most precious to you, which is interesting because what could be most precious to a child might not necessarily be what you think of. You know, for example, with Charlie, my children were kindergarten and second grade. I grabbed my child, my daughter's dress up clothes and I grabbed my son's signed Tiger Woods picture because that was <laughs> what was most precious to them being a kindergartner and a second grader. You know, now they are, you know, now they're grown adults. What I grabbed was different. I grabbed my son's most prized sneakers <laughs> and I grabbed, you know, something that was very sentimental to my daughter. <laughs> you know, it's different. And you have to look at what is most important besides the signed documents you know, the house deed and the insurance papers and that kind of things. So you have to, you really have to take into account, you know, what's important, but also besides taking care of the pets and, you know, making sure you have food and all that. You also want to make sure you're grabbing memories, you're grabbing the photo albums, but you also want to look at, you know, you want to look at your family, look at your children and grab what is important to them. And at that time, back in the day, what was important to them age appropriate. 
Well, I'll tell you what, Lisa, you should be writing the book on how to be prepared. <laughs> you have just got this down. You have just written the manuscript right there in front of our eyes. Um, we're going to keep checking in with you. I hope you don't mind uh, there in Pinellas Park as you are concerned, of course, about this king tide and what it means uh, for people there in your area, especially you. You've chosen to stay put. You've got the sandbags. You've got the tarps. You know what to, what to hold on to and what is most important. We are going to stay in close touch with you, and I'm just so glad you were able to zoom in with us. Uh, Lisa, stay in close touch, please. We'll talk to you in about an hour and a half or so, okay? Oh, thanks for checking in. I appreciate the thoughts and prayers, and, uh, you know, hopefully we will stay dry. <laughs> I, I have a good feeling. Um, if anything, you are prepared. That's for sure, Lisa. Thank you. And coming up, of course, more here on ABC News Live as we continue our coverage of the hurricane that's swirling inland now after slamming into Florida as a Cat 3. We are tracking the very latest for you all throughout the afternoon. Don't go far. One, two, three. Let's go! Stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website runs. Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and Shine. Rise and Shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the sky. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the aftermath of the Maui fires, I'm Melissa Adan. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. So glad you're choosing us to stream with as we are keeping a very close eye on Hurricane Adelia, as it's been downgraded now to a Category 1, losing strength as it moves northeast now overland into South Georgia. The hurricane made landfall this morning in Florida's Big Bend region, a powerful Cat 3 hurricane. High winds, strong storm surge. The hurricane now the strongest storm to hit that Big Bend area since 1896. And our next guest is Mayor of Bel Air, Florida. That's in Pinellas County, which has been under this mandatory evacuation order right now. Residents in that town are faced with dangerous standing floodwaters and power outages. The mayor of Bel Air, Michael Wilkinson, joining me now. Michael, uh, appreciate your time so much. I know you have a lot on your mind, a lot to prepare for. <laughs> and you know what, since you're, you're with me uh, outside there, why don't you just go ahead and and I give am. us a show and tell and tell us how I'll you're preparing. Okay, uh, let's see absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay, here we go. We're actually in one of our parks. We're in Thompson Park right now. I'll put my, my camera around here. So we're on Thompson Park. I'm now looking west, which the intercoastal to waterway is right here. And then in the distance, you'll see some condos, which are over on the beach. That's Clearwater Beach over there. And then as you move south, there's more beach towns. As you go south, they are under a mandatory evacuation. I understand the bridges are closed going over to the... Uh, over to the islands and the beach. Uh, here on the mainland, we're, like I said to the, your producer, we actually hug the intercoastal waterway right here. 
But I've had about three roads that were flooded. Uh, luck, very luckily, they're now receding. Uh, but we are going to be facing a high tide here very soon, and with other ones tonight with a full moon. So we do think we dodged a bullet out here. Uh, a band just came through pretty strong, and it feels like another one's coming through again. So, but uh, so far, so good. So how have you been, you know, just addressing your constituents, your community there, uh, and telling them, um, informing them, how are you bringing them up to date? What have you asked them to do? Right. Absolutely. So, no, we have, a, we have a whole department dedicated to public outreach through, our, you know, via, via Facebook and Instagram, and they've done a great job communicating with our, with our, with our residents. Our residents have been through all this before, so they knew exactly what to do. We have a tremendous staff. In fact, I've got someone out here right now who was actually out here cleaning the park when I came out. This is Brian, so uh, he was actually out here. We've got a great staff that got us prepared for this storm and now helping us through, uh, kind of going through it right now and uh, coming out the other side of it. So very fortunate to have a great staff and great residents here, here in Bel Air. So, so tell me who's out there with you right now. Oh, this is Brian Doyle. Let me see if I can get back can on camera. To, I have my mayor? earbuds in, so I don't think he can hear you. Yeah, I don't think he can hear you because my earbuds are in, but he's out here. Uh, he's part of our public works crew, and they're doing a fantastic job out here. Yeah, do me a favor. Okay, Brian, Could you help. just, uh, yeah, I was going to say, you've got the, the earbuds in, yeah. but it, can you ask Brian what he's been doing and how? Yeah. yeah, that would, okay, great. I'll take him out. I'll take him out. Okay, <laughs> get a chance to talk to Brian. <laughs> they want to know how you're doing out. Um, good, but I mean, compared to uh, our hurricane last year, Ian, um, which we, the, the town of Miller got very lucky in this area, uh, but Ian, um, this, this is uh, a lot better. The, the debris damage um, is nothing compared to the end. And again, we got very lucky last year. Uh, it's very minimal debris um, on the roadway. Um, like, like everyone's been saying, our biggest thing is uh, the water uh, flooding, which um, we try to, to contain as best we can, get road signs out. Um, but overall, it's, 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 it's been pretty good. Good, good. Let me see if I can see my Bluetooth off here. All right, can you, do you guys hear that? Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor. Right, and, and just did to- Did you guys hear all that? Yes, yes, heard all that. That was that. Thank you so much. And because that was one of my questions as, as Brian's out there, yes, uh, right Mayor. I know that your, yes, your tech, yep. Can you hear me okay? Okay, yeah, we're back. Do you hear Can me you hear all us right? Okay? I hear yes, you, I Mayor. Hear you just fine. Okay, great. Perfect. Well, just to just yeah, just to ask you, just to play off what Brian was saying, I know that you've been dealing with these dangerous uh, standing floodwaters right now and these power outages. Um, and so, what exactly are you know? What's Brian and the and the crews doing just to let folks know? Look, it's not safe to walk outdoors, right, into the water with power lines down. I mean, there's a lot of safety concerns right now. Uh, absolutely. So um, Duke Energy has been great here in town. We've had, we've had some power outages, but uh, they got us back up running pretty quickly. There's actually a band coming through right now. I don't know if you can tell or not, but there's now a band of water and wind coming um, coming through right now. So we may have to kind of uh, head to our vehicles. And it's you know what? Rough Let's do that. Let's do that, Mayor. Go ahead and head to your vehicles. We will stay in touch with us. We'll come back to you. Obviously, safety first. Uh, Mayor Michael Wilkinson there of Bel Air, Florida. Brian by his side uh, in the moment yeah. as it's all coming down. Absolutely. As we can. Thank, thank you, you Mayor. Thank you. We'll check, we'll check back with you. Appreciate it. We'll so be on much. it throughout the thank day. You. Absolutely. And we will continue okay, well, our live uh, coverage here uh, with people like the mayor there in certain areas uh, throughout Florida and also uh, within Georgia, the Carolinas, as this hurricane just continues uh, to slam certain parts of the country. We are tracking every bit of it for you throughout the afternoon. Stay with us. A lot more on the other side. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the 
know you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting in Philadelphia, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, so glad you're streaming with us today. Uh, we are, of course, following uh, the hurricane that continues uh, to, to move through Florida. Uh, slamming the Gulf Coast there. Powerful Category 3 hurricane. It's carved a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles. Also triggering widespread power outages. We've got... We've got the latest on the aftermath, of course, and the time and the track of this storm as it continues to swirl inland, putting millions of Americans on alert right now. I'm glad we have Greg Dutra with us, uh, our meteorologist who's been just tracking this storm um, through the night, the morning, now this afternoon. Uh, Greg, where do we even begin? It's kind of hard to keep up with all the various spots, right, that where it's already passed through, it's going to possibly be headed. We just talked to the mayor there in Bel Air. Mm -hmm. He thought that things were kind of calm and then all of a sudden the wind and the rain started picking up. Um, this is where we need you because you're looking at everything in real time. There. You've, you've got a couple of things you're juggling, right? You're, you're juggling the after effects from the rainfall. Of course, there's a little bit of a lag between when it rains and when the actual flooding happens. And then we're also looking forward into the forecast uh, ahead of this while at the same time keeping an eye on the current conditions. So you got past, present, and future all rolled into one. Three balls to keep juggling in the air and we continue that juggling act at this hour the two o'clock update just came in from the national hurricane center and idalia is still a hurricane but just barely 75 miles per hour is the latest wind speed 74 is enough to make it hurricane strength now that is also notably the last hourly update that the national hurricane center is going to do now they're going to switch to their standard times and that would put our next update at five o'clock so this is technically likely to remain our hurricane until five o'clock but i'd be surprised if it's got another hour left in it now we're getting all hung up in the naming and you know what category is it but that being said it still poses the same threat uh, that it had at a category one that it will still have as a tropical storm. And that is the heavy rains and also the flash flooding. So here we are to about seven o'clock tonight. I want you to notice something. See these winds that are blowing on shore? They're blowing on shore. They're not allowing the rivers and streams to effectively drain into the ocean. So all this rain that's also trying to drain back into the ocean is going to back up in areas like Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Wilmington, up into North Carolina, even through tomorrow morning are going to have to deal with at least some type of flooding. Now, is it going to be as bad as it was in coastal Florida or even uh, Tampa, even though it didn't make landfall in Tampa, didn't even come within 100 miles? 
No, I don't think the flooding is going to be that bad. But that being said, there will be isolated spots that will see major flooding from Wilmington all the way down to Charleston. Here's the core of the heaviest rainfall. Again, notice that it does fall a bit inland from the coast, but that is going to try to drain into the ocean and try as it might. It's going to have a hard time with that storm surge that we are watching at least through tomorrow afternoon. Kira? So you've been talking about this storm moving ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. is, is there a benefit to that? There is. There, there's, a, there's a cost and a benefit to it. Now, the biggest benefit is that you get your conditions uh, in a little or out rather a little bit earlier, right? But they also arrive a little bit earlier. So if you weren't preparing enough, uh, then perhaps you got caught a little bit off guard. But with the rainfall moving now at 20 miles per hour, uh, that is about four or five miles per hour faster than we thought. It is a significant difference because it won't let the rain stay over the same spot for the same amount of time. But again, it may catch people a little bit early in Charleston and on up the coast because it's getting to you effectively quicker. I mean, just six, seven hours ago, this made landfall and it's already through Georgia. So uh, it's moving pretty quick. And then we heard from the FEMA administrator. I know you were listening mm -hmm. uh, to her as well when she addressed uh, everybody there at the White House uh, briefing, uh, saying that one of the biggest things she was concerned about was the fact that um, those that were told to evacuate didn't evacuate. And, yeah. you know, you and I were talking about, look, not everybody has the ability just to pack up and go, right? You've yeah. got elderly people, disabled people. There's a lot that goes into this. Some folks don't have family members that can help them out. Right. But, you know, your advice as you're sort of tracking this, for those that can get out and help others to get out, mm -hmm. um, this is the type of storm you don't want to mess with. <laughs> yeah, you, you really don't, uh, especially because it's got such wide reaching problems. Now, you just got to stay on top of the weather. Uh, your latest observations, if you live further up, like up towards Charleston, because you are mainly going to be a flooding risk. But folks who live in around cities like Charleston uh, and the like, they know what it, parts of town flood. But what you do need to be prepared for is losing power for a couple of days. So that is going to be a problem again up the coast as this continues to move. And even though it's going to get below hurricane strength, you'll still see tropical storm force winds, 45 plus miles per hour, even up uh, and upwards of 50 for a long time. That's gonna knock down trees. It's gonna take out power too, but in the immediate term, there are still active flash flood warnings. And from Vidalia to Hazelhurst, Alma, Douglas, all of these areas still have flash flood warnings. They've seen three, four inches of rain. We'll likely see another two inches of rain on top of that. And that could, even though this is so far inland, really come up on you very fast. And I have a feeling that there were some folks in Georgia that maybe didn't take this threat as seriously uh, as they should have, even though we were saying the whole time, listen, this is not just a coastal Florida type storm. It's gonna go all the way up through the Carolinas. Okay, we'll continue talking, Greg. You, okay. Greg, thank you so much. No Let's head to Tampa now, and that's where we find our M win. So M, I'm curious, uh, earlier we were talking about there is still a tornado watch that's in effect for the Tampa area. Is that First of all, first question, is that still the case? Right, so we're understanding that should still be the case at this point. You can kind of tell it's pretty dark and eerily quiet right here compared to earlier this morning, Kira. Okay, sorry, I'm, I, I think I lost contact with you there for a minute. Kind of describe where exactly are you? Is there any show and tell that you can give us or you know, bring us up to date to the conditions uh, around you there? Right, so overnight, you know, we saw heavy rain, strong winds. Many of those coastal areas experienced flooding, and this area was no exception. We saw a storm surge in the area of Tampa Bay of up to six feet. Right now, we're just about mm, maybe five minutes from the airport, and we've seen a number of... Uh, of th just throughout the overnight area, just the rain really came down hard for hours and hours overnight. And now it's pretty much subsided. It's just pretty quiet. If you actually see the sky, the sky is moving real slowly and it's pretty dark at this time, Kira. Well, and we're, I'm reading here from the National Weather Service and we had a chance to actually talk um, with a woman, Lisa Benson, who lives in the Pinellas uh, County area there, that she's very concerned about the king tide. And I was seeing that just the National Weather Service was saying because of uh, the next full moon and the king tide, which only comes you know once or twice a year, uh, according to, to the National Weather Service, that you know this could bring some unexpected um, damage, uh, water damage, high tides. Is anybody? 
talking about that in addition to what Lisa was telling us, because that's her biggest concern is this king tide. The king tide, there's so many things on top of each other, especially with that full moon. So we're not out of the clear yet. You know, we have heard from officials saying that National Guardsmen and first responders have been out and deployed in the area, picking up debris and assisting where they can. We've also heard from some local crews also out assessing the damage. We've heard from the Tampa Police Department finding cars stranded in high waters. The Tampa International Airport, which I mentioned was just about five minutes from here, they experienced some flooding around the area. They had officials working around the clock to reopen the airport and that is officially happening this afternoon at 4 p.m. That's going to be reopening and then back in Washington the White House says that President Biden has been in close contact with authorities here in Georgia and the Carolinas and that he has been briefed multiple times a day. So President Biden is actually expected to make some remarks on the storm any moment now which definitely will give us a better idea of the aftermath and the calamity of this storm Kara. And we're definitely going to take that live as soon as the president does step up to the mics there. We're expecting his remarks uh, any moment now. It was pushed a little bit, but we're tracking it, and uh, we'll take it live as soon as it happens. Em, thank you so much. Let's go now to South Carolina. That's where we find our Alex Proche. The storm actually, Alex, headed your way. Uh, How is it looking right now? Okay, well, looks like the rain is kicking in. It's a little more blurred uh, behind you. You've got your hood up. You're ready to go. We're ready to go, Kira. Uh, yeah, we caught the, a, a little bit of a rain ban. It picked up probably in the last 15 minutes. Uh, but right now, Governor Henry McMaster is giving a, a, an update on today. Uh, we know that the state has already declared a state of emergency. So has the city of Charleston. And with that, they're operating at something called OpCon 2. That means extra precautions, also extra personnel on, on the streets. They've opened up shelters for people and their pets. They've also opened up city garages so folks can get their cars off the ground. And we've heard from Greg uh, a little bit earlier talking about, look, this isn't the first rodeo for a lot of the folks that live here, but they do understand that with this storm is going to come uh, some flooding. Charleston is a city that's prone for it, and you see the, the banks of the Ashley River behind me at Marina. It's very, very low. Uh, they're, they're expecting actually part of this area to flood, uh, and because of that, uh, the governor, or excuse me, the, the, the mayor of Charleston is saying uh, they're going to be closing some roads as we go into the evening. We're expecting Idalia to hit uh, somewhere somewhere late this evening. High tide is around 8.30, and so because of that, they're going to be closing roads uh, in, in advance of that. He's telling residents to be safe, to hunker down, to stay home, and not to put first responders at risk. Kira? Right. So what do you think the biggest concerns are uh, right now? And were there specific evacuation orders given for the Charleston area? I don't think I asked you that last time. So we haven't seen specific evacuation orders, but we have heard people to stay to stay home, to not be out. It's not necessary, is what the, uh, the mayor here has, has, has said. And I, I think that is the biggest concern, uh, people adhering, right, and, and not putting first responders at risk. Again, I mean, this is a city that's dealt with storms and hurricanes in the past, and so there is a fear that because they've gotten through it in the past, that maybe this time they're not taking it as seriously. And so, so when you hear from, from city of officials uh, and even state leaders, you know, the one thing that they're urging folks to do is to, to adhere and stay home. All right, we'll stay in close contact with you there in Charleston as things are picking up for sure as the storm heads your way. Alex Pache, thank you so much. And we're glad you're streaming with us, choosing us for your continuing coverage of this hurricane, as we've mentioned, now swirling over Georgia uh, after slamming into Florida as a Cat 3. We are tracking the very latest for you. Stay with us. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story, 
here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. One, two, three, let's get it! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed! <laughs> Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs to lose weight? I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind-blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Glad you're streaming with us. We are keeping a very close eye, as you know, on Hurricane Idalia. It's been downgraded now to a Category 1, losing strength as it moves northeast over land into South Georgia now. The hurricane did make landfall this morning, though, in Florida's Big Bend region as a powerful Cat 3, bringing a lot of high winds, strong storm surge. We're seeing the effects of that now. The hurricane, actually, the strongest storm to hit the Big Bend area since 1896. And my next guest now is from Manatee County, Florida, just south of Tampa and St. Petersburg and home to nearly half a million people. Steve Lechenberger is the Manatee County Public Safety Director uh, joining us to give us kind of an update. Uh, I understand um, the county there represents, what, about 30,000 people. Uh, tell me how residents and visitors uh, have been, I guess, hopefully cooperating with your advice and your direction from a safety perspective. Uh, we know that it's not easy to get people to evacuate. A lot of people want to come out and see what's going on. They don't want to leave. They don't want to leave their things behind. Bring us up to date, if you don't mind, just about how it's been going thus far. Sure, it's been going uh, rather well. Yesterday, we went under a mandatory evacuation level A, a volunteer B. Our, our um, citizens are about 420,000, but our evacuation level uh, took in a little over 30,000 people. We only did see about 500 in our shelters, but our um, direction is stay with a friend, travel tens, uh, miles away and not 100 miles away. Um, that went effect yesterday at two. We're in the process of releasing the evacuation orders now, but we did have, as predicted, a uh, considerable amount of flooding. Our uh, county encompasses half of Longbow Key and the island of Anna Marie Island, which has three cities. Uh, their major roadways are still flooded, and in other areas of the county is still flooded. So we're working our way through that. We had uh, earlier today about 3,500 um, homes without power. Now we're down to just a few hundred. We've been very lucky without uh, any injuries and death. And so we are working it through our, our damage assessment right now is only about 2% completed, but we're over $2.2 million worth of damage to our area from the flooding. Oh, wow. How did you, how did you come to that number so quickly? And, and what, what, I guess, tell me about those specific damages um, and how you were able to just quickly calculate that. Sure. We use an electronic system with GIS. Uh, um, it's an app on iPads. It's connected to our tax appraiser office. 
So if it goes to a residence, it's category either zero amount, 25%, 50%, 75%, or 100%. So if it's moderate, heavy, or destroyed, you uh, we do what's called windshield assessment. So they do a very quick assessment of a home, and then it calculates right away, let's say 25%, the value of that home. Got it. And, you know, Manatee County is home to uh, a number of world-famous beaches, including Anna Maria Island. Um, how, how did that fare? It, um, it is still having uh, water on the major roadways. Our bridges are open, but the islands are shut off because of the water in the road. I spoke to the mayor about two hours ago. Um, right along with this interview is a meeting with the four island communities to try to coordinate at what point in time we're able to let citizens back to check their homes. But our uh, damage assessment teams, which are made up of code enhancement, code enforcement, and building officials have begun to uh, evaluate. And like I said, we're only about 2% completed of the areas that we need to be. But that was primarily from flooding and not uh, wind damage. Got it. And I'm curious, Steve, how many hurricanes you've sort of uh, ridden out there uh, in the area, and how does this one compare uh, to other storms that um, you've had to deal with? Well, uh, it's quite a bit different. I've been here my my whole life. We experienced, we were on the north end of Hurricane Ian last year. We had probably over $99 million worth of damage from Hurricane Ian, and most of that damage was caused by wind and some flooding. But what we're seeing now, we had very little uh, wind damage, and what we're seeing now is primarily from the flooding, and it will take us some time to get around and look at the uh, area um, that has been impacted. Are you more concerned about the Bradenton area uh, right now? I understand the flooding is is pretty intense there. Well, it, it it's the whole community, so from the island communities to uh, Bradenton and Palmetto. So we're overall concerned about everyone right along the coastline because we're right on the Gulf of Mexico and then we have the intercoastal waterway and a couple other bays. So we're trying to address those that were directly impacted from uh, the storm. Yeah, so many, so many locals and so many visitors. You're in a popular spot, uh, Steve. Steve Lichauer, Manatee County Public Safety Director. Sure appreciate your time. We'll continue to stay connected with you as well. Thank you, Steve. Okay, thank you. And please stay with us as our continuing coverage of the hurricane. Uh, as we getting in all these affiliate pictures, these pictures coming to us from our affiliate WJXX, uh, seeing how when the hurricane came through, the water's just smacking up uh, and taking down part of the, the seawall there. This is just um, a snapshot of what we've seen throughout Florida. We'll continue to be getting in uh, live pictures, uh, pictures like this on tape to kind of give you an idea of what Florida felt and what Georgia and also South Carolina are starting to see as well. More news on the other side. We'll be right back. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The lips ain't fresh! <laughs> Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the South. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us here on ABC News Live. Hurricane Idalia now moving across Georgia. The storm has been downgraded now to a Cat 1, but it's losing strength as it's moving northeast over land. Governor Brian Kemp still telling people, though, that they need to prepare. The hurricane has already made history in Florida. It made landfall as a Cat 3 just before 8 o'clock this morning in the Big Bend region, making it the strongest storm to actually hit that area in more than 100 years. The hurricane expected to also impact South Carolina. We have our Alex Prashade there in Charleston. There are other headlines, though, that we are following this hour as well. Ukraine and Russia exchanging attacks overnight, targeting the Moscow region there. And also key, this appears to be the most widespread attack on Russia, presumably launched by Ukraine since the start of the war. It's targeted spots across the western and central Russia. Ukraine military leaders say that two civilians were killed in Kyiv after a barrage of Russian missiles and drones. Kyiv officials there are saying this is the largest attack on the capital since the spring offensive. And soldiers in the oil-rich African country of Gabon have declared a coup. The group there claiming to have seized power from the country's president, whose family has ruled the nation for decades. This announcement made on state TV by a dozen uniformed soldiers just hours after the president won re-election for a third term. That group declaring the election was a fraud and the results were canceled. The soldiers also announcing all borders have been closed until further notice and state institutions are dissolved. That coup, or the coup leaders rather, issuing another statement saying the president was under house arrest. If successful, Gabon's coup would be the eighth to occur in West and Central Africa since 2020. And those in Maui say that the land search for further victims of that catastrophic wildfire is essentially over now. Our affiliate, KITV, reporting uh, that they are searching the waters now, that rescue workers don't expect the death toll to rise much higher despite the more than 380 people who remain unaccounted for. 115 people have officially been declared dead now within that wildfire. Well, coming up, more ABC News Live, continuing coverage of Hurricane Dahlia. It's swirling in the land there, or above land, rather, after slamming into the state of Florida. Pictures out of Treasure Island here as we continue to track all the damage and also where the storm is headed next. thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. ABC News, America's number one news source. Happening right now on ABC News Live, E. Dahlia on the move after slamming into Florida's Gulf Coast as a powerful Category 3 hurricane, the storm carving a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles and triggering widespread power outages. We have the latest on the aftermath and the time and track as the storm swirls inland, putting millions of Americans on alert right now. I'm glad we have Greg Dutra with us, uh, our meteorologist who's been just tracking this storm um, through the night. The morning now, this afternoon. Uh, Greg, where do we even begin? It's kind of hard to keep up with all the various spots, right, that where it's already passed through, it's going to possibly be headed. We just talked to the mayor there in Bel Air. Mm -hmm. He thought that things were kind of calm, and then all of a sudden the wind and the rain started picking up. Um, this is where we need you, because you're looking at everything in real time there. You've, you've got a couple of things you're juggling, right? You're, you're juggling with the after effects from the rainfall. Of course, there's a little bit of a lag between when it rains and when the actual flooding happens. And then we're also looking forward into the forecast uh, ahead of this, while at the same time keeping an eye on the current conditions. So you got past, present, and future all rolled into one. Three balls to keep juggling in the air and we continue that juggling act at this hour the two o'clock update just came in from the national hurricane center and idalia is still a hurricane but just barely 75 miles per hour is the latest wind speed 74 is enough to make it hurricane strength now that is also notably the last hourly update that the national hurricane center is going to do now they're going to switch to their standard times and that would put our next update at five o'clock so this is technically likely to remain a hurricane until five o'clock but i'd be surprised if it's got another hour left in it now we're getting all hung up in the naming and you know what category is it but that being said it still poses the same threat uh, that it had at a Category 1 that it will still have as a tropical storm. And that is the heavy rains and also the flash flooding. So here we are to about 7 o'clock tonight. I want you to notice something. See these winds that are blowing on shore? They're blowing on shore. They're not allowing the rivers and streams to effectively drain into the ocean. So all this rain that's also trying to drain back into the ocean is going to back up in areas like Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Wilmington, up into North Carolina, even through tomorrow morning, are going to have to deal with at least some type of flooding. Now, is it going to be as bad as it was in coastal Florida or even uh, uh, Tampa? It, even though it didn't make landfall in Tampa, it didn't even come within 100 miles? No, I don't think the flooding is going to be that bad. But that being said, there will be isolated spots that will see major flooding from Wilmington all the way down to Charleston. Here's the core of the heaviest rainfall. Again, notice that it does fall a bit inland from the coast, but that is going to try to drain into the ocean and try as it might, it's going to have a hard time with that storm surge that we are watching at least through tomorrow afternoon. Kira? So you've been talking about this storm moving ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. Is there a benefit to that? 
There is. They, you know, there, there's, a, there's a cost and a benefit to it. Now, the biggest benefit is that you get your conditions uh, in a little, or out rather, a little bit earlier, right? But they also arrive a little bit earlier. So if you weren't preparing enough, uh, then, per then perhaps you got caught a little bit off guard. But with the rainfall moving now at 20 miles per hour, uh, that is about four or five miles per hour faster than we thought. It is a significant difference because it won't let the rain stay over the same spot for the same amount of time. But again, it may catch people a little bit earlier early in Charleston and on up the coast because it's getting to you effectively quicker. I mean, just six, seven hours ago, this made landfall and it's already through Georgia. So uh, it's moving pretty quick. And then we heard from the FEMA administrator. I know you were listening uh, mm -hmm. to her as well when she addressed uh, everybody there at the White House uh, briefing, uh, saying that one of the biggest things she was concerned about was the fact that um, those that were told to evacuate didn't evacuate. And yeah. you know, you and I were talking about, look, not everybody has the ability just to pack up and go, right? You've yeah. got elderly people, disabled people. There's a lot that goes into this. Some folks don't have family members that can help them out. Right. But you know, your advice as you're sort of tracking this, for those that can get out and help others to get out, mm -hmm. um, this is the type of storm you don't want to mess with. <laughs> yeah, you, you really don't, uh, especially because it's got such wide-reaching problems. Now, you just got to stay on top of the weather. Uh, your latest observations, if you live further up, like up towards Charleston, because you are mainly going to be a flooding risk, but folks who live in around cities like Charleston uh, and the like, they know what it, parts of town flood. But what you do need to be prepared for is losing power for a couple of days. So that is going to be a problem again up the coast as this continues to move. And even though it's going to get below hurricane strength, Strength, you'll still see tropical storm force winds, 45 plus miles per hour, even up uh, and upwards of 50 for a long time. That's going to knock down trees. It's going to take out power too. But in the immediate term, there are still active flash flood warnings. And from Vidalia to Hazelhurst, Alma, Douglas, all of these areas still have flash flood warnings. They've seen three, four inches of rain. We'll likely see another two inches of rain on top of that. And that could, even though this is so far inland, really come up on you very fast. And I have a feeling that there were some folks in Georgia that maybe didn't take this threat as seriously uh, as they should have, even though we were saying the whole time, listen, this is not just a coastal Florida type storm. It's going to go all the way up through the Carolinas. Okay, we'll continue talking, Greg. Okay. Greg, thank you so much. No Let's head to Tampa now, and that's where we find our M win. So M, I'm curious, uh, earlier we were talking about there is still a tornado watch that's in effect for the Tampa area. Is that First of all, what, first question, is that still the case? Right, so we're understanding that should still be the case at this point. You can kind of tell it's pretty dark and eerily quiet right here compared to earlier this morning, Kira. Kind of describe where exactly are you? Is there any show and tell that you can give us or you know, bring us up to date to the conditions uh, around you there? Right, so overnight, you know, we saw heavy rain, strong winds. Many of those coastal areas experienced flooding, and this area was no exception. We saw a storm surge in the area of Tampa Bay of up to six feet. Right now, we're just about mm, maybe five minutes from the airport, and we've seen a number of... Uh, of th just throughout the overnight area, just the rain really came down hard for hours and hours overnight. And now it's pretty much subsided. It's just pretty quiet. If you actually see the sky, the sky is moving real slowly and it's pretty dark at this time, Kira. Well, and we're, I'm reading here from the National Weather Service and we had a chance to actually talk um, with a woman, Lisa Benson, who lives in the Pinellas uh, County area there, that she's very concerned about the king tide. And I was seeing that just the National Weather Service was saying because of uh, the next full moon and the king tide, which only comes you know once or twice a year, uh, according to, to the National Weather Service, that you know this could bring some unexpected um, damage, uh, water damage, high tides. Is anybody? talking about that in addition to what Lisa was telling us, because that's her biggest concern is this king tide. The king tide, there's so many things on top of each other, especially with that full moon. So we're not out of the clear yet. You know, we have heard from officials saying that National Guardsmen and first responders have been out and deployed in the area, picking up debris and assisting where they can. We've also heard from some local crews also out assessing the damage. We've heard from the Tampa Police Department finding cars stranded in high waters. The Tampa International Airport, which I mentioned was just about five minutes from here, they experienced some flooding around the area. They had officials working around the clock 
o'clock to reopen the airport. And that is officially happening this afternoon at 4 p.m. That's going to be reopening. And then back in Washington, the White House says that President Biden has been in close contact with authorities here in Georgia and the Carolinas and that he has been briefed multiple times a day. So President Biden is actually expected to make some remarks on the storm any moment now, which definitely will give us a better idea of the aftermath and the calamity of this storm, Kara. And we're definitely going to take that live as soon as the president does step up to the mics there. We're expecting his remarks uh, any moment now. It was pushed a little bit, but we're tracking it, and uh, we'll take it live as soon as it happens. Em, thank you so much. Let's go now to South Carolina. That's where we find our Alex Prache. The storm actually, Alex, headed your way. Uh, how is it looking right now? Okay, well, looks like the rain is kicking in. It's a little more blurred uh, behind you. You've got your hood up. You're ready to go. Ready to go, Kira. Uh, yeah, we caught the, a, a little bit of a rain ban. It picked up probably in the last 15 minutes. Uh, but right now, Governor Henry McMaster is giving a, a, an update on today. Uh, we know that the state has already declared a state of emergency. So has the city of Charleston. And with that, they're operating at something called OpCon 2. That means extra precautions, also extra personnel on, on the streets. They've opened up shelters for people and their pets. They've also opened up city garages so folks can get their cars off the ground. And we've heard from Greg. Uh, a little bit earlier talking about, look, this isn't the first rodeo for a lot of the folks that live here, but they do understand that with this storm is going to come uh, some flooding. Charleston is a city that's prone for it, and you see the, the banks of the Ashley River behind me, that marina, it's very, very low. Uh, they're, they're expecting actually part of this area to flood, uh, and because of that, uh, the governor, or excuse me, the, 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 the mayor of Charleston is saying uh, they're going to be closing some roads as we go into the evening. We're expecting I doubt you to hit uh, somewhere somewhere late this evening. High tide is around 8.30, and so because of that, they're going to be closing roads uh, in, in advance of that. He's telling residents to be safe, to hunker down, to stay home, and not to put first responders at risk. Kira? Right. So what do you think the biggest concerns are uh, right now? And were there specific evacuation orders given for the Charleston area? I don't think I asked you that last time. So we haven't seen specific evacuation orders, but we have heard people to stay, to stay home, to not be out. It's not necessary, is what the, uh, the mayor here has, has said. And I, I think that is the biggest concern, uh, people adhering, right, and, and not putting first responders at risk. Again, I mean, this is a city that's dealt with storms and hurricanes in the past, and so there is a fear that because they've gotten through it in the past, that maybe this time they're not taking it as seriously. And so, so when you hear from, from the city of officials uh, and even state leaders, you know, the one thing that they're urging folks to do is to, to adhere and stay home. All right, we'll stay in close contact with you there in Charleston as things are picking up for sure as the storm heads your way. Alex Pache, thank you so much, and we're glad you're streaming with us, choosing us for your continuing coverage of this hurricane, as we've mentioned, now swirling over Georgia uh, after slamming into Florida as a Cat 3. We are tracking the very latest for you. Stay with us. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? One, two, three, let's get it! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Chow. Complicated. The website friends! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy there's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the 
know you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Hello everyone, I'm Kira Phillips. Welcome back to ABC News and our breaking news coverage of Hurricane Idalia. And as it continues, the storm now a Category 1 moving into Georgia after wreaking total havoc all across Florida. You can see by the pictures, the hurricane initially made landfall around 745 this morning. Let's get straight to the president now where he is going to be giving remarks on the current condition of the state of Florida and elsewhere. And I'm Diane Macedo. We're coming on the air because President Biden is about to address the nation concerning two major events at opposite ends of the United States. Hurricane Idalia in Florida and the recovery efforts after the catastrophic wildfires on Maui. Idalia hit Florida as a Category 3 this morning. It's now at Category 1 strength in Georgia and headed for the Carolinas. All four states have declared states of emergency. The hurricane made landfall near Keaton Beach with winds of up to 125 miles per hour and a life-threatening storm surge of up to eight feet. There are reports of major flooding in the area. Cedar Key is largely underwater and parts of Georgia are also declaring a flash flood emergency. Close Thousands of people have been evacuated here. along Florida's Gulf Coast. Today, and now let's uh, go ahead and listen to President I Biden. Made a point to speak to all the governors most likely to be impacted by this storm. I spoke with Governor DeSantis several times, Governor Kemp, Governor McMasters, Governor Cooper, about the impacts of the storm and that made landfall at 745 uh, this morning as a Category 3 hurricane. And uh, it's moved over land and is now shifted to Category 1, but it is still very dangerous with winds up to 75 miles an hour. And the impacts of this storm are being felt throughout the southeast, even as it moves up the eastern coast of the United States, affecting Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. And we have to remain vigilant, and there's much more to do. I just came from the Oval Office where I met with the FEMA administrator, who's standing to my left here, and uh, our federal response folks. And uh, early Monday morning, long before the storm made landfall, I spoke with Governor DeSantis and approved an early request for emergency declaration to enable him to have the full support ahead of time to protect the people's lives in the state of Florida. I, we surged personnel to Florida to help the state move people quickly to safety and out of a danger zone and to help the governor and his team to the greatest degree possible in advance, in advance of the hurricane's arrival. And I directed the FEMA to redeploy resources, including up to 1,500 personnel and 900 Coast Guard personnel throughout the Southeast. I directed Administrator Criswell to stay in close touch with the governor. She was with me when I was speaking to him as well. And uh, I guess he's maybe tired of hearing of both of us, but uh, he seemed like he welcomed it. As a matter of fact, I've asked that uh, she get on the plane and leave for Florida this afternoon. She'll meet with Governor DeSantis tomorrow and uh, began helping conducting the federal assessment at, uh, at my direction. Federal teams on the ground are going to continue to work with the first responders in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina to get people to safety. You've all been reporting this, you've seen it on television. There are a number of rescues already taken place as I walked out of my office a moment ago to begin to recover from the impacts of the storm. I let each governor I spoke with know if there's anything, anything the states need right now, I'm ready to mobilize that support of what they need. I don't think anybody can deny the impact <clears throat> of the climate crisis anymore. Just look around. Historic floods, I mean historic floods, more intense droughts, 
extreme heat, significant wildfires have caused significant damage like we've never seen before, not only throughout the Hawaiian Islands and the United States, but in Canada and other parts of the world. We've never seen this much fire. And while we're dealing with this latest extreme weather event, I remain laser focused on recovering and rebuilding efforts in Maui. We were out there and many of you were there as well. It's devastating what happened there. When I took office, I directed my team to raise our game and how we lead and coordinate our responses to natural disasters. And uh, because I've been around a while and I've known how these function. To ensure we met people where they are, when they need our help the most. Because of the devastation of wildfires from California, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington State, Idaho, Louisiana, we've learned a heck of a lot. A lot of damage in the meantime, but we've learned a heck of a lot. And we're putting the lessons we've learned to work. In a few moments, I'm going to be with my entire cabinet in the next room over, who are leading the federal recovery and rebuilding efforts to report on their progress, providing urgently needed support to the people of Maui. If I can note for just parenthetically for just a moment, you know, when you have your home washed away, when you are a fire that's taken your home away, when your school has been destroyed and there's no way you can't send your kid to school, these are urgent needs. And no matter how bright, how informed, how wealthy, how poor they are, it's, you just need reassurance. So how in God's name am I going to get through this? Well, Jill and I saw the devastation and in Maui firsthand. And I want to thank Governor Josh Green, who's doing one hell of a job, along with their congressional delegation. There's total unity out there. And for everything they're doing to support the recovery effort. I directed my team to do everything we can for as long as it takes to help Maui recover, rebuild in a way that respects and honors Hawaiian traditions and cultures and the needs of the local community. We're not going to turn this into a new land grab. We're not trying to have see multi-million dollar homes on the beach. We want to restore that part of the island like it was before, only better. To that end, when I was on the island last week, I appointed Bob Fenton, one of the nation's leading emergency managers, and I mean that, that's not hyperbole, who's been on the ground in Hawaii since before the fires erupted as our chief federal response coordinator to lead our long-term recovery on Maui. I've charged him with making sure the community has everything, everything the federal government can offer to heal and build back better as fast as possible. You know, he'll be giving me a report virtually on Maui when I walk out of this room and go to the cabinet room of our meeting in just a few minutes. And as an example of our commitment, we're not only building back, but we're going to build back stronger and more resilient future, which means we need to be ready to withstand any challenge coming our way in rebuilding the way that Maui wants to rebuild, the nature of the rebuilding. Today, I'm announcing that $95 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law is on the way to Hawaii to harden the ground power, harden the grid we talk about. I know when we start talking about the grid, the average American out there thinks, what are we talking about? Well, the ability to transmit electricity. Well, let me tell you what it means. It means investments to make sure electricity can continue to reach homes, hospitals, water stations, even during intense storms and extreme weather. Funding will be used for stronger and better poles holding up the, the wires that transmit the electricity. It'll mean stronger material. It'll mean burying these lines that transmit the electricity underground. It's more expensive to do that, but where possible, we should put them underground. They're safest. It means clearing trees and brush around these wires. It's like, like the kindling is, uh, that exists out there. Uh, it, that's what it ends up being when one of those wires come down. And this funding is going to pay for installing technology, technology like smart meters that can tell, tell you where the problem actually is when the line goes down. That's part of the problem. A lot of these in other, not Hawaii's, Maui's not that big, but in parts of California, Oregon, and all these places where these fires were, where did the wire go down? We're going to be installing meters to let the person sitting back in the headquarters know, whoa, it went down at such and such a coordinates, such and such a pole. 
to enable emergency responders to more quickly identify which lines are damaged or down so repairs can happen as quickly as possible and get the power back on and prevent damage from occurring. Anything else at, and anything else at our disposal. The Department of Energy and the Secretary, we're going to be talking about this in a minute, accelerated the announcement of this funding to meet the moment. All this is going to help Maui and the entire state of Hawaii better withstand future disasters, because this is not going away. It's not like, well, these are the last disasters. We know this works. And I've watched some of you folks stand in front of me on television in dangerous circumstances reporting on this stuff. You know it. It's one thing to look at it on television and hear someone else report it, but you're standing there and you're wondering, whoa, oh, what's that behind me? You know, it makes a difference, you know, because we've, you know, we've done it before. Look, under the Obama-Biden administration, <clears throat> we invested hundreds of millions of dollars in the state of Florida, replacing wooden power poles and steel poles and the bill, and we buried uh, these electric lines. Well, I wonder what would happen now if we hadn't done that. I'm not sure what, but the point is we did it and helped them withstand, withstand and recover from disasters more quickly than they otherwise would have. So it works. It costs a lot of money, but it works, but it saves a lot of money long term. When Jill and I visited Maui last week, we saw firsthand the magnitude of the loss. Your lives have been dramatically changed if anybody in Maui is listening. You've, got, you've lost everything. I mean, they lost everything. And we're doing everything we can to move heaven and earth to help you recover, rebuild, and return to your lives. We've already have dedicated $24 million to removal of hazardous material left behind when the, when the fires wake. There's pollution that is in that material. A lot of that, you just can't go in and take bulldozers and clear it all out. You got to take the bad stuff out. You got to take out the polluted, the dangerous stuff. And, we've, and, and once we've done that, we'll be able to remove all the debris. But it's going to be frustrating as a devil for people. They say, why can't I go back? Storm's over. Why can't I go back and look and see if I can find that wedding ring or why I can find that, that album? Can't find that thing that I've lost in the house. It's really tough. Really, really tough. I didn't know anything like that, but I lightning struck my house. We had to be out of that house for about seven months while it was repaired because so much damage was done to the house and half the house almost collapsed. You know, and you wonder what's, what's going to happen. We've already dedicated $400 million to pay for the debris removal. Once we get the toxic stuff out, to take all the removal. And we're going to, the federal government's going to pay for that. The state is not paying for that. And we're going to dedicate more if necessary. But I want to be clear with the people of Maui about what to expect. The work we're doing is going to take time, in some cases a long time. We're going to do it in a way to make sure we're respectful to the wishes and the traditions of the people of Hawaii as well. The process of removing hazardous material and cleaning the environmental damage means folks can't get back in the area right away. The start of school has been disrupted. It's painful. I get it. What can I tell you? The one thing I can tell you is that we're going to be with you every step of the way. We're not walking away. When Jill and I visited, we were struck by the absolute courage of the people there. People who lost loved ones, lost everything. People are just trying to find out whether the ones they lost are lost. Are they gone? Are they dead? Are they missing? Or are they just not accountable? Where are they? They've lost everything. Everywhere we turned, we saw and felt the aloha spirit, neighbors helping neighbors. I mean, it's, I know this sounds kind of corny, but it's true. It's true. Everybody's reaching out, trying to help the other guy, turning pain into purpose and keeping the faith. I'm directing my administration to continue working with urgency and focus to help the people of Maui on their journey of recovery and healing. And we're going to make sure you are healed and you're in better shape than before. I said when I was on the island last week, we're not leaving until the job's done. And we'll be there as long as it takes. I know there's a lot of questions you probably have. I'll take a few, but I have a cabinet meeting coming up right away. Yes. Mr. President, can you assure Americans that the federal government is going to have the emergency funding that they need to get through this hurricane season? The answer is, if I can't do that, I'm going to point out why. How can we not respond? My God, 
How can we not respond to these needs? And so I'm confident, even though there's a lot of talk from some of our friends up on the Hill about the cost, we got to do it. This is the United States of America. Yes. Uh, Mr. President, Governor DeSantis is also running for president. Uh, you are running for re-election. Do you sense any politics in your conversations with him about this issue? No, believe it or not. I know that sounds strange, especially how the, the nature of politics today. But, you know, I was down there when the last major storm. I spent a lot of time with him, walking from village to from community to community, making sure he had what he needed to get it done. I think he trusts my judgment and my desire to help, and I trust him to be able to suggest that he's, this is not about politics, it's about taking care of the people of the state. Mr. President, um, on uh, the hurricane, is in your conversations with the governors, is there anything that you've heard from them that gives you pause? things that you think need to be there that are not quite there yet? And secondly, are you making any contingency plans on your own schedule, um, either with this Labor Day, with your own personal travels, and also for your international travels that are coming up next week, that are you going to need to reshuffle things? Well, I may. I just don't know yet. And uh, first of all, the uh, each of the governors seem to be focused. And I think what's changing particularly the governors from North South Carolina, as well as Georgia, is there wasn't an anticipation that it'd be moving up the, up the coast. They were hopeful and initially it looked like it was going to go further east and not affect them. So I think they're all in the process of rapidly focusing on what may happen, what may not happen. And uh, what they're, what I hope the people of, uh, of those states listen to is the warnings when they come from the, I mean, a lot of it, they may not see 130 mile an hour winds coming through, but guess what? You may also be on the shore in low lying area and have a eight foot surge of, you know, w wind surge coming from off the, off the ocean. But they seem, they, they've all been through it. I, the guy furthest north, Cooper, Governor Cooper, is really focused on it. I mean, they all are. I don't mean to pick, but I mean, he is the least likely to have the most impact occurring on his shores. But it's a lot of low-lying country. I was joking with him. I mean, my state is, you know, when you have anything like hurricane in my state, in Delaware and, uh, and suburban, Mar I mean, and the eastern shore of Maryland, we're three feet above sea level, man. You know, you worry about what those, those surges do. And, uh, and that's the same thing still happening in, in Florida, because you're talking about the high tide, low tide, adding three feet and so on. So I found them all to be laser focused on what their needs were. And, and I, I asked them, but I think they're reassured that we're going to be there for whatever they need, including search and rescue off the shore of the Coast Guard and Coast Guard helicopters and the like. Mr. President. Mr. President, um, Mr. President um, I have a question for you about, we talked a lot about power lines and the, um, the, having stronger poles. I, I was curious, um, some power companies have talked about potentially shutting off power when there's sort of high wind incidences for vast parts of the country. And I'm wondering if you think this is sort of an appropriate response by power companies, or if you think that they should be working to sort of harden their infrastructure more than just ending power when there's a... I, I think both. Look, uh, I can... It's very expensive <laughs> to secure these power lines. Uh, both in terms of the actual structure. You know, we look out there and you see these, these, these large towers carrying multiple wires, and the wires are like that thick, and they're, you know, they're, they're carrying an awful lot of energy. And uh, sometimes those entire, uh, come, those entire towers come down. I am not expert enough to know when it makes pro it's appropriate to shut down that line and that's one of the reasons why I think having the technology to have these meters on each of these facilities tells you where the danger is. So I can picture 
I'm, get, I'm getting them beyond my expertise here, but... You're talking about huge numbers of Americans suddenly not having power because well, the company makes a determination that... Well, but by the way, uh, you know, we also know how many huge number of Americans have died, how many huge number of Americans have... For example, more forest has been burned to the ground since I've become, in the time I've been doing this, than the entire square miles of the state of Maryland. Imagine the entire state of Maryland burning to the ground. That's how much is already burned to the ground. So I think as we try to harden the capacity to transmit energy, it's not irrational to make a judgment that you may have to, in a certain circumstance, shut off the power. I just don't know enough to know the detail of how to do that. I mean, where that decision is made. That's why we're starting off, I was talking with with Sherwood Randall, who uh, handles this for me, about the need to put these meters along these so we know where where the power is going down. You may be able to shut off parts. I just don't know enough to know that. Mr. Mr. President, are you concerned at all that a potential government shutdown would impact the recovery efforts? And what is your reaction to House Republicans who say that they're approaching <coughs> a investigation into the federal response in that way? Well, I'm, I welcome a federal response in Maui. Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, they should go out and talk to every elected official, from the mayors to the governors to the United States senators to the congresspersons. Uh, I welcome them. Once they go out and see it, then I'm sure they'll, they'll provide the money. Thank you all very much. Any concerns about your Thank you, everybody. By the way, I, uh, I, I just heard, literally, coming out, and uh, Mitch is a friend, as you know, not a joke. We, we always, I know people don't believe that the case, but we have disagreements politically, but he's a good friend. And so I'm going to try to get in touch with him uh, later this afternoon. I don't know enough to know. Do you think he's fit to serve and should run for the election? Are you running? I'm not, sir. Okay, all right. Thank you. Just been listening to President Biden talking about the federal response to Hurricane Idalia. That storm is now at a Category 1 strength, but we heard the president warning that it is still very serious. He says he's spoken to the governors of Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, pledging the government's full support to the storm zone, saying federal teams are already on the ground helping with search and rescue. I want to get right to ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z in the Tampa, St. Petersburg area. Ginger, what can you tell us in terms of the damage from this storm and the impact so far? So, Diane, we've seen a steady stream within the last hour of emergency vehicles headed south to St. Pete Beach. And St. Pete itself, the fire rescue, saying they've had at least 75 water rescues. And that's right where we are. All the debris around me, that's from the water that was at one point up to about three feet deep here in the intersection at Gulf Boulevard and 107th. The ocean just pushed on for about 12 hours onto this land, such susceptible land on these uh, barrier islands. I will take you right to the maps, though, because this thing is still moving across southeast Georgia just past Waycross. So as a hurricane, it still has intense winds. It's got a lot of rain. We've seen some of the seven plus inch totals coming in in southeast Georgia. Flash flood emergencies have happened in Georgia, and now the onshore flow has started for South Carolina and North Carolina and also Savannah there. Tornado watch still in place. We've been watching tornado warnings pop. That happens every time we get a, a hurricane. You end up with those bands kind of spinning up small tornadoes, but they can do a lot of damage, so watch that all the way through Wilmington. Here's how it's going to go. We're going to exit this storm around Hilton Head, which, by the way, Hilton Head's still in a hurricane warning. And then it'll hug the coast. So if you're in Myrtle Beach up to Wilmington, you'll be dealing with it overnight tonight into early tomorrow before it makes its way back out into the Atlantic. Some of the models yesterday were trying to bring it back around. That doesn't look like it is going to happen. But I want to bring you to our drone because we've got this drone image that we, we shot just moments ago and really the amount of water that is still able to come in you know when this thing made landfall it was more than 100 miles to our northwest and it was pushing so much water into these heavily populated beaches and the tampa bay the causeway was shut down at one point i think we're still having trouble getting around on roads and the surge is really what we will keep talking about. Charleston and Savannah are both the places that we're watching really closely because when they get that onshore flow, it acts like a plug, adds six plus inches of rain, and that's trying to fall and get out through the rivers, and it can't move. 
And so we're really concerned going into tonight, early tomorrow morning for coastal Georgia and South Carolina. And there's the rainfall for you. And I will say that they have always been in the path, in the cone. And so we have kept warning and hopefully people are taking all of those evacuation orders seriously and certainly don't want to drive in it. We saw a lot of people trying to make their way through high water today and that's when you get in trouble. It's so Diane. important to heed those warnings. Ginger Z, thank you. And I want to go to ABC's Victor Akendo in Tallahassee where the big concern was the wind. Victor, what are you seeing there? Diane, you're absolutely right. Wind damage down trees and power outages. And just take a look behind me. Here's why. Tallahassee is lined with these trees. And with hurricane force winds, those trees can come crashing down, bring power lines along with them. They are not like palm trees that bend. These break. And as we drove around the state capitol after Idalia had cleared through, it didn't take long for our team to find a downed tree, a large one, blocking all lanes of a highway. That was US 90, one of the busier highways in town. Good news, we spotted crews already working to restore power and clear that debris. And there was this outside the governor's mansion. Florida First Lady Casey DeSantis posting this photo. It was a 100-year-old oak tree brought down by Idalia. She was inside along with her children when it happened. No one was hurt. But now comes the rush to restore power and clear debris. At last check here in Leon County, about 40,000 customers are currently without power. That's more than any other county in the state. Statewide, that number close to 300,000 right now. But in speaking with officials throughout the state before Idalia hit, they felt confident they had enough resources pre-positioned to be able to respond quickly. Diane? I certainly hope so, Victor, and I'm glad it looks that way. I, I also want to go over to Alex Prechet over in Charleston, South Carolina, Carolina, where they're now bracing for the brunt of this storm. Alex, what's the big concern there as the storm moves north? Well, Diane, we actually just got an update from Governor McMaster, and he says while there are no evacuations, a state of emergency has been declared uh, here and also here in Charleston where we are. They're operating at something called OpCon 2, which means that there are uh, extra precautions, also extra personnel. And with that, they've opened up shelters for people and their pets. They've also opened up city garages for folks to get their cars off the ground. This is an area, we're looking at the banks of the Ashley River behind me, this is an area that's prone to flooding. And so as I, Adalia makes its way here, this evening. Keep in mind that high tide is at 830. They're worried about that storm surge. Also, the concern for down power lines and trees. Uh, the mayor here is saying that he's, he's telling people, urging them to stay inside, stay at home. Don't put first responders at risk. All right. It, it's great advice, Alex. Thank you. And I want to go to ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, on something that the president mentioned. Mary, he was asked about emergency funding for hurricane season, and he couldn't guarantee that we will have enough to respond to all hurricanes, saying only that if we don't have enough, he will explain why. Can you expand on that? Yeah, there's a little bit of a political fight going on here. Some questions from some on the other side of the aisle about just how much f federal funding should be available to fight these kinds of emergencies. The president obviously reiterating that they need to provide whatever is needed. And if that is not the case, then he is going to, to point some fingers across the aisle. You also heard the president stressing again that he has been working the phones, reaching out to the four governors of those states hardest hit, Georgia, North and South Carolina, and of course, Florida, offering them the full assistance and aid of the federal government. The FEMA administrator actually telling us that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis expressed to the president that right now all of his needs are met. And you did hear the president there fielding a question about how it is a bit unusual for him to be talking to Governor DeSantis quite this often. They, of course, are rivals for the White House in 2024. But the president and Ron DeSantis have both made very clear this is the time you put politics aside, you focus on the urgent need at hand and simply doing what is needed to get help to the Americans. It is one bright spot of disasters like this. We see them bring people together, and that includes people on opposite sides of the political aisle. Mary Bruce at the White House. Thank you, Mary. And now we're going to return to your regular programming, but Hurricane Idalia coverage will continue on ABC News Live and abcnews.com. David and the entire team will also have a complete wrap-up today on World News Tonight. I'm Diane Macedo. Have a great rest of the day. This has been a special report from ABC News. Thanks, Diane. And our breaking news coverage does continue here on ABC News Live. Uh, we have to remain vigilant. Those were the first words out of the president's mouth there at the White House. The second most important piece of news, the president says, whatever the states need right now as the hurricane continues to move through Florida and Georgia and the Carolinas, the president says he will provide it. Already more than 1,500 federal workers on the ground, including more than 500 urban search and rescue personnel. 
He says he's going to be on standby for whatever they need. Uh, the funding, however, as Mary was just talking about, could get caught up in partisan politics in Washington. It has before. The president says he's determined to push through whatever funding is needed. But for more on the immediate situation, let's bring in Avis News meteorologist Greg Dutra. So, Greg, you know, this thing is just flying across uh, the American southeast there. What's the latest? Yeah, 20 miles per hour worth of forward speed, which is a blessing and a curse. A, a blessing because it gets the rainfall out a little bit earlier, a curse because folks in Charleston are going to end up seeing the storm hours and hours ahead of time as that time adds up every single hour that it's moving at that speed. Flash flood warning still out here for the northern edge of this. From Vidalia to Hazelhurst and south, I've seen a swath of five plus inches of rain, even some totals up around eight inches or so. We also have some tornado warnings that occasionally pop up in a big area that has a tornado watch. So we aren't out of the woods just yet. I mean, that tornado watch goes all the way up into North Carolina. So we have to watch for power outages, spin up tornadoes, and of course, that rainfall too. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z was talking about it. It's raining inland. That rain wants to find its way into, for example, Charleston has three rivers that go into Charleston Harbor, the Ashley, the Cooper, and the Wando. Uh, and all of those are trying to get back out into the ocean, but we've got winds that are blowing against those, not not allowing it back out to sea. So Charleston's going to have some flash flooding problems. Myrtle Beach, same type of deal there, very low lying spots. And this goes all the way up through the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Likely through early tomorrow morning, we'll be seeing immediate effects and then things will wind down very quickly later on Thursday. Back to you. All right, Greg, thanks very much for that. Keeping track of Idalia as it races across the American Southeast. Let's go to Charleston. Alex Prochet is there for us. And uh, Alex, you just heard what Greg was talking about, batting down the hatches because uh, not only is Idalia coming, but could be flash flooding as well. What did the governor have to say? Well, right now, Terry, the governor has, has said that there are no planned emergencies, but you heard, or evacuations, excuse me, but you heard Greg mention uh, those three rivers. Well, we're standing along the banks of the Ashley River, and look, high tide is at 8.30 tonight, and we're expecting Adalia to make its way here late this evening, and so that storm surge is something that is a big concern here in Charleston. We've heard from the mayor. Uh, they're operating at something they call OpCon 2. That means extra precautions, also extra personnel. They're going to be open, or they have opened up shelters for people and their pets as the rain picks up. Uh, they've also opened up garages around the city for folks to get their cars off the ground. This is an area that's prone to flooding. Uh, and also, uh, he's advised of a risk of down power lines and also down tree limbs. And one of the things that they were just stressing, yes, Charleston has dealt with hurricanes before, but they are urging people to stay indoors, to hunker down, uh, and not to put these first responders at risk. So, Alex, as you were there in Charleston, we saw it sort of, it was very calm. It was beautiful. The sun was out. Uh, now you're seeing it's more blurry behind you. The rain's coming in. The wind's picking up a little bit. Just give an idea how every, uh, give us an idea how everybody now is bracing uh, for the storm that is going to hit exactly where you are, including um, the colleges around you, the military academy. I mean, there's a lot to think about, uh, especially with regard to students who can't just evacuate immediately. Well, it's a highly populated area, right? And that's one of the reasons why Charleston has been so 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 keen on opening up these shelters, uh, making sure that those who do not have a, a safe place to go, at least uh, can you know the, the, the city is providing one. Uh, but but I, but I will say, I mean, with these preparations, uh, we we have seen even at our hotel. I mean, they've taken away all the outdoor furniture uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of the furniture around, like the balconies, just in preparation. Uh, there is a sense that look. Um, this surge could could be pretty impactful. I, they've dealt with hurricanes and floodings in the past. I was talking to the re receptionist here, and certainly, like this area is flooded. They're hopeful that the garage behind us does does, does not flood. But look, it is low lying. You see that uh, that marina behind me along the Ashley River. A lot of boats there. It, <laughs> that wall's not very tall. So you know, if there's a significant surge, we expect it to lap over, and and that's something that uh, this city is really dealing with right now. All right, let's take it to Tallahassee now. We'll leave you there in Charleston. Alex, continue to check in our Victor Akendo, uh, where it's definitely a lot more calm at the moment. But as the president said, we need to be stand mm. on standby uh, state to state. What can you tell us, Victor? 
So Kira, the major concerns here in Tallahassee, wind damage, down trees, and power outages. We got all three as Idalia passed through. And you see, Tallahassee is lined with trees. And with hurricane force winds, those trees, they can come crashing down and take power lines out with them. It didn't take long for our team. We started driving around once it was safe to do so. And immediately we saw a large tree snap like a toothpick, covering all lanes, blocking all lanes of a, a major highway here. It was US 90. Uh, the good news was that we also spotted crews there using a chainsaw, cutting that tree up, getting ready to remove that debris. And there was also this image outside the governor's mansion. Florida First Lady Casey DeSantis posting this photo. That was a 100-year-old oak tree brought down by Idalia. She was inside along with her children when it happened. Thankfully, no one was hurt. But now comes the rush to restore power and clear the debris. At last check, here in Leon County, the Tallahassee area, there are about 40,000 customers without power. That's more than any other county in the state. Statewide, that number is close to 300,000 customers without power. But in speaking with local officials ahead of Idalia's arrival, this is throughout the state, they all felt confident in the resources that they had put in place from ambulances to these crews that would restore power, clear debris, search and rescue units. They all felt very strong, confident in what they had in place so they could respond quickly. Terry, Kieran. And, and, and it looks like they did, Victor. And I just wonder how are people who are you are seeing, how many are you seeing? Are people out? And what's, what's their mood? Do they feel like they dodged uh, a bullet, like they did the right thing? Are they grateful for the preparations? What are you hearing? So here in Tallahassee, it does look like life is getting back to normal. There are certainly a lot more cars on the road right now. I just saw a family going out for a walk. It has absolutely cleared. It rained all morning long. The winds were definitely strong, but now Idalia is out of the way here in Tallahassee. Uh, we also met some people at a nearby shelter that had actually evacuated from Perry, Florida, that of course was so hard hit. And we met one man there, his name's Harold Weaver. He was there with his grandson. He told us how incredibly thankful he was that he made the right decision to evacuate, to leave his apartment, take his grandson and stay in a safe spot for the night. He's going to go back tomorrow. He's just not sure what to expect when he goes back, guys. Yeah, a lot of people are feeling that way. Uh, a lot of folks we talked to throughout the morning and into the afternoon. Uh, Victor, thank you so much. Let's take it now to our ABC uh, White House, Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce, um, who was there and listened to the president's remarks. Uh, clearly, he's been working uh, the phones. I mean, not only uh, regarding this hurricane, but also letting us know that he's still very much tuned in uh, to Hawaii and those there that still need support and assistance. So he's working two disasters, Mary, at the same time. Yeah, and the president very much trying to project to the American people that they are on top of this, that they are going to be there to help these states throughout these various disasters, both in the immediate need and the long term. The president today already speaking with the governors of those four hardest hit states that have already declared uh, states of emergency, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and of course, Florida. The president has been on the phone several times this week with Governor Ron DeSantis, someone who he doesn't normally speak to that often, given the fact that they are rivals for the White House in 2024. Four, but actually the FEMA administrator telling uh, reporters a short while ago after their most recent phone call that Governor DeSantis expressed to the president that so far his needs are being met. We do know that this administration has been surging resources to the area, including more than 1,500 federal personnel, 540 urban search and rescue personnel. They've also pre-staged a lot of you know critical needs, including more than 1.3 million meals, 1.6 million liters of water. So they're trying to get ahead of the urgent need that they know is coming and that's what the president was trying to project today that this administration is on top of this that they are going to be helping everyone as much as they can going forward and that of course extends as well to the aftermath of the wildfires in Maui you heard the president speaking at great length about what they are doing not only in the short term but what they are doing in the long term the president really trying to speak directly to those who survived this awful wildfire to, to tell them that they are here for the long haul Kieran Terry all right, Mary Bruce at the White House. Thanks for that, President Biden. Very busy, as is, obviously, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He is in Perry, Florida, hard hit by this storm. And he's given the people there an update. Let's go to Governor Ron DeSantis in Perry, Florida. Certainly the public roads you know, are going to be done. As you get into private debris removal, you know, it becomes a little bit trickier in terms of what is reimbursed and this and that. Uh, but, but certainly on the right-of-ways, 
that that is going to be taken care of and it's uh, public right away. That's that's kind of the core mission for debris removal. So look, we'll see as the as the day and, and tomorrow goes on in terms of uh, what we what we are looking at in terms of fatalities. Well, I can tell you with Hurricane Ian, as soon as that storm hit, uh, within an hour after it hitting, there were frantic phone calls uh, to to 911 locally there of people that were literally drowning in their house, and it was something that you just. When I was talking to the, the sheriff, I remember talking to the sheriff down in Lee County on the phone, just the feeling of dread that those phone calls represented, you knew that there was going to be a lot of problems. We have not seen that uh, in the same way on this storm. And I think part of it is that when you see storm surge of that nature, like we saw during Ian, I think a lot of people really heeded the warnings that their local officials uh, issued because... You know, you, you can't hide from the storm surge like in your house. Like if it comes and it's 10, 12 feet, uh, you are going to you're going to be in a world of hurt. And so it's not worth the risk. So I think a lot of people understood that you got to you got to run away from that uh, water, get out of the area, get the higher ground and you can hunker down in a safe structure. And that could mean saving your life. So I think a lot of people understood that. I think a lot of them did that. We obviously had really significant storm surge in both Cedar Key and Stein, uh, Steen Hatchie. And, 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 and clearly, the, the storm surge there was enough to potentially be life-threatening if people didn't take proper precautions. But I, I think most of the people did, and I think they probably really protected themselves and their families as a result. So the, the guys behind me here for our state guard, uh, they came in and they're assisting with damage assessments. And that obviously is important information to be able to, to get back to the state uh, so that we know what we need to do from a transportation perspective, uh, from a, a fish and wildlife perspective, anything in terms of uh, what needs to be done. So, so, this, so they've done a good job. And of course we have uh, many hundreds of National Guard just right here in Taylor County. This is kind of the ground zero deployment for them. And if there's more that's needed, we'll be able to surge more accordingly. We've that's activated 5,500 members of the Florida uh, National Guard. We also dust. have some of our members of the State Guard. And then we have eight urban search and rescue teams. So we are well equipped uh, to be able uh, to respond to whatever comes down the pike today into tomorrow. And uh, hopefully, you know, we're hoping for the best. We're hoping that there's not going to be a need to use all those resources to effectuate rescue operations, uh, but we'd rather be safe uh, than sorry. Okay, we'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you want to go right here? All right, well, there you have it. Uh, Governor Ron DeSantis there in hard hit Perry, Florida. You know, once again, outlining what the state is doing. He's there as well, I think, to demonstrate, you know, we are going to be here for this hard-hit community. Uh, look, you're a Florida governor. You're going to handle hurricanes. And one of the reasons he won re-election in the state of Florida by 20 points in a state that is still kind of purple uh, is because of this, because he's on it in a way that people have confidence in and trust. That's not the way he's run his presidential campaign, but certainly that's what he's doing there. Well, it is interesting to just see how he, you know, lights up and fires up, you know, yeah. right there at, at the mics in a situation like this. He knows what he's talking about. He has a plan. He has everybody in place. We saw members of the National Guard all throughout the morning. We've been talking with residents all throughout Florida um, that evacuated and didn't evacuate. Um, those even kind of preparing um, for the, what, what was it called, the King... The king tide, that, that, that was the one thing, uh, talking to a resident. Yeah, they're still not out of the woods yet, right? Right, right. So being able to hear him and, and um, kind of feel the presence of tonight. all those assets, exactly, yeah. which is playing into it all. All right, we do have a lot more uh, breaking news coverage for you. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and give you a fresh start right at the uh, half hour. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. 
four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website runs! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind-blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And today on ABC News Live, Idalia on the move after slamming into Florida's Gulf Coast as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. This storm is now carving a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles and triggering widespread power outages throughout the southeast. We have the latest on the aftermath and the time and track as the storm swirls inland now, putting millions of Americans on alert. So Hurricane Idalia is moving into South Georgia now and heading towards South Carolina. Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia has told people there to prepare and uh, that this is still a very dangerous situation. Of and that hurricane already making history in Florida, just lashing Big Bend, that area, blowing out power lines across the state with huge waves battering homes. And a lot of people right now just wondering if they have anything left. Hmm. Well, Dahlia made landfall as a Category 3 hurricane just before 8 this morning in that Big Bend region of Florida. And it was the strongest storm to hit this area in 127 years. It's a monster, really. It came ashore packing powerful winds, life-threatening storm surge there, as well as spinning off uh, the threat of spinning off tornadoes throughout that region as well. The storm has now been downgraded, though, to a Cat 1, losing strength as it moves northeast over land. And, of course, we have team coverage across the region. We want to head first uh, further inland, where our Maria Villarreal is in Gainesville, Florida. Maria, just describe the conditions for us at this hour. We well, you know Terry and Kira. 
Uh, last night, we went to bed knowing that this was going to be a Category 3 that was going to hit somewhere inland. We expected to get uh, a good bulk, a good hit of Hurricane Idalia. But overnight, they, she took a turn and obviously headed up towards Tallahassee. But what it did bring us on the back end was a hip check by this hurricane. We definitely got the outer bands, which means a whole lot of rain. And what you're still seeing right now, which is a lot of wind. You know, we've heard Victor Okendo and several of our, other of our correspondents talk about what the path or what this kind of hurricane can do even when we are so far from the eye of the storm. We definitely had a whole lot of flooding in this area which we are still battling with here in Gainesville. But on top of that we had a, a, a good amount of wind damage. Uh, that basically means down power lines and obstruction to services in the area as well. Uh, we have a few different um, evacuation shelters that are still open but now the main concern is an area that's about 40 miles from where I'm standing, Cedar Key. We were able to visit with them yesterday as a lot of residents and business owners were boarding up. We've been able to stay in contact with those people. Most of them did evacuate, but there were still people holding out, deciding to stay on that island to try and protect what little they had or the homes that they had and the businesses for that matter. The residents that we spoke with that have evacuated Cedar Key have attempted to go back onto the island to check on everything, but so far they are not being allowed in by law enforcement. There is an immense amount of flooding that has impacted that area so they don't know exactly when they will be back on that island. Hmm, that's got to be frustrating and, and Maria uh, people now after this storm has blown through because it is moving very fast as we can see in the in the radar are people coming out what, what what's their mood what are you hearing? So obviously we're in Gainesville, right? And there are a whole lot of college students here and they are growing restless just as much as residents in Tallahassee. We heard Victor talking about that a little earlier. You know, basically these are people that did heed the warnings. They obviously sheltered in place overnight, but now that the storm has quickly moved through this state, they are ready to get out and about. The thing is, is that again, we don't know exactly how much debris is on the roadways. There are still a number of places that are shut down because of the amount of flooding that was in the area. Plus, Crews are having to get through to try and service some of those down power lines as well. Um, on top of that, businesses closed up shop. The University of Florida isn't coming back in until tomorrow. So right now there's a lot of frustration and restlessness. But that being said, uh, you know, local leaders are saying, listen, give us through the day to make sure that everything is okay. Because the last thing we want is people driving into floodwaters or for that matter, stepping on things, hurting themselves as they try and wade through some of this water and debris. For sure. Maria, thanks very much. Let's head to Tampa now where we find our Ike Jachi. Ike, what's the latest from there and what are you seeing in Tampa? Well, Kira, we know that this area has been preparing for this storm really since yesterday. Uh, we saw the city's main hospital, which is located on the coast, erect those aqua barriers to protect it from the storm surge. And everybody in this city was expecting that hurricane to really hit here around 8 a.m. this morning. And as Maria said, we know that that hurricane path took a more direct approach toward Tallahassee. But nevertheless, those storms' bands have still affected this area here in Tampa. But what we've seen today so far after Adalia has left this area is several downed trees. We've seen down power lines. There are emergency crews and uh, police officers really blocking several roads because of that main concern that we're seeing right now, which is the flooding. That's the one thing that we're really seeing here in Tampa right now are those flood waters really rushing in here and elevating that level of water all throughout the city. One of those is actually right behind me. I want to show you something right here. We're at a Bahama breeze here in Tampa where a lot of people usually come here. They park their boats. They walk up here and they enjoy themselves here. That's not possible right now, because take a look. That dock where everyone usually comes in here, completely flooded out. It's usually above water level, but as you can see right now, the dock is almost completely submerged. And there's another boat actually here that's off camera that's been really sitting in this entire body of water here since this morning. We're not really sure where that boat came from, but it's right over there. And essentially, that's what we're seeing all around Tampa, are the flood waters. Now, I told you how there are lots of police officers and emergency crews blocking several roads because those roads have been washed out. Well, we do know that those elite urban search and rescue crews, those crews that have been here since yesterday, preparing, making sure, and getting ready to be used, we know that they're out there right now, really trying to help some of the individuals who decided to ignore those mandatory evacuation orders to stay inside their homes. We know now, though, that there are dozens of those search and rescue crews 
trying to get to those individuals, trying to get them out of their homes and their areas, because we know now that those floodwaters have not only encroached those neighborhoods, but in some cases, even gotten into some of the homes where these residents are living. Those search and rescue crews right now are going all throughout Tampa, trying to see if there are anybody trapped in those houses or anywhere of those businesses. Now, in terms of the businesses here, some of them are still trying to get back to normal. Fortunately, it didn't, see that those, didn't seem that those floodwaters have affected a lot of businesses around here. And in terms of other businesses, we now know that public services here are starting to resume back to normal. The Tampa International Airport has announced that it is now opened for arrivals only here, and full operations should be made available by Thursday morning. So things are starting to open up a little bit in Tampa, but again, the flood, the floodwaters that we know that were going to come is definitely affecting a lot of the area here in the city. All right, Ike, we'll stay in close touch with you there out of Tampa. Now let's head to Alex Prache, uh, who is in Charleston still. Um, the storm headed in your direction. It's, I guess, remains pretty much calm. Um, but uh, how are things at this moment? Hey, Kira and Terry. So we just heard from Governor McMaster this afternoon, and right now there are no planned evacuations here in South Carolina, but there is a of emergency declared for the state and also here in the city of Charleston. Uh, they're operating at something called OpCon 2, which means extra personnel and also extra precaution. They've opened up shelters across the city for people and their pets. They've also opened up garages for folks to get their cars off the ground because this is an area that is prone to flooding. You're looking at the banks of the Ashley River behind me. That's one of three rivers in this region uh, that we're expecting uh, to, to really kind of swell as Idalia makes its way here. And also keep in mind, as the storm comes here this evening, high tide is at 830. That's only going to compound things. The mayor here is urging residents to bat down the hatches, to stay indoors, and not to put any first responders at unnecessary risk. Yeah. Terry and Kira. All right, All right Alex Prochet. Thanks very much. And one of the small blessings uh, of a storm of this size and danger is that it, it moved pretty fast. I mean, it had that much water and rain been sitting over land, uh, towns like Tampa and elsewhere for a while, it would have been even worse. So let's take a look at the big picture now, where this storm is going and who should watch out next. Our meteorologist, Greg Dutra. Greg? Hi, Terry. And developing, developing rather this hour as the storm continues to move inland is the fact that we're seeing impacts away from the storm center. We were always talking about the threat for tornadoes, right? The tornado watch extending uh, all the way up into uh, North Carolina. Well, two tornado warnings now, one for kind of the Wando River side of Charleston and then one right through Charleston Harbor. And that's what you'll get. These are usually issued for half hour chunks of time. So this goes for the better part. There's a third one just popped on the map off to the south of Charleston, too. It's exactly what you see. And I'm just hearing now from the meteorologist back in the booth that this is indeed a confirmed tornado too, downtown Charleston. So we're definitely going to be getting the absolute latest on that. If it's a confirmed tornado, then not only has it been picked up by radar, but it has actually been spotted and is creating uh, tornadic conditions at the ground level. So not just a funnel cloud extending from the bottom of the cloud. So we will talk about that at length. Now, tracking this up the coast as we continue to gain information on what's going on in Charleston now is flash flood warnings around this. There is about a 150 mile stretch of five plus inch reports for rainfall, and that's about a 25 mile wide swath. That's a lot of water falling in a pretty small area, and that's why we still do have flash flood warnings at this hour. This will continue to move up the coast, and yes, it is only a category one, air quotes on only, likely weakening to a tropical storm here at either the next update or the one after that, but we're seeing right now with confirmed tornado reports around the Charleston area that this still is not done with the eastern seaboard. It continues up into North Carolina by late tonight, early tomorrow morning. Impacts still, I think, lingering into Thursday, too. So we will have to watch this from not only a flooding aspect, but well, from a breaking tornadic aspect at this point. Kira? Right, and if that's true about what you're seeing in mm. Charleston, our Alex Perche is there, and hopefully we can connect with him and find out what exactly is happening uh, in real time for him as you're tracking uh, all the... the radars there. Yep. But with regard to just the impact on other states, uh, specifically further north, uh, what do you think we can expect? Because we were just talking about how we've all been prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems for a much bigger story and knock on wood, it's, you know, 
Um, it, it hasn't turned out to be as bad as we thought thus far, but and, that could change. That, well, that's absolutely right. And I think it's tied to the fact that this is moving so fast. Every storm has its fingerprint, right? right? We like to talk about in category two, category three storms aren't exactly the same. A great example is the forward speed of this at 18 or so miles per hour is going to catch people a little bit off guard that are further off to the north as you're talking about. But the benefit from that is that you don't see those unrelenting rains, the unrelenting winds that'll continue to blow water inland for hours and hours at a time. So we're starting to see the water, yes, it got high in Cedar Key, but now it's receding quickly instead of staying up and causing more problems. Now, again, the flip side of that is areas like Charleston and up off to the north. They're still going to see those onshore winds along with the rainfall. So I'm still expecting to see some pretty significant flooding concerns uh, right around Charleston Harbor because that is a town that is very prone to flooding, even from just a normal run-of-the-mill summer thunderstorm. So you put three to five inches on top of that and then don't let the water drain into the ocean. And you're talking about more problems aside from just pop-up tornadoes like we're seeing now. Greg, we have been so lucky to have you mm. throughout the day. We are just so grateful um, for this ongoing coverage. Thank you. Truly. And coming up, we will have more here on ABC News Live, at live as we cover just, uh, well, pictures that you're looking at right now. That's what this hurricane has done, specifically to parts of Big Bend that just got slammed there in Florida. We're going to actually speak with the president of Duke Energy about all those power outages. We'll see what she has to say coming next. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to our ABC News Live ongoing breaking news coverage of Hurricane Idalia as it continues. The storm now at Category 1, moving into Georgia after well, wreaking all kinds of havoc all across Florida. The hurricane initially made landfall around 745 this morning as a major Category 3 storm in the region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm this strong since 1896. And as the hurricane uh, loses strength uh, heading into South Carolina, a lot of the damage is already done across Florida. Currently, more than 285,000 customers. Actually, it's a lot more than that now. Mm. Uh, that's almost reaching 500,000 in the uh, Sunshine State as we've been following the updated numbers. Let's get straight to St. Petersburg now. The president of Duke Energy in Florida Melissa uh, Satius joining us now. Uh, Melissa, thanks for being uh, with us. I know it's a very busy day, but we're really glad we have you because you're such a critical voice and perspective here. Duke Energy serves almost 2 million electric retail customers, I guess, across the 
St. Petersburg, Clearwater, and Orlando. That's what our research is telling us. Uh, how are they doing? How many are without power? And, and just give us a sense of what the situation is. Thank you. Yes, uh, Duke Energy Florida serves 35 counties in the state, and many of them are along the Gulf Coast uh, where the hurricane came in. And right now we have about 50,000 customers who are without service. Since the storm started to make itself present uh, in the state, we have restored about 80,000 customers. So we have about 5,000 resources that we have brought in including line personnel, vegetation management, support personnel. All of them are staged, ready to go. They're moving out, beginning uh, assessment of the damage and, uh, and beginning restoration as well. So how did you even prepare for this? We always want to know how this goes because it seems like the number one thing uh, that we're always talking about are the people that lose power and then the water comes in and uh, with all the down power lines, that becomes dangerous. Even though the storm may come through, you've got the threat even if you step outside, right, with down power lines and, and, and water. So how did you prepare for this and how do you think it went and what were the challenges this time around? I mean, it was a historic storm. It is a historic storm. So we prepare all year long. For this particular event, uh, we activated uh, our teams on Friday. So all through the weekend, we began the planning, bringing in resources, uh, using uh, data, uh, meteorological uh, data to uh, identify what kind of resources that we would need. Uh, so the teams have been all in. And of course, that also includes identifying where we would stage resources as well and beginning to communicate with our customers about preparation, which is one of the early messages that we need to and we do convey um, leading into uh, into the storm. And, you know, your reporters who were out in the field, as I've been watching and listening to them, I will just reemphasize for all citizens across Florida and other states that are dealing with the impacts of the storm, staying away from downed power lines, staying away from debris in the roads, uh, flooded areas. Energized lines are not always sparking. Uh, they are often very silent, um, but they can be very deadly. And so we really want everyone to come out of this as safe as possible. Uh, we'll do our job and get the power back on. In some places, we may have to rebuild facilities, uh, but we're very confident that we're going to be able to do that in a very timely manner because we want our customers to get back to living their lives. Absolutely, and get back safely. That's a, that's a great alert to put out to people that now power lines aren't always like they are in the movies, sparking and dangerous. They can just be lying there. And I want to ask about, about the, the crews, how you uh, are sending the crews out, where and when to put them, and also about your team. You just mentioned your preparations. You know, how, this is a major challenge for you. You're in Florida. You've, you've, you've dealt with it before. But, but what, are people sleeping at the office? How, how does that work when you have to put this much manpower, woman power into this challenge? Uh, how, how do you feel about how the team has had to face this? So uh, at Duke Energy, uh, every employee has a storm role. Uh, so again, as we train all year for this, but I think also it's important because Florida is a peninsula, uh, the mutual assistance and the way that the utilities, whether large or small, work together uh, through events like this is really critically important. It's how we determine how we can share resources. If one area uh, or company has completed its restoration, we can move resources to another that still is going through the process. So everyone has a storm role. We're 100% focused on it, uh, but it, we really do work closely with uh, the governor. Uh, with the state emergency operations and all of our county EOCs, our emergency operating centers, uh, law enforcement, fire rescue, those relationships are critical uh, for all of us to be successful for our customers and our citizens. Melissa well, Satius, president of Duke Energy there in Florida. Sure appreciate your time. I know it's been quite busy for you. Thanks, Melissa. Absolutely. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Well, coming up, more ABC News Live continuing coverage of Adalia swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. We're going to speak with the commissioner of Wakulla County, just south of Tallahassee. Hard hit up there. We're going to talk to him next.
Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shock story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts, he even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. My name is Lisa. Tiffany. Rita. Leslie. I am I'm a mother. mother. My son was shot dead. My partner abducted our son. This is the last chance to get my kids back. I had to live a double life to save my son. And this is, is my, my story. story. They are taking your children away. And that's when all hell breaks loose. I wanted him to know you mess with the wrong mother. Mother Undercover. Now streaming only on Hulu. Reporting from the Dudley Hospital shooting in Atlanta, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Well, thanks for streaming with us. We're keeping a close eye on Hurricane Adalia since it's been downgraded now to a Category 1 storm. It's losing strength as it moves overland northeast into South Georgia and up towards South Carolina. Adalia made landfall this morning in Florida's Big Bend region. There's a powerful Category 3 hurricane, bringing with it high winds, strong so storm surge, and a lot of danger. Adalia is now the strongest storm to hit that Big Bend area since 1896. Our next guest is Commissioner of Wakulla County there in Crawfordsville, Florida. Officials say that thousands of people are without power after those strong winds just knocked out the lines across the country. Uh, let's bring in Ralph Thomas. Uh, there we go. We got you. Oh, and you're outside for us, too. I guess, why don't we start with what are the conditions like? Uh, where you are? Are you at home? Just give us a scene setter right now, Ralph. Well, I'm in uh, beautiful Panacea, Florida, and what a difference a day makes. Yesterday, we were uh, staff trained and prepared and expecting a direct hit. And uh, this morning, it, it got a little rough, and, and for several hours, we had a lot of rain, a lot of wind, up, 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 probably up about 65 mile per hour wind speed. And so um, we were prepared, but then at the last minute, it kind of took a ride and headed toward Taylor County. Hmm. So how are things there in, in your county now? Are you, how are you faring? Are there down power lines, you know, people who need help? What are you seeing? We do still have some down power lines. We have a lot of trees that went down. Um, we fared much better than we thought. There are some damage to homes, but uh, no major injuries and really um, probably much less impact than what we experienced with Hurricane Michael back in 2018. Well, that's good news. So uh, are people going to have to wait for a while before the power can be restored or, or are people, are crews already out getting that done? They, they are. They're moving fast, and I'm getting reports of, of power coming on in blocks uh, all over the, the county. I think we had about 60 percent of the county that was without power at one point. And so um, that's, that's quickly uh, closing that gap, and they're, they're working hard to restore us countywide. So what's next, Ralph? It looks like you fared pretty well. Are you teaming up and helping with other areas that maybe got harder hit? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've spoken to uh, county commissioners in some other counties. I do know some counties are sending aid to Taylor County. So uh, we're prepared to do the same. You know, we help each other out in a situation like this. Several years ago, we needed it, and um, counties showed up for us as well. So any way we can help them, we're standing by to do so. 
That's All where right. it should be. That's Absolutely. right. <laughs> Ralph Thomas, appreciate you uh, zooming in with us. Well, today Thanks. in Kentucky, Republican Senator Mitch McConnell yeah. appeared to freeze in front of reporters amid concerns about his health. This is now the second episode in a little more than a month now. Take a look. That's a... <clears throat> Did you hear the question, Senator, running for re-election in 2026? Yes. All right, I'm sorry, you all. We're going to need a minute. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so the, the senator there is able to talk. He was asked a question and just kind of froze like that. Uh, he was able to respond to his aide, but not, uh, you know, not, not move or, or respond to the question directly. A spokesman for Senator McConnell tells ABC News that the 81-year-old Senate minority leader, quote, felt momentarily lightheaded but is doing fine and will be consulting a physician. Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre at the White House commented on the incident during today's briefing, saying the President Biden wishes the senator well. And like we said, this just says it comes just a month after McConnell appeared here uh, to freeze during a press conference on Capitol Hill. He was escorted away at that moment as well and then returned moments later saying that he was fine. ABC News recently learned that McConnell did fall on a jet bridge at Reagan Airport in D.C. last month and also suffered a concussion and broken rib after a fall in March. And we should point out it's, it's hard. Um, you know, to look at those moments, mm. um, but he is a public leader, and um, although he has not offered the public much of any no. explanation, right? Of he's seen doctors, been to hospital, but it, he just says he feels fine, which is his right. But as a public official, he's not explaining to the public what's going on there. We really do hope to learn more from him and from his staff. And coming up, of course, we will continue our coverage of the Hurricane uh, Adalia, which is swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Cat Three. We're tracking the very latest for you. Stay with us. More news on the other side. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And today on ABC News Live, Idalia on the move after slamming into Florida's Gulf Coast is a powerful Category 3 hurricane. This storm is now carving a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles and triggering widespread power outages throughout the southeast. We have the latest on the aftermath and the time and track as a storm swirls inland now, putting millions of Americans on alert. So Hurricane Nadalia is moving into South Georgia now and heading towards South Carolina. Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia has told people there to prepare and uh, that this is still a very dangerous situation. Of course. And that hurricane already uh, making history in Florida, just lashing Big Bend, that area, blowing out power lines across the state with huge waves battering homes. And a lot of people right now just wondering if they have anything left. Hmm. Well, Adalia made landfall as a Category 3 hurricane just before 8 this morning in that Big Bend region of Florida. And it was the strongest storm to hit this area in 127 years. It's a monster, really. It came ashore packing powerful winds, life-threatening storm surge there, as well as spinning off 
uh, the threat of spinning off tornadoes throughout that region as well. The storm has now been downgraded, though, to a Cat 1, losing strength as it moves northeast over land. And, of course, we have team coverage across the region. We want to head first uh, further inland, where our Maria Burial is in Gainesville, Florida. Maria, just describe the conditions for us at this hour. We know Tara, uh, Terry and Kira. Uh, last night, we went to bed knowing that this was going to be a Category 3 that was going to hit somewhere inland. We expected to get uh, a good bulk, a good hit of Hurricane Idalia, but overnight, they, she took a turn and obviously headed up towards Tallahassee. But what it did bring us on the back end was a hip check by this hurricane. We definitely got the outer bands, which means a whole lot of rain and what you're still seeing right now, which is a lot of wind. You know, we've heard Victor Okendo and several of our, other of our correspondents talk about what the path or what this kind of hurricane can do even when we are so far from the eye of the storm we definitely had a whole lot of flooding in this area which we are still battling with here in Gainesville but on top of that we had a, a, a good amount of wind damage uh, that basically means down power lines and obstruction to services in the area as well uh, we have a few different um, evacuation shelters that are still open but now the main concern is an area that's about 40 miles from where I'm standing, Cedar Key. We were able to visit with them yesterday as a lot of residents and business owners were boarding up. We've been able to stay in contact with those people. Most of them did evacuate, but there were still people holding out, deciding to stay on that island to try and protect what little they had or the homes that they had and the businesses for that matter. The residents that we spoke with that have evacuated Cedar Key have attempted to go back onto the island to check on everything, but so far they are not being allowed in by law enforcement. There is an immense amount of flooding that has impacted that area so they don't know exactly when they will be back on that island. Hmm, that's got to be frustrating and, and Maria uh, people now after this storm has blown through because it is moving very fast as we can see in the in the radar are people coming out what, what what's their mood what are you hearing? So obviously we're in Gainesville, right? And there are a whole lot of college students here and they are growing restless just as much as residents in Tallahassee. We heard Victor talking about that a little earlier. You know, basically these are people that did heed the warning. They obviously sheltered in place overnight, but now that the storm has quickly moved through this state, they are ready to get out and about. The thing is, is that again, we don't know exactly how much debris is on the roadways. There are still a number of places that are shut down because of the amount of flooding that was in the area. Plus, Crews are having to get through to try and service some of those down power lines as well. Um, on top of that, businesses closed up shop. The University of Florida isn't coming back in until tomorrow. So right now there's a lot of frustration and restlessness. But that being said, uh, you know, local leaders are saying, listen, give us through the day to make sure that everything is okay. Because the last thing we want is people driving into floodwaters or for that matter, stepping on things, hurting themselves as they try and wade through some of this water and debris. For sure. Maria, thanks very much. Let's head to Tampa now where we find our Ike Jachi. Ike, what's the latest from there and what are you seeing in Tampa? Well, Kira, we know that this area has been preparing for this storm really since yesterday. Uh, we saw the city's main hospital, which is located on the coast, erect those aqua barriers to protect it from the storm surge. And everybody in this city was expecting that hurricane to really hit here around 8 a.m. this morning. And as Maria said, we know that that hurricane path took a more direct approach toward Tallahassee. But nevertheless, those storms bands have still affected this area here in Tampa. What we've seen today so far after Adalia has left this area is several downed trees. We've seen down power lines. There are emergency crews and uh, police officers really blocking several roads because of that main concern that we're seeing right now, which is the flooding. That's the one thing that we're really seeing here in Tampa right now are those flood waters really rushing in here and elevating that level of water all throughout the city. One of those is actually right behind me. I want to show you something right here. We're at a Bahama breeze here in Tampa where a lot of people usually come here. They park their boats. They walk up here and they enjoy themselves here. 
Well, that's not possible right now, because take a look. That dock where everyone usually comes in here, completely flooded out. It's usually above water level, but as you can see right now, the dock is almost completely submerged. And there's another boat actually here that's off camera that's been really sitting in this entire body of water here since this morning. We're not really sure where that boat came from, but it's right over there. And essentially, that's what we're seeing all around Tampa, are the flood waters. Now, I told you how there are lots of police officers and emergency crews blocking several roads because those roads have been washed out. Well, we do know that those elite urban search and rescue crews, those crews that have been here since yesterday, preparing, making sure, and getting ready to be used, we know that they're out there right now, really trying to help some of the individuals who decided to ignore those mandatory evacuation orders to stay inside their homes. We know now, know that there are dozens of those search and rescue crews trying to get to those individuals, trying to get them out of their homes and their areas, because we know now that those floodwaters have not only encroached those neighborhoods, but in some cases, even gotten into some of the homes where these residents are living. Those search and rescue crews right now are going all throughout Tampa, trying to see if there are anybody trapped in those houses or anywhere of those businesses. Now, in terms of the businesses here, some of them are still trying to get back to normal. Fortunately, it didn't, see that those, didn't seem that those floodwaters have affected a lot of businesses around here. And in terms of other businesses, we now know that public services here are starting to resume back to normal. The Tampa International Airport has announced that it is now opened for arrivals only here, and full operations should be made available by Thursday morning. So things are starting to open up a little bit in Tampa, but again, the flood, the flood waters that we know that we're going to come is definitely affecting a lot of the area here in the city. All right, Ike, we'll stay in close touch with you there out of Tampa. Now let's head to Alex Perche, uh, who is in Charleston still. Um, the storm headed in your direction. It's, I guess, remains pretty much calm, um, but uh, how are things at this moment? Hey, Kira and Terry. So we just heard from Governor McMaster this afternoon, and right now there are no planned evacuations here in South Carolina, but there is a state of emergency declared for the state and also here in the city of Charleston. Uh, they're operating at something called OpCon 2, which means extra personnel and also extra precaution. They've opened up shelters across the city for people and their pets. They've also opened up garages for folks to get their cars off the ground because this is an area that is prone to flooding. You're looking at the banks of the Ashley River behind me. That's one of three rivers in this region uh, that we're expecting uh, to, to really kind of swell as Idalia makes its way here. And also keep in mind, as the storm comes here this evening, high tide is at 8.30. That's only going to compound things. The mayor here is urging residents to bat down the hatches, to stay indoors, and not to put any first responders at unnecessary risk. Yeah. Terry and Kira. All right, All right Alex Perche. Thanks very much. And one of the small blessings uh, of a storm of this size and danger is that it, it moved pretty fast. I mean, it had that much water and rain been sitting over land, uh, towns like Tampa and elsewhere for a while, it would have been even worse. So let's take a look at the big picture now, where this storm is going and who should watch out next. Our meteorologist, Greg Dutra. Greg? Hi, Terry. And developing, developing rather at this hour as the storm continues to move inland is the fact that we're seeing impacts away from the storm center. We were always talking about the threat for tornadoes, right? The tornado watch extending uh, all the way up into uh, North Carolina. Well, two tornado warnings now, one for kind of the Wando River side of Charleston and then one right through Charleston Harbor. And that's what you'll get. These are usually issued for half hour chunks of time. So this goes for the better part. There's a third one just popped on the map off to the south of Charleston, too. It's exactly what you see. And I'm just hearing now from the meteorologist back in the booth that this is indeed a confirmed tornado too, downtown Charleston. So we're definitely going to be getting the absolute latest on that. If it's a confirmed tornado, then not only has it been picked up by radar, but it has actually been spotted and is creating uh, tornadic conditions at the ground level. So not just a funnel cloud extending from the bottom of a cloud. So we will talk about that at length. Now, tracking this up the coast as we continue to gain information on what's going on in Charleston now is flash flood warnings around this. There is about a 150 mile stretch of five plus inch reports for rainfall, and that's about a 25 mile wide swath. That's a lot of water falling in a pretty small area, and that's why we still do have flash flood warnings at this hour. This will continue to move up the coast, and yes, it is only a category one, air quotes on only, likely weakening to a tropical storm here at either the next update or the one after that, but we're seeing 
seeing right now with confirmed tornado reports around the Charleston area that this still is not done with the eastern seaboard. It continues up into North Carolina by late tonight, early tomorrow morning. Impacts still, I think, lingering into Thursday, too. So we will have to watch this from not only a flooding aspect, but well, from a breaking tornadic aspect at this point. Kira? Right, and if that's true about what you're seeing in mm. Charleston, our Alex Brachet is there, and hopefully we can connect with him and find out what exactly is happening uh, in real time for him as you're tracking uh, all the, the radars there. Yep. But with regard to just the impact on other states, uh, specifically further north, uh, what do you think we can expect? Because we were just talking about how we've all been prepared, mm -hmm. uh, it seems, for a much bigger story. And knock on wood, it's, you know... Um, it, it hasn't turned out to be as bad as we thought thus far, but and, that could change. That, well, that's absolutely right. And I think it's tied to the fact that this is moving so fast. Every storm has its fingerprint, right? right? We like to talk about in category two, category three storms aren't exactly the same. A great example is the forward speed of this at 18 or so miles per hour is going to catch people a little bit off guard that are further off to the north as you're talking about. But the benefit from that is that you don't see those unrelenting rains, the unrelenting winds that'll continue to blow water inland for hours and hours at a time. So we're starting to see the water, yes, it got high in Cedar Key, but now it's receding quickly instead of staying up and causing more problems. Now, again, the flip side of that is areas like Charleston and up off to the north. They're still going to see those onshore winds along with the rainfall. So I'm still expecting to see some pretty significant flooding concerns uh, right around Charleston Harbor because that is a town that is very prone to flooding, even from just a normal run-of-the-mill summer thunderstorm. So you put three to five inches on top of that and then don't let the water drain into the ocean. And you're talking about more problems aside from just pop-up tornadoes like we're seeing now. Greg, we have been so lucky to have you mm. throughout the day. We are just so grateful um, for this ongoing coverage. Thank you. Truly. And coming up, we will have more here on ABC News Live, live as we cover just, uh, well, pictures that you're looking at right now. That's what this hurricane has done, specifically to parts of Big Bend that just got slammed there in Florida. We're going to actually speak with the president of Duke Energy about all those power outages. We'll see what she has to say coming next. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. One, two, three. Let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website friends. Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind-blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the South. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to our ABC News Live ongoing breaking news coverage of Hurricane Idalia as it continues. The storm now at Category 1, moving into Georgia after well, wreaking all kinds of havoc all across Florida. The hurricane initially made landfall around 745 this morning as a major Category 3 storm in the region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm this strong since 1896. And as the hurricane uh, loses strength uh, heading into South Carolina, a lot of damage is already done across Florida. Currently, more than 285,000 customers in the uh, Sunshine State as we've been following the updated numbers. Let's get straight to St. Petersburg now. The president of Duke Energy in Florida, Melissa uh, Satius, joining us now. Uh Melissa, thanks for being uh, with us. I know it's a very busy day, but we're really glad we have you because you're such a critical voice and perspective here. Duke Energy serves almost 2 million electric retail customers, I guess, across the St. Petersburg, Clearwater, and Orlando. That's what our research is telling us. Uh, how are they doing? How many are without power? And, and just give us a sense of what the situation is. Thank you. Yes, uh, Duke Energy Florida serves 35 counties in the state, and many of them are along the Gulf Coast uh, where the hurricane came in. And right now we have about 50,000 customers who are without service. Since the storm started to make itself present uh, in the state, we have restored about 80,000 customers. So we have about 5,000 resources that we have brought in including line personnel, vegetation management, support personnel. All of them are staged, ready to go. They're moving out, beginning uh, assessment of the damage and, uh, and beginning restoration as well. And so how did you even prepare for this? We always want to know how this goes because it seems like the number one thing uh, that we're always talking about are the people that lose power and then the water comes in and uh, with all the down power lines, that becomes dangerous. Even though the storm may come through, you've got the threat even if you step outside, right, with down power lines and, and, and water. So how did you prepare for this and how do you think it went and what were the challenges this time around? I mean, it was a historic storm. It is a historic storm. So we prepare all year long. For this particular event, uh, we activated uh, our teams on Friday. So all through the weekend, we began the planning, bringing in resources, uh, using uh, data, uh, meteorological uh, data to uh, identify what kind of resources that we would need. Uh, so the teams have been all in. And of course, that also includes identifying where we would stage resources as well and beginning to communicate with our customers about preparation, which is one of the early messages that we need to and we do convey um, leading into uh, into the storm. And, you know, your reporters who were out in the field, as I've been watching and listening to them, I will just reemphasize for all citizens across Florida and other states that are dealing with the impacts of the storm, staying away from downed power lines, staying away from debris in the roads, uh, flooded areas. Energized lines are not always sparking. Uh, they are often very silent, um, but they can be very deadly. And so we really want everyone to come out of this as safe as possible. Uh, we'll do our job and get the power back on. In some places, we may have to rebuild facilities, uh, but we're very confident that we're going to be able to do that in a very timely manner because we want our customers to get back to living their lives. Absolutely, and get back safely. That's a, that's a great alert to put out to people that now power lines aren't always like they are in the movies, sparking and dangerous. They can just be lying right. there. And I want to ask about, about the, the crews, how you uh, are sending the crews out. 
where and when to put them, and also about your team. You just mentioned your preparations. You know, how, this is a major challenge for you. You're in Florida. You've 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 dealt with it before, but but what are people sleeping at the office? How, how does that work when you have to put this much manpower, woman power into this challenge? Uh, how, how do you feel about how the team? has had to face this. So uh, at Duke Energy, uh, every employee has a storm role. Uh, so again, as we train all year for this, but I think also it's important because Florida is a peninsula, uh, the mutual assistance and the way that the utilities, whether large or small, work together uh, through events like this is really critically important. It's how we determine how we can share resources. If one area uh, or company has completed its restoration, we can move resources to another that still is going through the process. So everyone has a storm roll. We're 100% focused on it, uh, but it, we really do work closely with uh, the governor, uh, with the state emergency operations, and all of our county EOCs, our emergency operating centers, uh, law enforcement, fire rescue, those relationships are critical uh, for all of us to be successful for our customers and our citizens. Melissa Satius, president of Duke Energy there in Florida. Sure appreciate your time. I know it's been quite busy for you. Thanks, Melissa. Absolutely. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Well, coming up, more ABC News Live continuing coverage of Adalia swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. We're going to speak with the commissioner of Wakulla County, just south of Tallahassee. Hard hit up there. We're going to talk to him next. GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. ABC News, America's number one news source. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. We're keeping a close eye on Hurricane Adalia since it's been downgraded now to a Category 1 storm. It's losing strength as it moves overland northeast into South Georgia and up towards South Carolina. Adalia made landfall this morning in Florida's Big Bend region. as a powerful Category 3 hurricane, bringing with it high winds, strong so storm surge, a lot of danger. Adalia is now the strongest storm to hit that Big Bend area since 1896. Our next guest is Commissioner of Wakulla County there in Crawfordsville, Florida. Officials say that thousands of people are without power after those strong winds just knocked out the lines across the country. Uh, let's bring in Ralph Thomas. Uh, there we go. We got you. Oh, and you're outside for us, too. I guess, why don't we start with what are the conditions like uh, where you are? Are you at home? Just give us a scene setter right now, Ralph. Well, I'm in uh, beautiful Panacea, Florida, and what a difference a day makes. Yesterday, we were uh, staff trained and prepared and expecting a direct hit. And uh, this morning, it, it got a little rough, and, and for several hours, we had a lot of rain, a lot of wind, up, uh, up probably up about 65 mile per hour wind speed. And so um, we were prepared, but then at the last minute, it kind of took a ride and headed toward Taylor County. Hmm. So... How are things there in, in your county now? Are you, how are you faring? Are there down power lines, you know, people who need help? What are you seeing? We do still have some down power lines. We have a lot of trees that went down. Uh, we fared much better than we thought. There are some damage to homes, but uh, no major injuries and really um, probably much less impact than what we experienced with Hurricane Michael back in 2018. 
Well, that's good news. So uh, are people going to have to wait for a while before the power can be restored? Or are, are people, are crews already out getting that done? They, they are. They're moving fast. And I'm getting reports of, of power coming on in blocks uh, all over the, the county. I think we had about 60% of the county that was without power at one point. And so um, that's, that's quickly uh, closing that gap. And they're, they're working hard to restore us countywide. So what's next, Ralph? It looks like you fared pretty well. Are you teaming up and helping with other areas that maybe got harder hit? Yes, I've spoken to uh, county commissioners in some other counties. I do know some counties are sending aid to Taylor County. So uh, we're prepared to do the same. You know, we help each other out in a situation like this. Several years ago, we needed it. And um, counties showed up for us as well. So any way we can help them, we're standing by to do so. That's where right. it should be. That's Absolutely. right. <laughs> Ralph Thomas, appreciate you uh, zooming in with us. Well, today Thanks. in Kentucky, Republican Senator Mitch McConnell mm -hmm. appeared to freeze in front of reporters amid concerns about his health. This is now the second episode in a little more than a month now. Take a look. That's uh... <clears throat> Did you hear the question, Senator, running for re-election in 2026? Yes. All right, I'm sorry, you all. We're going to need a minute. Don't come with us. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, so the, the senator there is able to talk. He was asked a question and just kind of froze like that. Uh, he was able to respond to his aide, but not... Uh, you know, not, not move or, or respond to the question directly. A spokesman for Senator McConnell tells ABC News that the 81-year-old Senate Minority Leader, quote, felt momentarily lightheaded, but is doing fine and will be consulting a physician. Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre at the White House commented on the incident during today's briefing, saying the President Biden wishes the senator well. And like we said, this just as it comes just a month after McConnell appeared here uh, to freeze during a press conference on Capitol Hill. He was escorted away at that moment as well and then returned moments later saying that he was fine. ABC News recently learned that McConnell did fall on a jet bridge at Reagan Airport in D.C. last month and also suffered a concussion and broken rib after a fall in March. And we should point out it's, it's hard. Um, you know, to look at those moments, mm. um, but he is a public leader, and um, although he has not offered the public much of any no. explanation, right? Of he's seen doctors, been to hospital, but it, he just says he feels fine, which is his right. But as a public official, he's not explaining to the public what's going on there. We really do hope to learn more from him and from his staff. And coming up, of course, we will continue our coverage of the Hurricane uh, Adalia, which is swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Cat 3. We're tracking the very latest for you. Stay with us. More news on the other side. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And today on ABC News Live, Idalia on the move now after slamming into Florida's Gulf Coast as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. The storm is now carving a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles and triggering widespread power outages. We have the latest on the aftermath and the time and track of the storm swirls inland, putting millions of Americans on alert. 
So Hurricane Idalia is now moving into South Georgia at this hour. Governor Brian Kemp is telling people there to prepare and that this is still a very dangerous situation. Yeah, the hurricane already made history in Florida, lashing Big Ben, blowing out power across the state, and also those huge waves that just battered homes. And a lot of people right now are just wondering if they have anything left. Idalia made landfall as a Cat 3 just before 8 this morning in the Big Bend region of Florida, making it the strongest storm to hit this area in 127 years. And it came ashore packing you know, powerful winds, of course, a life-threatening storm surge as well, and confirmed tornadoes spinning off it. Now, the storm has now been downgraded to a Cat 1, losing strength as it moves northeast over land. We've got team coverage for you across the region. We're going to go ahead and start off in Charleston, South Carolina. Our Alex Prache is there. Alex, uh, the storm uh, headed your way. Uh, also, last time we talked, I believe a, a tornado had That's just, uh, right? We had heard had touched down there where you are. Were you able to confirm that? Yes, yeah, so it was actually a confirmed tor tornado. And, and, and Kira, actually, there, there, there's been some, some video floating around uh, uh, of the that uh, uh, authorities were able to use to, to, to confirm this tornado. It flipped a car in the air. Uh, and so, look, we've had tornado warnings throughout the day. That was the most recent one on our drive up here in South Carolina. Uh, when we first entered the state, there was another tornado warning around 11.45 this afternoon. And that's been uh, on top of the, the, the concern for Idalia, which is making its way here, uh, expected to arrive late this evening. Keep in mind, high tide here is 8.30. I'm standing basically on the banks of the Ashley River, and so there is a great concern for storm surge. There is a state of emergency already declared for the state. Also, the city of Charleston, they're operating at something called OpCon 2, which they've opened up shelters for people and pets. They've also opened up some of the garages for, for folks to uh, bring their cars in off the street. We have moved to higher ground in preparation for, for this evening because, look, Charleston has a history of flooding. The mayor here saying to residents that, look, we're hoping that you heed our warnings, hunker down, stay safe, don't put emergency first responders at risk. All right, Alex, uh, also, you mentioned the tides and the potential for flooding uh, later on because there's a full moon, a blue moon, and so it's, uh, that is certainly a situation to watch. You know, the community is bracing for this. Give us a sense of the timeline and how people are preparing. Well, so we, we've seen we've seen preparations here around our hotel and in, in, in this region, which is right along the banks of the Ashley River, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, but they're they're tying things down. They are taking uh, uh, down outdoor patio furniture and, and and really making sure that as these winds kick up this evening, that there's nothing for them to blow away. We mentioned uh, th this confirmed tornado. Look, there were already reports of debris flying uh, that you know could potentially hurt seriously hurt somebody, and so uh, in in anticipation of even higher winds this evening. We've seen a lot of that. Uh, and then also there is the concern for that storm surge, vehicles being moved to higher ground, some of the parking decks. We're expecting some more road closures as we go into this evening. We're also expecting for a lot of the businesses here to, uh, to, to shutter a little bit early, allowing those employees time to get home somewhere safe as Adalia moves in late this evening. All right, we'll be talking to you all the way into the evening. Alex, thank you so much. And of course, the ripple effects of this storm are wide reaching with the storm making impact in the Big Bend region of Florida. So let's head to Tampa, where we have our Ike Ajanchi. Ike, uh, are you finally in the clear there as the storm moved past you? Well, Terry, I will say this. I did see the blue skies here. It's been here <laughs> since the afternoon, which is a good sign, which means that Hurricane Adalia is definitely moving away from this area. Now, the National Hurricane Center said that the hurricane touched down this morning around 7.45 a.m. at Keaton Beach. And although it wasn't necessarily a direct hit here in, ha in Tampa, the effects of Adalia were definitely felt here. We've seen nonstop down trees all along the coastline here. We saw that high surf really bring some of the debris onto the beaches here, even though a lot of crews spent a good amount of time yesterday trying to remove anything from the beach that could potentially cause some harm to anybody in the way. 
We know that the high tide mixed with this storm surge is really causing an issue for flooding here. I told you just an hour ago how there were several law enforcement officers and emergency responders blocking a lot of the roads here in Tampa just to make sure that people don't go in there. I also told you how those urban, uh, rather those elite urban search and rescue crews were in the areas, a lot of those little remote neighborhoods here in Tampa, making sure that they can help people. We know that people were hunkering down here, ignoring those mandatory evacuation orders. We also know that the floodwaters really did rush into those neighborhoods, really threatening a lot of the residents' homes uh, by, but with those floodwaters eventually, potentially rather, flooding their homes. But there's a new story right now. We're getting word from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis that things are starting to open up a little bit before. I want to show you something. Just an hour ago, we showed you how a dock behind me was essentially submerged in water due to that high flood uh, storm surge. Take a look right now. You can see it right now. It's starting to show itself. Again, just an hour ago, this dock right here was essentially underneath the water. We're seeing the water start to uh, recede a little bit, and we're starting to see this dock really show its face again. It's a dock that's used by several people here in the community. They come here, and they really come to enjoy this restaurant that we're here now. And that's another sign. Things are starting to open up again. We just heard word here, we're at a Bah Bahama Breeze here in Tampa, that they were just given word to open up. So they've been placing their tables here and really getting a, a lot of things ready for what they feel are as an influx of customers that could be coming later tonight. We also heard word of a lot of other things opening up here in Tampa. We know that the gyms are starting to open up. We know that restaurants are starting to open up. We know that grocery stores, Publixes, are starting to open up. And yes, we were told from some people here that the strip clubs in Tampa are starting to open up. <laughs> a sign of things to really get back to normal, guys. Yeah, I guess that's a sign. Clearly, Ma major industry the there. hurricane has come and gone. Life is back to normal. That's well, just Cracker Jack reporting, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. To Ike, uh, you'll be coming home right now. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll All see right. you there. Thank you. Thank right. you very much. Appreciate it, Ike. Contribution. Uh, and, of course, this storm, serious, has caused tremendous delays in air travel as well. Oh, yes, it has. And our transportation reporter, Sam Sweeney, has been tracking all of that for us. Sam, some of the best news throughout the day is when uh, certain reporters across Florida were saying, OK, it looks like the airport's open now. <laughs> Yep, that's the good news. Tampa was the biggest airport that was closed, and that has since reopened to arriving flights. But it's going to take a couple of days for them to get fully back up and running. Uh, airlines move their planes out of the storm uh, areas before these storms move in. So now they've got to get those planes back in. Take a look at flight radar right now, and you can see uh, earlier this morning, there were very few planes over the Florida Panhandle area, uh, the west coast of Florida. Now they have moved back in. But as you go farther north near Savannah, you can see just a few planes in the air uh, there. There are more than 1,000 cancellations today. So far, just 100 tomorrow. That will likely grow overnight. Uh, but the good news is many people have been notified by their airlines that their flights were canceled days ago, and they were able to make alternate plans. But if you are flying over the next couple of days, you certainly want to check in uh, as the airlines in these airports get back up to speed. All right, so Sam, just give us, you're an expert in this area, give us a sense of the scale of the disruption and when things will be all together back to normal. Well, look, as we've been reporting, you know, in Florida, at least, the major airports didn't sustain that much damage. And for Tampa to be able to reopen so fast uh, is, is certainly a good sign. But when you shut down an airport, you have to move all of the equipment out of the way. You pull the jet bridges back. You tie them down. Uh, and, and it just takes a lot of time. Plus, you had these evacuations. So many airport employees leave the area. They also have to get back. So it, it really is just a, a process that takes a couple of days. Uh, but hopefully, as this storm moves north, there isn't more damage to those airports up there. All right, Sam, appreciate it. Thanks so much. And now we're going to take a look at, at the big picture where this storm is headed. ABC News meteorologist Greg Dutra has been with us all day and back now. So, Greg, what phase of the storm are we in now as you see it? Well, now I think it's it's more of a diffuse kind of problems pop up every once in a while in different spots area. Prime example uh, was just a little while ago out in Charleston where we had three concurrent tornado warnings and then tornado warnings that were popping up through the morning too. Look at this big area that has a tornado watch all the way from south of Savannah all the way up into North Carolina. And at any point here through the evening and into early tomorrow, we can see spin up tornadoes as 
those bands make their way in. So it's a more diffuse type situation than where we were laser focused on exactly where this was making landfall. Now, we have video that came in that we were talking about a little while ago. Alex Perche was talking about it. Uh, and here it is, folks driving, and that car just gets picked up and tossed around. I mean, that is not just a hurricane force gust of wind. That was very likely something spinning off, uh, again, out near the Charleston area. So there you go, South Carolina, well away from the core of this still, but still seeing those effects. And that's going to be something that we watch into the evening. Now, the other concern, of course, is the flash flooding. And while these are starting to fall off the map, there was a stripe that went from Georgia all the way into northern Florida, five Five plus inches of rainfall, some isolated pockets of eight to 10 inches of rain. The one good thing that I can say about this is that it's moving pretty quickly, 20 or so miles per hour. I'd be surprised if it's a cat to uh, one still as we head into this evening. Probably at the next update at five o'clock, it'll either be real borderline hurricane strength or drop below hurricane strength. But again, I don't wanna get too tied up in that because there are still other threats, including the heavy rainfall and also the storm surge from Charleston up to Myrtle Beach and all the way up to the outer bank as we head into early tomorrow morning. Kyra mm. and Perry. Greg, thank you so much. No great, great work today. Thank and you. coming up, of course, uh, more ABC News Live. ABC News Live continuing coverage of the hurricane as it's swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Cat 3 hurricane. We are going to speak with the Public Safety Director of Bullock County, Georgia, next. Leslie. I am I'm a mother. mother. My son was shot dead. My partner abducted our son. This is the last chance to get my kids back. I had to live a double life to save my son. And this is my, my story. story. They are taking your children away. And that's when all hell breaks loose. I wanted him to know you mess with the wrong mother. Mother Undercover. Now streaming only on Hulu. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the sun. Friday, Sam Hunt, performing for you live in Central Park, only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series, sponsored by Hot Tools. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did you do if she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Ooh. Friday, the David Muir two-hour 2020 event at 9, 8 central on ABC. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. So glad you're streaming with us as we continue our breaking news coverage of Hurricane Idalia. That storm still uh, now a Category 1, uh, but moving into Georgia after wreaking all that havoc across Florida. The hurricane initially made landfall around 745 this morning as a major Category 3 storm in a region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm that strong since 1896. And there are counties in Georgia declaring state of emergencies as this hurricane moves even farther north, and that includes Bullock County, Georgia. Joining us now, the public safety director from there, Ted Wynn. Ted, thanks so much uh, for being with us. I understand Bullock County, uh, well, it, it's, it's having its troubles. Tell us exactly what you're seeing uh, right now and where are your biggest concerns? Is it right there in Bullock? Is it surrounding areas? Well, we're just beginning to feel the effects of the uh, of the hurricane. Um, we have uh, seen some uh, heavy, heavy rainfalls and some tropical storm force winds, and it, they're picking up and getting a little stronger now. And we're experiencing some trees down, power outages, as well as water over a number of roads. 
Uh, and Ted, what is your county and surrounding areas anticipating from this storm now? What's coming next? Uh, how are you preparing? We uh, we started preparation about three or four days ago in in, in anticipation of this. But uh, our public works crews are out right now with law enforcement trying to do their best to keep as many roads cleared of trees and debris as possible. But, you know, we're asking motorists to stay off the road if at all possible because we've got a number of roads with water that is covering the roads, and certainly we don't want people to be driving through that. Absolutely. And, and aside from that, keeping the roads clear, what are you telling, what advice are you giving people there now? Uh, currently, shelter in place. Um, uh, we... We are running 911 calls at this point in time. However, there may come a point in time that we have to discontinue that because it may get too dangerous for first responders. But right now we are running the calls, but it will help us if people will just shelter in place and um, hopefully things are gonna begin to improve uh, later tonight. So right now you're not asking for any specific evacuations, any certain areas to evacuate or any types of, of you know people to? No evacuation orders here. We're a little bit inland uh, from the Atlantic Ocean, so we typically host, but we're not hosting because there was not an evacuation order from the coast of Georgia. But no, we're not. Uh, uh, we're not ordering any evacuation at this point in time. We just want people to be safe in their homes. And given that, uh, how do you feel about the resources that you have there? You know, we're being told that storms of this magnitude and this intensity are going to be more frequent given what's happening to the weather. What do you think of that? Uh, and and do, you, do you feel that Bullock County is prepared for you know, what, what might be coming? Absolutely, we're prepared. The state of Georgia uh, really leans forward into this. And, and you know, that, that permeates into the local government also. So... You know, we start preparations well ahead of time. We've had a number of storms and hurricanes over the last five to six years. So we've had a lot of practice at this also. So we feel well prepared. Although this one is bringing a lot of rain and wind, it's gonna take us some time overnight into tomorrow to recover fully. So if folks will just stay off the roadways, that will help us greatly. Let's hope they listen. Ted right. Wynn, thank you so much. My pleasure, Excellent. thank you. Well, coming up, more ABC News Live continuing coverage of Idalia swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. We're going to speak with the mayor of Gainesville, Florida, right in the path. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the sun. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Reporting from Boston, I'm Whit Johnson. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
glad you're streaming with us. Hurricane Idalia now moving across Georgia. The storm has been downgraded to a Cat 1. It's losing strength as it moves northeast over land. Governor Brian Kemp, though, is still telling people that they must prepare there in the state of Georgia. Hurricane Idalia already has made history in Florida, making landfall as a Category 3 storm just before 8 this morning in the Big Bend region of Florida. That's the strongest storm to hit that area in more than 100 years. Idalia is also expected to impact South Carolina. You can hear it, see it there on the, on the map heading uh, northeast right through those states, racing at a pretty good clip. Right, the dangerous conditions. I mean, they just continue uh, there in Florida as residents are just grappling with the storm damage that has already taken place. Joining us now from Gainesville, Florida, one area we have been focusing on in particular, it's Mayor Harvey Ward. Uh, linking up with us. Appreciate it. I know it's been a rough day when we we're glad we have you, Mayor. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, having me on. It's, uh, it's been a long day, but uh, we are very fortunate to not have had uh, the, the, the full brunt of the storm here in Gainesville. There was a storm surge southwest of us along the coast. And, uh, you know, when, when I left the emergency operations center to come home last night, we were pretty sure that we were going to be right in the uh, the middle of the path of the storm. But by the time we got back uh, uh, th this morning to the emergency operations center, uh, we were fortunate that it uh, it did miss us. Uh, some tremendous devastation north of us, though. Uh, really, really awful. Well, and, and Mayor, we, our reporter there on the ground in Gainesville has talked about the hazardous conditions even as the storm moves north. So how... How are the residents there and how's the safety situation with the down power lines and the flooding and all the rest that, that the storm like this can bring? So again, we're, we're very fortunate to, uh, to miss most of those events. We do have, we had tropical storm force winds here for uh, several, the, the first half of the day really. Um, and uh, we had a lot of, uh, have a lot of trees down, had some downed power lines. Uh, I'm so happy to report to you that our uh, our tremendous crew at crews at um, Gainesville Regional Utilities uh, have lowered the number of homes without electricity to 153 at this point. So unbelievable work by our uh, municipal utility. Uh, we have about 100,000 customers, and again, only 153 of those without power right now. So still work to do, but gosh, they've uh, our, our emergency crews. Uh, both in general government and our utilities have, have done remarkable work today. And just looking at the pictures of the crews there, getting in and assessing the damage, uh, moving the, the trees, the debris, trying to get things up and running. You talk about more than 100 uh, people still, though, without power. How, how do you, is it, are they in harder to get areas? Kind of describe to us what's making that a little more challenging so the, the bulk of folks without power are actually in my neighborhood. So unless anyone thinks that there's a benefit to being mayor, uh, I'll dispel that rumor right now. Um, we, uh, it, it, it really depends on, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the tree canopy in any given neighborhood and, and how extensive it is. Uh, we're very proud of our trees here in Gainesville. We're a tree city USA. And uh, most of the time, that's a very, very good thing. Uh, it is a little bit challenging when a storm comes through. Uh, so really, that's uh, th that's the issue with uh, down uh, down power lines and people without power right now. But again, out of uh, about a 200,000 person metro area, 100,000 utility accounts were down to about 150 uh, still without power. So uh, really tremendous response by our city emergency uh, uh, workers today, uh, both at the utility and our police and fire and public works folks. Our community responded very, very well. Uh, the, the danger of the storm has passed us and uh, we do have some some trees down. We, we have a, a handful of folks still without power, but I can't say enough good things about the response of our uh, our, our city's um, emergency crews today. They, they've been just just wonderful. Uh, the University of Florida has been very, uh, very good with with uh, their folks as well. They work uh, so well with uh, the city of Gainesville, with Alachua County, uh, the state of Florida. Very proud of all the response teams. And I'm pleased that, that now we're going to be able to uh, release some of our utility workers uh, through mutual aid agreements to go help in some of the other communities around Florida that were so much harder hit uh, than, than we were here in Gainesville. That, that's great. I know that you know, Floridians have a lot of experience with hurricanes, but this area, as we've been reporting, you know, not as much of, of 
with storms of this magnitude and threat. Now, it, it did move through pretty quickly, but talk about your team, how you prepared and, and, and how you feel about the people who have you know, met this challenge. So I, I've been telling them uh, in our community all day, there is no team I would rather have uh, doing uh, emergency operations than the ones that we have here at the city of Gainesville. I'm so proud of the work they do. Uh, they prepare all year long. And these are folks who don't just do emergency work. They, they have regular jobs at the city of Gainesville as well, but they, uh, they all participate in training exercises throughout the year, whether that's at public works or communications or uh, our, our Gainesville fire rescue department or our police department, our utilities. They, they work together in training exercises regularly so that when the inevitable storms come through, and we do have tropical storms uh, on a, you know, an annual basis, uh, when those storms come through, they can pull the book down off the shelf, flip to the right page, and get to work. And it, it feels seamless. You know, it feels like this is all they uh, all they prepare for, but they really do have other jobs. I'm so proud of uh, of the work they do, and and so pleased that that our community was was helpful in that effort. We we asked people to please stay inside their homes to to not be out in the storm where uh, they would be a danger to themselves and, and make it hard to get the emergency work done. And our community responded, uh, whether those be, you know, uh, older folks or uh, younger folks who were just kind of curious or university students or everything in between, everybody did their part in the storm and uh, the, the community uh, should really be proud of itself. Gainesville, Florida Mayor Harvey Ward. Thanks for your time, Mayor. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. Well, we want to get back to our meteorologist, Greg Dutra. So, Greg, I guess there are uh, developments in this storm. Tell us. Well, we were talking uh, earlier, and I said I'd be surprised if it makes it to or even past the 5 o'clock as a hurricane. And it's not a hurricane anymore. It's a tropical storm. Wind's now down to 70 miles per hour. And it's about 100 or so miles off to the south and west of Charleston, ticking up another mile per hour in forward speed, now at 21 miles per hour. Now, that doesn't mean we're completely out of the woods yet. Remember, it's uh, less of a laser focused on the coast type view and now a diffuse view of a wide area area that has a tornado watch and still two now active tornado warnings and anywhere along the coast here as we head through this evening and into the overnight at risk for one of those quick spin up tornadoes like we saw on the video just a little while ago so not out of the woods just yet but definitely trending in the right direction back to you all right greg thanks so much no problem. And coming up, a lot more here on ABC News Live. We are going to continue our coverage of the hurricane now, as you heard from Greg, downgraded to a tropical storm. She's giving up, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it has not been easy for a lot of the yeah. communities who are having to rebuild uh, in places like right here uh, where you're looking on your screen. We've got a lot more straight ahead. Stay with us. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. One, two, three, let's get it! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website runs! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs to lose weight? I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind-blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge. This Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the 
know you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the White House, I'm Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran, and today on ABC News Live, Idalia on the move now is a tropical storm after slamming into Florida's Gulf Coast as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. This storm carving a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles, and triggering widespread power outages. We have the latest on the aftermath and the time and track as this storm swirls inland, putting millions of Americans still on alert. A tropical storm, Idalia now, is what it is. It's moving into South Georgia. Governor Brian Kemp there telling people to prepare for it, uh, noting that it is still a dangerous situation. Right, the tropical storm already making history in Florida, lashing Big Bend, that area, also blowing out power across the state in Florida, and then the huge waves that just battered so many homes. A lot of people still wondering if they have anything left. And uh, take a look at this shocking video. Well. That is obviously an overhead shot. We do have video out of Goose Creek, South Carolina. That is not it. This there it is. is. It. Take a look. That car tossed, picked up and tossed into the air, slamming into another vehicle. Officials confirming that a small and brief tornado touched down and lifted that up. We certainly hope all are safe who experienced that terrifying moment there. Idalia made landfall as a Category 3 just before 8 this morning in the Big Bend region of Florida, making it the strongest storm to hit that area in 127 years. And it came ashore packing powerful winds, a life-threatening storm surge, which most people got out of the way of, and the threat of tornadoes. It was just saw in South Carolina there. Yeah, well now, as we mentioned, Idalia has been downgraded to a tropical storm. It lost strength as it moved northeast over land. We continue, though, to check in with uh, all our correspondents across the region, starting off there in Charleston, South Carolina, with our Alex Prache. Uh, how's it looking this hour? Hey, Kira and Terry. So you, you referenced that that video of that tornado in, in Goose Creek. That's about 30 minutes from here. Uh, and, and so, look, on top of preparing for this tropical storm, which we're expecting later in this evening, this region has been dealing with tornadoes and tornado warnings. Actually, the town of, of Huger right now, which is about 44 minutes from here, uh, just issued uh, the National Weather Service there, just issued a tornado warning there as well. This has been consistent throughout the afternoon. By our count, this is at least the third tornado warning in the area. Uh, officials warning about the possibility of debris flying. And obviously, you know, that is something that is a, a, a great concern. And so we've seen a lot of the local businesses uh, take tables and, and, and chairs and outdoor patio sets off their off their grounds, uh, securing them as as we're expecting this tropical storm to make its way uh, in this evening. The other thing that I would flag for you guys is that, look, it's no secret that Charleston is prone to flooding. I'm sitting right now, we're, we're on the banks of the Ashley River here, one of three rivers in the region. High tide is expected to be around 8.30 this evening. That's also when we're expecting uh, a brunt of this rain from this storm. And so with that is the possibility of storm surge, something that uh, the mayor and both the governor are, are concerned about. The governor saying this afternoon, uh, don't worry, don't panic, but be prepared. So let's talk about the biggest threats, Alex, to Charleston and surrounding areas right now. We saw that, you know, that terrifying video of what looked like a tornado lifting a car off the ground. What are people doing there? Well, so we've seen a lot of people actually uh, in, 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 in the last couple of hours uh, make those preparations, right? Uh, it's, it's the last minute trips to the grocery store before before it closes. It's, it's, it's filling up on gas and getting to where you need to be. The mayor here in Charleston has told folks that as this storm moves in this evening, uh, you want to be hunkered down. You want to be inside. Don't put first responders, emergency first responders at risk. And for those that don't have some place to go, the city has, has gone ahead and they've opened up shelters for, for people and pets. They've also opened up some of the garages to, to help folks get cars uh, off the ground because again this is prone to flooding uh, and, and and you know they've certainly dealt with this in the past um, look we've moved to higher ground but I can tell you that around here uh, there are a lot of low-lying parking lots 
that wall, as the rain picks up behind me, uh, between us and, and the river, isn't that high. So if there is a storm surge, uh, it, it, it's very plausible that water would flood this area. So, Alex, what's next? You know, now that this storm has been downgraded to a tropical storm, how's that changing the conversation where you are? Well, it's Kira, I don't think it's actually changing the conversation because, again, you know, we're we have this tropical storm that's making its way, but then we are also coupling it with some of these tornado warnings. Officials urging, urging residents here to heed the warnings, to, to take this seriously, and to eventually make your way indoors and stay there. All right. Alex Prochet, thanks very much. Now we're going to take a look at the big picture once again with our ABC News meteorologist, Greg Dutra. So, Greg... You know, how would you describe where this storm is and what it is? Now it's a tropical storm. Okay, it's much more diffuse. I don't, I, it, yeah. Would you call there, was there an eye in there still? What do you think? Hey, there's still <laughs> definitely a center of low pressure, for sure, for sure. But you know how it is when these things move and make landfall. We are laser focused on a tiny little wedge of coastline where they're going to see the most significant winds and storm surge. It's a 50 mile or so stretch that we're really focused on. Now you're absolutely right. I think. I think diffuse is the right word because we've got an area that stretches from just south of Savannah, Georgia, all the way up almost to the outer banks of North Carolina. Huge tornado watch. And every once in a while, like little fires that pop up, you see these red boxes come in and those are active tornado warnings. The city of Charleston at one point had three of them going on at the same time. And now there's two at this point, but spread out much more widespread. Now, one other issue will be that the heavy rainfall from this that's falling inland at this point there could be four to six almost up to 10 inches in some isolated spots of rain that's falling inland and trying to empty out into the ocean but the problem is yes this is only a tropical storm now but it's still pushing water up against all of these outlets two to five feet worth of storm surge from savannah to charleston and that's going to kind of plug up the drain a little bit for the water trying to get back out to sea and i wouldn't be surprised if we get some video out of cities like charleston uh, or savannah or farther up the coast into myrtle beach i've been to myrtle beach a number of times they're pretty prone to flooding too even from just garden variety thunderstorms so that's the main threat moving forward pop-up tornadoes and then some flooding and Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Wilmington, and possibly all the way up to the northern banks. Again, changing gears a little bit, but still not completely out of the woods. Okay, so let's expand on that. How likely sure. is it for this storm to, to grow in strength again? Well, that is always a good question, especially when it moves back over water, but it's out of the tropics now. So you're getting north of about 30 degrees north, which we call the horse latitudes, where the trade winds will switch. So it's definitely out of the tropics. And even though it's going to move back over open water, the water is much cooler. And in general, the prevailing winds are now moving from west to east. So it'll actually act to blow it away away from the U.S. and out towards Bermuda in the coming days. So even if it did gain a little bit more strength over the coming days, the good news is it's far enough north that it's not going to curve back in and hit us again. But we have certainly seen that before, so I understand the concern there. Hmm. All righty. Greg, thank you. No problem. Well, coming up, more ABC News Live continuing coverage of Idalia. Now a tropical storm swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. We're tracking the very latest just ahead. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the South. 
Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us here on ABC News Live. Our breaking news coverage continues. Dahlia now downgraded to a tropical storm, moving into Georgia after wreaking all that havoc across Florida. Uh, the hurricane initially made landfall around 745 this morning as a major Category 3 storm in a region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm this strong since 1896. And the American Red Cross has been on the ground, as always, ready to assist the hardest hit areas. And uh, Grace Meinhofer now joining us uh, from Tallahassee. Grace, just tell us about the response. Um, you know, that from the very beginning to this point, how did you prepare? What assets did you put out first and foremost? Where did you go first? Kind of give us the details on how you operated and also how you're still operating because we're not completely out of the woods yet. Thank you for having me, guys. And yes, preparation is the most important thing, especially for the Red Cross. I mean, not only are we responding to a major disaster in Hawaii, we have mobilized 500 disaster workers in Florida, Georgia, and the, in the Carolinas. Uh, we prepare these volunteers with intense training for the different tasks that they are going to perform, and they're going to be supporting the organization. We have 45 emergency response vehicles, like the one you're seeing on the screen right now, that are ready to provide services as soon as it's safe and the authorities have cleared the way. Uh, our volunteers will be providing 100,000 meals. They will be providing technical equipment and any other resources that we might need in the days to come. Uh, and now that the storm has kind of blown through that area, what do people need now and what advice and support are you offering? First advice, number one, is stay informed. Everybody thinks that because it's not raining, we can go out and take a look at what's happening. It's very important to stay informed. Once the authorities have clear, you can come out. Uh, you can download the American Red Cross app. We give you give you notifications, weather notifications, a plan on what to do prior, during, and now, this time after the storm, which are the steps that you need to take to make sure that you're safe and that your family is also safe. So how would you compare uh, this situation that we've seen in Florida to other hurricanes? In the last decade, I have to say, we've seen disasters becoming more stronger and more destructive due to the climate crisis that we are experiencing. And I think that's where the role of the Red Cross is so important. We are here to prepare the communities to make them more resilient, but also walk them through the recovery process because for this community especially in in the florida in the florida regions is going to be tough for them they're just recovering from hurricane ian and now they have another storm that has come their way but the red cross is here for the long-term recovery to provide the assistance that they are going to need in the days and the weeks ahead and uh, Greg, I was going to ask if you f have the resource the red cross is a big organization uh and i just wonder are you still seeing support for it to the degree that you need to do your job at moments like this? We rely on the generosity of the donors and, you know, donors come and donate to the organization financially. Our volunteers donate their time, which is precious, just as money. And people that are not in affected areas donate blood. Um, all of those three are necessary at this time. And we see the generosity of people and people standing up and, and supporting the organization. We could not do this without the support of our volunteers and our financial donors. What type of people have you been seeing in the shelters? Is it more, um, just describe, you know, who has benefited the most this time around from your various shelters? 
Honestly, all types of people, all, all ages, people with kids, people with pets. Um, we have all kinds of people and, and we are welcome everyone in our Red Cross shelters. It's very important. Uh, we welcome everyone. We don't discriminate. We are opening a safe haven for people who need help. And our shelters are not opening just for people who want to spend the night. Our shelters are open 24 hours for people who also need to go and charge their phone or need a hot meal or just need some assistance perhaps uh, with with um, mental health or any other assistance that they might get at a Red Cross shelter. So don't don't think that it's only for you to spend the night. There's multiple services that are offered in our centers and our shelters that we can provide for people who are affected by this disaster. Grace Meinhofer, really appreciate what the Red Cross does in situations like this. And thank you just for get a, getting us updated and up to speed on what you are doing in the region. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, a lot more ahead. ABC News Live continuing coverage of Idalia. Now a tropical storm swirling inland after slamming into Fort Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. We're going to speak with the mayor of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It's getting it right now, just ahead. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did you do If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Ooh. Friday, the David Muir two-hour 2020 event at 9, 8 central on ABC. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. At Reagan National Airport, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us here on ABC News Live. Our breaking news coverage continues. Italian now downgraded to a tropical storm moving into Georgia after wreaking havoc all across the state of Florida. Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia is still telling people, though, to prepare in his state. Dahlia already made history in Florida, making a landfall as a cat three just before eight this morning in the Big Bend region of that state, making the strongest storm to hit this area in more than 100 years. That's right, that hurricane expected uh, to impact South Carolina, or rather the tropical storm uh, expected to do just that. And it's moving north, as we mentioned, uh, in South Carolina, uh, right there, the path of destruction. You can see here uh, that car we've been showing that just flipped uh, within that tornado that touched down in Charleston. Pretty harrowing mm. uh, moment. Terrifying. Uh, and joining us now to talk about that damage is the mayor of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Brenda Bethune. Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, thank you for being with us. I know you're busy. I want to start just by asking about how the members of your community, how are people doing down there? Are they safe? Well, I haven't heard any news yet. And right now we have a lot of rain. 
some heavy downpours, but very little wind to no wind at this point. But we do expect that to change. You have a tornado watch, right, for, for your area? Is that is that right? Yes, we do. And that's probably the most um, important thing that we're watching at this moment is the tornado watch. We do have a king tide coming later this evening. So flooding and the tornadoes are our main concerns. And that's what residents have been talking about, the king tide. We've right. been talking about that as well. That was sort of an unexpected part to all of this, right? Absolutely. And we do have areas that are prone to flooding, and uh, we've seen that before with Hurricane Florence. Last year with Hurricane Ian, we lost all of our sand dunes and our sand fencing, and that is our only defense for storms like this for our coast, especially for our oceanfront properties. And we literally just rebuilt those uh, the sand fencing and planted new sea oats. That project was completed last month. So I don't know how they're gonna hold up with this storm. Hopefully they will, and um, there won't be much damage. Hopefully, absolutely. So uh, there are more than 13,000 South Carolinians without power right now. What's going on on that front in Myrtle Beach? I have not heard yet of anyone who has lost power, but like I said, we have very little effects here right now. It's rain with heavy downpours, but the wind has not come yet. So I do expect that once we see some heavier winds that, that we will start to see more power losses. All right, and how, what's the, what, what's the mood of your team there? I mean, you're used to hurricanes, you know, not a, not a lot, but they obviously they do come up that coast quite, quite a bit. So how did you prepare and, and what's the morale situation there after, after now you've, you're kind of right in the eye there? Our team prepares for this every year. Uh, every time we do have an event, we always analyze what we've done to see what we can prove upon for the next time. There are ongoing meetings that take place. So we are prepared. They have removed things from the oceanfront area, things that could be become flying debris. And we're prepared to start the cleanup efforts first thing tomorrow as soon as the storm is over and it's safe to get out. The main thing for us is to encourage people to stay off of the beaches and out of the water. We still have a lot of tourists in the area. And for them, this is a sightseeing event, and that's not what this is. It's very dangerous to be in the water, in the ocean right now. So we encourage people to shelter in place, stay inside, don't get out and drive around, and please don't get in the ocean. And up early and straight to work uh, for Absolutely. Mayor Bethune there in uh, Myrtle Beach. Brenda, thank you so much for zooming in with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Another bit of news that we've been following, and that is uh, Kentucky Republican Senator Mitch McConnell appearing once again to freeze in front of reporters amid concerns about his health. This is now the second episode in a little more than a month. Let's take a look. That's it. That's it. Did you hear the question, Senator, running for re-election in 2026? All right, I'm sorry, you all, we're going to need a minute. Senator. Benny. Yep. I'm going to head outside, sir. Don't come with us. <clears throat> okay. Somebody else have a question? Please speak up. Well, that is tough to watch there. Senator McConnell once again kind of freezing, unable, it seemed, to speak or, or move, although he did acknowledge uh, what his aide was asking him there. A spokesman for McConnell tells ABC News that the 81-year-old Senate Majority Leader, quote, felt momentarily lightheaded, unquote, but is doing fine and will be consulting a physician about this episode. Press Secretary Karen Jean-Pierre at the White House commented on the incident during today's briefing. She said the President Biden wishes the senator well. 
This comes just a month, as we mentioned, after McConnell appeared uh, to freeze during this press conference. You may remember it happened on Capitol Hill. Uh, McConnell was then escorted away, but did return moments later to say that he was just fine. ABC News also recently learned that McConnell fell on a jet bridge at Reagan a Airport in D.C. last month, also suffering a concussion and broken rib after a fall in March. Uh, we sure hope that we do get more information you know, from McConnell, his, his staff, his team, as to what's uh, what's going on here and that he gets better and makes the decisions that he needs to to make yep, to take care of himself yep absolutely we've uh, been following some other headlines uh, for you this hour as well ukraine and russia uh, exchanging attacks overnight targeting the moscow region and kiev this appears to be the most widespread attack on russia presumably launched by ukraine since the start of the war it targeted spots across western and central Russia. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, military, military leaders say that two civilians were killed there in Kyiv after a barrage of Russian missiles and drones. Uh, they said that it's the largest attack on the capital since the spring. Soldiers in the oil-rich African country of Gabon have declared a coup. The group uh, claiming to have seized power from the country's president. The group did claim to seize power from the country's president, whose family has ruled the nation for decades. The announcement was made on state television by a dozen uniformed soldiers hours after the Gabonese president won re-election for a third term. Uh, the group declared that the election was a fraud and that the results were canceled. The soldiers also announced that all borders are, quote, closed until further notice and that state institutions are, quote, dissolved. The coup leaders later issued another statement saying the president was under house arrest. If successful, Gabon's coup would be the eighth coup to occur in West Africa and Central Africa in just the past three years. Then a multinational firefighting force is battling the European Union's largest wildfire since the bloc started keeping records more than two decades ago. The fire now in its 12th day of activity. It's basically decimated homes and vast areas of the land near the border there with Turkey. Thousands of people have now been evacuated. We'll track it. And coming up, more ABC News Live continuing coverage of Idalia. Now a tropical storm swirling inland after slamming into Florida's Category 3 hurricane. We're tracking the very latest just ahead. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. My name is Lisa. Tiffany. Rita. Leslie. I am I'm a mother. mother. My son was shot dead. My partner abducted our son. This is the last chance to get my kids back. I had to live a double life to save my son. And this is my, my story. story. They are taking your children away. And that's when all hell breaks loose. I wanted him to know you mess with the wrong mother. Mother Undercover. Now streaming only on Hulu. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did she do next? Stab, 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 stab. If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Friday, the David Muir two-hour 2020 event at 9, 8 central on ABC. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the South. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? 
Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the... Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran, and today on ABC News Live, Idalia on the move now is a tropical storm after slamming into Florida's Gulf Coast as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. The storm carving a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles, and triggering widespread power outages. We have the latest on the aftermath and the time and track as this storm swirls inland, putting millions of Americans still on alert. A tropical storm, Idalia now, is what it is. It's moving into South Georgia. Governor Brian Kemp there telling people to prepare for it, and noting that it is still a dangerous situation. Right, the tropical storm already making history in Florida, lashing Big Bend, that area, also blowing out power across the state in Florida, and then the huge waves that just battered so many homes. A lot of people still wondering if they have anything left. And take a look at this shocking video. Take a look. That car tossed, picked up and tossed into the air, slamming into another vehicle. Officials confirming that a small and brief tornado touched down and lifted that up. We certainly hope all are safe who experienced that terrifying moment there. Idalia made landfall as a Category 3 just before 8 this morning in the Big Bend region of Florida, making it the strongest storm to hit that area in 127 years. And it came ashore packing powerful winds, a life-threatening storm surge, which most people got out of the way of, and the threat of tornadoes. It was just saw in South Carolina there. Yeah, well, now, as we mentioned, Idalia has been downgraded to a tropical storm. It lost strength as it moved northeast over land. We continue, though, to check in with uh, all our correspondents across the region starting off there in Charleston, South Carolina, with our Alex Preche. Uh, how's it looking this hour? Hey, Kira and Terry. So you, you referenced that that video of that tornado in, in Goose Creek. That's about 30 minutes from here. Uh, and, and so, look, on top of preparing for this tropical storm, which we're expecting later in this evening, this region has been dealing with tornadoes and tornado warnings. Actually, the town of, of Huger right now, which is about 44 minutes from here, uh, just issued uh, the National Weather Service there, just issued a tornado warning there as well. This has been consistent throughout the afternoon. By our count, this is at least the third tornado warning in the area. Uh, officials warning about the possibility of debris flying. And obviously, you know, that is something that is a, a, a great concern. And so we've seen a lot of the local businesses uh, take tables and, and, and chairs and outdoor patio sets off their off their grounds, uh, securing them as as we're expecting this tropical storm to make its way uh, in this evening. The other thing that I would flag for you guys is that, look, it's no secret that Charleston is prone to flooding. I'm sitting right now, we're, we're on the banks of the Ashley River here, one of three rivers in the region. High tide is expected to be around 8.30 this evening. That's also when we're expecting uh, a brunt of this rain from this storm. And so with that is the possibility of storm surge, something that uh, the mayor and both the governor are, are concerned about. The governor saying this afternoon, uh, don't worry, don't panic, but be prepared. So let's talk about the biggest threats, Alex, to Charleston and surrounding areas right now. We saw that, you know, that terrifying video of what looked like a tornado lifting a car off the ground. What are people doing there? 
Well, so we've seen a lot of people actually uh, in, 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 in the last couple of hours uh, make those preparations, right? Uh, it's, it's the last minute trips to the grocery store before, before it closes. It's, it's, it's filling up on gas and getting to where you need to be. The mayor here in Charleston has told folks that as this storm moves in this evening, uh, you want to be hunkered down. You want to be inside. Don't put first responders, emergency first responders at risk. And for those that don't have some place to go, the city has, has gone ahead and they've opened up shelters for, for people and pets. They've also opened up some of the garages to, to help folks get cars uh, off the ground because again this is prone to flooding uh, and, and and you know they've certainly dealt with this in the past um, look We've moved to higher ground, but I can tell you that around here, uh, there are a lot of low-lying parking lots. That wall, as the rain picks up behind me, uh, between us and, and the river, isn't that high. So if there is a storm surge, uh, it, it, it's very plausible that water would flood this area. So, Alex, what's next? You know, now that this storm has been downgraded to a tropical storm, how's that changing the conversation where you are? Well, it's Kira, I don't think it's actually changing the conversation because, again, you know, we're we have this tropical storm that's making its way, but then we are also coupling it with some of these tornado warnings. Officials urging, urging residents here to heed the warnings, to, to take this seriously, and to eventually make your way indoors and stay there. All right. Alex Prochet, thanks very much. Now we're going to take a look at the big picture once again with our ABC News meteorologist Greg Dutra. So, Greg, you know, how would you describe where this storm is and what it is? Now it's a tropical storm. Okay, it's much more diffuse. Uh, uh, it, yeah. Would you call there, uh, was there an eye in there still? What do you think? Uh, there's still <laughs> definitely a center of low pressure, for sure, for sure. But you know how it is when these things move and make landfall. We are laser focused on a tiny little wedge of coastline where they're going to see the most significant winds and storm surge. And it's a 50 mile or so stretch that we're really focused on. Now you're absolutely right. I think. I I think diffuse is the right word because we've got an area that stretches from just south of Savannah, Georgia, all the way up almost to the outer banks of North Carolina. Huge tornado watch. And every once in a while, like little fires that pop up, you see these red boxes come in and those are active tornado warnings. The city of Charleston at one point had three of them going on at the same time. And now there's two at this point, but spread out much more widespread. Now, one other issue will be the heavy rainfall from this that's falling inland at this point there could be four to six almost up to 10 inches in some isolated spots of rain that's falling inland and trying to empty out into the ocean but the problem is yes this is only a tropical storm now but it's still pushing water up against all of these outlets two to five feet worth of storm surge from savannah to charleston and that's going to kind of plug up the drain a little bit for the water trying to get back out to sea and i wouldn't be surprised if we get some video out of cities like like Charleston uh, or Savannah or farther up the coast into Myrtle Beach. I've been to Myrtle Beach a number of times. They're pretty prone to flooding too, even from just garden variety thunderstorms. So that's the main threat moving forward. Pop up tornadoes and then some flooding in Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Wilmington, and possibly all the way up to the northern banks. Again, changing gears a little bit, but still not completely out of the woods. Okay, so let's expand on that. How likely sure. is it for this storm to, to grow in strength again? Mm. Well, that is always a good question, especially when it moves back over water. But it's out of the tropics now. So you're getting north of about 30 degrees north, which we call the horse latitudes, where the trade winds will switch. So it's definitely out of the tropics. And even though it's going to move back over open water, the water is much cooler. And in general, the prevailing winds are now moving from west to east. So it'll actually act to blow it away away from the U.S. and out towards Bermuda in the coming days. So even if it did gain a little bit more strength over the coming days, the good news is it's far enough north that it's not going to curve back in and hit us again. But we have certainly seen that before, so I understand the concern there. Hmm. All righty. Greg, thank you. No problem. Well, coming up, more ABC News Live continuing coverage of Idalia. Now a tropical storm swirling inland after slamming into Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. We're tracking the very latest just ahead.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Lisa. Tiffany. Rita. Leslie. I am a mother. My son was shot dead. My partner abducted our son. This is the last chance to get my kids back. I had to live a double life to save my son. And this is It's my story. story. They are taking your children away. And that's when all hell breaks loose. I wanted him to know you messed with the wrong mother. Mother Undercover. Now streaming only on Hulu. Tonight, the fast-moving hurricane making landfall in Florida. Dangerous winds and a life-threatening storm surge. Tracking the storm's next move. More Americans turn to the most-watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the South. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. I'm Rebecca Jarvis reporting from the New York Stock Exchange, and wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us here on ABC News Live. Our breaking news coverage continues. Dahlia now downgraded to a tropical storm, moving into Georgia after wreaking all that havoc across Florida. Uh, the hurricane initially made landfall around 7.45 this morning as a major Category 3 storm in a region of Florida that hasn't been hit by a storm this strong since 1896. And the American Red Cross has been on the ground, as always, ready to assist the hardest hit areas. And uh, Grace at Meinhofer now joining us uh, from Tallahassee. Grace, just tell us about the response. Um, you know, that from the very beginning to this point, how did you prepare? What assets did you put out first and foremost? Where did you go first? Kind of give us the details on how you operated and also how you're still operating because we're not completely out of the woods yet. Thank you for having me, guys. And yes, preparation is the most important thing, especially for the Red Cross. I mean, not only are we responding to a major disaster in Hawaii, we have mobilized 500 disaster workers in Florida, Georgia, and the, in the Carolinas. Uh, we prepare these volunteers with intense training for the different tasks that they are going to perform, and they're going to be supporting the organization. We have 45 emergency response vehicles, like the one you're seeing on the screen right now, that are ready to provide services as soon as it's safe and the authorities have cleared the way. Uh, our volunteers will be providing 100,000 meals. They will be providing technical equipment and any other resources that we might need in the days to come. Uh, and now that the storm has kind of blown through that area, what do people need now and what advice and support are you offering? First advice, number one, is stay informed. Everybody thinks that because it's not raining, we can go out and take a look at what's happening. It's very important to stay informed. Once the authorities have clear, you can come out. Uh, you can download the American Red Cross app. It will give you, give you notifications, weather notifications, a plan on what to do prior, during, and now, this time after the storm, which are the steps that you need to take to make sure that you're safe and that your family is also safe. So how would you compare uh, this situation that we've seen in Florida to other hurricanes? 
In the last decade, I have to say, we've seen disasters becoming more stronger and more destructive due to the climate crisis that we are experiencing. And I think that's where the role of the Red Cross is so important. We are here to prepare the communities to make them more resilient, but also walk them through the recovery process because for this community especially in in the florida in the florida regions is going to be tough for them they're just recovering from hurricane ian and now they have another storm that has come their way but the red cross is here for the long-term recovery to provide the assistance that they are going to need in the days and the weeks ahead and uh, great i was going to ask if you to have the resource the red cross is a big organization uh and i just wonder are you still seeing support for it to the degree that you need to do your job at moments like this? We rely on the generosity of the donors and, you know, donors come and donate to the organization financially or volunteers donate their time, which is precious just as money. And people that are not in affected areas donate blood. Um, all of those three are necessary at this time. And we see the generosity of people and people standing up and, and supporting the organization. We could not do this without the support of our volunteers and our financial donors. What type of people have you been seeing in the shelters? Is it more, um, just describe, you know, who has benefited the most this time around from your various shelters? Honestly, all types of people, all, all ages, people with kids, people with pets. Um, we have all kinds of people and, and we are welcome everyone in our Red Cross shelters. It's very important. Uh, we welcome everyone. We don't discriminate. We are opening a safe haven for people who need help. And our shelters are not opening just for people who want to spend the night. Our shelters are open 24 hours for people who also need to go and charge their phone or need a hot meal or just need some assistance perhaps uh, with with um, mental health or any other assistance that they might get at a Red Cross shelter. So don't, don't think that it's only for you to spend the night. There's multiple services that are offered in our centers and our shelters that we can provide for people who are affected by this disaster. Grace Meinhofer, really appreciate what the Red Cross does in situations like this. And thank you just for get a, getting us updated and up to speed on what you are doing in the region. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, a lot more ahead. ABC News Live continuing coverage of Idalia. Now a tropical sto storm swirling inland after slamming into for Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. We're going to speak with the mayor of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It's getting it right now, just ahead. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the sun. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. Glad you're streaming with us here on ABC News Live. Our breaking news coverage continues. Italia now downgraded to a tropical storm moving into Georgia after wreaking havoc all across the state of Florida. Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia is still telling people, though, to prepare in his state. Italia already made history in Florida, making a landfall as a Cat 3 just before 8 this morning in the Big Bend region of that state, making the strongest storm to hit this area in more than 100 years. That's right. That hurricane expected... Uh, to impact South Carolina, or rather the tropical storm uh, expected to do just that. And it's moving north, as we mentioned, uh, in South Carolina, uh, right there, the path of destruction. You can see here uh, that car we've been showing that just flipped uh, within that tornado that touched down in Charleston. Pretty harrowing mm. uh, moment. Terrifying. Uh, and joining us now to talk about that damage is the mayor of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Brenda Bethune. Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, thank you for being with us. I know you're busy. I want to start just by asking about how the members of your community, how are people doing down there? Are they safe? Well, I haven't heard any news yet. And right now we have a lot of rain, some heavy downpours, but very little wind to no wind at this point. But we do expect that to change. You have a tornado watch, right, for, for your area? Is that is that right? Yes, we do. And that's probably the most um, important thing that we're watching at this moment is the tornado watch. We do have a king tide coming later this evening. So flooding and the tornadoes are our main concerns. And that's what residents have been talking about, the king tide. We've right. been talking about that as well. That was sort of an unexpected part to all of this, right? Absolutely. And we do have areas that are prone to flooding, and uh, we've seen that before with Hurricane Florence. Last year with Hurricane Ian, we lost all of our sand dunes and our sand fencing, and that is our only defense for storms like this for our coast, especially for our oceanfront properties. And we literally just rebuilt those uh, the sand fencing and planted new sea oats. That project was completed last month. so. I don't know how they're going to hold up with this storm. Hopefully they will, and um, there won't be much damage. Hopefully, absolutely. So uh, there are more than 13,000 South Carolinians without power right now. What's going on on that front in Myrtle Beach? I have not heard yet of anyone who has lost power. But like I said, we have very little effects here right now. It's rain with heavy downpours, but the wind has not come yet. So I do expect that once we see some heavier winds, that, that we will start to see more power losses. All right, and how, what's the, what's the mood of your team there? I mean, you're used to hurricanes, you know, not a, not a lot, but they obviously they do come up that coast quite, quite a bit. So how did you prepare and, and what's the morale situation there after, after now you've, you're kind of right in the eye there? Our team prepares for this every year. Um, Every time we do have an event, we always analyze what we've done to see what we can prove upon for the next time. There are ongoing meetings that take place, so we are prepared. They have removed things from the oceanfront area, things that could be become flying debris, and we're prepared to start the cleanup efforts first thing tomorrow as soon as the storm is over and it's safe to get out. The main thing for us is to encourage people to stay off of the beaches and out of the water. We still have a lot of tourists in the area. And for them, this is a sightseeing event, and that's not what this is. It's very dangerous to be in the water, in the ocean right now. So we encourage people to shelter in place, stay inside, don't get out and drive around, and please don't get in the ocean. And up early and straight to work uh, for Absolutely. Mayor Bethune there in uh, Myrtle Beach. Brenda, thank you so much for zooming in with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you.
another bit of news that we've been following, and that is uh, Kentucky Republican Senator Mitch McConnell appearing once again to freeze in front of reporters amid concerns about his health. This is now the second episode in a little more than a month. Let's mm. take a look. That's That's good. Did you hear the question, Senator, running for re-election in 2026? Yes. All right, I'm sorry, you all, we're going to need a minute. Senator. Benny. Yep. Go ahead outside, sir. Don't come with us. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Somebody else have a question? Please speak up. Well, that is tough to watch there. Senator McConnell once again kind of freezing, unable, it seemed, to speak or, or move, although he did acknowledge uh, what his aide was asking him there. A spokesman for McConnell tells ABC News that the 81-year-old, quote, felt momentarily lightheaded, unquote, but is doing fine and will be consulting a physician about this episode. Press Secretary Karen Jean-Pierre at the White House commented on the incident during today's briefing. She said the President Biden wishes the senator well. This comes just a month, as we mentioned, after McConnell appeared uh, to freeze during this press conference. You may remember it happened on Capitol Hill. Uh, McConnell was then escorted away, but did return moments later to say that he was just fine. ABC News also recently learned that McConnell fell on a jet bridge at Reagan a Airport in D.C. last month, also suffering a concussion and broken rib after a fall in March. Uh, we sure hope that we do get more information you know, from McConnell, as his staff, his team, as to what's, uh, what's going on here. And that he gets better and makes the decisions that he needs to, to make. Yep, to take care of himself. Yep, absolutely. We've uh, been following some other headlines uh, for you this hour as well. Ukraine and Russia uh, exchanging attacks overnight, targeting the Moscow region and Kyiv. This appears to be the most widespread attack on Russia, presumably launched by Ukraine since the start of the war. It targeted spots across western and central Russia. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, military, military leaders say that two civilians were killed there in Kyiv after a barrage of Russian missiles and drones. Uh, they said that it's the largest attack on the capital since the spring. Soldiers in the oil-rich African country of Gabon have declared a coup. The group uh, claiming to have seized power from the country's president. The group did claim to seize power from the country's president, whose family has ruled the nation for decades. The announcement was made on state television by a dozen uniformed soldiers hours after the Gabonese president won re-election for a third term. Uh, the group declared that the election was a fraud and that the results were canceled. The soldiers also announced that all borders are, quote, closed until further notice and that state institutions are, quote, dissolved. The coup leaders later issued another statement saying the president was under house arrest. If successful, Gabon's coup would be the eighth coup to occur in West Africa and Central Africa in just the past three years. Then a multinational firefighting force is battling the European Union's largest wildfire since the bloc started keeping records more than two decades ago. The fire now in its 12th day of activity. It's basically decimated homes and vast areas of the land near the border there with Turkey. Thousands of people have now been evacuated. We'll track it. And coming up, more ABC News Live continuing coverage of Idalia. Now a tropical storm swirling inland after slamming into Florida's a Category 3 hurricane. We're tracking the very latest just ahead. So many people have followed this story for so long, and this is the first time that Peyton Leitner is talking. Do you remember leaving the park to go to the woods? This is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. Who the heck is Slender Man? The suspects lured the victim into the woods. What did she do next? Stab, 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 stab. If she saw this, what would you want to say to her? Ooh. Friday, the David Muir two-hour 2020 event at 9, 8 central on ABC. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And today on ABC News Live, Idalia on the move now is a tropical storm after slamming into Florida's Gulf Coast as a powerful Category 3 hurricane. The storm carving a path of destruction, flooding homes and vehicles and triggering widespread power outages. We have the latest on the aftermath and the time and track as this storm swirls inland, putting millions of Americans still on alert. A tropical storm, Idalia now, is what it is. It's moving into South Georgia. Governor Brian Kemp there telling people to prepare for it, and noting that it is still a dangerous situation. Right, the tropical storm already making history in Florida, lashing Big Bend, that area, also blowing out power across the state in Florida, and then the huge waves that just battered so many homes. A lot of people still wondering if they have anything left. And take a look at this shocking video. Take a look. That car tossed, picked up and tossed into the air, slamming into another vehicle. Officials confirming that a small and brief tornado touched down and lifted that up. We certainly hope all are safe who experienced that terrifying moment there. Idalia made landfall as a Category 3 just before 8 this morning in the Big Bend region of Florida, making it the strongest storm to hit that area in 127 years. And it came ashore packing powerful winds, a life-threatening storm surge, which most people got out of the way of, and the threat of tornadoes. It was just saw in South Carolina there. Yeah, well, now, as we mentioned, Idalia has been downgraded to a tropical storm. It lost strength as it moved northeast over land. We continue, though, to check in with uh, all our correspondents across the region Jen, starting off there in Charleston, South Carolina, with our Alex Prache. Uh, how's it looking this hour? Hey, Kira and Terry. So you, you referenced that that video of that tornado in, in Goose Creek. That's about 30 minutes from here. Uh, and, and so, look, on top of preparing for this tropical storm, which we're expecting later in this evening, this region has been dealing with tornadoes and tornado warnings. Actually, the town of, of Huger right now, which is about 44 minutes from here, uh, just issued uh, the National Weather Service there, just issued a tornado warning there as well. This has been consistent throughout the afternoon. By our count, this is at least the third tornado warning in the area uh, officials warning okay. we take you straight to tallahassee florida now Here's governor Ron DeSantis providing an update on tropical storm Idalia as it makes its way across um, georgia and so into far, south carolina all, all signs have been positive there is of course a lot of debris to clean up but we will get uh, working with that with the local communities to make sure that the roads are cleared and uh, people can go back uh, to their lives. Uh, as of 6 o'clock today, there are approximately 250,000 power outages reported across the state uh, since the storm hit. Uh, their power has been restored to approximately 315,000. 
and that 250,000 number is actually a decline from what it was a few hours ago. So we appreciate the, the rapid attention to restoring power. Uh, clearly, the area that has the most significant percentage outages are those Big Bend counties that bore the brunt of the storm. Uh, counties like Columbia, Madison, Dixie, and uh, people are working. There's no shortage of fuel. Uh, we have more than enough fuel in the state of Florida. If you're at a gas station that, that's not pumping it, it largely is probably going to be a power issue. Those that have generators can, can get that back up or when the power is restored. But there is an abundance of fuel, and we made sure to have that gone, uh, ready to go. Uh, Florida Department of Transportation has uh, 20, 224 cut and toss crews. They've been working to clear the roadways. Uh, the Cedar Key Bridge has officially been cleared by FDOT. And uh, residents, first responders, and law enforcement can now pass. Residents should follow the guidance of the local emergency and law enforcement personnel in terms of any type of restrictions that may be on that. But the bridge has been cleared by the state. Uh, all state bridges at this point have also been cleared. Uh, there is a 15-mile stretch of Interstate 10 that is closed in Madison County. Uh, but FDOT is working on that to have that back online uh, by tonight. We have all uh, uh, resources have been deployed from urban search and rescue teams, the Florida National Guard, the Coast Guard, the Florida State Guard, Florida Fish and Wildlife. Uh, those are going to continue uh, until there's, there's no help uh, needed. Uh, in terms of hospitals, uh, in rural areas that receive direct impacts, the facilities remain operational and open to the public, and we're, we're happy that they were able to do that. Uh, throughout the state, uh, there were 10 evacuated hospitals. They reported minimal, minimal damage, and 9 of the 10 will be at full operational status within the next 24 hours. And ACA is working with the one remaining, but we don't think it's going to take too much longer after that. Uh, after the storm, uh, Agency for Health Care's uh, health care assessment teams must inspect all evacuated health care facilities which have sustained damage before they can reopen, and they are in the process of making assessments for all evacuated health care facilities. Uh, our Florida Department of Veterans Affairs uh, assisted one of Florida's federally operated VA hospitals with safely transferring veterans uh, prior to the hurricane, and we appreciate uh, Florida DVA for, for stepping up in that. Schools, 30 of the 52 school districts that closed due to the storm will reopen tomorrow, and an additional eight school districts will open reopen on Friday. And uh, Manny Diaz is calling through the remaining school districts uh, to try to get them open a as soon as possible. Uh, we appreciate everybody's hard work. It's been uh, a lot going on over these last few days. Uh, there's a lot to do. But I think the, the quick response is helping everybody get back on their feet. Okay, we're going to hear from some of the uh, folks who've been involved in, in different areas of this response, starting with Kevin Guthrie from Florida DEM. Thank you, Governor. Uh, appreciate your continued support. You know, I know you've taken some flack about whether or not you've been here or not. So let me go ahead and say for everybody, he's been here since 4 a.m. this morning. So uh, certainly appreciate that, sir, for all your support. Um, the division is boots on the ground. We are working through everything that is uh, that is happening. Uh, we've completed 75 percent. Urban search and rescue personnel have completed 75 percent of the hasty search and primary search for the entire impacted area. So all the way from southwest Florida all the way through to the um, state line, they have completed 75 percent of that search. Crews are still in the field working now, and they will continue to work through that. Uh, the next phase of this is we talk about is search, secure, and stabilize. So we'll be focusing tomorrow heavily on securing and stabilizing areas from getting any worse. Uh, we will be working uh, with our secondary searches tomorrow going back through uh, all the impacted areas, especially the heavily impacted areas to ensure that those have been cleared and there's nobody there. Um, we are, good news story, we are not finding uh, anybody at home. So therefore, as the governor has talked about, uh, many, many people heeded the warnings to evacuate. Um, and we, so far, have not had any reports of any uh, unconfirmed or confirmed fatalities um, related to any drowning or any flooding victims of that nature. 
We will then start moving into the next phase of this, the recovery phase. Uh, so we will start working to uh, do the windshield assessments and then what's referred to as the initial damage assessments with the cities and counties to determine what type of public infrastructure has been damaged and what those estimated costs will be. Uh, they will then end up working towards what's also referred to as the individual assessments, uh, damage assessments, and that's where we start looking at homes uh, that have been affected, minor, major damage, and coming up with a total to then see if we qualify for potentially an individual assistance major disaster declaration. Uh, we will be submitting uh, to the governor tonight for his review um, the expedited major disaster declaration, and with his approval, we will then submit that on up to FEMA tonight. So uh, that brings you up to speed on what we've been doing. And again, Governor, I cannot say it enough. I'm sure everybody will say the same thing. Thank you for your support from uh, through this whole entire incident. Thank you. Good evening and thank you, uh, Governor, for your leadership and support of your Florida National Guard. Director Guthrie, thank you again for the great work your team is doing to protect Florida citizens. As the Governor mentioned, we had the opportunity to survey the storm damage in some of the most impacted areas in Taylor County uh, earlier today. While there, we met with local emergency management team and witnessed firsthand a resilient community fully engaged in recovery operations. The Florida National Guard is fully mobilized in support of Taylor County recovery efforts as well as the ongoing efforts in all the impacted counties throughout Central and North Florida. With over 5,500 soldiers and airmen deployed since daybreak this morning, we have provided support with missions that included search and rescue, damage assessment, route clearance, and this afternoon, our rotary wing aviation assets are conducting reconnaissance flights across the impacted area of the storm. Since we were just there, I'd like to highlight some of the uh, missions conducted in Taylor County. Our 153rd Cavalry Squadron is the main effort assisted by an engineer company. This force of around 300 soldiers and airmen are conducting air and ground search and rescue, route clearance, and debris removal. As of this evening, we've cleared over 150 miles of roads in five counties. Part of this task force is an Air Force Engineer Squadron, Red Horse. This highly trained organization is a heavy construction unit that quickly moves debris and clears routes for our first responders. Their efforts have cleared routes for our teams to conduct door-to-door -door wellness checks of our fellow Floridians. And finally, our air operations is currently en route to the Perry Foley Airport to set up air operations, uh, critical air traffic control operations. Your Florida National Guard is ready to support relief operations for as long as needed. We are your friends and neighbors, and we will be in the impact of the, with the communities until the job is done. Thank you. Um, good evening. Thank you, Governor, for your leadership and continued dedication to health care. And thank you, Director Guthrie, for all that you're doing here to help the state. Um, the Agency for Healthcare Administration has employees working around the clock. Just yesterday, we reported uh, over 1,100 calls that were made to facilities, and, and that's something that we're doing daily. The numbers obviously change, but we have folks working very hard on this. Uh, one of the first things we did was open up an event in the health facility reporting system, which requires all residential and inpatient health care providers and hospitals uh, to submit updates on census, bed availability, evacuation, uh, and receiving status, power outages, generator status uh, by 10 a.m. daily, and whenever uh, a situation changes. Um, and we've been uh, very happy with the reporting so far, though we want everyone to keep it up. Uh, we rely on the self-reporting for decision makings. That remains in place for all 67 counties. Uh, the agency, as the governor mentioned, uh, the agency is currently performing assessments at every facility uh, that was evacuated and other facilities to make sure uh, that we can open up these facilities as quickly as possible. And we're going to continue that effort uh, until they are all open. Uh, for health facilities with storm damage, um, we follow the damage assessment guidelines that are available on our website, if anybody would care to look. Uh, I just also wanted to tick off a couple of other helpful resources uh, that we found uh, helpful to publicize during Hurricane Ian. Um, they're also available on our website. Uh, the Dialysis Patient Assistance Hotline uh, is active for patients who are unable to reach their facility or nursing homes needing assistance getting patients to centers uh, post-storm. Uh, the hotline is 1-800- 823-3773. Also, Teladoc is providing free 
virtual health care services, including general. All right, Medicaid, we've been following uh, Governor Ron visits, DeSantis and uh, various members of his leadership bills. there just updating us on restoring power, uh, getting enough fuel to where uh, folks need it. They are clearing the roadways and the bridges. All state bridges are cleared now. Urban search and rescue teams still out there, though, along with the Coast Guard, National Guard, uh, all operational. Uh, hospitals as well. Tw ten were evacuated, but within the next 24 hours, the governor said they should all be up and running, and they're working really hard to get all the school districts uh, going uh, full force as well. Those reconnaissance flights will continue to survey the area. Greg Dutra have been following uh, the conditions for us uh, all throughout uh, the early morning into the day. Uh, I guess, you know, things are looking pretty good right now in Florida, sort of in the recovery stage, right? But uh, we're not completely out of the woods. Um, Carolinas, right? Paula, we lost your mic, Greg. I'm so sorry. So maybe while we work to get that, we'll head to uh, Charleston, where Alex Prechet is. And uh, that's where definitely uh, you're not out of the woods yet. Still, um, folks there uh, warning residents, right, to shelter in place. Just be aware that you've got rising water still and uh, no evacuations yet, but rising water. That's right, Kira. No evacuations, but they are urging residents to hunker down, to be smart, to be safe, and to stay in and not put emergency uh, uh, first responders at risk. But I can tell you, uh, over the last couple of hours, we've, we've seen uh, the, the, the banks of this Ashley River behind me kind of rise as Adalia makes its way uh, here. But also, Kira, one of the things we've been talking about is, uh, in, in, in the interim, there have been tornado warnings in this region, at least three that uh, me and my colleagues have counted. Uh, we saw that one uh, that, that lifted a, uh, uh, in, in Goose Creek, that lifted a car from the road. There was actually another one reported uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, North Charleston area that uh, lifted a porta potty in a, in a, in a, in a residential neighborhood. Uh, and so that's also something that a lot of these residents here are, are, are dealing with. The, again, the message from the mayor, the message from the governor, Governor uh, McMaster, is to be safe, to hunker down, and to stay out of harm's way. All right, Alex, thank you so much. We'll stay in close touch with you there in Charleston. I'm Kara Phillips. We still have a lot more news ahead as we continue our uh, coverage of tracking now tropical storm Idalia. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website crashed! <laughs> Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind-blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge. This Labor Day weekend, streaming on ABC News Live. Friday on GMA, it's Sam Hunt in a summer concert event. Something about a summer in the sun. Friday, Sam Hunt performing for you live in Central Park. Only on Good Morning America's Summer Concert Series. Sponsored by Hot Tools. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay.